Hello and welcome to the Halo Championship Series Kickoff Major 2023, live from the beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. In the convention center, it is jam packed with Halo action, wall to wall booths, and open bracket teams, and many of those coming from far and wide, hoping to make it into pools and for a chance to take the first major of the season. To talk about all of the teams in the running, we do have an expert desk today for day one. We have Clutch and Tony with us. Gentlemen, so good to see you in person. So good to be back and a fresh year nonetheless. Clutch, how excited are you to be here in Charlotte? I'm stoked to get this season two underway. We've had a lot of team changes coming into this tournament. A lot of talent is there up on the stage ready to play. And I can't wait to get the competition started and see if Optic Gaming have what it takes to continue the run that they're on. Absolutely, cannot wait to find out all of the storylines coming forward here. And Tony, dude, it's so good to have you here. I've been watching from afar with all the qualifiers. How excited do you see that to transition now onto LAN? I'm ready for it, you know? Online qualifiers are one thing, but now it's when it really matters. Now it's your on land, no excuses, get out there and do the thing. Indeed. Now, the off-season has been very, very busy, so I thought to start the show, we can do a little bit of a show and tell on what you've missed, and you might have missed it, but the roadmap is officially here, so we know where we're going to be going all season long, and of course, we do have six incredible LAN events to look forward to. We do have those two online events as well, which are going to be absolutely incredible, so, so much Halo Infinite action for you guys to ca catch, excuse me, all year long. And ending up in Seattle, Washington, home of Halo for those World Championships once again. So exciting. But something else very exciting as well, Tony, is the fact that we have two maps that are coming into rotation here in Charlotte. Talk to me about these two new additions. Yeah, don't get me wrong, you know, I love the fundamentals. I, I love the streets, the recharge, the live fires, but there's one thing they don't have, and that's the double snipers. I want to see those classic sniper versus sniper battles. I want to see some counter snipe medals, and I'm sure we're going to see plenty of that over the weekend. I'm sure we will see plenty of it, and we can see gorgeous, gorgeous looking maps here as well. And I love the fact that Imperion is that pit remake, giving a little bit of a makeover as well. Uh, talking about makeovers, though, my goodness me. In the off season, roster mania has been manic to say the least. And uh, we have seen a seven year dynasty roster get completely torn apart. Lethal is left behind here in Snakebite, Royal 2, Frosty. They join up with Renegade in order to make a serious run this year. Clutch, what does Renegade really bring to the table that they had their eyes on to start this from scratch? I mean, Renegade brings everything to the table. So much space created, so much damage, power weapon control, you can name it. I mean, Renegade, obviously, one of the runners for the MVP of last year. You put that on this roster and you have to think that slaying power, the amount of space that players like Royal 2 and Frosty are gonna have to play around now that he's on the team. It's gonna be a world of difference coming into this tournament. Definitely eyes on this phase roster and to see what they can do from the get-go here at LAN. But I've also got eyes on that second place Cloud9 roster who stay together but getting that makeover with the SSG gaming behind their names as well. And Tony, second place constantly. How long will this haunt them? Do you see them fixing that hopefully here in Charlotte? Don't get me wrong, I love SSG, and especially when it comes to on land. I think that's when they perform at their best. However, they have a target on their back. That, forget about, you know, getting first place. I think it's gonna be tough for them to get second. I think it's gonna be tough for them to hold on to a top three placing. You got a lot of hungry teams that are after you. The new phase, that Optic are still are still world champions, back-to-back -back land champions. And don't forget about the hungry G1s and the native reds. SSG are gonna have a tough time. Yeah, there's a lot of teams biting at those heels. They're gonna be watching their back very carefully this land tournament, seeing who is the up and coming teams. Now, while everyone else is running around, changing things up, seeing what works coming into the brand new year, Optic stays the same. And Wes, looking at this team, you know, that momentum coming from that World Championship win, in fact, coming from the two back-to-back -back land wins, what can this do for here for them here at this land event? Yeah, coming into this event, there's a lot of disrespect going towards Optic's way right now. FaZe made the change, they've dominated, these online qualifiers, I say dominate, but the series has been close. But Optic Gaming have to almost feel like underdogs coming in after or back to back land wins after a world championship performance that is unforgettable. These guys all of a sudden find themselves maybe like the second favorited team coming in. I think that's a little disrespectful. I expect Optic to hit the hit the ground running this tournament, and I expect them to play at the highest level we've seen from them yet as well. Now, we found out a little about 
who we're going to be watching but i want you guys to know what you get just for tuning in and that is right it is twitch drops and my goodness Ooh. me look at all of this you get just Shoot. for watching this is the death hex and i'm so excited for these and thank goodness that everyone in person in charlotte also gets these drops try and find the cards around the arena take them home sign into your game and make sure you get those drops that you deserve as well now you're probably wondering where to watch in order to get to get these twitch drops and we've got three streams for you today to catch all of the friday halo action you're watching the a stream right now but we've got b and c gameplay for you so get your tabs open and earn those drops as well now we have of course a format to talk about and we do have pool play today really excited to see how all these teams fare but remember we have that fourth pool play spot still open for the open bracket teams where they're going to be grinding on through and hopefully taking some of the teams that we already have qualified for a little bit of a run here tony how excited are you to get into pool play anyone you're really like looking forward to seeing in terms of how the pools have actually balanced out yeah, I'm really excited to be honest with that. Uh, we talked about it all throughout season one that the competition was really tight. And going into season two, somehow it's even tighter than that. Uh, I'm, I gotta keep my eye out on Shopify Rebellion. The reason being is that from the moment after Worlds, these, these guys were out there scrimming. They were out there practicing and making sure that they stayed ready going into this season. Hopefully all that preparation pays off because they're in pool A. Yeah, we had a couple of switch ups, of course, with the pools as well. So a, a couple of different changes coming through. How do you think some of the, you know, quadrant changes? We also had Native Red bumped down as well into the open bracket teams. How do you think that's going to affect things for the teams? Yeah, I think it's a lot of opportunities for the teams through the 9 through 12 region or even in the top 16 that there's some weaker rosters coming into this tournament than expected. That should mean, hey, green flag, this is our best opportunity to get our best, best placing yet. So a lot of teams can see themselves as hungry underdogs in situations against teams where, hey, they might not be full force this weekend. And that's something that they're going to have to, like, go forward with and play through. So I'm super excited about that opportunity. Who's going to seize it? And then also, the teams that don't have their full roster squatter and native red, they're going to have an opportunity to play with a little less pressure because they do not have their full roster. Now, Clutch, whether it's concern or excitement, is there a team in particular you have your eye on? Yeah, I think we have to put the spotlight on Sentinels for this tournament, right? These guys come in with individual expectations of like winning championships. Lethal has been doing this for so long and now he's got to get back on the horse. He's got to figure it out. And the Sentinels roster has not impressed me at all through the online qualifiers. And they know that they are very good land players. However, I expect their individual skill to start giving them some opportunity and hopefully Sentinels can get back on that horse. We're going to learn a lot about this team here on Friday. That's why they're my team to watch. Indeed they are. And Tony, on the other side of things, again, who have you really got your eye on in order to make a really big statement here in Charlotte? You know, kind of the opposite of where you're at. You know, I, I really love this gamer's first roster. This this is oh, yeah. my this is my squad to watch out for. I think they're absolutely dangerous. You've taken three of the best layers and high damage dealers, by the way, also the fastest players on three different teams. Bring them all together. Their play style complements each other. I'm expecting G1 to hit the ground running. I'm expecting them to be targeting the SSGs and the phases and the optics and by the way, who's the only team to beat FaZe in the preseason? Oh yeah, that's right, it's G1. Yeah, indeed, I gotta say, in terms of G1, there's a lot of eyes on this roster. Yes, they may not have won the qualifiers, but I think they've done enough and kept so close enough to have that kind of pressure coming into this land. And Clutch, you know, if you are these gentlemen on that main stage, what are you bringing to the table this event? Yeah, a lot of individual skill. We know these guys. These are household names by this point. Still very young, I feel like, in their careers. And I love what G1's been able to do with this franchise as far as build around Booba Dubu. They found themselves a superstar last year. They stuck with that superstar. They rebuilt around him. They put a lot of friends around him, too. Like, the relationships on this team, these guys vibe with each other very well. I expect that to immediately transition in the game. We've seen glimpses of what G1 is capable of taking down Sentinels in one of the qualifiers, or FaZe in one of the qualifiers. I I think that very same story can happen here on land. G1 is a true underdog that has a fight for a championship this weekend. Indeed, they do. And Tony, just while we're on G1, we have a tiny little bit of time here as well. You know, we look at teamwork a lot of the time, and some of these rosters have some impeccable teamwork, Optic Gaming being one of those, and have definitely put that statement on the table last season. Do you see G1 following up with really great teamwork, or is it a team of individual talent? 
I think they do. I think even throughout season one, G1 already naturally have like played well beyond their years, played like like serious veterans. And now you're bringing their friends, like you said. Now you're bringing play styles that complement each other. G1, the moment a call out comes in, you got three players flying and collapsing on it. They're one of the most dangerous teams in the league for a reason. I think not only are G1 coming with that firepower, not only coming with that speed, but they're definitely coming with that teamwork and coordination as well. It's a new team. Yes, but a lot of these guys have history playing with each other, competing alongside. I think that that teamwork immediately gets felt very early in their scrims. Although they haven't been a team for a extended period of time, that chemistry from free, from the past with like Falcated and Bubudubu, those guys have teamed countless times. I expect that that to make this transition to a first LAN event so easy for these guys, it's gonna be natural. Now we're talking about new teams and the teamwork that is required to really get things done here, especially on LAN. You've gotta be super, super buttoned up as a team. You know, I, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, that kind of meme we saw earlier on on the screen with Optic looking back at all of the teams who are kind of in chaos and still trying to figure things out. And you know, like how much of an advantage do you think Optic truly has here, Clutch? Being the team that has stayed together, they don't have to catch up on any homework other than making sure things are still going well for them you know really what what does that say about this roster and the other ones who might have to do that homework there's a lot of pros and cons right there's a lot of pros as far as like communication you know what to expect the level the teamwork the expectation of what play this player is going to make optic have the advantage in every one of those categories the difficult part is hey once you become a world champion you got a target on the back of your head everybody is coming for that spot everybody wants to take you down and that makes every series a little bit harder a little bit more difficult all of these teams have formed here to see have we put together a roster that can compete against this world championship squad this team is going to be challenged every single series this weekend to play their best. They certainly are indeed. And Tony, you know, looking at the four gentlemen on our screen there, I mean, just incredible players. We've seen them get it done in the most incredible fashion last year. But you know, this is a different year. And so far on the qualifiers phase have been a step ahead of them. Do you feel like Optic are coming in feeling like the underdogs here? Do you think that they still feel like they are the world champions coming into this and that they are one of the favorites that people are going to be looking at? Or have FaZe kind of taken that away from them on the three online tournaments that we've just seen? I don't think Optic fear FaZe. And, 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 and the same way what you just said, Wes, that, that, that they have a target on their back, multiple teams, including FaZe, Optic welcomed that challenge. They won. They, they, they play better the better the competition is. So Optic's going to come in do their preparation, do their film review, find out what were the mistakes they were making, find out how they could overcome those mistakes and just practice, practice, practice. Yes, they have a target on their back. Yes, it's going to be tough, but yes, they're also welcoming it. Watch out for Optic Gaming. Love that. We love competition here, of course, and day one competition. It's going to be absolutely <laughs> incredible. But I'll tell you what, there is so much action happening, but I want you guys to remember a couple of things. That Sunday, we do have an incredible season three showdown match happening on the main stage with very, very familiar Halo faces. It's going to be absolutely incredible, so make sure you're tuning into that. Here is the schedule for the day, though. Coming your way first, we've got Optic Gaming versus Sentinels. Pool A is bringing you Shopify Rebellion versus Na'Vi. Pool B, Sentinels versus Quadrant. Pool A, FaZe Clan takes on Shopify Rebellion. And to end the night, G1 versus Believe the Hype. And do you believe, Clutch? Do you believe? That's a big question for those players, because the only ones that matter are the four people playing on those controllers. And I hope that that name kind of gives them a little bit of that like false hope and false opportunity there. And I mean, if a team of four players that believe can beat anybody. I think uh, if, if the name speaks for itself, they're going to make some fireworks. I got some friends on that team, so I'm looking forward to seeing what BTH can bring us. Me too. And Tony, you know, in some of the, the meetings that we've had, you believe the hype. I know you do. Talk to me about this team and what you really think they're going to be bringing this weekend. There's two things I look out for when it comes to a team, and, and I, one, one would be them being underdogs. Two, them having something to fight for. Like They, they, they want to come to land and, and translate that same success that they had in the online qualifiers and prove everybody wrong. People are thinking that Bleed the Hype aren't going to perform here on land, and I'm telling you, I think they will. Now is their time. The team looks good. Mind you, they got fourth place during the first qualifier. They got top six in the next one. Believe the Hype are the real deal. Watch out for them. Watch out indeed. Well, folks, the 2023 season is here, but we can't get started without giving Halo Infinite's year one a proper send off. So let's watch Optic get some bling.
one of the biggest stories in the Halo Championship Series. Before we do that, we have to honor our world champions of season one. It's Optic Gaming here. But to do that, to help me out, I got to bring to the stage 343's eSports lead is Toshi. Make some noise for him. Thank you, Blaze. And thank you, everybody, for being here in person and to everyone watching online at home, too. Uh, you know, the first year of HCS and Halo Infinite has been, you know, insane. And so we're very thankful for all the support. Uh, so a huge shout out to all the fans and all the players for being part of it, as well as our partners. Um, so first, I want to say congratulations to the Optic Gaming Organization for winning their second Halo World Championship and being the first and only team to do so. So congratulations to the organization. Of course, we also want to show some love to the players and the coach who are out there in the game busting their butts all season long. You know, to win a world championship, it's a long season and there's a lot of trials and tribulations that go along with it. You have roster changes, ups and downs, and the story of Optic throughout the season was something of resilience, I would say. And that's what it takes to come out on top in a scene that is so competitive. So congratulations to all the players and the coach as well. And Hey, let's hand out some rings. All right, time to hand out these rings to come out first. Get loud because it's the coach of Optic Gaming. Show some love to Lunchbox. Now it's time to bring out our players. Give it up for the GOAT. It's formal. Now, Charlotte, make some noise for APG! Now, give it up for the man himself! It's Trippy! And last, but definitely not least, the most valuable player of the 2022 World Championship, it's Lucid! Now Charlotte and Halo fans all around the world, show some love to your 2022 World Champions! Optic Gaming! Fire. That is sick. <laughs> Wait, that, like, that was so sick. What was that? Congratulations again, Optic Gaming. And with that, year one officially comes to a close with Optic adding another banner to the Hall of Champions. However, there is always room for more. And this year, we will crown a champion once again. Year two starts now.
three majors, three different champions. We saw rookies surpass expectations and veterans return to form. In the end, Optic Gaming with the power of the green wall behind them secured the world championship. It's time yet again to write a new chapter, but this time the landscape has changed entirely. Super teams have formed to challenge Optic's reign, the young guns in the scene are entering their prime, and legendary maps and players alike make their return. Will Optic defend their crown, or will new champions steal their throne? This is the Halo Championship Series. As the curtain closes on season one, it's time for us to lift a new curtain here on season two. Welcome to Charlotte, North Carolina, and welcome to the first HGS major of the year. Andy, woo, dude, it's a pleasure to be here to cast his first game. And as you can see here on the lower third, the oh. Esports Awards winner, wow. color commentator of the year, Andy Dudinski. Welcome back, friend. Uh, very kind of you. Could not have done it alongside, without you, excuse me, couldn't have done it without being alongside you for the whole season. Absolutely incredible year last year, but like you said, New season, new stories ahead of us here as Optic looks to defend their title. Phase, of course, the biggest threat to the throne, and we have a treat here. Just after Optic get their rings, they have to play right away on the main stage against a brand new Sentinels roster. They do indeed, and what a game to kick things off. We're heading into Pool B to kick off the major here, and like you say, our matchup is the world champions. We've just seen them step onto the stage, collect their rings, all the good memories of last year, but now they've got to sit down. It's a complete blank slate for the Mirandi. They have to start again. Absolutely, and of course, expecting to continue that culture of excellence from last year. We'll see if they can bring that into year two yet again. They are ready to play. We've been hanging out with them backstage. Of course, the vibes are high on the squad, and I think they know exactly what they need to do this weekend. Taking a look at the series layout in just a moment, and we have quite a few good game types to start things off with. We're going to be kicking things off with two of the new maps here in year two. We do, we're gonna see a lot of sniper action to start this series off. Optic versus Sentinels. And we're starting off with a little bit of Argyle. So we do have that dual sniper rifle map to get us kicked off. And then we move over to Imperian Slayer. Now, if you're wondering how Imperian is pronounced, it is actually pronounced the pit. Just it's so actually, you know, yeah. it's spelled a certain way, but you know, we might- Imperian is actually Latin for the pit. Exactly, it's very yeah. true. So that's where we're gonna head for game number two. Once again, two sniper rifles to play with. So certainly a chance for Optic and Sentinels to flex the, uh, the muscles a little bit when it comes to power weapons. Yeah, this will actually be there. Uh, most sniper heavy series layout you've seen yet in the Halo Championship series. Four snipers across the first two. Live Fire, of course, gonna have a sniper rifle in play as well. So the headshots will be booming with big talent on both sides of the stage. If necessary, we'll go to Oddball Streets, Slayer Recharge to round out the series. Now, speaking of the other side of the stage, we should uh, obviously highlight the team who's gonna be dressed in red here. That is Sentinels. Now, this roster has all of the components for success, right? We looked at this roster coming together. We know Lethal kind of left under the Sentinels banner as now now been joined by three new players to form this squad. Now, we have the right ingredients here, Andy. When you're looking at the play player type, what they bring to the team, chemistry, experience, it all seems to be there. However, we don't really know where they stand at the moment in the tall order of all of the teams here in the Halo Championship That's series. That's right, the right ingredients, but you got to know how to cook. But hey, yo, let them cook. Let them cook. Let them cook. Let's see what they got in store for us this weekend here right away. Main stage on the first match of the day. The question is, where do they stack up in the lineup? Take a look at that expression on Lethal. Sometimes you see him joking around before a game. Arms are folded, though. I think he's, this man's ready to go. He's saying, where was my ring ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's thinking right now. And we saw a couple of tweets Actually, flying about, yes. about it, which is quite interesting to talk about and kind of highlight because Going into the first series of new season, if you're Optic, you've just picked up your rings, you yep. kind of think, how's this going to feel for us? We're going to be pumped up, or we're going to be thinking maybe there's a target on our back. But for Sentinels, for me, I think it's the biggest motivator you could possibly ask for. Absolutely, right away, they just saw the World Championships get awarded the rings, and now maybe they can strip that title of them in the first match of the day. 
Here we go, baby. Season two, map one, gonna be Argyle CTF, Optic Gaming going up against Sentinels. Now, Optic Gaming, this will be the perfect way to start for them. It's a map they've been incredibly strong in, in the build-up to this event. Look out for those sniper rifles, of course. They're gonna be such an influence on creating openings for that flag to be run, but there's so much to explore yeah. and see because we've been watching a lot of gameplay in the build up to this, and we still feel like a couple of teams have still got a few things up their sleeve. Absolutely, now we're into game number one. Welcome to year two of the Halo Championship Series. Optic Gaming up against Sentinel, start things off with Lethal with some early damage against Lucid. Perfect shots, almost takes down APG as well. It's gonna be 2v2, make that just collect now left on his own. And the man who's got the sniper rifle on his hands, it's gonna be Formal here. So we're gonna have to see how Formal can perform. Currently sat at two and zero, and looking to lock down the vets. Yeah, taking a look exactly where that camo went. You can tell right here, Formal gonna reset a few things there on the mix amp, make sure all the audio is dialed, but now zooms back in on the vent yet again. Have to see exactly where things play out here. You just heard a camo off screen. We'll keep an eye on that as well. Flair comes in with a repulse, manages to take down the sniper rifle player, and King Nick is going to be moving up now, and it's actually a bit of early pressure coming in from Sentinels here. Nick will pick up another, that's a double for him. APG going to back down to the top of the engine, and Nick's going to try and use that opportunity just to sneak into the flag, but APG, he's seen that play once or twice before, and he reads it perfectly. Absolutely, APG now with sniper rifle in hand, also has a repulsor to play with, going to be very, very important on this map. Lots of creative ways to use that across really the entire map, as we see now, formal falling yet again. APG going to just have to hold down vent here, and you can see how much of a back and forth stalemate there is top middle, really for that early control. Yeah, There's gonna be a lot of battle around the 50 yard mark. We look to see sniper rifles being kept in the hands of players. They don't want to overextend because if you give two sniper rifles away, you can really put yourself into some trouble. Lethal gets repulsed back, manages to pick up the kill because unfortunately the battle rifle was empty to finish it off. But speaking of sniper rifles, here's Formal again, picking up for the second time in this game. Ooh, nice little body shot there. That will be cleaned up right away. Two dead for Sentinels. Maybe an opportunity here for Optic to get the first bit of control. Gets weak on Commando. It's a great sideline, but cannot get away from the angles of the plasmas as well as the elbow. He will fall. And once again, the joust for top mid continues. See, Collect was trying to fly and make a play on that camouflage. Camo is now up, and this can be the complete game changer. This is how you get behind enemy lines. You've already seen in these first few moments, Andy, and everyone watching at home, what a battle it can be to get past that 50-yard mark, to get inside of the base and formulate one of those spawn traps. The camo is a perfect way to do that. Maybe sneaking under the base here for Trippy is another way. Yeah, absolutely. That camo might have stayed on the top platform. Looks like, yes, indeed, it did not fall to bottom middle. So it will be a continuous battle. We'll see exactly. There it is. Now, this will be the first potentially impactful camo of the game. First kill does come in for Formal as well. This will be a big kill if Lethal oh. takes him down and shuts down Formal, Formal, excuse me, with the camo sniper. Absolutely huge play there. And you can see how Formal didn't want to fire his gun. Yeah. He did not want to give away his position, but Kalek put enough pressure on that he had to be forced to give away his position. Lethal had a sightline, and Lethal cleans things up. Speaking of Lethal, six and four at the start of this game and looking pretty comfortable. Yeah. Certainly there. Once again, as we said, arms folded there. Sometimes you see Lethal really joking around on the stage with his teammates. Of course, surrounded by new teammates this season. Instead, it's arms folded from him as he looks to make a statement about this squad. There'll be three dead, excuse me, three alive for both sides. Been a bit of a war so far in this game. Nobody really been able to get into the base. We saw Nick trying to sneak through at one point. He almost got in. Trippy managed to sneak in for just a second, but wasn't able to make much of it. Lucid challenges out aggressively to take down Nick after getting bodied himself. And yet again, we're still seeing that battle around mid-map. But Spartan, for the first time, he gets a sniper rifle on his hand. Can he pierce a couple of openings here, crack a couple of skulls just to force Sentinels forward? Absolutely. And right now, Sentinels doing very well to stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with the reigning world champion. Oh, oh good morning. Boy, we're getting started early here on Friday. Spartan with a nice little 180 no-scope for the double. Moves in as well, and now you can see Formal's managed to get out, but everyone else is on the spawn trap, and Spartan's gonna be flying in. If he hits one of these shots, it'll be pretty crispy, but instead he's gonna have to back down. No more sniper rifle ammo to play with, but the new one's popping in five seconds. He's never repulsor to sneak to the back of the base as well, and nobody from Optic has called him out. APG gets taken down, and there's three dead. Trippy last alive, and Spartan's got him locked down as well, gets the trade, and Sentinels not only have this flag moving here, they also have the camo here in the hands of Lethal. Big trade for Trippy, but is it enough? Take a look at this. Lethal with camo up top mid, as you say, he knows the spawners exactly where they're coming from. They have been mapped. This flag should go home. Should go home, but Lethal still has some work to do. Collect picks up one though. Now the flank from Lethal could be 
devastating to Optic's chances of pushing this flag back towards home. It's not going to happen. And Sentinels strike first in our game number one here. The world champions just picked up their rings. We're going to have to pick their game up now, Andy. That's right. And rings might be on the hand, but the first flag is picked up by Sentinels. The brand new roster, they are looking good. We had questions about how this team was going to be in terms of team chemistry, right? You have a, an interesting cocktail of personalities and talent on this team, but so far, so good. It takes them about four and a half minutes of play, and they strike first on the board, one to zero in favor of Sentinels. Once again, Lethal just locking down these vents. You can see what a priority position it is. You get so much line of sight on so many different positions on the map here on Argyle, and not only can you do damage, but it's communication. Where do we push? Where are Optic? Where do we take the space on the map? And that's something the Sentinels at the moment are doing extremely well. Lethal now decides it's time to get aggressive, but Formal shut him down. Nice little body shot and a clean up, but there's the exchange immediately coming in from Sen. You and I talked a lot about Collect on this roster. Maybe this is the roster that he's finally found as three do fall for Sentinels. Maybe this is an opportunity for Collect, right? He finally has the veteran talent around him here. We saw great pop-off games from him last season, but we knew there was maybe a little bit more gas in the tank, and you have to think Collect now, the only player on 10 kills, he's had quite a performance so far. He certainly has, and a lot of that good work that led up to the flag cap was because he had a sniper rifle when he sounded. Power weapons and Collect, trust me, we're hearing a lot more from us throughout the season talking about that combination of things. He really does know how to put them to use, but Formal, he's put it to use at the moment. He picks up one, Trippy working together now with APG to get this flag moving. And it looks like Sentinel's kind of split across the map. Trippy's trying to play this one slow, but a vital kill here from Lethal is going to stop that flag for a second. Yeah, Lethal gets a kill right there on E2. He's going to actually stop the flag entirely. Might also finish this kill on Trippy. It's a nice stop from Lethal so far. And Lethal gets both and stays alive. It's perfect timing. Let's go over to the Sentinel side of the stage and get into a listen in with this squad. I'm just watching camera. On it. Yes, Kama. Who was it? It was APG or Kama. Our, our plasma is weak. Our plasma is weak. Formal. Nade, 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 nade. He's weak. One shot. One shot. One shot, on one shot. One shot. I got killed by our front piece. He's R1. He's our plasma with camo. In our flag. In our flag. Where do we camo goes? Yeah, it's hot mid. Lift. Yeah, I'm gonna die. I got one. Our mando. One shot on window. I got one. Flag, one shot. I lost sniper. Yo, sniper window. Our window. Our window. Two air window. Last guy. Last guy. Last guy. Last guy. He's our high cuts. Our high cuts loose. There was a sniper down our window somewhere. Grab on the back of our flag, guys. Yeah, he's in our basement or something. Yeah, he's on me. Our pistol. Nice, nice. Alright, one minute. Grab one shot. They're long. He's going. They're coiled. They're coiled to bottom mid. One shot. APG. He's got to be there. Or are you? Yeah, he's there. He's there. One shot. One shot. They're coiled. Nice, K. They're top pistol. They're top pistol, Shrippy. Okay. I'm Pisano Mark. He's their top pistol, Shrippy. One's going their vent. I see two of their pistols, Shrippy and Lucid. They're going their pistol door right now, I think. Their vent, Shrippy. I'm their vent, Shrippy. Well, Sentinel's continuing to hold the line. You can hear the comms are looking pretty concise, pretty yeah. calm, as you would expect. But there's one zero oh. lead, but Lethal had a sniper rifle. Unfortunately, he doesn't anymore because Trippy just blamed him. Yeah, Trippy with a nice job there, but take a look at the composure you're seeing out of Lethal. Let's not forget this man is fresh off of a team change and a, a pretty big one there, a controversial one. He is looking so good in this game so far. He's 10 and 8 and a convincing bit of control from Sentinels early on as they still maintain their 1-0 lead. Nick trying to get a little bit aggressive here with this sniper rifle as well. Body shot, and there's going to be Spartan. He can re-challenge because he knows Spartan's going to be moving in. If they can get these touches here, they'll be able to send this one home. They will be able to pick up the camo as well. And with Optic Gaming finding themselves three dead, it's a fantastic defensive play there for the Sentinels, all working together towards the same objective to make sure they lock down that camouflage. This game is under complete control of the Sentinels roster. Look at that, three dead, and they get the camo off of that trade coming in there for lethal as well three dead though collect now with the camo needs to play this carefully lots of opportunity here he doesn't wait oh! oh boy the double for collect oh you love to see it. i mentioned how this man has got ability he has got talent and that is a perfect example of it give him power weapons and just let him go to work let him have fun on the map he can lock down half a map on his own here on argo i mean yeah as you say on his own last player alive camo needed to hit those snipes and he hits them both against Formal and APG. Talk about an introduction to year two. Collect has come to play. Trippy though, he's pushing forward, but Lethal needs to set up a landmine there for a few seconds. And unfortunately, Trippy found out a little bit too late shooting those plasma grenades to make sure that that push was not going to be easy. But Optic do have two players dead here from Sentinel. That's why he's seeing such a slow pace here from Lethal. Knows he has to survive, knows he has to delay to let spawners come in. 
Can Optic take advantage of this though? Sentinels find themselves three dead. APG with another opportunity for a flag pull. Now they find themselves four dead. Optic have a chance here to retaliate and tie this game up at 1 1. Based off the spawn timings, this flag should go as well. Lots of damage on E1, however, because that kill did not convert, this should almost secure the cap. Getting it past that 50 yard line is massive. All the lines of sight once you get around this corner are pretty much eliminated. However, Sentinels all alive. Lead to will fall, collect will fall, and that was why you saw the stutter step. Yep. APG needed to see some kills in the feed. He saw them, runs this one home, and Optic tied up a one to one. And as you hear this crowd in Charlotte, happy to see that flag on the board. Optic Gaming, sometimes they take a little bit of time to warm up here at these majors, and that's no problem for them. They're now tied one to one. Took them quite a little bit of time, 10 minutes of play before they got that first flag on the board. Speaking of time in the game as well, there's only two minutes left which would mean a flag pull and a flag cap here could well be the winning and deciding flag between these two teams. It has been an absolute ding-dong battle between them in this game number one of our first major of the year in season two. But you have to say another thing that's kind of stood out for me is how efficient both teams have been. Really, one opportunity to pull on either side, both been converted. Absolutely now. Yeah. Nice kill once again from Collector will be two dead for Optic Gaming. And once again, the battle for Tom Mid will continue. As we've seen in the qualifiers, you often need to slay at least oh! once, often twice the shots from Lucid. Maybe now the man's heating up. They've got one minute and 20 left before we head to overtime. Yeah, collect has got 20 kills, but he probably should have 21 in that situation. The problem is the man he was up against in that battle rifle fight was called Lucid. And season one MVP, you can see exactly why. Collect is going to come back for a little bit of revenge, though, and just remind him that He's still in this game, and Optic find themselves three dead once again. Trippy's been spotted out as well, inside of the vent. The question is, can they collapse on this kill quick enough to formulate a push forward? Two dead still for Optic. What you gotta love about Collect is this man has clearly put in the hours. Stays alive again, yet again. Getting good damage against Fornal, and Nick will clean that one up. 21 and 16 in this game, and he showed up here in game number one. So far, 45 seconds left in regulation. Nick's hit some good shots here. Collect get another trade, and Optic can't get out of their base at the moment. Nick's just got them pinned in. Formal gets bodied, Formal gets finished. And this is a real opportunity here with APG as the last player alive for Sentinels to get another run going. But where is the support? Nick is trying to play this one slowly, trying to wait for teammates to get back on the map before he makes his play. Collect might be that player to watch. What a play from APG. You just saw him get that kill on Spartan, who was on the flag for the pull. That's APG, a solo effort denying the run. He will delay it and buy them a bit of time. Nick trying to be aggressive, trying to push in. Needs to try and bait for his teammates, though. We'll do it perfectly. Two players fall now for Optic. Sniper Rifle coming up as well. This could be a massive moment in this game. Lucy cleaned up. Last player alive is Trippy. Nick has got all the work to do here, just staying alive. And by doing so, he's such a distraction. The flag is moving, and Sentinels can take this one home. Trippy gets taken down. Only two players alive for Optic. Spartan even crosses the halfway line. It's sudden death here. This would be the game-winning flag. Shields are broken, but the spirit is strong here for Sentinels. They just need to run this one home. Spawn will do so, and Sentinels take home game number one in our first series of the day. My God, if you wanted a way to start off year two, how about this? The title holders, Optic Gaming, dropping game number one in sudden death overtime. And the brand new roster, Lethal and the boys, Take game number one, Argyle CTF, already putting off to gaming against the green wall. A long way to go, of course, in the series. A long, long way to go in this series. However, we mentioned how in the build up to this event, maybe those qualifiers, they were a wake up call for Optic. You spoke to Lunchbox. He said the same thing. Yep. Losing game one on the main stage. Well, it's time to wake up now. Uh, absolutely, and like we said, maybe it was a good thing that happened to this Optic Gaming roster that they happened to fall in those qualifiers with narrow games. However, already in game number one, falling to Sentinel. Take a look at the stats here from that match. Yeah, uh, collect the standout on the Sentinel side, but you're looking across the board here. Thing that's standing out for me, kind of the assists, to be honest with you, assists across the board, really, really strong for Sentinels. Everybody contributing to kills, and to be honest, nobody really having a lackluster game. Everybody doing a, a great amount of damage, everybody doing what they would expect to create space with those, those KDs that you're seeing, but collect for me. There were certain yep. moments in that game where he got the power weapon, he got the sniper rifle in his hand, and he can just make something happen. Make something out of nothing. Absolutely, and in the end, out slaying Optic 74 to 67, and doing it in fashion. They will take game number one, as you see on your screen, and they start to build a wall of red. We'll see if they can continue it in this series. We talked about Collect a lot last year. He had pop-offs. We knew there was potential. 
the question for you and I, as we said earlier, was does he now have a veteran team of talent that he surrounded himself that gives him the environment to succeed? The answer in game number one was undoubtedly yes. What a game number two, though. What a game number two to set things up here. Imperian Slayer, brand new map. For Halo Infinite, of course. But the fact that we have an option now for Sentinels to really put pressure on Optic, if they get an early lead here and force Optic to have to make plays to try and claw that lead back, that puts a lot of pressure onto Optic. And with all due respect, I know it's only one game. Let's not get carried away with things here, but some concern looks on the side yeah. of Optic Gaming right now. Certainly. I think they need to be. I think, as we said, Optic Gaming is a team that won the World Championship last year due to their culture of excellence. They slowly built over the year Great online results, they dropped a little bit lower at LAN. Eventually, they built themselves to a playoff winning team and a world championship team, as you saw from tweets and streams from Lucid, from Trippy, talking about how they only want to pursue excellence in and out of the game. And you have to think, coming into the first major of the year, dropping game number one, not how they intended. However, if there's one thing we know about this Optic Gaming team, they are a resilient team, they dig deep, and you know that they're not going to be getting down on themselves just yet. Yeah, long way to go, as I say, and I'll keep repeating because it's the best of five. Nothing was ever won in the first game of the series, but it certainly does give you a pretty good foot on the ladder towards a, a, what you would have to call an upset yeah. in this pool. But for Optic, certainly some questions to be answered. And the reason that I wanted to kind of highlight Imperium as game number two as well is because we were watching the Grand Finals back, the Optic phase Grand Finals a few times and kind of trying to work out how Optic approached Pit TS. Yeah. I did it for the first time, everybody. There you go. It was me who caught it Pit for the first time. Imperium TS, thank you. Um, and it was very interesting to see how they actually played it in comparison to some of the other teams that they were up against. Optic right. were very passive, very, very passive, yes. even when they had multiple power weapons to play with, even when they had opportunities to push with power, right. they wanted to let their opponents make the mistake. My question is now, as we head into this game number two, is that something they've recognized? Is that something they've tried to address? Or is that something we're going to see yeah. and may play into the hands a little bit of sensors? Absolutely. You have to think the answer is yes. When they've reviewed the VODs, anyone who caught the last Charlotte qualifier, of course, you have to look at that tape and you have to think we had at times two snipers. We had mid-map, we had green control. However, in the example of their phase series, they let phase get over shields and push against them. And Optic Gaming, that's pretty uncharacteristic for them. When they identify advantages, they push them immediately. They don't waste any time and they have perfectly coordinated timing pushes. They will need to change their strategy on Empyrean Slayer from what we saw in the qualifier into the main stage today if they want to find success. They will do indeed. And uh, all eyes on the Optic Gaming side at the moment. All eyes on Formal, of course, as well. And, you know, amazing performance, amazing comeback season to Halo that we saw finish with a World Championship. You can't really have a better season than that, to be honest right. with you. Uh, Lucid, the MVP. But I think something that we highlighted after those rings were given out and credit where credit's due, Optic, best team in season one. This is a new season. The target is on your back now. Every single team change that has happened has been designed and formulated to beat Optic Gaming. Right. Getting to the top is tough. Staying there, it's a cliche for a reason, is even tougher. It really is, and that's going to be the true test for Optic Gaming, not just at the Charlotte Major, but truly for the whole year. Can they secure another World Championship, the third Halo World Championship for the organization? It goes without saying that that's what they have their eyes set on. However, it will be a long road, not just this weekend, but all year long if they want to do what has never been done before. We'll take a look at their game type breakdown as well as we hear that we have an audio tech on the stage. Just taking a look at the audio on the Optic Gaming side of the stage. We'll get into the game as fast as we can. Of course, when we look at Pit Slayer, take a look at their qualifier record here. Optic traditionally a very strong Slayer team. Take a look, seven and three in the qualifier. So coming in pretty good with a Slayer record. Yeah, they said it. you did it as well. Go to Pit. I thought I said Imperium. I got it out of the way, though. So now it's sure it's I said Imperium. It, 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 it's, it's, it's really a, quickly. It's a, it's a free for all now. Period. Don't worry. I, I opened the bottle. Don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the game. It's more important. Yeah, I think, I think you make some really good points here. The fact that this is a Slayer game type that Optic have been historically very, very strong on as well, not just in the qualifiers and the build up to this. But on the same side, you know, Sentinels, I think one thing that I, I'm keeping my eyes on, there's a few keys to success here for Sentinels in this roster, right? One is. I, it's a very silly thing to say, but just keeping death down. Because we were highlighting the series they lost, there was a couple of players, and I'm going to highlight Nick, where his deaths were outweighing the kills by not a significant amount, but there were so many of them. So he'd go 19 and 19, for example, which is, which is fine. And in that last game, he went 18 and 18. Yeah. It's a lot of deaths for a game. That was a longer game, so maybe not the best example of it. 
Because Nick is a player who wants to make plays, right? He wants to be aggressive, he wants to step forward, he wants to be the bait for his teammates to take advantage of it. And sometimes, as that kind of player, you can get picked apart yeah. a little bit if you don't get the support from a teammate. That doesn't show up in the statistics. If Nick can play his life a little bit more and keep those deaths slightly, so I'm not saying like a huge amount down, I'm saying like two, three, four deaths down, it means he's in the game. It means he's alive and able to influence the game for a little bit longer, make right. a few more of those plays. And I think in that game number one, I was actually very impressed by the way that Nick actually approached it. Because you saw on the front of that base, maybe if that's online, maybe if that's a scrim, he's jumping in straight away. He's trying to think about a flag pull immediately. Yeah. Just took that extra step, extra little bit of patience, waited for the support to come in, and then made the play that ended up pretty much converting into the role of events that turned into that final flag cap. So I think Nick has obviously identified that. I think the Sentinels maybe have identified that. And by playing a little bit slower in those aggressive situations can just make sure they've got the help that they need in order to get those flags moving or pick up those kills they need. Absolutely, I could not agree more, especially when we took a look. APG wins the 1v1 against Sparty, and that puts them in a tough position because they have no candidate for the flag carrier in that position. And you could not be more correct. What we saw Sentinels do there is they slow down, they let the opponent spawn, they get back into position. King Nick sits front base, helps the team to secure the game-winning flag, and we are ready to get into game number two. Sentinels with a 1-0 lead. Wow, I'm locked into this series. I tell you what, it's been a little bit of a wait for game number two to get underway. But you can see the score on your screens. It's lit up on those LED panels. Sentinels lead Optic Gaming by one game to zero. As we head into our game number two, Imperian Slayer double snipes once again. Sniper rifles are on the menu. And everything to play for off the opening here, of course, a classic map in the Halo franchise, and you're gonna see a lot of weapons to fight for right away off of the opening rip of the game. This is map number two. Imperial Slayer, Ken, Optic Gaming, and Sir Back and tie the series one to one, or will we see Sentinels with a two to zero lead as the 50th kill comes in? Yeah, Sentinels probably thinking we win this one. We're on match point, pretty much. We've got an opportunity to convert the series. And that would be a real story here, but for Optic, it would not be a shock. It would not be a surprise to see them bounce back in this game number two in quite some style. Collect flies past the sniper. Take a look at that. He gets beamed. Tries to get it. No! Great overshield grab coming in early in the game from Trippy. He just beats Collect to the punch. That'll be an early advantage for Optic Gaming in terms of power, but he gets nuked. Body shotted by the sniper rifle. Everything even here at one. One sniper rifle either side of things. Spartan has it for Sentinels. Lucid, as you can see on your screen, he's got it for Optic. But where did those rockets go? There's your answer. Sentinels managed to get those into their hands and will be able to lock down the entirety of the high side of the map. So power control is in the hands of Sentinels, coming out on top massively in that opening break. First rocket connects, and that's all you need to do in green. You just hold that angle. It's easy to hold two to one here. Very few kills coming in. And we talked about 50 kills to win the game, but oftentimes, and the qualifiers included, sometimes these games don't go all the way to the 50 mark. And you can tell that teams are going to play these slowly. They need to play the advantages, only pushing when they have true maybe 50% or more chance to get the kills that they need. Very interesting to see this. You can see King Nick, while well, Spartan picks up another kill in the kill feed, by the way, being escorted. I should say, excuse me, Collect being escorted by his teammate King Nick with those rockets to make sure they get the heat wave as well. So, I mean, imagine right now if you're Optic Gaming, you walk into Sword, you've got a rocket, you've got a heat wave, you've got Spartan staring at you with a sniper rifle as well, and he's already hit two big headshots. But Formal's gonna make the play here, he's gonna make this a one kill game. One thing that can change it is this drop ball, Andy. We were really highlighting this when we were looking at games in the build up. Yeah, Lucid right away putting that drop ball to use, and we're gonna keep an eye on that, of course, all weekend long. Somehow Spartan stays alive there, as I just said. Tied to three to three, and Optic Gaming has played this very well. We'll get over to their side of the stage and get ready for a listen here with Optic Gaming. Yeah, they're training, they're training, they're training. Mid bridge, mid bridge. Mid bridge, mid bridge, mid bridge. Our side, our side, Julie, one shot. Are you on a bridge, on a bridge? Nice. Oh, they're training, pit. Our sword, 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 s
Wait, that's their long, that's their long thing there on the second. That's absolute. That's absolute. Another one needle pit. Yep. Push it to the base. Trying to look, Tommy? Trying to look over you? You're dead. One more on me. They're flying. 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 they are flying it's the perfect time to listen in with Optic Gaming as they picked up everything that yeah. you needed there. They got the Overshield, they got the new Sniper, they got the Sentinel Sniper and the Rocket Launcher. And that is why you're seeing this lead completely flip on its head. And again, we were talking about Imperium Slayer. This is going to be one of the most mentally testing game types that we've ever had in Halo for any team who's involved. Because you're going to see 15 kill swings, 20 kill swings. But you're not out of the game. You have to keep that in mind. Wow, look at that confidence from Formal. Even though the nade hits, he does not back down and holds the angle. Really a very different game, too, here for Optic Gaming. We were, excuse me, they were down 3-1 to one at the beginning of that listen, and now they're up 17-6 to six and really controlling every single lane. As you oh! said, the power-ups as well, and Formal's not afraid. He hits the shot on Lethal on the tower, continues to challenge, and this has so far been a runaway game for Optic Gaming. But as you say, Mark, this game is not over until we get to the home stretch. Still a lot of time to play for, and you can really mount huge comebacks here on Imperium Slayer. Sentinel's just got to kind of slow things down a little bit here. Got to make sure that they keep the death's minimum, the impact of these power weapons, until that new set of weapons comes up. Then they have to fight for it again. But at the moment, they're just letting a few kills kind of slip away that maybe they would look back on after the game and think, we could have just played this a little bit slower, tried to bait out a few of the sniper rifle bullets, whatever it might be, because at 20 to 8, it's a pretty significant lead at this point for Optic Gaming. It really is, and look at Collect here, 1 and 5. Not the same start that we saw in that last game. We do have to keep an eye on power weapons coming up now. And Formal with a really the opposite start. He's 7 and 1 in this game. Lucid picks up one, APG picks up another. That's going to be the second rocket launcher in a row now going to Optic Gaming. And that has been the difference maker. The rockets being secured consistently by one team. And they also, as you heard there, have got the plasma pistol. I'm pretty sure the Sentinels would have been able to secure that overshield by the sound of things and with the manpower that they sent there. And that's why you're seeing Optic play this slow. Formal picks up Nick again. And now APG is going to transition towards Sword. And with the overshield being spotted out, APG is thinking, do you know what? We got a heat wave and a rocket. So kind of fancy this battle. Absolutely. APG can just turn these corners and now comfortably has control of the entire Sword area. Gonna just check these angles. He's gonna find lethal. A little splash damage. That'll be cleaned up as well. It's 25 to 8, and Optic Gaming is back here on the main stage. This is a commanding victory, and the crowd, excuse me, path to victory. But the Charlotte crowd likes what they see on the stage. They are starting to pick the Sentinels apart a little bit here, and APG is currently sat at 7 and 2, and he's trying to pick up the Sentinel sniper rifle, not for the first time for Optic Gaming. This will be the second one they managed to steal if they can. However, APG under pressure has to just prioritize keeping his deaths down and being a nuisance. Making himself beautifully here. Wait for the help. Smart sniffs him out. Finally gets taken down, but you got to talk not just about this game number two, but what this scoreline is going to do to the Sentinel side. They're coming hot off of a very impressive game number one. All of a sudden, not only are they losing in game number two, they're losing by nearly triple their score in a Slayer. And this might be the momentum that Optic Gaming needed here on day number one. Yeah, Trippy's got a heat wave as well. Collect picks up one. APG cleans that damage up. And Formal's currently sat at nine and one. He's only died once in this game and he's been controlling this sniper for so, so long now. A 31 to 11 is the score. Collect. Oh, what? Collect with what? the Repulsor 180 no scope. Gee whiz, we got to see that from his that POV. That was horrible. That was wild. Now, let's not forget, his team still trails 32 to 13, but maybe that's a little bit of a spark that Collect needed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> 32 to 13, but Collect has just made one of the highlight plays, probably the tournament. And he's going to have to make a few more, to be honest with you. At the moment, Luce is playing ping pong with Spartan's body. Collect is going to challenge again, and Collect picks up one. Gets the sniper rifle back here for Sentinels. Now, if they can get this overshield, if they can work towards the Rockets, as crazy as it sounds, 32 to 14 on Imperian Slayer is not game over. If they can make these weapons work. Yeah, I, absolutely. I'm glad you said it. Because even oh. though it does sound insane, Collect's starting to really tap these bodies he's taken down in the end. But even though it sounds insane, you can mount 
absurd comebacks here. However, APG with the Rockets, that will slow things down and bring it back within the comfortable control of Optic Gaming. And Collect tries to fly out of the Mangler corner and he's greeted by a Rocket. He'll be sent back to the death screen as well. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I was going to say there's a way back into this game, but giving the Rockets away is not yeah. the way to get back into the game. And just those little picks now mean that this game is pretty much going to be done and dusted. It will be Optic will be able to tie things up one to one, even with a little bit of time left in this game. Trippy's top tower and I tell you what, Back on Halo 3, if someone was top of your tower, it was a problem. Here on Halo Infinite, if they've got weapons on the map and someone's top of your tower, it's a nightmare. The absolute nightmare here. Trippy just waiting to poise in 40 to 16. This is a wild result that we've seen so far. 3.30 left on the clock, but you got to think, Optic Gaming not going to need all that time as they look towards the home stretch. Trippy with a repulsor. Just collect backwards. 42 to 18. This game is... Uh, Moments away from his conclusion, I think, is the, yeah, the most political way I could put it. I was going to say, that's probably the most broadcast safe way to put <laughs> exactly what's happening on the main stage here. A entire dismantling of Sentinels in game number two. Six kills to go for Optic Gaming, make it five as Lucid picks up another. Yeah, you can see that I think Sentinels understand this one's done and dusted as well. They're trying to challenge, they're just trying to pick up the kills and get this game done as quickly as possible. Lucid's still being such a pain at the moment. Nick will clean him up, but Formal once again with the sniper rifle. Takes his stat line to 14 and 2. And any questions asked about Formal coming to this event? Sunny oh. starting to be answered. There's one, there's two. Formal's back, baby. Formal is back on the main stage looking and hunting for that 50th kill. That's going to fire him up as well. It's a spectacular on your screen. And Optic Gaming bounces back in the most enormous way in game number two. What a win for them on Imperial Slayer. They will tie up the series one to one. Now. What a turnaround that is, right? Sentinels, yeah. who would have been, I imagine, full of adrenaline, feeling really good after game number one. One to up in the series. Get absolutely crushed in game number two. Which kind of resets the equilibrium a little bit, as it far does. as the mentalities are concerned. Optic now on the ascent, but as we know, staying pretty calm about it. How do Sentinels respond to that? Because that's not that's not just a loss, that is a spanking. That really is, 50 to 22. If I'm honest, we're looking over at the open bracket stations as well, and 50 to 22 is more likely a score line that you see in the open bracket early on, not something you see on the main stage. So that's a huge, huge margin for Optic Gaming. Maybe the bounce back that they needed, and you have to think for Sentinels, you can't even spend time thinking about that game. You've got to move on, go next, and focus up on game number three. Yeah, and I think it's uh, maybe a learning experience as well for Sentinels. That game type can be the most unforgiving game type, like you've just seen. Sometimes it feels like there's nothing you can do, right? When you've got to go up against players who've got overshield, rocket, double snipers, like, what can you do in that position? But they have to find a way, because there were situations in that game where, right at the start of the game, Sentinels had the better of the power on the map and Optic were able to turn it around. Shots like this from Formal certainly help. But Formal with a stat line, I think it was 14 and two at the end of that game, only the two deaths for him. And Sentinel certainly got some work to do on Imperial Slayer, but for Optic, the perfect response. Absolutely, and you gotta think, even Formal in the end, ending at 16 and two, even more numbers on the board. And we asked the question of, will Optic push the advantage when they get it? And they really answered that question in a big way. As we said, they were down three to one early on. They slowed the game down, made sure to get the power weapons they needed. And from there, they went on an absolute tear. They tie the series with a 50 to 22 win. And that sets us up for game number three, Strongholds Live Fire. I love how game types have stories behind them now as well, right? We've just had two slower game types, I would say that we have now in Halo Infinite. And now we go arguably to one of the quickest. We have Live Fire Strongholds, which at the start, we've, we've talked about how Optic was so damn good at this. Yep. Right at the start of Halo Infinite. That fell away a little bit as people started to catch up and understand how the game type works and how Optic works here on Live Fire. But it's a very interesting one because Sentinels, I think they're going to have the biggest questions asked in this game type that we're going to see in the series. Not only because of how the game type works and yep. how unforgiving this can be in Strongholds, but also how do you get back into a series after a crushing defeat like we just saw in Imperium? Absolutely, and I also really love just how this series was built out. We saw both of the new game types, right? And these teams split them in pretty different ways now as we're tied one-to-one. -one. Now we get back into the classics. Now we're into the season one game types that you saw, and as you said, it will be a fast-paced test of game number three. It will be, and I questioned, you know, how a center was gonna react to that. One player you want on your team after you've just got absolutely smashed on a game type, 
Probably lethal. Yeah. Because he will say something to bring the spirits back up. However sarcastic and dark it might be, he certainly is going to put a smile on the face. You saw Collect looking across at Lethal there, a little smile on his face. Spartan didn't look too bothered about the situation. He knows there's a lot more work to do. Right. And sometimes they're the intangibles, right? We always talk about what happens in-game, how players perform in-game, but it's our game in those little moments. What is someone going to say to get your team back on the right track for success in the series? Absolutely. I also think, like, if you think about the chemistry we talked about on the side of Sentinels, when we went to that first listening on Argyle, I was so impressed because you have, as we said, players with very, very big, bold personalities on this team. And I think we just saw essentially clinical teamwork out of them on Argyle. And they'll need to bring that once again here. Bring the fire, bring the pace in game number three. But if they can keep those really clear communications in those listenings, I think they'll find a lot of success here on this game type. Well, we're gonna move away from this main stage game for just a second, but the score isn't gonna change. The teams are though. It's FaZe Clan versus Na'Vi. And the series is tied here at one to one. The European powerhouse who have picked up Snipe Drone are pushing FaZe to their limit here. And we are tied 0-0 on Empyrean CTF with only one minute left on the clock. They've now played 11 minutes of deadlocked CTF as well. And I am so glad we popped over to this series. We talked about not, we talked to Na'Vi this morning. They were feeling good against FaZe and right now it's showing. Wonderboy, the coach of Na'Vi said to me, we're not here to take part, we're here to take over. And Mighties is here, the perfect. And right in the moment, FaZe Clan have three players in the death screen. Frost is trying to stay alive. Na'Vi again, this flag moving. In the distance, I can hear that flag being tossed. It's going to continue on. Flag is already in green. The two spawners are in the court. Snake Bite gets the stop, though, and it looks like FaZe managed to slow things down. Na'Vi did not get that flag forced through the green box, and now Na'Vi haven't expended so many resources to try and do so. Find themselves on the back foot. Phase though, that was a scare. That, the biggest of scares. That is a heroic stop. Those nades came from Courtyard and they stopped the flag in green. Also, by the way, we just got word this is actually in overtime. So this should be 14 seconds left. And if we're correct, this game should end here in 10 and we will see a reset. Jimbo's on the flag. He's gonna have to do some defensive work. Frosty's there, Renegade's there. Snipe Drone trying to help him out. Snipe Drone with a big double kill, but Snake Bite might be able to think about getting this flag moving. He's gonna get it moving and keep this game going. Here we go, here's the last player alive and he needs to have a heroic run here. Stay alive as long as he can, it's not gonna be easy. He will be taken down, the pie chart will go and we can assume there should be no spawners within range. Unless Frosty can put the jets on and get across to it, not gonna happen. We go to a replay. Wow, a replay. The series at one to one, the game tied and Na'Vi are giving FaZe Clan hell. <laughs> We are going to keep a very close eye and ear on that series without a doubt. And of course, everyone backstage making sure that we'll be able to get you updates. Don't forget, you can also open up an extra tab and make sure you're watching that match as well. And I can bet that there's a lot of people that just opened up a second tab because they're going to want to see exactly how that series plays out. I bet there's a lot of Europeans watching that right now. I'll tell you that for, uh, for nothing. And uh, just a quick highlight on that as well. Mentioned Snipe Drone making the move previously on Ascend. What a roster that was. He's now part of Na'Vi, replacing Kimbo. So that change looks like it's working for him at the moment, but enough about that series. Back to our main stage and back to this game at number three between Optic and Sentinels, tied up at one-to-one. -one. Live fire is where we're headed. And man, you could not ask for a better, I would say, series across both of those matches here. We're tied one-to-one -one in both of our featured matches with the top two favorites in the tournament here, tied up with their opponents early on in pool play. Once again, Stronghold's 12 minutes on the clock, 250 points to win here in game number three. And this will be the swing game of the series, the go-ahead match. The winner here will lead two to one and be only one game away from closing out their first series of the tournament. Optic fans will certainly be happy to see this game side. One they've had so much success in and they're so relentless when they get control on this map. But for Sentinels, it's a chance to put themselves a little bit ahead in this series, just by a nose and give themselves the chance of performing the first upset that we will see here in Charlotte at the kickoff major. Optic versus Sentinels, it looks like we're ready to go here. Getting ready to get into this game number three as fast as we can, and I gotta say, already so much energy on the stage, and if you're on the Sentinels side, the right side of this main stage, the red side, you need to make sure you're, you're forgetting about that game too entirely. Remember what they did in that game number one, and get right into the gameplay here. We're starting things off with Lucid and the sniper rifle in Optic Gaming's hands. Love this from Lucid. Picks up the sniper and just walks forward. He's like, how dare you? How dare you think that I'm not just going to walk at you? Spartan gets chunked away in the back. Formal picks up two and Sentinel's already on the back foot. Lucid! 
in the desk creep. Unfortunately, as he hit the nice body shot, Spark was there to get that trade, but early control is going to be very much in the hands of Optic, as they have A and B in their hands. It's a great collapse there. Spartan was the last player alive on C-plat. Optic gaming wastes no time. Should be an overshield grab for APG. Doesn't oh! get it. Does not get it. That will be down on the overshield platform. Two dead for each side. That should have been an Optic grab. Somehow they don't get it in the end. Here comes Formal. I think it's still down. Formal's last alive here, and he's going to get the overshield. He did a lot of work. Maybe it works out for the best. keeping Sentinels away from it. I think he hit a nice body shot, and it's not another player we just didn't quite catch on screen but while all of this fighting is going down on this side of the map and Optic have had to expend so many resources Sentinels have done a good job of turning things around they're scoring momentarily but now you're seeing the push coming from Optic here comes Formal here just going sandbags right away with the sniper rifle 25 to 3 off of the opening does not connect on Nest Bridge but he has all the tools to play with eventually he'll be taken down one dead apiece Collect trying to hold at the moment put pressure onto these players Inside a B, but the kill will come in. Spartan does fall. So Optic once again scoring now with an AB hold. 30 points on the board already for them. Big 1v1 here, hey! but no collect. Fortunately, he finds that ledge a little bit slippier than he anticipated. Gotta watch the toes. You can't step a toe over the edge, you might just slip off. So collect if you're just joining us here with an absolute pop-off in game number one. However, in this game, we'll see if he can bounce back from that performance. Of course, getting 50 to 22 in that Slayer now. As we take a look, uh, exactly what Sentinels might be able to do is they will start to cap B as well. B and C now in their hands, and they will put a few more points on the board, but they trail early on, 50 to seven. So you have Trippy in the death screen though, so it's an opportunity for them to at least take a little bit of space, make a few more risky plays. Nice shots coming in from Lethal. Backs that player down, but another overshield now goes into the hands of Optic. So even though Sentinels Managed to work away and ooh, get control. That missed shot with the plasma pistol could be a real nail in the coffin, though. Nick wasn't able to connect, and that means that not only Formal can work with his teammates to get B in the hands of Optic, he still has Overshield to play with and move forward. Look at Formal putting on the dance moves. Little jump, little jive. He just tiptoes right around that green gun and will maintain the Overshield control as well. Optic Gaming picking up where they left off in that game number two, and they will continue to pick up even more kills, even more points on the board. For a moment, it looked like a trip cap. However, it will be an AC hold, and now they're gonna push B yet again. Yeah, collect. He's gonna be toast here, even though he wins his 1v1. You can see a triple cap is in effect, and APG with a sniper rifle now is gonna be able to pick off anyone who steps into a stronghold. Sentinels are in a chokehold at the moment, and Optic are looking extremely, extremely strong. And like we said, a game like that in game number two, that is not just a game two Slayer win. That is a convincing victory for Optic Gaming and an absolutely deflating game for Sentinels. It looks like that has carried over here into game number three. It's 117 to 23. And the story of the game has been the overshields, right? Every single time we see an Optic pick up the overshield, they've made a play with it and it has turned into points. That is the point of getting that power on your side. Get those power-ups, you can make plays, and it turns into that scoring opportunity. 132 and rising at the moment. You can see that Sentinels kind of split across the map. Lethal in a 1v1. He's going to lose that one against Lucid as well. Sentinels three dead. You heard the sniper rifle ringing out as well. Sentinels struggling at the moment in game three. Absolutely being outslayed by a huge margin as well. 28 to 14 right now in favor of Optic Gaming. And it's going to be Trippy, who's 9 and 4 in the match right now, leading the way. Is he gonna fly out, trying to clean up the damage done by his teammate? We'll be able to do so. Lethal will fall as well. There's two. Spun. gonna be challenging. Lucy just trying to buy time for his teammates to get in position to help. Almost manages to do so. Trippy will be there to get the cleanup. And Sentinels finally stop the bleeding. They have AP control, but they've got a long, long way to go here. And Optic still just in control of the positions on the map that you need to have body present. They flip A almost without contest. And now you can see the battle for B is going down. Look how well Trippy stays alive there and just really paves the way here for APG with the overshield to push it. Lucid is there to help as well, and they will now continue pushing in on B. It's a perfect push there out of A into B. They saw that C was flipping, and they're able to get control. APG has company in B, though. He certainly does. You can see the hill being contested here. Collect picks up one. APG kind of last alive. Other players on the respawn. Oh! oh! Lethal had no idea APG was there, and APG said... Good morning, Lethal. I am here, my friend. Look at that. <laughs> Quite an angle there from APG. And Spartan is able to stay alive, but he's the last guy alive. Players are going to be spawning here on dummies. They're pushed back yet again. It's 176 to 28. The Sentinels at the moment just seem like they, they, they do the first part pretty good. They get two strongholds in their control. They have numbers on the map, but they're not quite on the same page on the next play. Like, do they want to try and push a trip? Do they want to try and hold? And it's allowing Opti to get back on the map a little bit too easily here. Looking across the stats at the moment, Lucid 
back to form. 11 and 6 for him. Trippy, like you mentioned, 10 and 5, double positive as well. On the other side, lethal, 3 and 11. Collect with 10 deaths as well. And this is what I meant about this Sentinels lineup. Sometimes a few too many deaths means that you just don't have the numbers to fight. Perfect flank there from Lucid. The damage came in on the pillars. Lucid was just a second late, but not to worry. He flanks around pillars, back to sandbags, to then cut off the nest angle as well. This is the home stretch for Optic Gaming. Another huge lead. It's 216 to 28. Nick tries to fly in to finish off the damage, but look at the difference here. How hard Nick's having to work just to clean up the one shot. Collect over the sniper rifle. Maybe once again, he can be the spark. He can create something out of nothing. And off of the back of the sniper rifle pickup as well, you also see flash in front of his eyes. Sentinels have their first overshield in quite some time. So the problem here for Sentinels, even with the power in their hands, they don't have any mistakes left. One mistake here, 228 turns to 250 very, very quickly. That's right, no room for error. It's a BC hold, but the first kill will come in once again for Optic Gaming. Those are traded out. Trippy gets blasted back by the repulsor of King Nick, so that will be two dead for Optic. Maybe an opportunity for quite a comeback, but as you say, Sentinels, zero room for error. Nick did a huge amount of damage there, tried to clean the kill up, but Lucy just too good in that 1v1 scenario. And that would have been a triple cap if he had picked up that kill, but Sentinels for the first time have some map presence. You're going to see the fight for B break out. Lethal now has to stay alive as long as he can, has to just contest. And even better than that, he picks wow. up one, he picks up two, flying out of B to make sure that he's completely in their control and now makes the play on A as well. Three dead yet again, he will get A right away as long as they clean up APG on the scoreboard. Easier said than done though, they don't get that kill so they cannot flip A just yet. APG with a really, really smart play, but yeah. Lethal also played his life well enough to come back and surprise him. We'll get that kill. Formal will be on the flank here. Lethal has to be careful, has to be aware of Formal's position. That shot at the back is going to certainly help him. The Repulsor isn't enough. The Ooh. beat down coming in from that Plasma Grenade was enough to take the shields off, and that will be the kill going. Optic three dead now, and Sentinels. I mentioned how they have no mistakes left. They're hanging on by his thread, but they're hanging on. APG, last player alive, back to back. That means back to back four deads coming in for Sentinels. It's great control. You have to wonder, is it too little too late? They've just put an 80 point run on the board. So now they find themselves down by just over 100, but they will need to continue this for another few minutes and they will have to continue to rule in the slaying category. 4v4 on the map at the moment. Next fight, massive. Formal is going to pick up the first kill, and this is going to be an overshield going to Optic. The AC hold at that time yep. allowed complete access to the overshield, and even with Sentinels making the play onto C, Trippy now has the cutoff for all of his players who are inside the B to turn that back over. You can see a little bit of ring around the Rosie, and now, unfortunately, you can see Trippy with all of this overshield just needs to find players to kill. That's all he needs to do in there. They're going to go ahead and flip C after they find a loss of A. Now BC in control, 10 points to go for Optic Gaming. This could be the game here for Optic. It could be the series going back into their hands. Collect, trying to make a flank. Desperate play coming in from Sentinels onto B, but there's the reset coming in from Trippy. Optic should be home and dry here. And just at the last second, a triple kill from Lucid will secure things. Optic, two to one up in the series. They flip it on its head and now find themselves one map away from closing things out here in Pool B. And we wondered if that game number two would give Optic Gaming the spark that they needed. And the answer so far has been absolutely yes. Lucid, as you mentioned, back on form 20 and 11 in that game. He will lead the game in kills and put up quite a show. Big numbers all around for the Optic Gaming boys. And you can tell by the look on their face, it's all business as usual. Don't get ahead of yourselves. It might have been an early deficit for Optic Gaming, but right away, two games later, they find themselves with a two to one series lead, one game away from closing it out. Yeah, there was a reason that I kept saying it's a long way to go. Yeah. Kept repeating it, because there was a long way to go, and there still is a long way to go in this series, but next game type is going to be very, very interesting as well. Streets Oddball. Now, Oddball has been a game type where Optic have been pretty damn good. Historically, looking through the, uh, the previous season, obviously they won a lot of good close optimal games, but there was a few clutch ones which they didn't quite manage to get over the line. The game type breakdown we were looking at beforehand, you know, four and four in Opel in the in the qualifier. Yeah. Not, not amazing, not amazing. Maybe a chance here for Sentinels to take advantage of that. I do think it is. I think the Sentinels would have watched a lot of uh, Optics gameplay here on ball and see them in the qualifier lose several ball games, especially in those phase matchups. There you go, Formal just tiptoeing around to avoid that green gun and continue the control. And Optic Gaming is firing on all cylinders here, but they will need to continue to do that through the rest of the series. Still potentially two games to play. Still potentially two games to play. And just a reminder as well that for Sentinels, a game type like that can be extremely tough to play a team like Optic. Optic 
like we mentioned, they're the only team in the offseason that didn't make a change, pretty yeah. much, right? They have their historical patterns. What is What happens after we make play A? How do we try and approach the map? What's our next move? How do we try and focus our attention? Sentinel's still trying to work that out yeah. in some respects. Yes, they've had a few scrims and, you know, a, few, a month or so to get this their game plan together, but when you're really being tested by the world champions, the holes in your game get exposed extremely quickly, and that was an example of it there on Lifefire. Obble Street is going to be up next before we potentially head to a Game 5. I'm not going to be too opposed to heading to a Game 5 in our first series of the season, which will be Slayer Recharge, of course. But Obble Streets, obviously Red Rack is going to be important as well. We're not going to see quite as much of that Stalker Rifle that we had previously. Same can be said about the Bulldog, which certainly put a smile on a lot of people's faces, including myself. Absolutely. And we take a look at the most recent time we've seen Optic play this inofficial tournament play. It was the Charlotte Qualifier. It was going to be the winner's finals against FaZe. They did get 2 0 in that game and a pretty convincing result for FaZe. So as we say, maybe Sentinels has watched that gameplay. You got to think hopefully they've watched that gameplay and they know exactly what they need to do to have a similar performance and maybe force a game five. We'll take a look at some of the uh, the stats that stood out in that previous game as well. You can see Formal with a 1.26. The man was coated in gold most of the time. And I'm not just talking about championship gold, of course. I'm talking about the overshields that he managed to secure for his team. A couple of big solo plays with the sniper rifle to Keep his team even contesting it at certain points was really, really important for Optic just to get a little bit of semblance on the map. But on the other side of things, 29-47, a 0.62 from Nick. It's tough to get into a Strongholds game if you're in the death screen that much. Absolutely. We talked about that we're keeping an eye exactly on Nick's numbers here. He needs to make sure that not only is he not spending time in the death screen, but also that during that time that he is alive, how much support can he provide? We'll be keeping an eye on his numbers in this game as well. But Oddball Street is going to be the next test for these two. It's an optic, excuse me, an opportunity for Optic Gaming to close this one out in a convincing fashion. However, on the other side of the stage, Sentinels can make this series one to remember and send it to a game at number five. I fancy a game five. I've got to say, I just, I just got a funny feeling. It's a ridiculous thing to wish for. It's a ridiculous thing to hope for in the first series of a major of a new season. But hey, funnier things have happened, right? Game five could be around the corner, or it could be Optic closing things out here in a three to one fashion. Now I mentioned the red rack is going to be changing things a little bit here. You aren't going to see quite as much power on the map as you had previously. Last season with the respawns being adjusted ever so slightly on their store prior for Bulldog. We'll have to see if that plays into the hands of Optic or in the hands of Sentinels. And as you see big damage coming in initially for the side of Sentinels as Optic Gaming not able to grab the rockets just yet. Too dead for them. So Sentinels with a little bit of an early man advantage. Trippy doing a great job of just holding the line here. Unfortunately, he had to do it for so long, but Lethal was able to walk up that pink street and flank, and he's picked up two now, and Rockets are now in the hands of Sentinels. Three dead here for Optic. Lucid last alive, and he will be eliminated by Spartan. So a really good start here for Sentinels. They'll be able to put the pressure on, wow. and Spartan is picking up bodies here with these Rockets. Really great slow play there from Sentinels. What they did is they got key damage bottom middle and in the L. However, three dead right away. Optic Gaming answers back immediately and gets control off of what was a four dead, essentially, off of that rocket kill. And it must have been spawns that were coming in on Music and PD there, because they got there quick. Yeah, I think it was a four-man flood out from Optic from PD, and it just kind of worked for them. I don't know quite how they got out of that situation, but they certainly did. And now they're making Sentinels pay for it. 21 to 9 the lead, the ball being held in PD at the moment. Collect versus the Stalker Rifle, and Collect will win that one. Formal with some uncharacteristic, shaky-looking shots there. APG now just gonna run this ball right down. They already have control of Commando. Lucid is holding that down. He'll probably rotate here to challenge Spartan over on the back first. But APG says, nope, I'm not interested in this. And now's a not perfect opportunity. APG's rotations that we've seen in the qualifier as well. This man is playing fantastic objective play. You might even say better than he looked in season number one. So look out for him to continue to control those rotations. Really interesting to see how Optic developed their raw baller game. Like you mentioned, it's not just a case of playing the ball now. It's where do we go next? How do we try and get out of this situation? Well, for now, they're going to have to get out of a spawn trap because Lethal has got the Stalker Rifle. Rockets are coming up as well. And most importantly, Sentinels have that ball back into their hands. APG has the Bulldog, so power as far as pickups for both teams is kind of oh. shared. Nice little cheeky headshot coming in from Lethal. Good damage, but elsewhere his teammates have fallen here and Lucid's making a play with a double kill himself. All up to collect here, but I think he's going to get, yep, he's going to get absolutely blown up by the rocket to Trippy. <laughs> and Trippy says, I'll just handle this. He flies in with the rocks, picks up the ball as well. He will continue to add points on the board for Optic Gaming, 37-23. There was no other poetic way to put that. He just, he just got absolutely blown yeah. up. That was all it was. But Trippy now on our screens. 
little bit of disruptor action. Fizzing away at the shields here at Lethal. Lethal survives for now and is going to hit the G slide to travel across bottom middle and do a little bit of damage on his way. But the game is still in the hands of Optic here. 50 to 23. And the oddball also in their hands as well. Everybody trapped inside a tram here for Sen. And despite that we see quite a significant lead here, about to be something like 40 points almost here for the side of Optic Gaming, still pretty close, 21 to 18 in, in the slaying department here. And that's actually going to be right now Sentinels out slaying them by four kills, yet losing quite a bit. This rotation again though, from Optic. They managed to get that ball away, get an extra 10 seconds or so, Formal will get the stick. Three dead though for Optic as the rotation is cut off. So Trippy now left in his own trying to defend that ball, trying to buy time for teammates to get back on the map so that they can fight on a more level of footing. And every second that ball isn't in the hands of Sentinels here is a win here for Optic Gaming. Look at this from Trippy. Eventually doesn't take down Collect, but look how long he stays alive there on Neons as the only player alive and paves the way perfectly for them to add more time on the board. Great solo effort there from Trippy on the screen. It might not look too flashy. He's just holding down the Bulldog spawn and the Neons, but in the end, it allows his teammates to spawn up, reestablish control as a unit, and they put even more points on the board. Now just about 30 points away from closing out the round. Really important moments in this game here. Nick's trying to go for the odd ball, but the Rockets are also coming up as well. And Sentinels might be thinking about using this ball as bait, trying and get the attention of Optic Gaming away from that power weapon coming up, then use the odd ball to direct the attention of Optic towards them after they get those rockets to pick up some easy kills. But for now, it's not going to happen. Spartan's going to thread the needle, and they do manage to secure the power weapon. So Spartan's going to use that second rocket, almost wasted, to keep the Stalker rifle in his hand. Lucy challenging, and that'll be a big turnover of weaponry here. As Lucy will pick up the pieces from Spartan's body. Oh boy, that needed to be a finish for Collect. He needed to capitalize on the damage for Spartan. And because he did not capitalize, Lucy is going to get that kill on rail, pick up another one. Three dead for Sentinels. This could be the home stretch for Optic Gaming. Fantastic effort from Lucy there in the 1v1 on the pillars. Lucy making all the difference once again, just in really, really clutch scenarios. Optic now moving within 12 points of closing out round number one. Stalker rifle in the hands of Lucid. It's going to be tough to push on the tram. Damage already been doing, done. Nickel managed to burst in the front door though. But APG once again with a rotation away. Sees where his spawners are coming in. Does enough to keep the space between him and that push. And Optic will go up one to zero here in round number four. Once again, great rotations, as we said, for Optic Gaming. Oftentimes, it's APG leading the way on those rotations, and he's always a solid one to two seconds ahead of when he needs to be rotating. And you can always see it off screen. The second the pressure is coming in from one side of the map, APG has already started those rotations. They have continued this here in game number one. They take the first round, now just one round away from closing it out. Optic find themselves too dead, though. You can see the rockets going down as well. Thrust is going to be down just on Nick's body. And now you see Optic trying to survive once more. APG the last alive. Lethal trying to hunt him down. And this is something, this is a bit of a difference maker, right? APG stays alive once again as the final player alive for Optic and gets a kill. A little bit of help coming in from Lucid. Might will be able to pick up one, but that's been the difference, right? We always talk about the best teams in the world are the most efficient when they get three dead, it becomes four as quickly as possible. Then they have complete control of spawn, complete control of map. Optic are surviving, are being such a nuisance for Sentinels. And absolutely, let's not forget, we still see Sentinels out slaying in the game overall. They're out slaying 43 to 36. However, they get crushed in that first round and now need to find themselves a little bit of a different strategy here. They're leading in the slays, but Optic is still picking them apart. But with two, certainly gives an opportunity here for Collect to pick up that off ball, which he will take. Goes down on his way to throwing it towards a teammate, but where's the support? Where are the teammates here to maybe rotate that ball in towards Tram? The shields have already been broken, and they might be thinking about gifting a little bit of an opportunity here for Optic to steal that ball back towards the A side, and that's what they're doing right now. Trippy's gonna bring the ball, as you say, back A. Lucid tries to stay alive on the B stairs, but the kills will be traded out, so an opportunity for Sentinels to try to make the push. Formal not gonna make it easy, though. Bulldog in hand. Once again, Sentinels had the kills. They had the opportunity. They had the play in front of them, but weren't able to capitalize. Optic took opportunity when it was presented to them. You don't have to ask them twice. Lethal though, with that thrust. 
is going to win a big 1v1 there against Formal. Nick wins another one as well with the help of Collect and four dead here for Optic. Rockets up as well. Sentinels, this is your chance to get back into this game, to win this round. You have everything you could ask for. This is a perfectly timed battle there. As you say, four dead. It's a big win from Lethal and PD against Formal as well. If he doesn't win that 1v1, this entire setup is completely different. But now Sentinels will take the lead for the first time in this game. Up 24 to 16, still one rocket here for Sparty. That'll be two kills going into the hands of Spartan. Optic find themselves still being able to push forward ever so slightly though. Nick picks up a third and surely that's going to be ball time now. That will be a clean wipe. Lucid last alive trying to push up the pink streak but there's space here. But where's the rotation? Prioritizing the kill and oh! he can't do it with Lucid flying at you. If that's Optic in that situation, I think Optic are already rotating that ball to where the kills had happened. Sentinels try and hold the line. And Lucid makes them pay. It's the second time we've seen a 1v1 between Collect and Lucid, and Lucid comes out on top in a battle that he should not have won. Able to do that, and once again, it changes the map entirely. Those 1v1s are absolutely pivotal, and the game stays within 16 seconds. Spartan gets a touch on the ball, and I think that's important because all the PD spawns are coming in for Sentinels. They needed to try and keep some attention away from Three. them, but four more. I mentioned uncharacteristic shots from him. Gets a little tap on the back <laughs> for a teammate as well, just to increase the difficulty level a little bit. Respect to Optic. That's a love tap from Lucid there as you're going back. Yeah, he's like, hey, that might have been a nice kill, but going to give you a little extra melee here to slow things down, slow your roll. Players pushing in here now on the L. No ammo left for Formal. It doesn't matter. He still gets the kill. And Optic are closing in now and have managed to turn over that lead that Sentinels had established. So Sentinels, even with Rockets, even with four dead from Optic, only able to get into the lead for a few moments' time. After gaming, taking the lead now by two seconds, and what was a 17-second lead for Sentinels, as you mentioned, is all but gone here as Optic Gaming take control of the game yet again. Ball gonna be down here on front A. A nice little grab here, two dead for both sides. APG just gonna think about maybe supporting with these oh. rockets, but this should be a Sentinels grab if they play this correctly. Yeah. These are trying to stay alive, has the thrust as well, so we'll be able to pick the rockets up, maybe? Maybe got a call out from a teammate that I'll get the rockets? Yep. That thrust is the difference maker once again as Spartan does get the rockets, but where's the Opal once more? Are the kills gonna be supported? There's two! Gets the bomber medal as well with that one rocket, and that will be Sentinels again with another chance here to establish a lead in this game. Three dead there, as you say, full control for Sentinels. Let's get into a listen in here, see if they can continue this hold and continue on in the game. Uh, one shot, PD, APG, back PD. On the ball, on the ball, show. He's just there, he's there. Two to your halls, to your halls. By time, by time. Oh my god! Oh my fucking god, Trying to get Trying to get to get to get to get to Nice, let's lock it down there. I have it, I have it. Could be up, could be up fast, could be up fast. Probably cafe. I'm getting touched, I'm getting touched. Drop balls up. Okay, I have it, I have it. We're spawning B. one red, they're gonna be pink and C, pink and C. I'll watch if you want. Look at that P1. They're doing like coordinated push. Yeah, camp for bottom mid, bottom mid. Bottom mid or front mid. It's gonna be bottom mid looking for you, dude. Watch out laundry, watch out laundry with shotgun. Shotgun's laundry, loosen. Come on, drive A on me, drive A on me. Yes, 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 not one. I mentioned how Nick could be the difference maker here for Sentinels, where he's making a difference at the moment. Finally taken down, but 17 kills to his name, plus 15 assists to the second most objective on his team. And it looks like Sentinels have found a bit of rhythm here. They really have. What a run there from King Nick. Absolutely fantastic. And Beautiful communication as well from that side. We'll talk about that in a moment because this game could be over quick. It's 88 to 34 in favor of Sentinels. They'll find themselves three dead at the moment though. One minute left on the clock. Optic Gaming is going to look to be the heartbreak kids and steal this game back. And they got 59 seconds left in this game to play with though. Have to be perfect here, Optic. Have to be in a position where they can't afford to make mistakes, but Sentinels, they've been in this position with the Rockets before, and they made it work to get a lead, but a trade comes in. Formos forced into that position because of the thrust that was in the back of Spartan. 
Trippy manages to pick up the rockets and manages to do enough damage to keep himself alive and keep Sentinels off of that oddball. But with 50 seconds left, this is going down to the wire here. Lethal staying alive back A there was absolutely huge. It maintains control of that side of the map now. One dead apiece yet again. 40 seconds left on the clock. Two dead for Sentinels. Collecto needs to be careful exactly on this rotate. He's a bit trapped at B here. 2v2, the spawns will determine exactly how this goes. 99! Oh! Not over! Optic Gaming gonna hold the ball here. They have zero room for error yet again. 99 to 57. They need to hold, and they cannot allow a hold to come oh, in. Oh, Sentinels again a little bit desperate here, though. They're flying in at PD to try and get that ball out of the hands of Optic Gaming. Formal's gonna pick it back up, though. Oh my 32 God. seconds left on this clock, and Sentinels find themselves too dead. If they do this, this would be the most Optic Gaming fashion to end this game now. They will need 20 plus points to tie this game now. Make it just shy of 30. Oh, the grenade comes in though from Nick. That's huge from PD. There is that play from Nick. There's Lethal as well. Optic find themselves three dead, and surely that will be it now. Spawn swoops in. He picks up that oddball, and we are tied up at one to one in the series now, heading to a deciding round number three. Wow, uh, round number three here in Ball. And as we said, this series has been neck and neck all the way through Optic Gaming with a two to one series lead currently. However, it's a big, big bounce back from Sentinels as they come back in this series. And as we said, off of the back of huge performances from both Sparty and Collect, 26 and 25 kills apiece. They lead the game by a long shot, make it tied at 26. And also, once again, a fantastic piece of technical play from King Nick in that game. Spartan picks up another one, wastes both rockets. Well done to keep two dead for Optic Gaming. At least a little bit of visual clutter for the team. <laughs> for anyone trying to take him down in that situation, allowed his teammates to pick up the kills, but Collect now immediately turning the attention towards the upper, throws it out. The pink coming, street push coming in here from Optic gets shut down on the cross. Vice Spartan doing some big, big damage with that commando, but can they force the ball back into tram? That's the question here for Sen. Two dead right now. See this 2v2 going down the map. One of those battles is on rail. Lucid wins that against Lethal. That will create a momentary man advantage. Trippy wants to rotate the ball back through Neons up to A if he can here. Manages to do so as well. Formal will fall in the meantime, but the death is good enough to create the path for Optic to get that ball back. It shouldn't be too much of a hold, you would imagine. However, Trippy is going to make it a lot stronger as he crouches in the corner with that shotgun to make sure that Collect gets caught off guard and puts the numbers back on their side. And now you can see Optic can rearrange themselves in the setup. They can put the numbers towards this push coming in, and now they can flood, now they can push. Lucid with two is gonna give them the numbers once more. You gotta think the way that Lucid's trending in this game as well. That was so well-timed. Two dead once again in a 2v2, but Lucid with that pressure picks up back-to-back -back double kills, providing now a 34-point lead for Optic Gaming early on. Trippy once again, trying to be sneaky, trying to be quiet. However, what? he's making enough noise, oh, somehow gets a kill! And somehow comes out of the scenario with far too much damage. And you gotta wonder, who was looking at Trippy? It felt like nobody was looking at Trippy as he just starts to bulldog rip apart that Sentinel's roster. Eventually he's taken down, but off of that damage yet again, 50 to zero for Optic Gaming. Rocket's coming up as well. Big set of kills here and they're going in the hands of Sentinels by the looks of things. Trippy will answer that though. That'll be two. And now the Rocket's up for grab. APG versus King Nick manages to keep the Sentinels push off of those rockets and keep eyes and also turns the attention to the off ball. So Sentinels will be able to pick up the rockets. But they have decided the map to control them. But now you're seeing the push. Wait. Come in from Optic and they're managing to wrap all the way round from PD towards those rockets. Sentinels have not done anything here. They have zero points on the board in round number three. And even tougher news than that, if I'm honest, is the fact that they're outslaying 105 to 90 overall in this game, yet trailing 65 to zero in the third round. It's unacceptable and it's perfect objective play from Optic Gaming so far in round number three. Now you're going to see another chance, maybe for Sentinels to get their hands on the oddball. Spartan has to play this one slow though. He's got rockets and he knows where Optic Gaming members are. Spots out formal, will do damage. Nick will pick up one. Spartan flies out to finish off the damage on another. Now gets information on those last two players as well. That means Sentinels can rotate away. If they can get into Tram here, if they can lock it down, there's a chance here for them to close that lead. Oh, I like the decision for Spartan. He doesn't even challenge Neons, but the pressure's ah! coming! Look at Lucid beats him into Tram because of the damage on the cross shot from Neons. And Lucid picks up a double oh, oh, to me! Oh! That's the third 1v1 we've seen. This time, Collect will win it, and he will deny the triple kill to keep Sentinels in this. Formal comes in, though, to clean up the damage. Trippy trying to chase that kill down himself, but that is how good the teamwork has been from Opti. The flank from Lucid, though, is the only reason that Sentinels don't have a full setup at the moment inside a tram. 
And that's just a bit of miscommunication. Someone lost track of Lucid. Easy to do with how he moves across the map, but you can't afford to let him do what he just did. Sparty tried to just disengage entirely and get into Commando and take no damage and beat Lucid there, but because he took so much damage, likely from two players, Lucid! Almost does it again. King Nick will finally take him down. But because Spartan took too much damage there, Lucid beats him into the back of Tram. And Optic Gaming has essentially controlled the game since that play. It's 91 to 16, nine points to go for Optic Gaming to close out the series. I was about to say, if Trippy gets away with these rockets, this could be the game. This could be the series going into their hands. Trippy, once again with the boom booms, doing a little bit of work. Collect, he'll be dealt with as well. Trippy clearing the way here for Optic Gaming to close out the series. Two players still dead here from Sentinel. Spartan trying to make a desperation play, but Lucid, after the back of that, off of the back of that player, should say, in towards Tram, gets the winning points here for Optic Gaming. They close out the series at three to one, and the world champions look strong. It was maybe a bit of a slow start for the green wall. However, as you say, bounce back in a big way. Three to one win. And to be honest, it will not even be a footnote in the history books, that first series for them. This is business as usual for Optic Gaming. And on the other side of the stage, it's Sentinels with a good fight. However, it's Optic Gaming proving they are in a tier above. In that game, they win Oddball in the last round while getting outslayed 114 to 104, proving that their objective gameplay in ball is ready to go. And even when they don't have the slays on the board, they will get the game win. And it's showing it as well on the other side of the stage, the Sentinels still do need that little bit of time to cook, right? They do need a little bit more time together as a unit just to work out what the next stages are in this strategy and how they want to approach some of the game types because against Optic, you don't have a chance to make those mistakes. They get highlighted. I mean, in some ways, it's a good thing, right? Because they're going to highlight where your weaknesses are better than anyone can in those game types. And even though they managed to take that round away, it wasn't enough. Optic are looking extremely strong in series number one. Here. I think they have a lot to be proud of in that first series. It's not easy to go down. As a world champion, you just got a ring on your finger. It's not easy to lose the game in front of a live crowd in the first series, of course, and so many people watching online as well. But they bounce back in the biggest of ways in the end. 271 to 154 is your total in the game in terms of oddball points on the board. Here's a look at damage as well. And Lucid in the 9K club. And unsurprisingly, big damage coming out of everyone on Sentinels, being that they outslayed by 10. However, in the end, as we said, not something that will be remembered. Sentinels will go back to the playbook, take a look at the rest of the series for the rest of the day. Optic Gaming will do the same, but they'll do it with a game win on the board. Three to one is your final score. Yeah, like you say, they'll be able to do it while looking back at this series graphic, which shows three back-to-back -back games for Optic all going in their favor. Didn't even have to go to that game five, Slayer recharge. They get it done inside of four. Maybe a little bit of a wake-up call. Maybe just a little bit of uh, Argyle Cobwebs to blow off on yeah, exactly. strategy to work out for Optic Gaming as they move throughout this tournament. But I got to say, there was a pretty Optic like performance yeah. from our world champions that we just saw. I think so. And even you saw Lucid time and time again winning pivotal 1v1s there on pillars, winning those battles that he really shouldn't have won to pick out double kills and things like that. And that's what gave Optic Gaming the opportunity to have the rotates. Even when they're heavily being outslayed, at one point it was even 15 kills they're being outslayed by, and they still get the win. They'll record the 3 to 1 series win as well. Optic looking very, very good. Even though they were tested a little bit in that game at number one, they come out with a series win 3 to 1 over Sentinels, but that's going to do it all from our first cast of the season. Strange thing to say. Great to be back. Uh, it's great to be back, everybody. We'll send it over to the desk now. Lots Take it away. Thank you so much, Onset and um, Bravo. It's so good to see them back in the booth once again. The duo. Uh, but I tell you what, we've got a trio on the desk right now. we got Clutch, Tony. Yeah. Boys, my goodness me, what a series that was. Was a little bit concerned for Optic right at the beginning there. Map number one, I was thinking, my goodness, we have a series on our hands. But what a bounce back from the green wall. You can never count them out. And, you know, I was very impressed with that momentum switch that they had after that first map. And it just really went from there. But let's talk about it. Let's talk about the momentum of this clutch. Because that map one was something else. And Sentinels coming out hot like that might have been a surprise to most. But for me, it was the details. What happened here with Spartan? Yeah, I love that we're able to actually highlight this play. Spartan hits a pretty disgusting double. But what this does is it opens up the map for his team. They're able to push this left side. I call it the street. And when they take that control, Spartan does something extremely innovative and creative. And because of it, it throws up the entire timing from the respawners of OG. I'm talking about this repulse as we see it on screen. This is beautiful. This is a phenomenal way to innovate yourself to a new route. Because of this, Optic aren't going to expect Spartan to be here. They fly out. He gets a free melee, repulses back, good damage. And this opens up the first cap, and really the most important cap 
to be able to play from an advantage throughout this entire game one. Sentinels proving a lot of people wrong and staying in this series in a very competitive fashion. They certainly did indeed. And I got to say what Optic did after that was answer back. And Tony, Boy, answer me this. APG has been so lights out in the qualifiers, the stats, the pips he wins, the swing moments he gets with his team, and it hasn't stopped there. Lan is a different beast, but APG, he can tame it. Yeah, I mean, going into this tournament, you know, APG has so much responsibility on his hands. Even before the tournament started, he was always top two in KD, str uh, stronghold captures, ball carry time, flag caps, assist, king of the hill caps. They expect him to fill in the gaps. Wherever they need him, he has to stand out and you see the highest KD. You saw that in that game number four. He had 91 seconds of ball time in that first round out of 100. Ended up with the most kills, the most ball time, about 150 plus seconds. APG was an absolute animal in that game four. Our games one and four were fairly close. We saw round three in the oddball. I mean, games two and three were absolute blowouts in Optic's favor. You see that damage stat that we just saw? Lucid had like 24 44. I think Spartan had 1,600. That's almost like that's almost 10,000 more damage done by Lucid throughout the series. Sentinels cannot afford to get blown out in those games. They need to make every game competitive in order to like push and be where they want to be. They showed some a lot of promise in games one and four. They need to figure out ways to play like that. Yeah, they do indeed. I've got to say, uh, huge, huge swing moments there from Optic. Uh, and honestly, really happy to see the kind of a testament that Sen have been doing and, and what they've been working on, you know, post qualifiers coming into land because I think to make a statement like that, even if it is kind of in between maps, sorry, excuse me, in the series, I think it just shows the hard work that they are putting in to try and round up this roster and make it the roster that they want. Uh, I've got to say though, before we go to break, I want to let everyone know that we do have season three coming your way very soon. We're giving you huge sneak peeks this Sunday with, of course, a full season three showcase match happening behind us on the main stage. We've got some of your favorite HCS faces that are going to be up there playing, showing you what to expect as well. So we hope to see you there and hope to see you guys tuning in. And if you're actually on site on Saturday and Sunday, you'll actually be able to get an exclusive opportunity to play season three early, which is pretty sick, I've got to say. Ooh. I'm going to have to find the booth somewhere so I can go and have a little sneak peek myself. I think it's kind of crazy that we won't be able to play ourselves. We'll be up here working, but we also have some new skins for the new season as well, which is going to be absolutely incre incredible, excuse me. But maybe you'll actually get a glimpse of these new skins and the first look as well as we take you to this season three and what to expect. Why here? Because you refuse to see. Yeah. 
starting off the season the season opener, the major in Raleigh, getting second place with E United. Him and Ryan have been a duo for long before Halo Infinite. They've been killing it for so long. They anytime Ryan Newb and Rain are on a team, no matter their teammates, I give them a puncher's chance in the series, more than a puncher's chance in a lot of instances. Rain has not been talked about enough. He's got everything, and to uh, to see him on on the battlefield doing all the small things, all the background noise that no one ever gets to see, uh, it's been nice. You know, he doesn't really pick up a snipe and go crazy. When he, he does pick it up, he does go to go pretty crazy, but for the most part, he tries to win rather than be flashy. B will be flipped once more, and Rain has a sniper rifle. One shot here, two body shots, whatever it might be. Damage from Rain. This could be the game. Oh my God, look at this. The assist will come in there. Kills will be traded, though, not over just yet. Less than 20 points to go here. Oh my United. God, Rain is going wild. Double kill in the feed now. 10 points no! to go. Double kill for Rain. He wants to to lead us silently to what we want to achieve, and to have that like we always have that extra player, we always have that person who uh, you just don't ever feel is like caught out in the wrong spot, and to have that on the team it means so much. But I think Rain is definitely an underappreciated, under talked about player. Even though United have had very up and down season, we've always been talking about Ryan Noob or now you know Snipe down, and Rain just kind of sits there and uh, he must be feeling. Well, why is no one mentioning me? Like, I'm, I'm good. I've been doing it. He's been amazing for years, like, fantastic. His shot is unreal, but I think he's one of those players who just goes under the radar because he's silently going about his business. He knows he's good, he practices, but he's not really flashy. He does the dirty work sometimes, and I think that he maybe is under underappreciated on that team. He's earned his stripes every step of the way, and I expect to see big things from him even next year. I'm gonna boot him. There's just something about that radical when it starts moving like that. No! Oh! Kill Rexy! Killing Frenzy for Royal 2! And it's dead! Royal 2! Stop this man! We will have that elastic boss of it. Do it again! Do it again! Do it again! Genuinely sets out and truly believes he's gonna be Ooh. a world champion! Ooh. Ooh. It's to watch if you like that aggressive play style. He's kind of the guy who is always leading the front oh. here. Native Fred, and he can do stuff like that as well. Oh. Oh. oh my god. Yeah, as soon as you see one, you know the reinforcements are coming quick, so you better get that trade or you better take some cover. Collect the metal. There's two. Go for three. That's formal, baby. Let's see what he can do with a little bit. Big double kill. Hail Mary gets a triple kill. Big hey, looking for the One, he oh, takes yeah. down two, and they know where the last two players are as well. Snake fight, oh, you're dead as well. Oh, Make it an overkill! Overkill for Jimbo! Talk about Cloud9, talk about the slight process had so much success. Inbound the missing piece they need as he's making play after play, play after play. You got the heat, you've got the snipe. Oh, it's all headshots for Snake fight. Oh, big time snipe out of Stellar, and that's gonna close the door in game number one as Cloud9. This is a great, great for G1 right now. This has to pick off these players. They have the angles. This needs the damage. I liked everything that oh. Boo Boo Dubu did there. Give him the overkill! And Boo Boo, take my Dubu once again, baby! Orlando with the seconds, and now the journey is complete! Optic Gaming! The green wall! Stands tallest! Wait, wait a second, you're wait one a second. Hey, BG's headset was off. The game isn't over yet. There's no way. Somehow Cloud9, now we can say it. Oh my God. It's a premature celebration even on the stage for Optic Gaming. They thought it was over. C9 was in the hill the whole time.
APG was shaking. He couldn't believe it. They forced a reset there in overtime for just a few extra seconds. Optic had no idea. We had no idea. And in the end, now we can say that Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions. I mean, reset, right? This has been the craziest week. The craziest tournament of all time. What other way would you have it end? But now that we are finally at its conclusion, Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions! The HCS Charlotte Kickoff Major is presented by AMD and by Zowie. Welcome back, folks, to the HCS Kickoff Major in Charlotte, North Carolina. We just watched Optic take down Sentinels in your first match of the Major. We have a lot going on here in Charlotte, including all of the booths. We have the open bracket where all of our teams are fighting for their chance to break into the pools and get their chance at getting on that main stage as well. Joining me on this desk, I have Clutch and Onset. What's Hello. up, mate? How Hello. are you? I'm all right. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, good to get the, uh, the rust off. <laughs> it felt like you know, it's been a bit of an off long off season. I know. Was it too long, everybody? Too long. <laughs> uh, too but long. it's good to be back. It was uh, an interesting series to start things off as well. Optic, well, Optic looking like Optic, though. Yeah. They are. A little bit of a shaky stop. That always seems to happen day one at Majors, isn't it? Lots of our top teams, Clutch, always seem to start a little bit slow. Like they're, they're still wiping the sleep out of their eyes. Yeah, it's a matter of can you wake up in the middle of that first series is a lot of the time the big question. We've seen countless teams like Splice, Triggers Down throughout the ages lose early in tournaments, especially in pool play and then have to make up for that with a fantastic elimination bracket round uh, run. Thank God we didn't have to see that from Optic early on. They were able to get some win behind their sails. Game two was a, a special performance from Formal, I think yeah. 16 and two, but they got the job done. They certainly did indeed. Well, pools continue, folks. Let's take a look at the schedule coming your way today. Of course, we already had Optic versus Sen. We've got Shopify Rebellion versus Na'Vi coming up next. And then later on, Sen versus Quadrant. Face Clan takes on Rebellion and G1 versus BTH. Believe the hype, oh, oh, oh. Uh, which I'm actually really looking forward to that end match. I want to know what the hype is all about and whether they can actually bring it to LAN as well. Let's take a look at the pools though and see all of the updates coming forward because of course what you're seeing on a stream there's things happening behind the scenes as well on the other streams we have this weekend too but as you can see pool b we've just filled in one for zero with optic versus sentinels phase clan also want to know but i've got to say that was quite a tight match there clutch you watched navi actually take a game off phase clan and kept it close to the rest of the series too yeah just like optic struggling to come out the gates and really find their rhythm until later on in that series i think we can say very similar for phase in that Navi series as well. This is going to be something that every team is going to have to deal with, especially early on in this tournament, pool play and whatnot. You got to come ready for every series because every series is going to count. And now I'm looking at that Sentinel Squadron match that's going to be oh so important to decide who's going to get second place in pool B because Optic Gaming, of course, are expected to come out on top. Indeed, and our next match of the day, Rebellion taking on the European team, Na'Vi, who, let's be honest, have had a pretty decent morning so far. Yes, they're not going to be happy with the result, but it's an encouragement for sure to be playing really, really well against FaZe, making them sweat the way that they did in that first match. That's definitely testament to how good this team are. Now, Rebellion, though, it's going to be a little bit tricky here, right? They have a quick day today, but it's not an easy day. Rebellion. Clutch. I mean, how is Ryan Noob going to get this team in shape to become a roster to compete with? Can he do it? I am a big fan of this team. I think the pickups that they made so early in the offseason in Carmea and Mental, I think that that was a very direct decision from Ryan and Rain, and they stuck with it. They put a lot of time coming into this tournament, probably one of the more practice teams like we can typically say about Ryan Noob, and usually those practice teams, they pay off, especially early in the season. Yeah, they, they certainly do. Uh, I think one thing I want to highlight as well here, this isn't like two players just picked out of nowhere. These both players who have earned their spot on this roster as well. Kamea kind of became the ghost of the open bracket. Whenever I was speaking to Wonderboy on Na'Vi, the coach, he was like, dude, Kamea is frying. Like every time we play against a team with Kamea on, he is the standout player. Yeah. And Mental's a 22-time Gears of War champion. Like he's won more titles than most people have in their entire careers. Yeah. It's a lot. It, it's a lot. So he knows what it takes to, take, to get a win. He does indeed. I'll tell you what, Na'Vi, they know what it takes to get a win. Also, they really want this bad right now on LAN. Uh, but a great showing against FaZe, like I said here. And, you know, 
on set. Do you think they have what it takes right here, right now to take down Rebellion? This is a feisty team. It's got some serious household names, but can they do it? It's a, it's a really tough question. And I'm just saying this from history where I believe that something is going to happen. And then a European team will just not get over that hurdle, right? But one thing I will say about this Na'Vi lineup is Snipe Drone makes you stronger. He is one of the best players the region has ever produced. And the pickup of Snipe Drone for a consistency basis of putting up numbers, Na'Vi could not have asked for more. And I think that the fact that, you know, Quadrant made their moves in the offseason, it worked out for this lineup as well. Not just because of what Snipe Drone brings, but also because of the fact that, uh, game plan wise, everyone's mentality has been reset and everyone now is playing the same way. Everyone has the way they want to play. The team has the identity that they want to play with. And they are all extremely comfortable with each other. Uh, and I think Snipe Drone's addition is not just great for him, but it's made everyone else better. Everyone else more comfortable in what their role is and what they want to do. And this is the strongest Na'Vi has ever looked. That, that's all I say on it. They have the components, they have the pieces to beat this Rebellion team. The question is, do they have the mentality? Are the ghosts still in the closet of losing to a Ryanu team? But I will say, historically, when Europe have had their best performances ever, they've usually beaten a Ryanu team on the way. So <laughs> it's this a very, very interesting true. series. This is very true. I've got to say, though, I, I completely agree. Having Snipe Drone there changes the dynamic of this team entirely. And we've seen that happen many, many times where you do just make one significant change that really does change how your team operates and works. Very excited to see both of these in action in just a moment. But it wouldn't be the same without, of course, the casters in your ear. And I would love to throw over to two of my favorite people in the world. I got Shirzy and Gaskin on the mics. Throw it our way, we'll catch it. I'll tell you something, Dan, the desk talked about it, they touched on it. It's been a while since we've been here back on LAN, and boy, does it feel good to be back, but it's been so long, in fact, that on set has forgotten how to dress. He looks like my nan's curtains. He does look a little bit like your nan's curtains, but I tell you what, if anyone could pull it off, it is on set indeed. But they were completely right with the desk. You know, Na'Vi, a new look Na'Vi, a roster that has been through a lot of struggles. You know, they were top 32 at one point, into top eight, but with that. Snipe Drone, this looks like a roster who believes they can take on any squad. And we saw a good result against FaZe earlier on. Now listen, we talk about this all the time. Every time we get to an event, we talk about Quadrant, we were talking about Ascend and Navi, and we always had these high hopes. And every single time they broke our hearts. They did, well, they broke everyone else's hearts, not your hearts. No, we're, not, we're not allowed to be biased. Of course, yeah. I have a US passport as well. So I actually, it's a win-win or a lose-lose, whichever way you want to look at it. But you I will say, things. Navi, I think, have that belief now. And I think they've put so much study, so much pre preparation, so much research into this Rebellion roster. Is it the same on the other side? I've seen Wonderboy's notes, right? I've seen how much in depth he's gone into this roster. Is it the same for Best Man? Now, don't get me wrong, Best Man is an incredible player and coach to have behind you with his historic results, with all of the achievements he has. But has he looked at Na'Vi the same way Rebellion and the way Na'Vi's looked at them? Well, it's one thing to be the best man, but the best coach, that's a different thing entirely. Has he done his homework on the Na'Vi side? And like they touched upon on the desk, this team has gotten a lot better since Ascend sort of went by the wayside. They split up, they broke up, half gone to Quadrant, Snipe Drone now finding his feet on this new Na'Vi roster. And they come in here to this tournament with the number one seed. Can they cause the upset? And I will say, when we look at the series layout, it is a good one for Na'Vi as they looked across, you know, how the qualifiers went, who's been good at what maps. This general series, it's actually probably better for Na'Vi when you look at every single aspect of it, whether we're going Slayer, whether we're going into the game modes, whether it's CTF, there will still, though, be that error of doubt in a European roster of getting over that hurdle. Can they get the job done in three? Is it going to end up as a game five? And if it does, Imperium Slayer is a very difficult game to navigate against a Rebellion roster that features Ryan Oob, who is the ultimate sneaky beaver. Well, let's actually zoom in on our first game. Let's hyper-focus now. Oddball recharge. As we go into game one, what jumped off the page? What can we expect here in game one? I mean, this is one of Na'Vi's best oddball game types. Very good indeed at knowing how they get those setups, how they lock them down so they can secure as much points as possible. There's two players I want to focus on. I want to focus on Snipe Drone. He won't be picking up that ball, but he is going to be someone who's been doing that damage, making things work. And on the other side, we've got Rain. He won't touch the ball whatsoever, but you better believe he's going to be in the faces of Na'Vi. This series right here could have serious implications as to who progresses into the winner's side of the bracket come the end of pool play. Can it be Rebellion or will Na'Vi cause the upset? And if they want to do it, 
It's right here, right now. And you can learn so much at the start of a game here on Recharge as well. How are the teams going to be trying to get that ball? Where are they going to be trying to get that ball? Where is their priority position and their ideal setup? Already, Na'Vi have got it in pipes. And this is the important factor. Get that shock in the hands of Snipe Drone. We've seen what he was able to do last season. Now is he going to have even more chance to elevate himself? It's Snipe Drone. Position top pipes. A little bit of timing there just off as he de-scopes for a second. Can he be shock drawn for a moment? Fires one towards Ryan who will not connect too much, will not do the damage required to get the kill, that much is for sure. But the setup's being broken pretty quickly here as Ryan Oop soars into pipe trying to secure that territory for his team. Snipe Drone gets shut down. And numbers advantage ever so slightly in favor of Navi here as ball is played down bottom middle. And one thing for Navi, they really struggled last season with their ability to react to how North American teams were playing. They were a little bit too rigid, a little bit too scared, but ever since the change, ever since the addition of Snipe Drone, they do seem far more comfortable in their own skin. They are happy to... They will play strict at times, and it's very important to do so, but when they have to just amp it up, then they have to change the pace. They're able to do so now. Mental on our screens here. On our, it has to be said, 22-time Gears of War champion. They set in the desk because he picks up two. How old is this man if he's got 22 championships under his belt? Oh. Make it a triple kill! And Mental is trying to announce himself on the world stage here. And Ryan Noob being his coach, maybe he can make the difference. He's a, another member of the Academy of Ryan Noob. And then Mental playing Mental at the moment. I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on this young man, not just in this event, but as we progress through this season. Speaking of eyes, Snakey tries to avoid the eyes now, has to camouflage to work with, and that's sometimes what you need to try and break any sort of setup as Ryan Noob will do his best, but it's not going to work out on this occasion. Two dead apiece then. Map resets for a moment. Ball back home. Carme of Editions. Top bat ledge. Will secure a kill onto Jimbo. Now will scoop up the ball, will be Ryan Noob. Back in the goal pipes. This is good for Rebellion here. As they start to build a little bit of a lead. Snakey still has a bit of a camo here, but must be running out of juice. There it is, it's gone. Carmea spins around, nails him with the plasma pistol. Shot two, and ball will be played. They recognize the danger. And Rebellion already starting to click through the gears here with 52 points to 12. You can always trust Ryan Noob to make sure that ball gets out of the danger areas. You can see he's the one who's been scoring all the points so far for Rebellion, and it's allowed the rest of the squad to just be slaying, but Ryan Noob is still in areas to make it awkward for Na'Vi. Three go down, and then suddenly Snipe Drone's left to just try and pick up the pieces here alongside Mighty. Mighty in a tough spot. Gets killed. You see across the map, Mental and Snipe Drone are the 1v1, and Snipe Drone doesn't often lose them, but he has this time, and... Ryan Hoop tries to give the wiggles, but unfortunately he gets shut down. Stanky picks up two, but ball will be thrown off. That's going to be another reset. 66 to 12 now. Rebellion making this really difficult. And during the qualifiers, Rebellion had a lot of success on this game type as well. I may have said that Na'Vi, you know, it's one of their better full games, but certainly for Rebellion, it is just perfect for their play style with how they set up, with how they break setups. And you've been able to see it so far in this game. This maybe is going to be a temporary chance, though, for Na'Vi to get that ball locked down. But look at how awkward every single time Rebellion to make it. The ball is always in an area where Na'Vi have to commit to it, and they're just not able to do so. Every time they get the numbers, again, Rebellion making this very, very difficult indeed. And you can see why. Snakey finally gets his hands on the ball. They have numbers advantage here. Bottom elevator is going to be the play. He clambers up and Mikey's trying to provide that cover fire. Spawns over towards top gold. Rotations will come through and Snakey immediately loses two members. Snipe Drone and Jimbo in the respawn screen, but opting to still try and hold this ball and milk it for all it's worth before the push comes. And I will say, usually Na'Vi, they share the ball load between Jimbo, Snakey and Mikey's quite well. But it is Jimbo, when they have success, Jimbo often has the most ball time. He's not really been able to get into the objective so far but he has been picking up big kills. And I think that's what's important for any team, not just Na'Vi, is about making sure you take advantage of the positions you're put in at that time. Snipe drone then, what can he do? Widely regarded as Europe's best ever player, our best export. And Helby's looking to make the difference here in the black and gold. More familiar to wearing the purple of last season, but four dead go Na'Vi Rain. And his long time duo in Ryan who now has the ball. Rain fires a couple of shots towards Snipe John, but he's just able to manip manipulate. That's a word, Dan. I forgot yeah, to do those words. A little bit. He has managed to get away, scamper bottom middle, Snakey. 
faces him up though. The 1v1 and no. Snakey somehow, some way gets reversal. And when stuff like that happens to you, you start to fear the worst. I do feel like Rain is the unsung hero of pretty much every roster he's ever featured on because he does the dirty work, because sometimes he goes a little bit unnoticed, but you will see it in the stats, whether it be the amount of kills, the assists, he's always up there. And he is going to be such an integral part of this Rebellion roster and their big push to try and get, you know, not just top six, they want top four, they want top three. Every team here wants to be able to win an event. 88 then, 39 on the side of Navi in round one. Rebellion in the ascendancy, at least for now. Making this a very difficult kill once more. Jimbo chases it, his trade does come through and Snipe Drone hits the four shots onto Carmea, but it's a little bit too little, too late. Was good timing though from Jimbo. It's Sometimes you're gonna be reluctant to push in alone because you can leave your team in a three versus four, but Jim did enough damage and he knew he had players nearby, a Snipe Drone. Patient as ever, watches like a hawk. Able to stay invisible, but now he needs some help because Ryan Hoop comes on in. And I tell you what, Snipe Drone, if he was able to get away, this could have been very different. But at least Na'Vi have full control now. They can hold it over towards blue. They can play it when they feel like they are under enough pressure. But Jimbo's holding back the world at the moment. Mental gets another kill. Three dead now for Na'Vi. Been impressed so far by Mental, winning those 1v1s. Every pip that comes his way, he seems to be coming out on top. And that's exactly what you need. For rebellion here as they rotate the ball only requiring four more seconds desperation on the side of navi as they cannot stop the ball scoring one oh rebellion it's a great start for rebellion and it's what they needed just to shut down the momentum from navi after that series navi had with phase getting one map off them tying on imperium as well navi would have been feeling so confident and it means now Na'Vi need to reassess. What are we doing wrong? Why are we not able to get these setups that perhaps we have been able to during these European qualifiers? But North American teams are very different. They play in a different style and you have to adapt. That's important to note about Na'Vi. They took an objective game against FaZe. Maybe your expectations rose a little bit for the tournament. Okay, we can compete against some of the big boys, but you play against Rebellion now and they show you and they almost put you straight back in your box. I did like at the end though, you see Snipe Drone prioritizing trying to kill that ball because you have to. I've seen so many players in those situations still just get kills for no reason. But I think Na'Vi have their eyes firmly set on trying to secure a victory here so they can get top two in this group. Now, it's not a guarantee. When we look at these pools, often we would say, okay, one and two is probably likely. Even the open teams that are going to be coming into these pools are going to be unreal. The open bracket is stacked, and I cannot wait to see who is going to be breaking through. Open bracket is an absolute bloodbath. Many big hitters in there, like Proton. Native white and indeed native red in there. I do not want to be a player competing, and if I was, I'd be double rounded, let's be honest. And looking at Ryan Noob, 66 points on the board, now scoops it up once more, trying to add more to his tally. As oh, he wow. sends a player away from a mighty, he crouches down just to avoid the headshot. Two dead apiece, but it's Carmea with ball. Snipe Drone comes in, tries to find the face, but Snipe Drone does get the kill. Could have been so different if you hit that headshot as well. It's why it's so important when you've got that shock to line it up, take your time a little bit. I've been impressed with Carmea so far though, and I think they touched upon it on the desk. This was not just a random pickup for Rebellion. This was a very much assessed squad. This is a Ryan Noob special once more, and Ryan Noob very good at deciding who he wants to be teaming with, how he wants to plan the nature of the squad, and how they're going to be assessing these games as well. I do think so far here, on Oddball Recharge, it's all starting to play into the hands of the strategy that Rebellion wants to try and approach. But Na'Vi now doing a little bit better. Now they've been able to get three or four down and the camouflage, this is their best opportunity to score. Can Jimbo turn his fortunes around in this game? Camouflage and shock rifle in hand. Does lose a teammate though. So they are scoring. First shot will not find a home. That's going to make this an even more difficult task as teammates fall around them. They have had the opportunity no. to play the ball as Jim finds one. Can he line up the second onto Rain? He cannot do so, but a teammate is on hand to get the trade there. Camouflage will survive for the moment. Jim's just missing those vital shots, Dan. It's okay, it's not the end of the world. He's still connecting with a few. And one big difference I've noticed from Na'Vi of season one to Na'Vi of now is they are reacting to callouts a lot quicker. They are making sure there is that finish, that there is that trade. Jimbo may not have survived last season. But he's doing so well at the moment to make Rebellion think about him, and he Ooh. still gets that reversal. Of course, ammo run out on the other side, but the fact that Jim is still alive, still holding pipes, means that Rebellion off spawn constantly are having to think about it. Map's been reset then. Kamea sliding across C-plat, still manages to find a couple of shots onto Jimbo. 
just enough to let him know he's there. A couple of members of Rebellion positioned over towards the long haul side and Reigns the first one to feel the wrath of Jimbo. Still controlling the commando, still controlling and patrolling around this glass area and indeed controlling pipes. Ball over towards the elevator now. Carmea gets a couple of shots and again fires back. But this is much better from Navi. Yeah, can we look at Snakey as well? I mean, he has the second amount of kills, the second most amount of kills, excuse me, and is still picking up that objective. And I think that's something that Na'Vi have had to work on as they've progressed, is making sure that people are doing all of the dirty work and you don't just leave it up to Jimbo, who's had to play a very different role in this game as he's the last remaining player, still alive, still surviving, and still being a nuisance, now has a shot rifle. His teammates, though, although Jim was living all the live-long day, unfortunately for him, his teammates couldn't do so over on the elevator side, and that setup was blown wide open. And now, Rebellion starting to score some more points, and just closing the gap now that Navi managed to surmount. There's one dead apiece now. Jimbo with camouflage and shock rifle for the second successive time in a row. Can he have the more desired effect here with it? As he throws the ball over towards Whirlpool, fires a warning shot over towards Mental, but will not connect. Now got enemies around him, playing this one patiently with. A little bit of trigger this spin, but he get lit up. Doesn't know where he is now. Jim is still alive here. Absolutely Honestly, we've been, we've been watching like a pleasant fishing trip for Jim. He's just been slowly marauding around the map, picking up a camo, and then picking up the shock rifle, then grabs the ball. It was far too peaceful, and Rebellion had to make sure they did shut him down, which they eventually do. But all the meanwhile, Na'Vi weren't really scoring that many points. They do still find themselves ahead with 1 minute and 52 remaining. A Snipe Drone has another kill, making it 21 now. Three dead for Rebellion. And Na'Vi need to take advantage of this. Big damage from Snipe Drone. Four dead for Rebellion. Now all of a sudden, Na'Vi starting to find their feet in this game. Can they build on it now? They find themselves down by a single round at the moment. That grenade does a lot of damage onto Snakey and indeed Mighty's, but they're clearing out pipes once more and Rebellion are on the back foot. Rebellion very good at getting that final nade in though to make it awkward to pick up the ball, to pick up those seconds, but now they can hold it. And they're gonna have a good setup here in Elevator, so Rebellion, we're gonna learn a lot about how they try and break these setups. I've always credited any Ryanu team in being able to break setups successfully, but with Ryanu going down first, that's not really the opening, as now they're gonna fall like flies, and Na'Vi should be able to clean things up comfortably. Back to back three deads then for Rebellion, that push was not successful, and Na'Vi inching ever closer to that 100 point threshold now. Five seconds required, and nobody seems to be in a position for Rebellion. Grenades come in, but Stakey's just gonna be able to survive. 1-1 one, one the score. An excellent response from Na'Vi, a much needed response as well after that initial round. And even though it's all calm, it's collected in the moment from the boys, you know that they're starting to feel this a little bit. They're starting to realize that maybe this tournament is something a little bit different for them, especially compared to what happened in season one. You've got to make sure you get over the finish line. You've got to get over those stereotypes that we seem to be finding ourselves talking about every single event with European teams, choking, as it were, against some of these NA rosters. What a massive difference Snipe Drone can make to this roster throughout the season. Carmea gets blown back by the repulsor play there. Camouflage will not have the desired effect this time. Jimbo tried to scoop up the ball and get away, but unfortunately not able to be successful on this occasion. Mental then in pipes, tries to get the trade desperately, but Snipe Drone stands strong. And I love that Onset brought it up. Snipe Drone is one of the greatest talents that European Halo has seen in quite some time. And even though he fit very well on that Ascend roster with his play style, as Snakey also gets the perfect. You've got to imagine that Snipe Drone's going to be far more comfortable now on a roster. Everyone's speaking English. There's not going to be any sort of confrontation with any French language coming up as well. I think this is the perfect chance for Snipe Drone to shine this season. 29 kills at the moment, but Ryan he has the shock. And he's looking to try and penetrate the defense of Na'Vi. Ryan continuing to be a thorn in the side of Na'Vi. Couple of shock rifle shots will connect and take the shields away from the Dutchman Mighties. As he backs away in control, Jimbo, with the help of a teammate in rain, will see the death screen once more. Two down on the side of Navi. Snipe Drone coming the latest one to join a man is. Mighties peeks out and almost loses his face as a consequence. It is very rare that you're seeing either team all four dead. They're doing well at surviving, making sure that last player is going to be making a difference. Is going to try and do something, whether it be with your battle rifle or with a grenade or whether you're just going to make them look in a different angle that allows your team to get out of spawn quite easily as Mighties comes literally zipping in. 
but needs some help here. The help has come in the shape of Snakey, but three go down, so that push is not going to be successful. Jimbo, last man alive, and you spoke about how they've been doing very well. Can he burn the camo? Yes, he can. And that's job done. That's what you need to do. You need to do something that makes a difference when you are the last remaining player. 18 assists for, at the moment for Jimbo. He's not really stood out in terms of kills, in terms of objective, but everyone has to play their part on the roster. What a pool this is in Pool 8. With Rebellion, Faze, Navi. Two number one seeds. Number one seed in Europe, number one seed in NA. Find themselves in the same group and no doubt there's going to be an open team that joins them that will be causing a little bit of carnage as well. And it could come into account later on as well with the one map that Na'Vi were able to pick up against FaZe. If there was any sort of three-way tie, it could be huge that they got a game off FaZe. Because now FaZe may go on and 3-0 everyone, right? Because they've had that warm-up. It was their first match on LAN after quite some time. And it really could make a difference as they go on. If there was a three-way tie, that nade's going to do a lot of damage for Jim, though. And I love that he's able to navigate his way out of the situation just to try and delay things. All three members of Rebellion, the last three rem remaining members of Rebellion, almost ate the same grenade. Snipe drone positions himself over towards batteries. This gunfight goes down, but somehow, someway, Carmea gets a trade of his own life. But two down for Rebellion now as Navi pick up the ball, but Mental trying to make this a difficult task and is doing so. Snipe drone position below them. Can he pick up on some of the damage that was being put down? Here's a 1v1. Mental desperately trying to stay alive behind the pillar. He's got away and milked his life long here. Can he get the trade? No, he can't, but that was good. It was an awkward fight to watch, but in the end, Snipe drone comes out on top. Na'Vi find themselves 20 plus points behind, 23 to be precise. And they were far better in round two when they had the lead, when they were able to build on their lead, when they didn't have to force their way onto the ball. Whereas when Rebellion have the lead, they are making it so tough for Na'Vi to get into these situations to get any time. This could be the first real opportunity though for Na'Vi to get a strong setup. Camouflage is going to be popping as well. So if Snakey can get this kill, oh. which he can, how is Mental just getting away time and time again? Just like Jimbo was earlier, it seems like he's going on his own fishing trip. Talks his head between his knees and just manages to avoid the headshot. Ryan Noob now with the camouflage. What can he do with it? Can he open the door for a rebellion push? Two members go down for Navi. They have numbers advantage for a moment. Ryan Noob thought about going towards top elevator, changed his mind. Does a bit of damage to Snipe Drone and now Mighty's last remaining member. Positioned over towards top control. Teammate and Snakey will come to join him. Ryan Noob gets face to face with Snakey and with the help of a teammate once more, they get the damage. Again, Na'Vi, though, they're still behind. They weren't able to gain the lead with that amount of time they were able to pick up as it's another reversal for Ryan Oop. The camouflage was so important in their push, in their break there, and now they've got ball time. Jimbo tries to force his way into long haul. They are doing a lot of damage, Na'Vi, at the moment, but still, ball time is being found. Rebellion have been far better at getting that scrappy time, and Na'Vi need to respond, and they need to do it quickly, Jersey, because there's only about 1 minute 35 left. I'm glad you mentioned that word scrappy because that's what we've seen so far in these first two rounds of oddball. Nobody really able to put 40, 50, 60 points together. It's all been very scrappy, all very disjointed. It also suggests that these are quite evenly matched teams as well. We're not seeing a clear favorite and I think we knew that looking at this group that this was going to be a, a damn right dogfight between these two squads to try and pick up that second place depending on who comes in from pools or from open bracket into pools. But Na'Vi have been able to close this gap significantly now. It's only a 13 second difference. There is a lot of players trapped in pipes. Nades can make a huge difference here. Minute 17 on the clock. Snipe drone picks up one. The ball over towards pipes. It's actually at the feet of two members of Rebellion. They've got a pipe set up now. What can Navi do with so little time left and so many, so few mistakes you can make now? One goes down. Mighty gets the opening pick, but he loses a teammate in the process. Ball down. Can Mighty pick this one up, scoop it away? That's what he needs to do. Uh, I think that Na'Vi this whole time have been trying to be too perfect sometimes with their setups, but they need to now start taking the initiative a little bit because they are running out of time. You need to be picking up one or two seconds when it becomes available. Jimbo, last remaining player. Ryan Noob has the chance to make a difference here in pipes as well. Shot's going to be up, but here comes the double push from Na'Vi. Ryan Noob's in big trouble. Somehow, some way, gets a trade though. That's going to make this even more difficult. As time is starting to run out. Just over 30 seconds left then. That's gonna be Snipe Jonah makes the first move. Down on batteries. Or two is the 
The position, the grenades clear him out once more. So close. It's gonna be one last push here for Na'Vi. Rebellion are just gonna play hold. They are gonna watch this ball. They're gonna make sure that Na'Vi do not pick it up. And again, it's two dead. Is there any sort of last ditch attempt here for Na'Vi Nation? They've got nine seconds. Jimbo's got ball, but he hasn't no longer. Five seconds remaining. And they're like lambs to the slaughter. Snipe Jones somehow managed to pick it up and scoop away. The information comes his way. Snipe Drone falls with two seconds remaining. It's going to be Rebellion that take the game. It's a fantastic effort from Na'Vi, but it's Rebellion who show their true colors here and show how much of this practice is paying off. One of the most practiced teams you'd have to feel coming into this season. It's a Ryanu masterclass yet again. The breaks, the setups, everything seemed to be on point. It wasn't a dominant game, don't get me wrong but it was just doing enough. And sometimes that's what you've got to do against teams who are very similar in skill level. You mentioned the word dogfight. And that's what it felt like at times. It was all about frustrating Na'Vi. And they've done that so successfully in game one, that They really did. I think that Na'Vi, when they look back at this game now, they'll be a bit frustrated with certain elements that they weren't able to pick up four or five seconds in certain areas where they maybe hesitated to pick up that ball because one player would be remaining and they think, oh, well, if I go for the ball here, maybe a nade's going to hit us and then we lose out on some big chunks of time. But I really think they could have picked up those scrappy points to try and make this even closer than it was. But when you look at the, the scoreboard and the stats, I mean, Snipe Drone stood out on the Na'Vi team. We knew that was going to be very apparent throughout this tournament, but Snakey was keeping up with him. It wasn't the best game for the likes of Jimbo, but I don't think that will kind of trouble him at all. These guys, they are so experienced nowadays. We're not looking at anyone who is going to be worn out or struggling just because it's land rather than being online. And you look at the damage, you see Karamea with 10K, almost 11. Snipe Drone just behind them with 10,100. We spoke about how those players are going to be so important, particularly with Snipe Drone, but Karmay is showing that he can be a real damage dealer on the map. And one of the biggest differences from online to LAN when you look at Rebellion is Rain. Rain was getting the ball. This wasn't happening during the qualifiers. Rain was very much allowing Ryan Oob or anyone who was in the area to get that ball instead, and Rain just kept his distance. But it does show if you're in the right place at the right time and you know that you need to be getting that ball, that's what Rain did. And you spoke about how there was very little to separate them in terms of skill and with the oddball. It was actually Navi who had more oddball time, but it was again Rebellion who got the better of them in those later games and just making it so difficult. Well, game two is going to be Slayer on live fire. Now, this is the best Slayer game type from Navi throughout qualifiers. They went 3 0, they didn't drop it. They looked pretty flawless, to be honest, but that's against European teams, right? This is a different kettle of fish now. No disrespect to the other European teams they may have faced, but I think as you get into these international tournaments and you start to play against the biggest and best teams in the world, suddenly some of those strategies are not going to work out and you need to have a game plan. That being said, Na'Vi do have game plans. I have spoken to the coach. I know that they have assessed everything about this Rebellion roster and they truly believe they can win this series, but it has to start now. Well. If you're saying that Navi have typically been flawless in this map, I'm prepared in the interest of saving time for indeed the broadcast and everybody else just to call this series 1-1 to move on. What yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I think we can go to game three here and just make sure this is all even Stevens. Uh, maybe Rebellion wouldn't be happy about that one, uh, but maybe there's some revenge from some of the European players. But Rhinoob and the rest of the squad here, when I looked at their slaying ability, because I was curious, you know, who's the main slayer on this team? Who am I going to be looking out for? And even though you look at Kame, you look at Mental, these new kind of young guns who have demonstrated what they could do in not just online performances, but LAN, across the board, they're all sharing the slays fairly evenly. There isn't anyone who is the main slayer, it would seem. And I think that's very important when we look at these because you're not going to see someone have a bad game, a duff game. Someone can always step up on this Rebellion side. Well, you mentioned the word while you were talking there. You used the word revenge, and we all remember what happened last year, and Snipe Jones got something to settle with Ryan Noob, and perhaps this could be the series to do it. Yeah, I, I, I spoke to Mighty before this event, and he said that I think the the revenge from Snipe Drone onto Ryan Oob will maybe just give them that little bit of an extra incentive in this series. And sometimes you need that. I mean, you were a player, I was a player. There are teams you just downright hate. There are players you want to make sure you beat because of X reason. It happened at the last event, or it happened three years ago. God knows, it could have happened 10 years ago. I would still want to beat certain players in the European Halo scene, right? If I had to play against them on main stage. These rivalries, they live and they breathe through Halo history. And that's what makes Halo such an incredible game to watch. Well, you speak about players that you always wanted to beat. And I remember talking to you, you and Warlord had a bit of a back and forth. And is Warlord still living rent free in that head of yours? I think I'm living rent free in Warlord's head, but I don't even know why he has to appear. He's not even here. Where are you, Stu? You should be here. You should be on one of those teams. But now it's the new blood, it's the new Europeans who are trying to show us what they're made of. And we need a response 
Well, Europe needs a response from Na'Vi here. I don't think they'll be too downhearted. I don't think they'll be beaten up here. They knew that Recharge Oddball was going to be tough. But Slayer Lifar, I think, will tell us a little bit more. If we see Rebellion dominate here, then I would start to worry about Na'Vi's chances in this series. Well, as we head into game number two then, is there a player that you have your eye on that could be the real difference maker here? We already mentioned Snipe Drone. Is there somebody else on Rebellion that can maybe be the X Factor? Well, I think that Snakey has already demonstrated he can keep up with Snipe Drone Slay. So if you have both of these players on form and firing, get the Sniper into Snipe Drone's hands. Yes, they can make this tough for Rebellion. But on the side of Rebellion, I've always already mentioned, all four of them are fantastic Slayers when they're on and when they're hot and firing. Here we go then, game two then. Navi looking to desperately tie up the series here, and Ryan Oob is going to be the first man to get his hands on that snipe rifle and secure the first open kill for his team. Mighty's 1v1 tries to back away as there was help over the shoulder of Ryan Oob, and that kill is going to be meat and drink to the experienced veteran. Navi usually impressively structured when it comes to the way they play Slayer Live Fire, but. One of the things we will always credit Rebellion is how well they break structure, how they can break that mold. Well, Ryan Oob, a lot of responsibility to stop that Overshield from being picked up. And that shot is huge because now Overshield's still going to be there. Teams and his players are going to be spawning and suddenly it's a downright dogfight once more. Snakey trying to give Ryan Oob the wiggles. Somehow, Ryan Oob stays alive and secures the kill for his team. Three dead for Navi then. Mighty's last remaining member has got two of Rebellion in his sights, gets forced pushed back and gets handled with pretty easily. No way. Oh, I was going to say, if that story had ended with Ryan Oob actually getting the overshield, then it would have been a brilliant one to watch back. But now that overshield is still going to be there. It's still going to be available. Kamea is going to be the player who gets it in the end, but it's quickly wiped. And this has been a, such a quick start to Slayer Life by here. Already 24 kills between the two teams, and it doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon. Very fast paced here. We're gonna get another overshield in 25 seconds, so barely a moment to catch your breath. All four members up for both teams. We're gonna slow down just for a moment. Mighty's will try to put a couple of shots down over on Dummy's wrap. Snakey flies out top middle. Both teams respecting one another and backing away when they need to. And if you're ever watching and you're wondering, you know, why is there overshields? Why is there camouflages? That's why, because it forces these fights. It forced that quick pace to the start of this game where both teams were desperately trying to stop the other team from getting the overshield. It wasn't even a case of we need the overshield, it was we cannot allow the other team to start to snowball out of control with these OVs. But it looks like now Rebellion in the best position to set up for the next one. They will get it. It's going to be Kamea again. Now can they start to take advantage of it? We are going to potentially see a heat wave as well. So this is going to be a little bit scary now for Na'Vi. The last two minutes of this map have been played all the way over this side of the map. I promise you folks at home, there is another side of the map, but it's all been over here on the overshield. I'll believe it when I see it. Maybe we're going to start to see a little bit of action over here now. We will indeed, as Kamea will look to push in. It does have to help, Ooh. but you know, you need the plasma pistol in someone's hands as soon as you know the overshield is going to be into the chest of another Spartan. And as you may have heard, Onset and Bravo in game number one mentioning you, we've seen a lot of changes now coming into the season. Red racks are very apparent. You are going to see certain weapons that aren't going to be spawning as quickly. So now you've got to make sure you take advantage of it when you have those power weapons in your hand. And something that we might see later on as the game, the meta starts to develop down is teams starting to use that tactically, maybe not dropping the weapon so an enemy team can maybe pick up that heat wave. Yeah, I mean, we saw dirtying weapons back throughout the old history of Halos and certainly play a factor in Halo Infinite, that's for sure. But only two kills separate these teams now. Again, I feel like Na'Vi are a better team when they're ahead, Shurs. I feel like when they're behind, they try and do a little bit too much. But if they can gain control here against Rebellion, perhaps we'll start to see a few kills going in their favor and maybe a gap to be created. Our Na'Vi desperate of just making a few mistakes and as a result of that, Rebellion really able to punish them. Only separated by three, though. But shots like that from Rain connecting on the snipe drone as he tries to get away Dummy's side. Put an extra kill in their column. 24 to 19. Just starting to squeak away here with another overshield about to pop. So again, it's going to be another scrap. There is going to be a lot of setup this time from Na'Vi, but the heat wave is going to really change things. Snipe drone does pop it in. And it's great that Na'Vi were at least able to be in a position this time to actually properly contest it. It felt like it was a little bit awkward the times prior. But quite rightly, Rebellion will retreat. They will try and deplete this overshield as much as they can, just purely through time. Snipe Drone's given chase. Finally does 
get back touch tight with Carmea gets the kill, but it's going to be a 2-2 trade. The overshield not doing the sort of damage, not having the kind of swing that you want. As these two teams still separate by three. Nine kills in the moment for Snipe Drone. He is the difference maker on this roster. I think that every player on Na'Vi deserves to be here, don't get me wrong, but... I think that Snipe Drone, the addition to Na'Vi, means that they have that X factor. They have someone who can really take the game by the scruff of the neck. I don't think he's going to be able to stay alive on this occasion. Now three go dead. And this is when we're starting to see a little bit of a gap created by Rebellion. They have a four kill lead, make it five. And if they can set up, if they can get this next overshield, it might be a little bit too late for Na'Vi. And something we noticed last year, particularly when, when D United had their really strong show in the tournament play, is they were so good on Slayer. And it was like you said, slowing the game down, making it difficult. And they're doing the same thing here. Yeah, I credited D United as being one of the best Slayers teams, if not the best Slayer team prior. And a lot of that was down to this man on your screen, Ryan Oob. The way that he sees the game and the way that he strategizes and he's got Reigns still alongside him. And now with two players who are hungry, who are going to be willing to learn, Kamea and Mental. I think as this Rebellion roster develops, it really is going to be a threat to the top teams in this, not just this region, but internationally. Going to see another overshield. Snipe Drone got the last one, but didn't do much damage. Ryan Noob then will scoop up the heat wave. We'll head over top middle then. Looks as though he's going to need some help from his teammates here. Jimbo will peek out window. Overshield coming fresh out the oven. Who's going to scoop it up? Two kills go in favor once more of Rebellion. Ryan Oops thinks the job is done. Three dead then. And another Overshield for Rebellion. Yeah, and suddenly now this gap has got a little bit too big in Rebellion with another Overshield and catching Na'Vi on a little bit of a clustered spawn situation as well. They're spawning in twos. They're not able to really get together as a full squad. They have at least been able to move together off spawn so they can get a little bit closer to watch those angles, but still, Rebellion are finding ones and twos in certain places. Again, three are dead for Na'Vi. And now Rebellion only need eight. We would have to see off spawn Na'Vi get all four dead, get an overshield, get a sniper rifle, have all the goodies to have any sort of opportunity, because at the moment, this is looking like Rebellion 2-0. What was once a gap in kills has now opened up to an entire canyon. As Snakey falls, all four dead for Navi. And perhaps that could be the second nail in the coffin. I'm a game three on the horizon here. This one looks all but done. So impressive how Rebellion have been forcing themselves onto Navi throughout these spawns. They've not really let Navi breathe at all. This should be another kill, not another kill, but I don't think it really matters. This one's sewn up, this one's done, it's dusted, and Rebellion are going to be 2 0 up, and it's just a case of when, not if. One kill required then. Will it be Rain to secure it? Jimbo takes three shots. Great experience out of Rain to back down. Ryan Yub scoops up the final kill. And it's going to be Rebellion who double their series lead. It's not going to the Na'Vi script, that's for sure. But Rebellion, they were confident as ever coming into this series as well. They knew they only had one job to do, and it was to shut down another European roster, something that Ryan Yub has been able to do many a time. But it is not quite job done in terms of the series. It's only 2-0. We've seen reverse sweeps happen. Doesn't always happen on day one, I will say, of any sort of Halo Major. But maybe this could be a little bit different. As we look at the kills, you asked me who I wanted to focus on. And I said, well, I think snakey has been performing well. It wasn't the best of games for him. Just couldn't pick up the pace. It's a, it's a difficult negative 10 to look at, that's for sure. Looking at Ryan Oop, 13, 6, and 10. And Carmea once again leading the line for his team. 16, 7 deaths and 5 assists. He's showing up. Well, as we look across to the damage, and sometimes you can tell a different story, but I think, again, you can look at the Rebellion roster, everyone playing a part in that. Maybe Mental not quite up there with the damage dealt, but he was playing his part in various different ways, whether it was kind of being aggressive on those spawns or making sure he was in areas to stop Na'Vi from getting that overshield. But I think when we look back at that game, it all starts with that no-scope from Ryan Oob onto the overshield, then picks up the overshield. Okay, he didn't pop it in his chest in the end, but that really stopped Na'Vi from gaining any momentum. It could have been so different after they had won that initial fight. Confirmation of what we have seen on our screens then. 2-1 oddball recharge. It was close, but no cigar for Na'Vi. And the Slayer was anything but close. Almost a stake with 50 to 33, and with King of the Hill, streets on the horizon. Give me more hope, Dan. I mean, I love stats, and we're going to see some stats on our screen as well, and I can go into map stats in a little minute, but we've got Rhino 
We've got Jimbo, two veterans of the scene now, but a very big difference in terms of a story on how they're performing in this series. Ryan Oop has been up there after a disappointing last qualifier as well from Ryan Oop. I remember that Imperium Slayer where he really struggled, and I think that probably would have eaten away at him a little bit. As for Jim, this is not the Jimbo I'm used to seeing. Going into game three and onward, if we can see Jimbo elevate his performance, maybe he can be the leading factor to get Na'Vi back into this series. But right now, Ryan Oop seems like he is a man on a mission. Now, you, you spoke about the stats, and you promised me even more as we head into this King of the Hill. What have you got for me, Dan? Well, King of the Hill is not necessarily Na'Vi's best game type. Great. Typically, they're better at strongholds, right? But I'll give you a little bit of hope when it comes to actually streets. That is their best King of the Hill. So that's the at least little bit of a silver lining for you for Na'Vi. However, when you look at Rebellion, they uh -oh. did not lose a King of the Hill on any map throughout the qualifiers. They really seem to nail down how they want to approach King of the Hills, whether it be how they're breaking setups, how they are setting up themselves. Their structure is insane when it comes to King of the Hill. So I probably would give this one to Rebellion, especially from what I've seen so far. Well, we had hopes and expectations that in games one and two, they were going to be really strong for Navi. And uh, I'm looking at the script, it says here, Sherzy and Dan, big up Europe and say this is their chance and opportunity. And then it says just under it, and it doesn't happen. <laughs> can, can they finally rip up the script? Uh, it just, you know, it seems to be the same old story every event. But I'm not going to put Na'Vi to the sword just yet, because it is a best of five. It is a series that can very quickly change and turn on its head after a game three. But as I did say, Rebellion, they haven't lost to King of Hill throughout the entirety of the qualifier. So it depends if you are pessimistic or if you're optimistic when you look at this series, if you are a European fan at home. But if you are, you need to send Na'Vi their energy because they haven't looked the same Na'Vi from what we saw throughout the qualifiers, that's for sure. Maybe it's just a case of they don't feel warmed up, they're not comfortable. I'll give them all the excuses in the world, I guess. But only they really know what's going wrong right now. Do we have any Jimbo subs in the chat? I'd like to see some Jimbo faces being spammed because Boy, oh boy, does he need it after that game too. He does, and I think that they'll still be confident coming into this game three. As I said, it is their best King of the Hill for Na'Vi. And I think the, the reason for that is it does play somewhat similarly to times as Stronghold Streets. Like, you can move as a team, you lock down very similar locations, you are going to play in a similar way at certain times throughout the maps. However, some King of the Hill is very different from their stronghold when it comes to the actual map for map likeness. As for Rebellion though, they look so good when it comes to King of the Hill. I love watching how they approach these games. It doesn't matter what team they were playing against, they always had an answer, they always had a strategy, and that could be bad news here for Na'Vi. Perception was coming into this tournament that perhaps Rebellion could be got at. They scraped their way into pool play, but they have shown no frailties here in their first series of the day. And they're looking to put Navi to the sword, but can the boys in black and gold turn their fortunes around? It's trade for trade right at the start of this game. Snipe drone soars out, but you don't want to be soaring out towards rain. But again, good trading. Navi listening, making sure they are putting themselves in the right position to pick up those kills and not allow Rebellion to perhaps set up as we expect them to. But Red Gun now going to be available for Mental. The Stalker Rifle just hit so, so hard, and it's going to be so important. Who can really control this weapon throughout this game? Mental really lighting up the boys on Navi here. All four dead, they go, and just Mental locking down that lane. As he moves now over towards PD. Look at the handcuff this Navi team here and now. Mighty's goes down, and Mental still making it a really difficult kill, buying more time. And look at that already. Rebellion have over half the hill that they need. But now Snipe Drone does have control of the Stalker Rifle, and now it's his turn to make a big difference. Na'Vi at least stopped Rebellion from getting a solid single point to begin with. We sometimes do see teams getting that first point on the board very consistently and very comfortably, and then it snowballs out of control because the other team is not able to really catch up. But Na'Vi have demonstrated that this is not going to be a walkover situation, and they still have life in them just yet. Snipe Drone will get taken care of, not really able to use that Stalker Rifle. As Rebellion take control once more. Starting to just ever so slightly get into the ascendancy here. Two go down for Navi. And there's something I'm getting too, all too familiar with saying right now. And you do wonder, maybe the, the phase series sucked a little bit of life out of Navi. Maybe they put so much effort into that game that a little bit of energy Perhaps is what they need now going into this second series of the day. 
We always know that any Halo tournament is a marathon, and you really have to be prepared for game after game, sometimes for long days as well. Staying sharp and on point in all of these maps and series can be difficult for more players than others, but it's going to be 1-0. Shopify Rebellion will take the first point, but Na'Vi do get all four dead, but maybe a little bit too late. Is this an opportunity then? Can Na'Vi take control of the map? Can they hold down the lanes that we spoke about? Rain getting shot in the back, but Snakey is unaware of the player position behind him. It should result in a trade, but somehow the Englishman escapes with his life, for now at least. As now Ryan Noob sets him up and takes him down, but it's going to be another trade here. Two down for Rebellion, one on the side of Na'Vi, and Snipe Drone tiptoes into the hill. Yeah, just by surviving there, Snakey made such a huge difference because Rebellion was still calling him out, and even though he did get killed, they put so much effort into trying to kill him, they exposed themselves to allow the rest of Na'Vi to take down the player comfortably. And now this is what I like about Na'Vi. They are very good at setting up on streets King of the Hill. They know how they want to prioritize certain areas here, but can they secure the point will be my biggest question. Snipe Drone just patrolling here around the ATMs. Just a little bit of timing has done him in here as a player has gone towards the stock rifle, but drop back down. Carme is in behind him now on command. Now the Bulldog not able to take sufficient chunks out of Rebellion, Rebellion and the setup's been broken wide open. And again, it's another beautiful push from Rebellion. They strategized. They almost gave them the Dipsy Doodle a little bit. They sent themselves over towards the Arcade. They made some noise. They made a little bit of a ruckus and then they suddenly darted through bottom middle and they really caught Na'Vi off guard. And now Rebellion have the opportunity to hold down and lock down this hill to try and make it 2-0. And it goes right back to my point. Na'Vi just couldn't quite get over the finish line. It was something Mighty was talking about before this event. They struggle in King of the Hill sometimes just to lock down that point. Here's Na'Vi, his Achilles heel. Coming back to bite them once more. Snakey, back base will get handled by the Bulldog. That's two dead. And Na'Vi just need a sliver of time in this hill, but it's important it don't desperate it. It's so tough because you want to just be able to stop Rebellion from picking up any serious time here, so they're not a threat for getting a point here. But now with Rockets in the hands of Ryan Oob, suddenly Na'Vi are going to be looking at this one saying, okay, we need to avoid the Rockets. If we even think about going towards this hill, are we going to get blown up? But there's some good damage coming from a distance. Ryan Oob will shoot one across, does not hit, and he will go down, but at least he gets rid of the Rockets. Ryan Oob shoots two flares, doesn't find a home. Two dead, make it three for Rebellion. And will Navi now be able to secure that final point? It looks though Mental's going to give it up and try and play from the rotate over towards Statue here. One to one, we're all tied up. Well, Navi needed that. It was looking a little bit worrying that maybe Rebellion were going to be able to hold it, lock it down over towards Station as again Mental impresses me more and more every time I see his screen. You heard Onset talking about it at 22 times Gears of War champion, but now would love to try and progress towards a Halo Championship as well. There's not many players that can talk about multiple championships across different esports titles. We're lucky enough in Halo to have them. Now we'll see whether Rebellion can get back into this game in a way that will shut down Na'Vi from any sort of thought of a comeback in this series. If I was in Mourinho here, he'd be talking about Halo heritage. That's what he'd be speaking about. And there's plenty of it at this tournament. None more so than mental, that man on your screens. With 22 championships, how old is this man? Well, he doesn't look much older than 22, I will say. So perhaps he started very early. Although Gears of War was, a, what, 16 plus? So makes it even more impressive. Nice hold down and lockdown at the moment from Rebellion. They were waiting, they were baiting. They weren't grabbing the hill time, but they said to Na'Vi, look, you come along. We don't need to at the moment. We've got a little bit of a lead. We don't have to start getting too desperate. Instead, we're going to take advantage. All four now dead. And the trap was set, and it worked perfectly. Navi attracted to the cheese. Now Carme has got the boom box over his shoulders. He's gonna play a little bit of heavy metal. Down goes Snipe Drone. Numbers advantage once more. Favor Rebellion. Two dead for Navi. Jimbo last man alive, and he is so far away he will have absolutely no influence. This should be a guaranteed point here for Rebellion. Navi are gonna have one last chance of pushing if they want to, but most likely they're gonna start thinking about setting up for this next hill. So they're gonna allow this one to go. But for Rebellion, they don't have to score it straight away. This is what's beautiful about the new way of King of the Hill in Halo Infinite ever since it was introduced, is that you can choose when to finish this point. You can get players in areas to start thinking about the next hill before you secure it. Still haven't stepped in to secure that second hill. Waiting for the pieces to all fall together here. Mighty's trying to stop that. Be a thorn. Drop wall goes down, Ryan will push the Dutchman away. Really starting to express themselves here and 
just keeping Navi at arm's length, but perhaps they've opened the door here for the boys in black and gold. They have, but they've done it on purpose. Now Navi are going to be spawning on this side of the map. Navi have to really prioritize trying to score, obviously. But it means if Rebellion get an all four dead, they stick their toes into the hill, they score the point, and then they're already set up for the next one. It could be a beautiful masterpiece of a plan, but you do put it at risk. There is the possibility that it all could go wrong, that's for sure, but now Mental may be sensing that, steps into the hill, secures the point, and Rebellion, they're 2-1 up. So 1v1 on the map for the moment. It's Jimbo against Mental. Sentinel Beam will absolutely fry the shields. That hits different on LAN, I promise you that. And it's gonna be Karmaya controlling the cafe spawns. Mighty's in PD. And he could be about to suffer the same fate as his teammate. And indeed he is. Evaporated dust looking like Thanos has just snapped his fingers. The same what was that? A fate. I put a, put a, put a H there. It's an Irish thing. I keep dropping H's, adding H's. It's a real problem. Just yeah. faith in, having faith in someone, but 2-1. Killing spree again for Mental, but is going to be eventually shut down. And the trouble is for Na'Vi, only 50 seconds remaining, sure. So this is going to be their last chance to try and pick up a hill to try and tie this game. Otherwise, Rebellion are going to walk away in this series with a 3-0. Kamea's got the Bulldog and he's doing the damage. And time is running out. Rebellion now can play this one in a way where they just watch Na'Vi run towards the hill. They slay them out over and over again and they just win 2-1. Was this the plan over on the statue side, just to eat away, almost ha having yourself an insurance policy? Yes. For 32 seconds then, two members go down once more, and this is exactly what Rebellion wanted, was to make Navi play a little bit desperate. Fairly certainly, United were one of the only teams last year to win 1-0 in King of the Hill. And I was always crediting Ryan Oob to be able to do that, but I do think he was trolling when it happened. That was over on Recharge, then it did happen. But now, 2-1, 20 seconds remaining. Rebellion will step in, but they step out, they do the hokey cokey and they turn around, and now Na'Vi have to get desperate for this hill. In Ireland, that was called the hokey pokey. You do things differently over there. 10 seconds remaining, double kill, and now Na'Vi, they're three dead. This one's done. Done and dusted, it would seem. Kermaya and Rain combine once more just to lock in one more kill before the buzzer. And with 2 1 the final score, 3 0 the series lead. It's Rebellion who claim all the points. There is no revenge tour for Snipe Drone on to Ryan Oof. Not yet, anyway. It is just poor play and things can very much change as we get into bracket play. But for Na'Vi, now their aim is to make sure they get into bracket play. Their chances of second place maybe just went down a helter-skelter as they lost 3-0. They're going to have to look to try and beat that pool play team that comes from the open bracket to try and secure themselves in the elimination bracket later on as we get into championship Saturday and Sunday. But what a performance it was from Rebellion, a very telling one. I think one of the biggest questions we had coming into this event is how are Sentinels going to look? How are Rebellion going to look? Because they were a kind of a mixed match. They were forced to make these changes, to be these teams. And I'd say both teams have demonstrated that actually they could be a real threat to the top teams in this tournament. Well, speaking about the top teams, Rebellion are going to have to play phase, and we already see Navi almost take phase the distance with a very close Empyrean game and also winning an objective game, not just a Slayer. Have we seen enough here to suggest that Rebellion could take on the big dogs in phase? I certainly think Rebellion can make it difficult for phase. I believe phase are the best team at this tournament alongside Optic Gaming, so they're still going to be the favorites. Uh, but I think that Rebellion, you know, if, if the game types go well for them, there could be a map or two there. As we look at the stats, it was Karmea who really showed what he was made of when it came to kills, but Mental with the 6k damage, they had so much fun, Rebellion, there. They were almost toying with Na'Vi at moments during that game. And there was question marks right over Ryan Oop and Rain picking up these two players, but you can see exactly why they've done it. They've seen something in these two guys with 6k damage. That is so much, and the European team just couldn't match. It's the same old story for Europe, unfortunately. It's a, it's a chance to try and break into that top eight in the early stages, but it may be the elimination bracket where Na'Vi have to make their run. It's crazy to say that already in pool play, but unfortunately, that's how the cookie crumbles. If you lose to the team that is the second seed when you are in pool, that's what can happen sometimes. But I think the biggest story here is Rebellion look like the real deal. Yeah, Rebellion definitely looking like the real deal, but maybe all of our hopes and ambitions now fall on Quadrant. Yeah, Quadrant are going to finish top eight. That's what I think. Yeah, Quadrant, maybe they could be the team, but remember, they've had changes as well. Yeah, well, that's all for us. We're going to throw it over to Lottie and the guys to break this one down.
Thank you so much, Jersey and Gaskin. Gents, my goodness me, what a showing from Rebellion right there. Uh, that's exactly the scoreline you want, delivering us our first 3-0 of the day and the tournament so far. But incredible stuff coming out of this team. And I have my eyes set on those two newest additions really here on set. What impressed you about that duo of Mental and Carmea and what they delivered, not only in the qualifiers, in the lead up, obviously to this land, but now being here and having that pressure to perform, they did just that behind us. It just looks so comfortable, like so, so comfortable, so assured in what their role was, what they were meant to do for the team. And it just looks like a classic Ryanu team. Everyone knows their role, everyone knows what's expected of them and everyone is performing to the level you would expect them to. I would say maybe Kamiya is performing even higher than the level I expected. He's an unbelievable player. Like I mentioned, the ghost of the open bracket now is becoming a problem in pool play as well. The guy was absolutely ridiculous. I think his KD across the series was probably one of the most positive we're going to see all day. It was it was nuts, but uh, also very impressed with mental, as you expect to be. Like, like we're going to keep harping on about, you know, he's a 22-time champion. He knows how to win games. He's also, you know, a professional in multiple games, not just Halo. So he knows what he needs to do, and he just looks so calm and assured. I think when you're playing with two players like Ryan Uber Rain, who have been there, done that, they're just the perfect fit. It, it's such a smart pickup from those two players, and everything is working the way you would expect it to. Indeed. Now, Clutch, play of the match, Rebellion, decision-making, the patience coming forward, really pushing them above Na'Vi in these game-making situations. Yeah, I wanted to pop, highlight this one just because, I mean, this series, it's done and dusted by this point, but I want to show just a little bit of the highlight that Ryan New kind of brings to this Rebellion roster, this strategy of almost scoring this point. Take a look at the clock. It started with two minutes and three seconds left when they had it to this the bar this full. They decide to continue to slay. They decide not to score it. And what they're doing is just making the win conditions for Na'Vi almost impossible by the time this rotates to Shotgun Hill. They've got a minute and so on the clock. And as long as Rebellion are able to keep them out of that hill, keep it neutralized, even if Na'Vi score that hill, that bottom mid hill is going to take you into overtime. I mean, Rebellion do such a good job to try and create meta all the time. We praise Ryan Noob. It's beautiful to see Ryan Noob. Different team, same influence, same impact. We have a few new map mode combinations coming into this tournament. Wouldn't be shocked if Ryan Noob's team had a leg above every other team in those. So if those come into crucial play against a much better team, a, a bigger series, you could look for a couple upsets to happen with this team and how well they're playing. It's always the small things of Ryan Noob as well that I just noticed throughout the series that other players maybe just overlook for just a second, right? It's like just small things. Like when the overshield was coming up on live fire, instead of like holding the angle, Ryan Noob knew there was a player in front of him, so he just went and collected two extra nades. Just yep. to throw it. Like some players don't even think of that. Like it's two nades, frag nades that spawn bottom tower. What's the best way to hold people off for the OS? Just throwing nades down there. So it's just those tiny little things that all add up, even on the pushes, going to get in a drop ball. All these little things add up and make it such more of a success rate. Your, your success rate is going to increase if you have these little things to work with. And again, just mastery of the game. Yeah, it certainly was indeed. I got to say, you know, poor showing from Na'Vi there, especially coming quite hot off phase as well. Uh, but I think a little bit more organization from that team around power ups, the, the sandbox, just getting back in the zone and knowing what you want to do and, and how to dictate things for your team. Uh, a couple of cleanups and I think Na'Vi hopefully will be back into it as well. Well, folks, we're going to head to a quick break right now. But when we come back, we will be seeing our next matchup on that main stage. We're going to be seeing Quadrant versus Sentinel. So more Europe, more NA battling it out right behind me. We'll see you in a few. All the smoke to Boo Boo Doo. Nice night there out of Swish. Nice triple kill for Swish. Looking for the over. I'm going to boot him. There's just something about that radical when it starts moving like that. No! Oh! Kill Rexy! Killing Frenzy for Royal 2! Oh, it's a Royal 2! Stop this man! We will have that all right. Take oh. both of it. Do it again! Let's Let's do, do it again! again. Genuinely sets out and truly believes he's going to be a world champion. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. It's to watch if you like that aggressive playstyle. He's kind of the guy who is always leading the front oh. here. But native Fred, and he can do stuff like that as well. Oh. Oh. oh my god. Yeah, as soon as you see one, you know the reinforcements are coming quick. So you better get that trade, or you better take some cover. Collect the metal. There's two. Go for three. That's formal, baby. Let's see what he can do with a little bit of 
double kill. Hail Mary gets a triple kill. Snake Bite's looking for the overkill. Odin ties it. Big time overkill for Snake Bite. So they're again in a moment. Loser. Stop that. You felt the animal. Takes down one. He takes down two. And they know where the last two players are as well. Snake Bite, you're dead as well. Make it an overkill. Overkill for Jimbo. Talk about Cloud9. Talk about the slice process had so much success. It's found the missing piece they need as he's making play after play, play after play. You got the heat, you've got the snipe. Oh, it's all headshots for Snake Point. Oh, big time snipe out of Stellar, and that's gonna close the door in game number one as Cloud9. This is a great, great position for G1 right now. This has to pick off these players, they have the angles. This is the damage. I liked everything that Boo 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 did there. Give him the overkill! And Boo Boo take my Doo Boo once again, baby! Orlando with the seconds, and now the journey is complete! Optic Gaming! The green wall stands tallest! As we're just a few moments left. Wait! Wait a second, you're Wait one a of second! Eight. Celebration even on the stage for Optic Gaming. They thought it was over. C9 was in the hill the whole time. APG was shaking. He couldn't believe it. They forced a reset there in overtime for just a few extra seconds. Optic had no idea. We had no idea. And in the end, now we can say that Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions. I mean, we said, right? This has been the craziest week. The craziest tournament of all time. What other way would you have it end? But now that we are finally at its conclusion, Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions! This is the world's most advanced processor. In entertainment, its rendering speeds render other processors obsolete. It drives the future of autonomous driving, powers cloud services for billions, helps change the course of climate change, connects communities of gamers anytime, anywhere, and uses AI to accelerate disease detection and cures. We make the world's most advanced processors, but only with your vision can we advance the world. AMD, together we advance. Welcome back, folks, to the HCS Kickoff Major, live from Charlotte, North Carolina. We have had two series under the belt so far, and Rebellion have delivered us the first 3-0 of the weekend, and they're looking primed to take on whoever comes their way next. It's an absolute halo celebration in here in the Charlotte Convention Center. Incredible stuff across the board, but I'll tell you what, I've got somebody more incredible on my desk. Joining us is Ryan Noob from Rebellion, coming hot off that 3-0. Ryan, so good to have you on the desk. Good to see you. Congratulations on that epic, epic series that we just watched. I want to ask you about this team, how you feel about it. We've been talking about Kamea and Mental and you know what you guys can do and the dynamic of your team. Talk to you about how you guys got together and how you're feeling. Oh my goodness, there's a long story that goes there, but <laughs> I just think I picked up two of the best uh, amateur players in the game and uh, really found some talent that I could help mold. And, and uh, the best thing about this is we all love each other. Like this is a team that really, like we could yell at each other and like smile while doing it and everyone's laughing afterwards. Cause we know we're not serious. We know we're not actually upset. And uh, so anytime that we have any critics, we, we go hard at it, but we're still love at the end of the day. 
So going up against a team like Navi, I felt like you guys were going to be the favorites going in there. You accomplished the goals. The 3-0 in fashion was uh, honestly a better performance than I almost anticipated. Next year, you're going to have to deal with FaZe. And that's a completely different beast, where, especially when you're talking about individual skill level, right? Is that something that concerns you going up in that series, especially with, I would say, like the newer players on your team? Like knowing that you have some skill, does FaZe's skill like worry you? And if so, what are you going to be able to do in order to like counterbalance some of the individual skill that they have? Yeah, of course, FaZe's skill is worrying me, right? They're, they're <laughs> really good. Uh, no, at the same time, it's just, it's our game. You know, it's, it's always been on our teams. It's, it's always been our game. And if we can execute our game, if we can do it well, then we'll beat the teams that we shouldn't be able to beat. You know, we got second at the first event, third at the second, you know? So it, it's a lot about that. Yep. And uh, yeah, beating Na'Vi, I mean, Usually I'm pretty bad against the European teams. We usually we struggle a lot, but this series was pretty strong out of us. I was really happy. Very. And about the worrying, it, it, something really caught my eye. 18 year old Carmea walks on stage, sitting down, getting ready. You think nerves, right? And he walks up. I said, he says, it's not really that. I, I thought I'd be nervous here. I, yeah. th I, I thought you know some. I would feel something, but no, it's just Halo, right? We just sit down and play some Halo. So if we can play our game, then you know who knows how far we can go. I absolutely love to hear that confidence coming out of them, coming on the main stage. And to be honest, he wasn't lacking any confidence in terms of his stats and what he produced. There was just absolutely incredible. Ryan, I've got to ask you about your Halo brain because when it comes to your name in Halo, everybody knows you like to change the meta. You play your own game. We've seen so many iterations of teams and how you perform. Talk to me about getting Carmea and, and Mental into that same rhythm and how you want to play Halo Infinite, especially coming into the second season. Oh, it was great. It was It's something that I haven't really had in a long time where I have two players who didn't have a preconceived idea on how to play the game. So anything that I'm talking about, anything I want to talk to them about, they, they pick it up instantly. Um, maybe not instantly sometimes, but you know, they're not, there's not really any adversity towards what we're talking about and towards what we want to do. And it's all about learning on how we want to play together as a team. I love all of that. Well, Ryan, I'm not going to take up any more of your precious time. I know you need to get back there, get ready for your next uh, set of competition, but thank you so much for the time and, and joining us and giving us some insight here on the desk as well. We really appreciate you. GG's and good luck on the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Ryan. What an absolute angel for coming up here. And Clutch, we have another match to talk about. Sentinels versus Quadrant, another battle of NA and Europe. Now, when we look at that Quadrant roster, I'm a little bit worried about them. Obviously not coming in with their full iteration, their full team taking on Sentinels, who, yes, had a bit of a difficult ride against Optic earlier on, but hoping to bounce back and do it right here against Europe. What do you think about this matchup? I think it's going to be tough for Quadrant to stay in this series without Chick. I mean, arguably the best player from Europe. It's going to be a, a, a masterpiece to try and push this series games four and game five. I haven't been able to see this quadrant play, obviously, with the substitution. But what we saw from Sentinels earlier today against the Green Wall was a very strong performance. I expect Sentinels to get the job done here. If they want an opportunity to still compete at this tournament, and I mean like go the distance, potentially playing in the grand finals, Sentinels have to win series against this quadrant roster. My expectations are going to be that Sentinels get the job done. How impressive do they do it? We could learn a lot about how dominant the Sentinels team is going to be compared to the rest of the pack, as opposed to the Optic Gaming series we saw earlier. Indeed, we got Gaskin jumping on that far part of the desk here. Lovely to have you with us, Dan. Looking at Sentinels right now, and obviously our lower third here, chemistry, it is very much a key factor for this team. And we've talked about would they settle down, you know, post qualifiers not going their way? Is land going to be the place that we see these guys find their feet? What did you make of their first showing against Optic? I was pleasantly surprised. I must say, I was a little bit worried after seeing some results online, and maybe there's a little bit of shakiness here or there, but I think against an Optic Gaming roster that you'd expect to be polished coming into the first tournament. They actually showed up. They made it very difficult for Optic and they took a map. And I will say, as we look at this series, I mean, game type wise, it's very good for Sentinels. Spoiler alert, Quadrant are going to struggle here because Sentinels, the games they've got coming up, some of their best throughout the qualifiers. Okay, I love that. I mean, we're going to see Sentinels obviously take the hit there in terms of the rotations. But, you know, Clutch, looking at this roster, we said coming into this weekend that that first match was going to tell you everything you needed to know about this Sentinels roster. What did you need to know?
know, what did you get from that first match? I wanted to see if Sentinel's individuals were playing well enough to get them to a certain point in this bracket where they're going to be able to separate themselves. And I think that they were all playing pretty well individually going into that series against Optic. You have to be winning gunfights against the best team in the world. And Sentinels were winning their fair share of the gunfights. They actually outslayed them in game four, arguably should have been able to take it to a game five if they were a little bit more efficient in the objective department and could hold a setup. But on the bright side, when you're able to compete with Optic individually, going up against teams like Quadrant, you're going to outperform those individual fights. I'm looking at Collect to really have a stand-up series here, making himself a superstar in this league. I feel like he's got to take over series like this. Indeed, and looking to take over the main stage is Quadrant. You know, despite the fact that they are a man down, bringing two Foxy in on the last minute. You know, really, really unfortunate situation there for Chick. And I got to ask you, Gaskin, what is it going to be like for this roster to have somebody like Chick out for the count here? Because it's very, very difficult to adapt last minute, let alone with obviously the language barrier that's going to come through as well. They've got used to calling out in French. They're going to have to revert back to that kind of mixed lingo as well. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on it because that is going to be the biggest difference. They're going to be calling out in English rather than French. And that was one of the main reasons why Quadrant made this change, right? They had Snipe Drone previously. They were calling out in English. Now you've got this French roster. But 2 Foxy is an excellent addition to this squad. If you're going to get anyone that can do what Chick does from an Englishman, I think that Foxy maybe wasn't given as much of an opportunity in some of the teams that he has had. Now he's going to have room to really show what he's made of in his slaying ability. Back in the day, Foxy was one of the best individual talents that Europe had to offer, but I don't think we've ever seen that in Halo Infinite. Absolutely. I've got to say, though, looking at all four of these players, great, obviously, individual talent here. But Clutch, who are you looking at to really have to step up in this series? Is it going to be two Foxy who has come in for Chick, or are you looking at one of the other three to really have a step up series? Well, I'm glad you limited it to those three, because I was looking at Jesus Christ up on a cross. I'd be saying prayers if I'm a Quadrant <laughs> fan here. Legend, you got to step up. You got to pop off. It's got to be you. Uh, and he needs a superstar performance. I do believe that Legend is the best player in Europe. Chick is right there with them, though. And with the lack of Chick on this team, I don't think there's any Englishman that could represent what Chick would do in that game. Unfortunately, show goes on, brother. So, two Foxy, let's see what you got. But, Legend, we're going to need a big performance out of you. Would you agree with that there, Gaskin? I mean, Snipe Drone did a lot of similar stuff that Chick was able to do as well, if we look at like for likes from French to English. But I do love that we've got to a point where we have some of the best players in Europe are French, some are English. And I'm, you know, I'm very disappointed we don't get to see Quadrant at their full strength, because I really do think this was the god squad that Europe was trying to put together for an entire season. Uh, but now Foxy's going to have to step up to the plate. These guys, they still know how to play the game. They will still have gone through strategy, and they will still be prepared, quite rightly, underprepared comparatively to how they would have been. But they can still still certainly put up a fight here. Now we've talked about comparisons an awful lot here, you know, comparing who has the better game types and maps and modes. Obviously Quadrant are going to take that one, but then Sentinels have been looking to try and find their footing and try and actually be dynamic as a team with the chemistry. You know, Clutch, when you're looking at the comparisons here, who do you see having the edge? Are you looking at the roster who has had to have a last minute addition come in? Or are you looking at Sentinels? Yes, the maps and modes don't favor them, but they have been together the entire way through the qualifying. Yeah, the issue here is that Sentinels has been like underperforming. So they're looking for something like this series in particular to turn their entire dynamic around, to turn like their momentum and get the ball rolling. They need a nice convincing win. And Quadrant, they, they're going to look like roadkill in this series. The game types do not matter to me. I know, Dan, you already said Sentinels are favored in a lot of these game types. But with, the, with a sub on your team, you don't even know what your strong game types are on the side of Quadrant. Sentinels, I'm looking at this to be a dominant fashioned win. Recharge off ball is maybe something that Quadrant can get ahead of because Sentinels weren't very e efficient in their objective against Optic earlier today. But I expect it to be a lot easier when you're not playing against the likes of Lucid, APG, and company. Well, do you know what? I, t I totally listened to the wrong part of what you said, Gaskin, earlier on. I thought it had favored Quadrant, but you're right. It does favor Sentinels here. Talk us through how, in fact, it does. I mean, actually, they've only, throughout the qualifiers, they've only lost one of these maps once, and that was Oddball Recharge. Every other map here for Sentinels is flawless. It's 100%. They didn't lose Imperium at all throughout qualifiers on Slayer or Capture the Flag. So when you look at series layouts, everything's going towards Sentinels. And I think that makes things go from bad to worse for a Quadrant roster who not only have had to make a change, but now are looking at Sentinels on arguably one of the best series layouts they could have asked for. Indeed. I, I've got to ask on the side of Sentinels, though, we talk about, uh, you know, 
players stepping up and having to step up and have a really big series or a big game. Who are you looking at on that Sen roster? Because so far, Spot has really been doing some massive, massive things, winning huge pivs, but also heads up plays that we actually went through earlier on. Is it going to be Spartan again here for you, Clutch, or is there somebody else? Well, I mean, you got playmakers across the board on this team, right? I think anybody can statistically pop off. What I want to see from Sentinels is some efficiency. I want to see some good Halo play by this team, some cohesiveness. Show me that your strategy, your communication is on point, and that when you're given an opportunity to have complete map control, you can hold a setup. You can cap a flag when you get four down. Things like that are going to be so pivotal to showing me that, hey, the ball's rolling in the right direction because we know Spartan, we know Kuwait. Like, they're going to be hitting like no scope doubles and making plays and openings and opportunities in that situation. It's a matter of can this Sin team be on the same page well enough to cohesively get the job done against a lot stronger of opponents down the road. And if you can do it against a less like strength of opponent, that shows me that you can do that same Repl like replicate that same strategy against the higher level opponents. You just need those situations to fall into your hands. Yeah, indeed. And falling into our hands is going to be the battle of that global right on the backstage right there. I'm very excited to see these two go head to head. We do have our casters ready to talk to you about both of these teams. We have Walshie and Tony. Over to you, lads. Woo! Feels good to be here at the HS Charlotte Major kickoff. Oh. Oh my gosh, I'm excited to be here. Quadrant, Sentinels, how are you feeling, Dave? I'm feeling great for this series. I mean, there was a couple question marks surrounding both these squads. We saw some of those questions answered in that first series with Sentinels taking on Optic. Sentinels look really strong in my eyes. They answered a lot of those questions. Yes, they felt Optic, but we're talking about the 2022 World Champions here. Whereas this is kind of that squad of misfits, kind of like, not exactly like a leftover squad, but like that Motley crew, as we've been saying, there's, there's such strong talent in here, and how do they gel together? And from what I saw, especially in that Argyle CTF right off the gate against Optic, they look good. Yeah, I was really excited to watch, you know, Collect really come into his own. Those nasty nose skills were really dominating in that Argyle game number one. Even Spartan stepping out and being that main slayer. I know he's been having trouble getting used to his sensitivity. Clearly he found something that works for him because he was slaying out all series long. Yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, I would say when I look at Spartan's POV, he's always so on point when it comes to his shooting, his ability. So to hear he's even doing those little fine tunings to make that even more deadly, it's just a scary thought. The other scary thought is, is Spartan to get his own head? You know, he's gotta get out of there. He really has it on the other side, you know, Quadrant coming in. So I kind of didn't mention that to Desk. I've had high expectations for Quadrant coming in and, you know, they, they had a big substitute in, uh, two, in, in two Foxy coming in. Some big shoes to fill. To, uh, Chick was that secondary slayer, that, that dirty work player. Can two Foxy really fill those shoes? I mean, it's got to be the opportunity and roller coaster of a lifetime here for two Foxy. If I recall correctly, after the online qualifiers, I remember two Foxy saying, well, our run ends there. This is rough. And now getting that second chance to say, all right, I get a chance to compete in Charlotte with a top squad here. Let's do this. We're gonna take a look at the series layout here, but uh, Sentinels versus Quadra coming up next, and this pool is, is, is just gonna be so tough, so much competition, and going into Oddball Recharge, which I would say normally favors Sentinels to begin with, but the fact that the substitute's coming in, the fact that we're not sure what we're gonna receive from Quadra, Sentinels really have to come out, I would say even 2-0 here, they're already a great Oddball Recharge team to begin with. Yeah, I mean, getting that 2-0 start would be great, but ultimately, I look at all those game modes, and I see four out of five being very snowball -y. I see the only one that's really not a big snowball game mode as Aquarius CTF, but we are going to kick it off here. Recharge Oddball. We got Sentinels versus Quadrant. Let's kick it off with these two teams. All about controlling the sandbox. Shock Rifle, Camouflage. Add a couple of reposts, a little bit of grapple in there. Make sure you control out that glass or that tower side. Who's it going to be? Sentinels. Is it going to be Quadrant? Game number one is on the way. Cody, you just listen up all the weapons there and add-ons. I'm like, all right, if you were selling me a car, I would buy it. You're like, you know, I'm going to throw in power windows. Okay. I'm going to throw in uh, DIC back windows. I'm going right. to throw everything. Okay. <laughs> I'm not buying anything from you. I don't, I don't, I don't trust you, man. <laughs> Kate Nick, though, snatching up that shock rifle and the camouflage combination. One of the most dangerous combinations that we have here at Halo Infinite. Yeah, and with that shock rifle, look at how careful he's playing. Just realizing that time is on his side as long as he just stays alive, 
get some damage across the map. His team is going to take advantage of it and go flying. But look at that! Desperately, he was going to try to grapple the ball and just eliminate it right away. That's the opening quadrant needs. Not only did they take care of that camel player and grapple player, they took out the shock rifle. I love that idea by King Nick Sandy was executed by the best of Squadron coming in with the quickness. And Zika even able to take down one to the grave with us. So a big trade by him. Two bots are going to move that ball. And I'm also going to count that one as an insta. Technically, that got exploded off the very first one. We got our first insta of Charlotte <laughs> that gets cast. You know that makes me happy. If Dave calls it an insta, I'm going to call it an insta. That's fine by me. <laughs> Off screen. SOG and Ledger getting back-to-back -back kills, but Spartan answering right back over toward the bottom mid side. The map snatches up that three pulse, and now some excellent flank shots onto Sika, but Sika somehow stays alive. Sika stays alive, but also a little surprised in there how Spartan didn't expect the rest of the players to come out from elevator. See that one last player over in elevator? You're not blocking those spawns. He exposed his back for that brief moment in time to potentially get punished from catwalk or from top elevator. Well, that's the play that King Nick wanted to do. Spartan now gonna snatch that ball up with that grapple. We do see off the screen, Legend and SLG trying to push him onto the gold side, and they're gonna get back to that kill. King Nick and Lethal end up going down. That's the first kill they need, but of course, Spartan drops that ball and immediately puts in the wall. And look at that difference there in those up close melee battles. You're gonna see this much different here on land compared to online. These players aren't gonna get those lunges, they're not gonna know exactly when they can hit that. So you saw how smart danced perfectly, allowed that player to whip the melee, and took zero damage from a melee there to get that first kill. But a big double kill out of the man that hour two, Foxy. Not only able to get that camouflage, but able to put it to work immediately as well as he looks to move over toward that gold side. Ball is coming with them. Quadra get into their early setup, and they're gonna take the early lead here. I like this play. It looks like they're just clearing this path through long haul and prepping rotation so they can play ball this if they need it. That's all the info that they needed. They saw another player weak over in the pit. They had the C plat, and now they have two options. Hold in pipes or rotate it over towards C plat. Two Fox have a lot of responsibility here, holding on to the A side. Multiple members of Sentinels now pushing up over towards the long haul. And that ball rotation was cut off though, Tony. What I thought was originally a great clearing. Sika gets caught off guard over in that trippy corner. And now because of it, they weren't able to revert that ball back over towards Pipe. Luckily, Quadrant had the slaying ability and they clear off all four members of Sentinels to get control of that ball. Hey, the best game plan is Offense, offense, <laughs> offense, and if you wipe the enemy team, it doesn't matter. It's Quadrant once again getting that ball into the early side C setup. And of course, Legend with the shot rifle body shot gonna connect King Nick and some going down. A second one's gonna challenge Legend being so sneaky around the pool, working the pool like he knows what he's doing. Somehow, Legend's alive. He's controlling the tower side. He's gonna line it up, but. Sadly, Lethal was on the end of that one. I was going to say, totally threw off Lethal. Here in America on the roundabouts, we go clockwise, whereas here's just running oh, counterclockwise. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah. uh, I just got my right. mind all jumbled there. Actually, we do go counterclockwise, but moving on here, we're going Lethal and the Shock Rifle. Take it over this catwalk Woo! and gets a sick shot over on Legend. So much damage across the map. Last player alive. Lethal's too smart. He is not going to challenge that one to the death, but still going to be a nuisance towards that player, over towards Batteries. Legend wasn't able to take down Lethal with that shock rifle, so Lethal takes it right back and puts it to work, collect, stealing the camouflage, and here comes Sentinels, ready to take the lead. Collect the nine axes over to the long side. The commando shots are gonna connect. Sika ends up going down. Sentinels hold on to the setup. Also, such great aim there from Collect and that first fight. Generally, if you do a grenade lead on somebody and it doesn't do any damage, you're expecting at least a little bit to be on there. And so sometimes your shots might be a little jostled or a little windmilly. Instead, collect just laser beaming those shots. Speaking of laser beaming, <laughs> Lethal coming in, beaming everybody with the shot by well, I thought he was an objective player. He'd be slammed like this. I didn't know. He is just putting up big, big numbers already with eight kills on the board. Almost make that nine and look at that. <laughs> what a nice right, three pulls to stay alive there from Lethal. In a situation where most people trade out that death to stay alive, Lethal repulses away, gets that sick kill on CSLG, and continues to lay down damage via nuisance here to this quadrant roster. <laughs> Why would they leave that man when he's playing like this? They gonna try to come back over the Sentinel. Lethal <laughs> slaying out right now. 11 and eight. 
Kaindix still manning that ball time as well as Sentinels are moving into the end game. Just 10 seconds away, Spartan dropping the people's elbow quick. Sentinels looking unstoppable, but Quadrant are going to steal that ball and try to play it off. Great rotation by them. Great rotation by Quadrant indeed. Oh, Generally the position that Spartan was going to get control of, that catwalk, is very strong if your team already has the ball over at glass. However, as soon as your team loses that position, as soon as you lose the ball, you now are spawning the exact opposite corner across the map. So it's a fine, delicate balance. It can be the perfect setup, or it can be the perfect spawn trap for your team to get stuck in. Full map control is so hard to hold on to, but Sentinels managed to come off of the spawn, get the slays they were looking for, steal that ball, and now round number one, go to the boys in red. Sentinels taking the first one. And they looked so, so good there as they closed out that first round. It looked a little shaky. There was a lot of times where Quadrant getting the kills, but as time went on, Sentinels out slaying, out maneuvering the objective, and going out strong. Lethal, however, to a slow start there here in round number two. SLG getting the better of him over in control and getting that strong position. Looks like King Nick now has Camel. Let's see what he can do. Yeah, King Nick so far not starting off the way you would want him to. It'll be in 12 performance so far. Seven assists, so you know, I like that. And I like him with the camouflage, but trades out his life. Not what you want with a camo. You don't want to trade, but one kind of silver lining there, though, Tony, is that if King Nick is going 3-12 and 12 and you're still winning the round, that's a great sign, because what's going to happen as soon as King Nick picks it up? What happens when he goes even or starts out slaying like we see him do consistently? While all that happens, Collect rips off a nasty double kill and somehow stays alive despite being one shot that entire time. Collect still holding on to this gold side angle here as multiple members of Quadrant trying to push up. Legend comes in. SLG tries to come with the bait and switch. Legend didn't have the help he was looking for. And somehow Collect takes down two. The third one is going to fall. That is a breakdown by Quadrant. Collect holding true to his name. I've been recently watching Sandman and they called some of the serial killers collectors and Collect is just taking names and bodies with the most kills on the board in this game. Collecting skulls right now is more like it is party. <laughs> Comes in to clean up some of the pieces here, but luckily Quadrant are able to rebound, push right back over toward the gold side, and now they have the control and have that early ball time in hand. 20 seconds or so until active camouflage comes up. Can Quadrant somehow get the ball and camo at the same time? Uh, it's gonna be a tough order. Down a person here against Sentinels as it's popping up. And this is the second time we're seeing that Sentinel, or sorry, Quadrant having that oddball stuck over near the trippy spot. This time they're able to rotate it out just fine. But it goes to show that a couple times when they're trying to rotate the ball from glass over towards long haul or the reverse, they've been getting snagged. So that means they either need to get a little more control before they rotate the ball or just rotate the ball a little faster. Once again, Sentinel is able to get away with another camouflage. This is going to be a pivotal one as two bots have no idea what he's coming oh. from. Return to center. Sparty drops a nasty double kill. Oh, he's not no. done. Three go down here for Quadrant. Sparty got that dog in him. That was so sick by Spartan the dog. Two times back to back, throwing out that plasma and repulsing it as a fastball across the map. Single handedly getting control on the map here for the Sentinels roster. If you recall, when Spartan had that camo, it was a 2v4 scenario. Somehow Sentinels got that camo, but because of those sick back to back plays, Sentinels in a strong, strong position. Far coming in quick, able to take down Sika. That's two down for Quadrant here, but Sentinel still had to clear out this gold side, and Nades are coming in left and right. Despite this, it looks like an excellent shot by Sparty. You can't stop all those grenades coming at you. It looks like Collect's gonna get chased down, so Quadrant chased all of Sentinel off their yard. And now manning that top last time, manning that gold side of the map. Yeah, and this is a good time for Quadrant to pull through, but they have, in my eyes, limited time until King Nick comes online. You highlight before in that first round, only three kills. It's three and 12. So, well, so far to start off this round number two, not so different. I believe it's a one or two kills and eight deaths here in round number two for King Nick. So, you know, we got to highlight the good with the bad. And so far, King Nick, it's not reflecting well on the scoreboard. Hopefully, King Nick will be able to bounce back here, and hopefully, Quadrant can 
take advantage of this because it's only down 0-1 as round, still looking to tie things up. But that the camouflage is coming up in Quadrant to find the frags they were looking for. Finally, we should see a camouflage in the hands of Quadrant. And on top of that, they have the A side set up here. Quadrant have woken up. Nice A side setup. The important key here to this A side setup is deciding if you have to play bullet back towards the bottom center pit or if you get an opportunity to rotate it through pipes. A couple times for Quadrant, anytime we see them try to rotate it through, it hasn't been successful. But look at this charge from Sentinels. They break through the elevator setup. Quadrant does not get the play ball. And now Sentinels are going to have an elevator setup. But a straight nade from Quadrant ends up taking down his own teammate right there. So. Really fortunate for Sentinels as Lethal breaks right through an excellent response coming out of them as they look to take back the lead, but Quadrant still only 12 seconds away from taking this round. But yeah, you have to wonder what if, if Quadrant played that ball in the bomb center, wherever they spawned across the map, they could have contested this. They would not be having to charge across Catwalk. Here comes Two Foxy in a very revealed position, and it's just a matter of time before Two Foxy gets picked on off. Well, look at this. Push it from above, push it from below. All angles coming in here for Quadrant. And it seems like Sentinels don't have the control across the map that I assume they did, and that setup gets broken off once again. Lethal was able to drop that ball and do damage onto multiple players, but Sentinels not able to clean up those pieces here. So Quadrant break through. They're able to play that ball, and it's a no man's land, so that ball going to be used as bait at the moment here. Who's going to get first hands on it? And that's exactly what you want to do. As soon as you start to lose control, play that ball in the seventh map. Give your teammates all across the map a position to be a factor and to punish someone going for the ball. The whole goal is just to get a numbers advantage. At some point, if you can force the enemy team to be on the bomb side of the map, or forcibly put one of their players in a bad position, grab the ball where you can pick them off and punish them from touching the objective. That's the best you can do in a bad situation. The camouflage coming up here in 10 seconds, collect. Despite the fact going to get the nasty strafe right there, he kept that reticle center and able to finish off his kill, but now has two more members pushing up over toward the long haul side. Luckily, he was just a decoy. Kate Nick steals camo. Somehow, Collect also getting away there. When I saw him round the corner with two <laughs> members from Quadrant there, I was like, all right, Collect's going to the death screen, but somehow his movement's so quick and rapid that able to round that corner and get away and buy time for his teammates. Still looking across the plays. King Nick, stronger performance. One also thing to keep in mind is King Nick has been that strong OBJ player for his team this entire game. Most time on the board for his team, most time on the OBJ this game. Surprised to see King Nick with that camouflage and the oddball, because he's just putting a beacon on your head here. They, they passed that a little while ago. And <laughs> Not the same fine. as like the flag you know one. What? Like sometimes you do the flag camo run, people are like, I can't hit you. Like that's been kind of like a new, a new strategy here in matchmaking. Well, here it is. King Nick forced to play the ball off the map, but just four more seconds needed a minute and 23 seconds on the clock for Quadrant to try to make a miracle happen here. Collect with the plasma pistol, gonna deny access to this ball because you know there's two members on his left side, almost able to take down the first one with that nade. Luckily, his teammates have his back. The cleanup crew comes in. Both teams are two down. This next kill, so important. So smart there by Lethal as well, or interesting play by Lethal as he knows that player's behind the battery. He decides just to reposition. Doesn't want to get stuck and be a city duck over at the top elevator. But here we go, two Foxy, what? seven points away from scrapping up these last few seconds. I don't see anyone in position here from Sentinels. We got ourselves a tie game, Tony. There it is. Quadrant forced that play ball over towards the seaside. They played damn near perfect Halo in order to take over the gold side of the map and they steal that round away. Round number three, anything could happen here. Both these teams have gotten to see starting strats from each other. Here is the final round, though. One of these teams walking away with a victory here on Oddball. And who has had the bang starts? At the beginning, I feel like it's been Quadrant. I feel like Quadrant's been winning those major engagements over towards Control and C-Plat. But this time, we see two members of Quadrant fall. Legend falls, arguably the greatest player on their squad. Now, our Sentinels will be able to take advantage of this. They have the camo. They have the numbers. They need to get the ball. My question for you, is that man a sub or a starter? Because I see 27 <laughs> kills, 13 assists, 30 seconds worth of ball time, two Foxy, too good in this matchup so far, and a thorn in the side of Sentinels, a large reason why they were able to take round number two. Got an opportunity and making the most of it. Mm -hmm. Not only just going for those slays, you also see two Foxy putting 30 points of OBJ on the board. 
making sure it's a team player because I feel like you can slot in a really good player on oh. any of these squads, and if they really want to be selfish, they can put up good numbers. What you know about playing OBG? What, you, 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 I bet you were a stat back in your day. I bet, I bet you never touched the objective. Somebody I, I, had to do the dirty work, Tony. Somebody had to do yeah, the dirty, yeah. dirty work. I don't know. I saw you flanking all the time. I saw you, all, <laughs> I saw you always in the base on pit. I didn't see you shooting nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we had a little technical difficulty there, so we'll get a ruling here from the TOs in just a moment. But we got ourselves a series. We got ourselves a game, so I'm excited to see how these two continue to battle out when we get back in. Yeah, I was really excited to see Sentinels and how they're going to play on their first man, because it's, like you said, a motley crew, a very interesting crew, you know? I, I thought it was going to take them some time to really get into their own, to, be, uh, to, to become that top 12, top 6, maybe even a top 4 team, but so far, I feel like they're looking good. On the other side, I thought Quadrant, you, you're bringing the last minute substitute I thought they were going to struggle as well, but so far Sentinels and Quadrant really taking advantage of the opportunities that were given to them. That is all great points, Tony. But what we're going to do real quick while they are getting all set up here is we're going to jump into a match going on at the B station. It's okay. going to be Believe the Hype versus Luminosity. We'll see where they're at as soon as we jump on in. It looks like they are kicking off here on game number one. BTH up 1-0. Do you believe the hype? Do you believe the hype, Walshi? I uh, I don't know if I'm a full believer. <laughs> I, you know, I I'm a I'm a appreciate the hype kind of guy. Believe the hype, bone, ironical, precision, and monster going up against Luminosity, Bullet, Atzo with Chia Drift, and Noble. Luminosity recently losing their top player and tapping buttons over toward that native white squad. Meanwhile, believe the hype's looking to come into their own here on land, trying to replicate that same success that you've seen them in the online qualifiers and bring it to land. Yeah, and it's totally possible. I mean, we're also seeing some of these Gears players and other top players from FPSs coming over and showing their prowess here in Halo. Precision, just dominating with 18 kills so far this game, helping BTH to their one round lead over Luminosity. It's funny because Precision normally playing for Hawaii. That connection ain't all that good, you know. He ain't out there. He ain't out there in Texas. You know what I mean? Like but now we're coming into land. He's like, oh, the shackles are off. That is super impressive because it's pretty rare that we hear, you know, obviously internet connection does make a big difference in your development as a player growing up because, you know, you, your performance is better. You get used to what you can and can't do on land. And to see Precision playing at likely a strong disadvantage over such a long period of time. And then come out to land and just like you said, unleashing those shackles, just coming out and dominating, saying, oh, guess what? I don't have a 100 plus ping now. You're gonna have to get four shot by me instantly. So far it's 1-0 in rounds right now. Believe the hype, have the advantage over Luminosity. They also have that ball in hands, rotated toward the long haul side and Bone chasing away the only player in position to stop that ball. So excellent teamwork and excellent angles being taken here by Believe the Hype. Look at Bo Max rotating this over towards C, looking like a well-oiled machine here. And knowing that there's a bunch of players going through long haul, two options once again. Do you continue trying to get this rotation over towards Pit and Elevator? Or do you just hold it back towards the back of Hydro and be prepared to play the ball? I would say generally here on this map, you rarely see the rotation over through control all the way to the elevator. In most cases, people do their last stand back at Hydro and commit towards playing the ball in the back of that map. This man got to change his name from Bullet to Electric Stream right there. He took the punch <laughs> right to the head. A perfect kill when it comes right back in to take down Bones with the BR. Believe the hype going to fall. Three players, Luminosity, having all their players up right now. Now they have to punish Believe the hype off of spawn. Keep that aggression going. And look at that spawn awareness from Bullet. Even understanding that didn't see someone at the top of the elevator right away, knows that there's just a strong likelihood players are gonna spawn the elevator. It's such a difficult to contest spawn. Unless you're actually in elevator, you're really not blocking elevator. This spawn gonna be so important and Believe the Hype obviously are aware of it, so they're gonna push right through it. They even have the flanker coming up towards the gold stairs, so attacking Luminosity from two angles gonna work out here for Believe the Hype Drift, one of the final players alive Trying to do damage, trying to stay alive, wait for his teammates to come in, but now he's getting caught. Trying to, but also kind of just giving away your position at some point if you're hidden. Don't throw those grenades across the map. I've had this same talk with one of my old Halo 1 buddies, and we'd play 2v2s, and the first thing you do when he spawns is 
throw four grenades across the map trying to get some damage or whatnot. And I was like, dude, you're just throwing flares across the map. You are just giving away your position. So in a case like that, unless your spot is already given up, make them search for you. See if you can get that extra shot or two, that, that little element of surprise to throw up that player in that crucial 1v1, especially when your team's down. Luminosity still trying to figure things out here. You know, coming over to that international play here, here in the US, it just comes out a little bit better. And uh, believe the hype coming out with a huge win on that one. Now we're going to find out if Luminosity come into their own throughout the rest of the series. But they're still a very strong team. I saw them during the, the Mexican qualifiers. They were dominating. All right, and what's going to happen here for round three between Quadrant Sentinels? It's just a full replay of round three. So whoever wins this round of oddball wins game number one, since it was tied 1-1 going into it. Now, the stats are going to be clean, which I feel uh, someone like King Nick is going to appreciate going here into this final round, as he had a little rough of a start. But he actually started, like I said, come online towards the end of that game. Like, he was doing such a good job controlling the ball, getting slays. He had the most objective time of the game. But right here, fresh slate for both these teams. We're kicking it off here with Spartan the Dog, who's going to charge on over towards Pipes. And that's a really good point that you bring up here. You know, you, your mental's going to be tested after coming out. You're going to have forced to reset. Now you got to press that mental reset button and go and keep the same energy that you did in the round that you won. And I mean, King Nick, two kills, zero deaths right off the bat. What a brand new refresh can do for your mental state. And he knows for all these players that control. Just gonna lay down some damage, walk away, and sees those ticks still going on through. Just realizing that all these players are getting weakened over control. King Nick, definitely one of those players that takes advantage of that disruptor, one of the best disruptor players that we have in the game. One of the best shock rifle players of the commando is what's gonna come into the close range in a 1v2. We just didn't have the numbers he was looking for. And it looks like Quads are gonna overwhelm them there. Yeah, it looks like we'll also probably get this one reset again as there's a minor tech issue there on the main stage. So we'll uh, we'll let them deal with that because I don't know how to fix any of that stuff, man. That's, that's not my job. I'm just here to try to look pretty. Well, what do you think we brought you here for? What do you mean? <laughs> get in there and get them in the lobby. <laughs> Oh my gosh, hard to find good help these days. <laughs> King, uh, King Nick coming out a little bit better than he did in that in that round, and I thought he was going to try to ride through it, but um, uh, sadly, we're to, again, press, press that mental reset button. Come in and make sure you keep that same energy. That's what we're going to need from King Nick and the entire Sentinels roster. But yeah, it's gonna be, they're gonna be just fine. I mean, when I try to think of play, when I think of someone like King Nick on a squad, he's such a strong slayer. And so it's a great sign that if he's not, you know, out slaying, not going even, like having like more of a rough game as far as the stats go, like, and your team's still winning or tied, it's just a matter of time before those plays start to go in his favor. He's gonna start dominating, he's gonna start taking over. And that's where your team score is just gonna skyrocket up. Yeah, but every, every time we see those large swings for Sentinels, it's usually King Nick that gets some crazy multi go, makes some crazy play. And once he starts to get into his zone, he starts to catch fire a little bit, he just rolls with it. Meanwhile, Quadrant, always that consistent punch. Always playing with that speed, playing with that teamwork, not afraid to dedicate numbers to overwhelming one side of the map or breaking a setup. I love the way Quadrant play Halo and two Foxy. He's been darn good as a sub. We Looking saw super spray. good. I mean, they, they still have a strong chance to put up a huge performance here in Charlotte. But we've seen a bunch here from the top pool play squads. We've been watching there a little on B stream, over on this stream. Let's go to Blaze, who has an update from the open bracket out on the floor. Take it away, Blaze. What's up, everybody? Blaze here, and I'm in the open bracket to give you guys your updates. Now, we've already hit a lot of craziness, and as you can see behind me, we have the conclusion of Native Red versus Status Quo, and it was a 2-0 victory for Native Red. Now, as we know, they have to play through the open bracket. They have some issues there with Drug, but they got the young superstar in Diagram, one of the triplets, coming out here to show that he got what it takes to make pro. But as far as some of the up other updates go, I know we got U.S. Army towards the lowest bracket. We actually got some mouse and keyboard players out here. We got Scub coming all the way from Australia. He won his match with his squad in Vertex. We even got some throwback players like Wildcard Z on the mouse and keyboard. Talk about that one. So no matter what you brought, we got all of our players out here trying to make that championship bracket and come away with a trip. And uh, it's been a lot of action so far, but I'm about to go dive back into it and see what other updates I can find. And I'll bring them to you right as soon as I get them. 
you know, Dave, you may not know about this, but a lot, a lot of us, like myself, came through the open bracket. Okay? We, we didn't always start in pool play, but there's some plenty of teams out there, you know, native whites of the world featuring Tappy Buns and Barcode, by the way. Dog7, that mouse and keyboard expert. I don't know how he's able to beat me in 1v1s, but he don't even got no aim assist, but he is. And plenty of other uh, teams in, as well, Cloud9. It's, 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 a, it's a pit out there. Yeah, it's, it's a pit, but you also might not know this. Some of us here might be building the foundation that you're standing on, created something called the open bracket, and ran through the open bracket many a time, so you don't need to explain to me what I have helped create in the past. All right, maybe I've not done that, but no, the open bracket is a, it's a bloodbath down there. There are so many strong teams, only four of them making it out here, and when you start to see some of those squads that are in there, like when Blaze is on the four, and I see Native Red walking down, I'm like, oh my god, well, clearly that's gotta be one of the four squads that's locking up the spot. It is just such a difficult process, so huge props to all the teams that are playing in the open bracket, and I am not envious of the difficult trials you have ahead of you. Yeah, plenty of teams we're gonna follow up with Native Red, Complexity, and actually, we have uh, two members formerly of Complexity, that's Neuronical and Monster on screen for Believe the Hype up 1-0 so far in this series here and with the early lead. Just like that, they have the overshield in the hands of Luminosity. Now, where are they going to push to get some slaves with this advantage they have? I mean, right now, if I was going to be in Luminosity's position, you got to worry about the tower and make sure you have that control. Looks like Atso, great job backing up his teammate over towards the mud side at back tower because you know they're going to be focused over at that sniper and they successfully were able to take that sniper out of their hands so I would, I would say this is a big miss here from Luminosity. That overshield, that sniper were not able to secure kills. In fact, they gave up the weapon without using up the ammo. It's funny that we're watching the uh, two matchups here. You know, when Collect first made a name for himself, it was on that breakout team, that esports arena red. You know who else was on that team? Boom. You know what else was on the team? Neuronical. So you have two more young guns that are looking to come in and say, hey, you know what? That collect our sign of Sentinels. If we show off, we show out, maybe if we did get assigned to another team. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a tales of old time when it comes to building squads in Halo. You generally do a lot of, you do a couple veterans and you usually do a couple of young guns. And that just seems to be that perfect mix of finding you know, the next generation of shooting talent and molding them into being stronger teammates and objective players. Now, some points you start to find these players that are all somehow veterans and still cracked out of their minds when you look at the likes of FaZe and you look at Optic, who are all, you gotta consider almost veterans at this point. Um, but generally you start to see, like I said, that, that main recipe for a successful Halo team is a couple veterans, a couple young guns, and who can build the better squad. We'll definitely keep you updated on that matchup between Believe the Hype and Luminosity. Remember, they were up 1-0 was Believe the Hype, but Luminosity started off that game too well. But let's go right into the matchup that I know you guys are waiting oh, for. Round number sick. three, just 88 seconds needed in order to come out with the win. Sentinels have the advantage here. I love that play from King Nick. And yes, I'm uh, obviously biased towards Instas, but <laughs> literally just reading where players are going to come from and can do damage. Ended up getting two assists, I believe, possibly from the Insta. Uh, flying that across the bottom center and set this team up to get those slays and deny that camo. We tied that as a combination, you know, main slayer, you know, support player, and the Walshy player of the tournament. <laughs> and who had the most instas. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I would be totally down for that. I'll, I'll start giving a cash prize for that in the each week. Don't quote me on it. But um, look in here at, to, at Spartan, see what he's going to do. Because now that he's on the bottom of the map, this is a spot where Quadrant can charge all the way across the top, avoid one member, and they essentially have a 4v2 because one player's holding the ball, one's a bottom of the map, and you can use that number advantage to your advantage charging across. But it looks like it did not work out well for Quadrant as Sentinel still put time up on the board until they play balled it over at back Hydra. A 22 to 0 run by Sentinels who already have a 12 second advantage going into this matchup to begin with. It's up to Quadra to answer back. You're forcing to play ball, but now you have to slay out another time and get that ball for yourself. Looks like that's exactly what Quadra's gonna do. Early ball time here, and already working on the spawning players. Great play by SLG, Woo! getting the perfect shots, finishing off collect, and this is a great position here for Quadra. I like how they didn't wait till they got more and more slaves before picking up that ball. You said they got two down and instantly beeline for that ball and ran over towards pipe. Now we got ourselves a tie game. 
I told you, SOG stands for slay like a gunner. That's exactly <laughs> what he's doing right now. The double kill, the killing spree, almost able to get the triple, but the damage has been done. Sentinels fall three down. That should be more ball time being earned by Quadrant. They've taken the lead. And camo's up, but nobody brave enough to run towards it just, just yet. That's going to be one member of Sentinels going towards Bombsire, picking up. I believe it was King Nick that snagged it. Now, can King Nick get out of the pit? Two lives have been spent trying to get this camo. It's just King Nick and Collect, and they have to do some damage to get out of this bad position. Hasn't been the most consistent player here for Sentinels, but so far, playing well with that camouflage. Four kills, three assists to go along with it. Working onto his fifth, that's gonna be a trade out with SLT. Sentinels still having the numbers advantage. Sentinels also rotating the ball. <laughs> Look at that, reflecting the plasma shot, just doing everything. I feel like I'm watching Sparty's TikToks again. They're always over in my feed. And it's always about like, Commando is OP. Or check out this double triple kill I got. Um, and I just feel like I'm watching those all over again, playing in my head as I see him just do the sickest repulses with those plasma grenades earlier in this. And then with that plasma burst. Set up here for sense. We have Sparty over towards the A side of King Nick spread across the glass side. And look at the way they're able to help each other out despite being across the map, cleaning up those call outs. Quadrant fall three. One more player left who's being held back here while this happens. Sentinels continues to put points on the board. Remember, they only need 88. Only need 88 to close this one out, but they're in such a strong position right now. Elevator is being taken though, so that's really good for Cecil G, but no! Insta kill for Spartan over at bottom elevator to keep that crucial position under his control. These boys clearly know you're casting over them. I mean, they must have, they must have, they must have peaced over the death. You know, I mean, <laughs> let's make Walshie proud real quick as we see another insta slow coming in. Sentinels' defenses will not be denied. Quadrant are having such a tough time breaking through. Finally, they're able to do so. The maid ends up taking down the Quadrant player, but hold on, the ball's not played. That's bad. No play ball is not gonna be good, especially if you're spawning over at the elevator. Now look at this, all these members of Sentinels are gonna be charging across the map. But is this a great rotation? No, another denied rotation. So a forced rotation there from Quadrant shut down again. I want to count that as the third time that I feel like we've seen a rotation fail there from Quadrant. There's just something that's a slight disconnect, whether it's a new member on the squad or whether it's just the fast, aggressive play of these North American squads that's just a little too quick to deal with. Sentinels keep cutting off that, those angles. Quadrant not able to put the points necessary on the board here, and Sentinel just five seconds away from coming out with the win. King Nick going in for the early pull, almost able to get it onto the glass side. Sadly, that ball falls. <laughs> Trying to toss it up, but do not desperate right here because you cannot overlook a squad like Quadrant. They had two members out for Sentinels. If they get a full set, they can easily rack together 50 points with the right amount of slays. And don't forget, it's just one round to take it. This is technically round number three. Quadrant fighting for their, for their game number one life right now here. They're able to get that ball over towards the spawning players here. Quadrant have to play perfect Halo. One false move and Sentinels are taking it. And here comes the rotation. I've been critical of them before, saying a few failed rotations, they're gonna try and bring it over towards Elevator. Legend running into a fight over at Pipes. Doesn't what? get the trade with Lethal. Lethal getting the better of him. That's two down for Quadrant. That ball is going in the hands of Sentinels, and that's gonna be 87, 88. And that's gonna be it. Sentinels are gonna be your game number one winner. Lethal makes a clutch play. How many times have we said that? <laughs> what a trade on Legend right there to open up the entire map and allow Sentinels to grab that ball and take game number one. And I gotta say, Squadron are right there with them. I feel like if some of those ball rotations go slightly different, they get an extended setup, they get a play ball, they get a feel of things going their way, but like I said, just falling short in a couple different ways. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you count that, like I said, just to a new member. I mean, one member of your team swapping out is a massive difference. Quadrant clearly had the game plan, but now it's about execution, and sadly, they weren't able to execute in that game number one since it was taken, but game number two, should be a different story, shouldn't it be? It's a Slayer. Yes, oh. Live Fire Slayer, if I recall correctly. Well, well Sentinels are seven and one in Slayer. Woo. That's not a good sign that if you're- seven and one in Slayer. <laughs> Woo. Well, that's gonna be a tough one to beat then. Like I said, when I looked at this game mode and map combination across the board, four out of the five I felt are fairly snowball -y. Like on something like Recharge Oddball, 
it can just be so tough when the team has a full setup and you're spawning over an elevator or all the way towards C plat, all the way across the map. Similarly on live fire, the team gets overshield snipe and gets a good setup. If they want to start spawn trapping a green or start pushing that badge, it can be really tough to get to to back down and get your numbers back up. Live fire definitely one of the most punishing maps that we have here in Halo Infinite. And if you don't come prepared, you will end up going down quick. First to 50 kills takes the win. 12 minutes on the clock. Quadra needs to answer back here on map number two. Do they have it in them? Well, they need to. They do not want to go down 0-2 in this series. They want to set themselves up the best they can here in pool play. Only two squads from this pool play go up into the upper bracket. One's going to the elimination bracket, and one is being eliminated from the tournament. And Quadrant want to be one of those top two. Overshield coming up on a delay here, so the fight for the sniper rifle won by Sentinels, but now it's the fight to stay alive. As that Overshield comes up, you have to be able to set up around it. And you talked about that green side spawn. Quadra getting locked in there for just a little bit. Sparring gets away with Sniper once again. And Sparty opting not to go towards top tower, just realizing that players are going to be looking for him around there. Now the Sparty realizes he has a teammate over towards tower. He's going to poke back over and try to help, but gets surprised by SLG and one other member, which is Legend. And a fight for the power up begins. Collect, going to trade the overshield for that sniper and heat wave. I'll take that trade. Yeah, might as well. Overshield's going to dis dissipate anyways. Quads are going to struggle if they're not able to control the Snipe Wife when the Overshield. And as of right now, Sentinels have been locking it down and Collect looking to lock down Tower. I love that pre-fire there from Collect after he got that Snipe shot on the player over at Plasmas. Just instantly starts shooting the BR because knowing that that player is not going to run towards top center, they are going to revert back over towards Kidor. He's just pre-firing his VR, hoping to get the headshot because you're not going to have a fast enough reaction to see someone around that corner react to it. So might as well start pulling the trigger and try to get that lucky shot. Sensor looking to create space here, giving Collect all this room to work with over toward the tower side. But as I say, that lethal fall, so does King Nick. That's going to be a double kill by Sika. Sika now chasing Collect off of the tower side. They wipe Sensors off of the seaside. The map Quadric now looks to punish Sensors off the of spawn. Zika now holding his top tower. I'm surprised he's gonna just leave. I guess that makes sense if he sees all his teammates fighting over towards Garage and wants to be a bigger effect over here on the overshield. But this whole entire time, Zika's just not gonna find anyone. Finally finds Collect, makes him go towards Bob Center, and Legend's gonna happily help finish off that kill. Legend Zika hunt down Collect over in the tunnel, and they're gonna keep on pushing. Two kill lead here for Quadrant. It's not stopping just yet with his OS. Momentum shifts quickly, and Quadrant, the moment to get that overshield is also the moment they take the lead here. Currently up by two kills, and you see Legend trying to provide cover here onto the next side. His teammate comes up with the repost. We're starting as a 1v1, now is a 2v2. A double kill by a Legend makes it a 3v2. One more player to deal with it. <laughs> Oh, he was hot. It's hot over here. Over here. Yeah, it is. It was like 80-something you know? degrees yesterday. You got to go for a dip every <laughs> once in a while. But one thing that was so great there from Quadrant is they knew that Spartan was still somewhere nearby because as they, if you're paying attention to those names as they come across your screen, you saw Collect kind of double back to help fight when Spartan ducked away. And at some point, when you can keep track of the whole enemy team, it really adds up. You can say, all right, three of them were top center area. You now know if you can collapse and expose your back to different spots across the map. Whereas if you only know where one or two members are, you have to play differently and cautiously. Information is a weapon here in Halo Infinite and one the sensors are hopefully using masterly to try to come back in this game, but watch you find yourself to be down. Sentinels! Watch out! Quadra may have been three down, but the final player is SLG, and he has that sniper rifle, and I promise he knows what to do with it. Absolutely, and I like this, just setting up over towards back tower. Nobody from Sentinel's gonna get there anytime soon, and he can be a huge factor towards this OS, but during this time, he's rotating. Looks like he's gonna decide to get up close and personal with the snipe, hits the no scope on collect, push over towards Kidor, and creating the space for his teammate to grab the overshield. Here's the quadrant that we wanted to see, and so far they are answering right back, which started off as a two-kill lead for Sentinel, slipped away, and now Quadrant with a seven-kill lead. Legend steals away that overshield, chasing away Sparty, the one-shot Sparty. Somehow McFly is out of there, but 
Collect goes down trying to cover his back and Quadric keep control. One thing I noticed it just feels like when a member of Quadrant gets someone from Sentinel's weak, they're finding those angles to get those finishes. They're not letting them escape as much as you generally see here on Live Fire. So kudos to them to try to hunt down those different positions. Look at the repulse back from Lethal. Legend decides to throw out a second grenade and get a trade, but it is just a massacre over at the plasma grenades. And that's right now, two Foxy and Seek are just playing excellent Halo right now. Nine kills out of each of them. As Lethal does a great job of playing his life over to the sandbag side, but now gonna stare down the barrel of three different players, trying to take the 1v1, able to trade out his life here, but every trade is gonna work in favor of Quadrant. They have the lead. Such a smart dance there from Lethal, real, le realizing that if Lethal hightails it, not gonna be in range to get a melee trade, realizing he doubles back in challenges, fighting a 2v1, so forces the opposing team to make a move, forces them to both expose at the exact same time if they want to kill him without getting a trade, so that's why he's one of the best. 32 to 29 lead in favor of Quadrant still. Sentinel is able to claw their way back into it just a bit here, but every time they do, Quadrant answer right back. Like, not able to find the back smack. It's put on skates there by Sika. That movement different over the EU. You didn't know he ain't move like that. <laughs> that dance move I have not seen just yet. Might be my age, or like I said, might be the Atlantic Ocean between us. But one thing is for certain is we have a five kill lead for Quadrant, and they need to make sure they do not just throw that away. That is a significant enough lead that they can use those advantages to push on over to get more just overshields, get towards that snipe. You can't just throw those lives away carelessly. And that's gonna be SLG grabbing the overshield. That's gonna be the second or third OS we've been seeing going in the hands of Quadrant. The moment you said you didn't want to see Quadrant, Quadrant throw away that lead, they did go multiple down, but luckily SLG still comes away with that overshield, and that's going to be used to hold Sentinels back over toward the A side, two players trapped. Love that play, though, too, by SLG. Realized those players were hard to come down, and he realized that if he doubled back over towards Keto or a different spot, he's going to leave his teams down a member. So he decides to charge right back through Tunnel and be a factor in that fight. There's always this interesting dance you do as a flanker where you don't want to be too close where you get picked off from the majority of the opposing team. But if you're too far away, you're leaving your teammates a person down. So that was just that perfect dance you saw executed by SLG, just dancing back when too much pressure was on, going forward when the pressure was not. Woo! No scope right to the head by Collect. We've seen how dominant he can be all tournament long with the sniper rifle, and if they're gonna come back, it's gonna be on the back of the sniper, down by two, over towards the end game, can collect dominate here. And that's actually really scary. This is now a tie game. Quadrant had a five kill lead with overshield, mm. and now that is gone, and there's still a sniper bullet left here for Sentinel, so. I didn't want them to lose that lead. They've lost it. Now, how are they gonna claw it back here? because Overshield's coming up in 30 seconds. Sentinels has the superior position. Just barely been sound that no scope, but has the numbers to keep Quadrant at bay, but goes in for the challenge while one shot. There's Sparty now gonna be left alone here over toward the tower side, and Quadrant now focusing on the teammates coming off the spawn. This is interesting though. Quadrant kind of pushing all the way back through Garage, now realizing Overshield's coming up in five and now reverting back. Quadrant aren't going to have many angles on this OS. They're going to have sandbags, what? and they're going to have the cylinder itself. <laughs> and look at this, two members of Quadrant fall. That's going to be three. Legend, the only one left that's going to try and make something happen near this OS. And he does get it. It's 49-48. Can he pull off a kill soon? No room for error here for Quadrant, but they have a chance. There's no sniper left on the map. So Legend's going to have to make something happen. He runs in, 2v1. What's he going to do? There's all four members. What a fight, and that's gonna be a trade out kill, trade after trade, and somehow Quadrant pulled that out. They somehow killed two members over on the elbow. What happened? That was an absolute fight over towards the end game. What? Sentinels won the Slaves battle, but somehow Quadrant were able to get away with that overshield. They had a 49-48, and with that overshield, they were overwhelmed on the A side. His overshield gets shredded, but that one trade was enough to give Quadrant the one kill lead they needed, and now we're going into a swing, game number three. Everyone from Sentinels was just over on that elbow at the garage, and I was just like, all right, well, even though he has overshield, that's just gonna get shredded real quick, but somehow able to secure those two kills so fast.
What a clutch ending and surprising ending, to be frank, from Quadra. And once again, to Foxy, so much pressure. Big shoes to fill in, Chick, and what does he do? He answers every single time of 15 and 10 performance. Although I love Legend with the 12 kills and the 10 assists to go along with it, but I'm saying all eyes are on Two Foxy, and it's easy to crumble under that pressure, but he's thriving. All eyes on Two Foxy. So the stats show a couple things on different screens. You saw he had most kills, least deaths, but also least damage dealt and least damage taken. Those are also very telling stats. Sometimes just not show, knowing how to perfectly operate with this. But at the same time, if you're winning a clutch 50-49 here against Sentinels, what more do you want? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the damage separated by just 200 apiece from everybody. It was a full team effort, and uh, we gotta take a look at these stats here. Sparty versus two Foxy. 50 kills out of Sparty so far. 48 out of two Foxy. The KD really close. I'm gonna be watching out for this matchup the rest of the series long. I am interested to see Two Foxy's full-on stats at the end of this series okay. because, you know, at some point, maybe that damage is all damage taken can be a little misleading. Maybe I'm just a singular slayer. Mm -hmm. But end of the day, these teams are neck and neck, and we're taking this one. Where to next, Tony? We're going to the streets. King of the hell on the streets. Who will be the king on the streets of New Mombasa? <laughs> and a swing game number three. You know, I, I, I'm really good at math, and I tell you, 98.7249Q percent of the time, the team that wins game number three when the series is tied up usually wins out in the series. That's just facts. Going to seven significant figures there with that stat. That's why you're the best in the business, Tony. <laughs> Sentinel versus Quadra, this is going to be a big one here right now. And now the question is, with that momentum shifting in favor of Quadrant, can they run away with it? Because Slayer is a lot different of a game type than, say, an objective but Slayer is also where Sentinels usually thrive. That's true, yes. Yeah. Sentinels, like you said, they were 7 1 and make that 7 and 2, depending on what stat range you're looking at. So we are ourselves quite a series here on the main stage, but I believe we're going to go look at the very end here of Believe the Hype versus Luminosity. And that's going to be it. Believe the Hype. Winning that game number three, three to one here. King of the Hill on the street. So if you're keeping up on that B stream, you can pull that on up if you'd like to check it out and see that full series. But why would you want to go there when you got me and Tony here? Why? That's what I'm trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I mean, you got, you got professional player, caster, analyst, one of the best looking people in the HCS. Oh, and you know I'm talking about me, right? I mean, you're, you're oh. cool. I mean, some guy named Dave, whatever. Yeah. All right, all right. I see how it is. Yeah. I see how it is. You want to you get up to start like that? <laughs> Quadra versus Sentinel. <laughs> Gonna go at it this game number three. And talk to me a little bit about streets. What are some of your keys to success on winning on a map like streets? Oh, man, it is tough on the streets. Obviously, you're looking towards those rockets. One thing that you're, I was gonna say, that's gonna be very important here on like streets is with King of the Hill in a play and how it affects the timer. Your coach let you know how and when those rockets are coming up because you don't have as much of a consistent timer as something like uh, Strongholds or as Slayer. Um, you don't have the exact same consistent timer of knowing hair is coming up at the two minute mark at this spot at this time. Instead, you have to really rely on your coach to help you time that one. So that's gonna be one key is focusing on the weapon. And then knowing which hills you want to get full control of and go for full slays and which hills you want to get scrappy on. Some kills on streets, you don't need to have all four down, you don't need to have a full setup. In fact, you're gonna trade a kill or two, grab five seconds of time, die, rinse and repeat, and win that hill just by those little advantages. So you need to realize which hills you're going for full setups and which ones you are getting scrappy. We know the game plan. We know how important this matchup is. Now enough talk. Let's see them walk. Sentinels versus Quadrant. And of course, it's lethal that they would get away with the early rockets here. Multiple players alive on Sentinels. So when this hill comes up, Sentinels already controlling the B side of the map. Controlling B side, lethal a little out of place here, but he's gonna be kind of this counter for anyone come out of tram. And there he catches Legend trying to go down those C stairs. Gets punished right away, and here comes another one-on-one -on -one against Two Foxy, and his shots are gonna be perfect. We go down for a Quadrant here, but luckily SLG gonna answer right back with that Stalker Rifle, taking down two with them, Sparty the leading Slayer, and now Quadrant <laughs> looks to push up here. 
Collect loses the Bulldog. And a couple of individual fights that we're seeing more from the Sentinels roster versus working together. If you expect somebody holding towards that B balcony, you can get those crossfire shots over towards the C stairs. Lethal should not be having to fight someone one-on-one -on, -one on C stairs when you have the B hill. So a little bit of a disconnect there from Sentinel's roster. Maybe players getting tunnel vision, trying to fight individual fights and not realize where they have covered and where they need help. And look at SLG, despite almost running into a 1v2, the way he's able to play his life masterfully and still holding on to that that Stalker Rifle, that's not four kills in a row, but his teammates are going down left and right. It's only a matter of time before he does as well, right? SLG, that's going to be SLG's first death of the game. Almost going on a spree there, but showing how he was angry that entire time. Just laying down shots with Stalker. Like you said, holding on to that Bulldog. Kind of that perfect double threat up close and at far away. Early control here for Sentinels over toward this hill. We see multiple members of Quadrant now surrounded. He'll seek over toward the seaside, a couple over towards the A, and that's going to pull out just for a moment here. Reset things a little bit, but so far, that power weapon control went to the hands of Sentinels, but when SOG had that Stalker rifle, woof. Yeah, I was going to say, like, full on power weapons in the hands of Sentinels, like rockets, but then kind of that next tier of weapons with the Bulldog and Stalker. I would say not even in the hands of Quadrant, in the hands of SLG. SLG is holding on to them the entire time, being selfish. Yeah, I didn't know you could hold three weapons at the same time. I'm pretty sure I saw him out of the thrust. I saw him out of BR and the and AR. Man had everything on the map. Forget controlling the sandbox. He was the sandbox for a moment here as we're getting game number three ready for you. Again, we're tied up at one apiece right now. Sentinels came out hot in that game number one. And Quadrant did respond well in game two. Yeah, yeah. And you also just saw the interesting strat of how when Quadrant didn't have anyone towards the hill, they heavily favored holding that tram area, just realizing that they felt they had a better angle of attack and approach rather than getting spawn killed or letting go of tram area and trying to push that over from PD and tower. So pay attention now. Quadrant wants to hold that for, for, for that reason. And, you know, having a player over toward that top stalker rifle spawn perch when you're trying to push over toward the B side, you get a clear angle towards that hill. And it's dangerous. It's so annoying trying to hold the setup or trying to push in the setup when you're sitting over toward that Stalker Rifle spawn. And mind you, even if they lose that first hill or win it, where does it move over to? The subway side. So clearly Quadrant have a plan, and uh, I like it so far. It's a great Yeah, point. like you said, it's kind of a dual purpose. One, you're setting for the next hill. Obviously, early on the hill, they don't care about that as much, but they're setting mm -hmm. the next hill. But then, secondly, like I said, it cuts off all those other angles across the map. If you have somebody like SLG holding down Balcony with a stalker rifle, all of a sudden, all these members of Sentinels are just stuck in the hill. They don't really have a good angle towards Balcony. If they come towards Balcony, you get damage from the Balcony, from, uh, from Balcony to rails. If anyone is pushing towards the side of the map like Lethal was, they're kind of a safe dog. You can try to pick off those players and you just have more of a refined fight over there towards driveway and B stairs that you get to control. So now on the other side of things with Sentinels, they were able to get that early rocket control. You also saw Collect at one point had the Bulldog but lost it quick. SLG, once he got the Bulldog and Stalker Rifle, that's when he puts four kills in a row before going down. What are some of the things you saw from Sentinels or want to see from them? Ooh, what do I want to see different from Sentinels? Uh, like I said, one counter that they need to do is if, if Sentinels have other players across the map, they really need to have a stronger presence towards B rails instead of just tunnel vision over towards driveway. Make those players push all the way up towards driveway to contest your hill and your B rail player versus trying to fight a 1v1 at driveway. Driveway is a fight that favors the players and teams holding tram. Don't push over towards driveway unless you have the numbers or a damage advantage to take that over. That's why I want to see from Sentinels. Well, just as important as the B rail is on streets, this car side on Aquarius controls the map and Nirvana was showing he got the early access to the dynamo grenades, throwing a couple grenades over toward the spawning players as believe the hype move in for their first pull. BTH getting control, trying to get that first pull, but we're gonna have to see what happens here. Neuronical just meet, meeting so much damage there and have to back all the way over at the Luminosity base. So we're gonna have to see, now that they've broken out their base, can they push on in? And that's gonna be a no bullet. It's gonna take them on out. And just as I say that there from BTH versus Luminosity, like I said, you can catch that one on the B stream. We are gonna jump back in here in just a moment here with Sentinels versus Quadrant on Streets, King of the Hill. Yeah, I heard you guys at home, y'all don't like breaks. 
So we ain't got no breaks. We go from <laughs> game to game, showing the action at all times. We'll definitely keep you updated on that Believe the Hype versus Luminosity matchup. But this is the matchup that you're here for. Sentinels versus Quadrant. Who's coming out on top here in Streets? Game number three. And Lethal got the Rockets first last time. Gets a touch on this time. Toss them over towards the ATM. That's going to be Collect grabbing those and trying to stay alive. But that's three down here for Sentinel. Sparty McFly, the only one alive. And looks like SLG wants him dead, realizing that with that weapon still up for grabs, does not want to grab that time. But that's going to be a couple staggered kills. Sika getting taken out, trying to take out Sparty. SLG dropping, trying to take out Sparty. So what looked like a great setup for Quadrant, where they had three alive and only one member of Sentinels turned out to backfire. We talked about how crazy SOG were play was playing with that Stalker rifle over in that game, number I guess game number three before the reset, but sadly wasn't able to get that critical kill. King Nick answers back with a double kill, and now they're pushing right through the cafe. And look at this from Sentinels. They do not want anyone from Quadrant behind them at all. They sent three members all the way over towards Back Tower, two of them going directly towards Tower. King Nick going towards PD to block those and get additional angle to make sure nobody's fun over there. So it looks like that's either Sentinel strategy when they have someone behind them to quickly clear that out, or Sentinel strongly favor to have the opposing team spawn and tram as it's a B-sided hill. We'll have to see how that plays throughout different scenarios later this game. That's a great call. I thought maybe Sentinels forgot we were playing King of the Hill and they thought we were playing <laughs> Slayer. I didn't, I didn't know, but controlling those spawns, keeping the pressure on, as Quadrant now going three down, and we're gonna see another Rockets coming up already. Almost no progression on the hill for either team, and we're about to see another Rocket launcher. Normally that comes when it's like 1-0 and moving towards the subway side. Right, yeah, two Rockets here on the first B-Hill. B-Hill's not even halfway captured here for Sentinels. Pretty much even on Slaves. Obviously a little, favor in, uh, little ahead in favor of Sentinels. Quadrant for the first time though. Getting three down and getting hill time. Last time they got three down, they did not get hill time. They tried to chase after that rocket launcher and were unsuccessful. I like this play from Two Foxy. Putting some pressure on, on Tram. And these members are just gonna scrap up time, lay down shots towards Neon, and start to tie this hill up. First time we're seeing Quadra put some points on the board and looks like they're gonna take the lead with it. And Two Foxy still has a rocket in the back pocket looking to... I'm pretty sure this is a, sure this is a Dr. Seuss book. Yeah. We're, we're... I'm a rapper, you didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> Big kill by two, Foxy. No more rockets left here, but Collect still trying to come in and put some damage. Somehow able to take that SLG and live over towards the red side. Foxy not having any part of that. He's going to chase them away. And super impressive. Consider the quadrant. This is their first time really getting set up on this hill, and they pretty much take it from zero to 100. They go with pretty much a full capture, putting the first point on the board. So what a great start here for Quadrant here in the replay. Zero to 100 real quick and a 1-0 lead here from Quadrant. And SLG continue to put the pressure on board. Quadrant already onto the Southway side. And SLG trying to make it a hard cross, but Sparty gonna deal with them quickly. And now you give the dog the bulldog. Yeah, it seemed like maybe an over challenge, but SLG likely was in a position saying, all right, I'm already this far up. They might not take their time and check all the corners, and he was going to try to get further behind. And secondly, SLG is now going to spawn behind them. So if Sentinels didn't push fast enough across the map, SLG was going to be a sandwich factor against Sentinels. And King Nick eventually found by the dumpster by SLG. So. Great, great push there from Sentinels after they got the initial pick on SLG, but the control still in the favor of Quadrant for the most part. What a good trade there. Both these squads fighting desperately for Tram, trading every single kill, but this one's gonna now go in favor of Sentinels. Four down for Quadrant. Rockets, Tram, everything in control for Sentinels. And Sentinels are able to get a hold of the Rockets, only able to get assist through it. Can they at least get the control here as Legend is manning the B, the B railing side, going all the way down to one shot. And Sentinels once again pulling off of that hill to chase down that player. They don't want anybody to survive. Yeah, I mean, that was a great play by Legend, doing everything right, getting that damage towards Neons, making sure that player can't run away, uh, who was uh, Collect over there. But it just took a little too long for those members of Quadrant to get that kill over towards Neons. So great play by Legend individually, but just not fast enough from the rest of the squad. 
Spider gonna stay alive here with the Commando. Meanwhile, there is a trade off the screen. King Nick and SLG go down, collect. Getting a big remote detonation, and this B, this seaside is almost cleared out. Just one more play to deal with, but having no idea that Sika had the bulldog. Good play by Sika. I was gonna say it's so difficult to sometimes slip by and get inside Tram because every area is so exposed. You're not gonna really slip by going through the front door or through sea stairs. The only time you're really gonna be sneaky is if you jump up through the dumpster. But these teams are usually aware their spidey senses tingle if they know that it's been a little too quiet for a little too long. So not sure exactly how Sika broke through, but breaking through that, his team needs to take advantage of it. One of the newest faces here on a partner organization, Collect, had a great season one and continues that here in season two. We saw the electrifying plays with that S7 sniper rifle. Now we're showing what it can do with the Stalker and Bulldog. This man just sports all the power weapons. <laughs> Doing everything right and no pressure here on Collect just yet. And I like this play too. Interesting to have the Stalk Rifle on your player in the hill. General players opt to have that over towards the balcony, someone up high, but generally all the fights you're gonna be fighting from the hill, especially when you have the team spawn across the map, are gonna be long range. And I'll take a Stalker fight long range. Sensor is almost done with that subway side. And mind you, look at all of the time that's been drained off the clock. Only a minute on the clock here, and it's just a 1-0 lead in favor of Quadrant. Meanwhile, Sentinels are so close to taking that second hill. These teams are evenly matched, and they are fighting for every last bit of map control here. Doing everything the can, and King Nick just in such a big brainer spot. Most players hiding all the way in that corner. You saw the pre-fire come out too foxy, but we have a little too smart of a play there from King Nick just slightly adjusting where he's hiding. Sometimes a small difference, a small nuance of hiding in a slightly different spot is gonna throw off a player and be the difference between life and death. Now we got ourselves a 1-1 game, Tony. 49 seconds left, and we got ourselves the hill all the way towards the plaza. King Nick's creativeness, creativeness was enough to give them that hill, but will it be enough to have them push forward because Quadrant already rotating back? And once again, King Nick showing us how dangerous this disruptor can be. That player finally getting his shields back and he still hunts it down. That disruptor, the, the residual damage lasts forever, it seems like. Just give him a harsh <laughs> check right there as they tried to hide in PD and not getting much help there. So here we have King Nick pushing up, taking up more ground, and what a great read going out. So she was hiding down there. Just damage after damage coming out of King Nick, realizing that he has now a death screen. No one plays all coming from B side. And here comes the pinch. Sparty and Lethal putting the pressure right away. But is it a mistake? That's going to be three charges from Quadrant. Both Sparty and Lethal taken down. And a time where they could have racked up more points in the hill is now going to be Quadrant set up. What an answer back by Quadra, but look at King Nick getting the double kill when his team was three down. We called out King Nick. We called out his stats in that game number one, and he has really stepped up here on streets. And there's only 10 seconds left here. We're gonna have to see if they decide to commit towards this hill or if it's gonna be slay after slay. We go right no team. We will have to see how this one pops out. But there's only five seconds left. Both teams opting for slays. When in doubt, you just need to slay. You cannot desperate give the other team full control on the map. This next capture is going to determine the winner here. And as I say, that Sentinels and the four down collect the first one off of respawn, trying to do any kind of damage here. I've casted maybe over 100 matches on streets, and I've never seen a two to one win in King of the Hill, and we're about to see one right here, right now. More importantly, like you said, what, a minute left after the uh, second hill was capped? So it's just like <laughs> zero time left here. Just so much back and forth on the very first hill. But this next fight or so could potentially determine it. Sika overextending arguably a little bit. There's just too many members there on the B side here for Sentinel. So Sika wisely backing down, but no, gets picked off by collecting lethal. They no longer have to chase and hunt them down towards back tower, and King Nick's gonna happily take that position to that angle while Sentinels put some time on the board. I told you, King Nick's one of the best disruptor players in the game. He always makes sure he has one. I'm <laughs> questioning whether he spawns with one or not, but Legend of Two Foxy off the screen getting back to back kills. That's the break Quadrant are looking for, and now King Nick gonna be chased down. Spartan Nick somehow gets a big kill. Such a Sick bait and switch there from Spartan King Nick. Realize that someone's near Cafe. And it's tough to clear these players out of here. Starts through with that number, but does not matter. Quadrant gonna put that time on the board instead of hunting those players towards back tower. So, yes, they're doing great bait and switches. 
they were getting good kills. But in the end, Quadrant put time on the board, clearing out the back of the base, and going to win game number three, two to one. No matter how strong those kills are, no matter how well you play your life, at the end of the day, that hill was on the other side of the map. And it looks like they're able to steal that one. A two to one win by Quadrant, and they go up also two to one in the series. Two to one as well. They're going to be going into game number four, which is going to be Aquarius, CTF, and look at those slays. Basically even. In fact, Quadrant got outslayed by two kills across that game, but wins the objective game two to one. So showing that smart, efficient kills and smart, efficient grabbing of the hill is where it's at. This was going to be a tough matchup for Quadrant going up against Centrals, even if they had their full roster. But the fact that they have the sub coming in, I really questioned whether they were going to put up a fight. Honestly, I, I could have saw this being a 3-0 in favor of Sentinels because they're just not practiced with two Foxes. They're, they're speaking a different language at this point. <laughs> and it, it was Quite just literally. crazy to be. But Quadrant are here. Quadrant are dangerous. And two Foxy? Man, he might be the baddest man in the EU right now. I am just so continually impressed by how much these EU squads have been stepping up year after year. Halo in North America had such a large head start in development as competitive scene, in pros playing and orc supporting, and EU somehow, despite that big disadvantage for years and years, have been able to get stronger and stronger and build up incredible performances like this. So. My props out to the EU Halo community. Right now, Quadrant are positioned. If they win the series, they are a shoe in to take that first or second slot in the pool. You know, you gotta beat Sentinels, you gotta be an open team. And then Optic is a little different. You know, you don't, don't worry about you Optic. You don't have to much. beat him Optic? I don't have Quadrant beat an Optic, no. You don't believe in two Foxes? Is that what you're saying? I, I never said that. You're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, sort of like not believe in the hype. I, I appreciate two Foxy. <laughs> But uh, I'm not sure if I, if I believe in two Foxy to beat Optic. Optic definitely another beast, but so far Quadrant have been impressing me. And let me tell you, he may not be in the starting line, but I'm just saying, all these EU organizations looking for a new fourth, I'm just two Foxy about <laughs> to be available after Charlotte. Keep those DMs open, two Foxy. They gonna be people sliding in them. <laughs> <laughs> two Foxy absolutely performing so well in the situation, but I mean, these are the these are the situations you dream of, you know, to get the opportunity to fill in as a fourth here on the strong quad roster and playing on the main stage at the biggest, you know, the, at the at the open beginning here in 2023 out in Charlotte. It's just uh, it's, it's one of those opportunities that like it makes or breaks some careers. Frank Sinatra once said, "The best success is massive revenge." So this one's for Chick Quadrant. Come out with the win here. Take down Sentinels. Pull off the upset. It starts right here. Game number four. You're one win away. And look at this zero pressure over towards the car side. What is arguably the more important side to control when grabbing the flag and running the flag. We saw nobody really from going from Sentinels. And look at this. Quadrant rewarded with... The sizzle sticks, reward with the flag. They're running this all the way across. Gonna get a slide? No, just gonna hold on to it and gets flanked there by Collect. So maybe not all the control they needed as they're running across, but a bit of a different prioritization I would expect there from Sentinels off the get go. You talked about it in game number one. Sentinels have a way of cutting off those rotations and cutting off those angles on Quadrant. And you're even seeing that rear its ugly head here on Capture the Flag Aquarius. Now we have a flag standoff here and a big kill by Lethal. Those both flags sit side by side. Lethal goes in for the flag touch. Now going in for the challenge. Ends up going down, but Sentinels are still grinding forward. I love the flag run there by Sentinels, running it towards the opposing flag. My rule of thumb is if your team has more control than the other team, match the same flag path so that you can match firepower to get the recovery and the cap. If your team is down in numbers, run the flag to the opposite side of the map. Try to have them divert resources, spread them thin, and then draw it out into a flag stalemate. So great heads up play there by Sentinels to run the flag the same path that Quadrant had it since they had a numbers advantage. Sentinels pulling one off of your playbook and now, mind you, Quadrant once again going three down, and Sentinels find themselves 
in the base of Quadrant. Once again, that flag's being run. Quadrant are able to come off a of spawn, but Lethal's gonna continue to push that flag forward here right across the car's side. We do see one kill in favor of Quadrant, but do they have any players across the map? I like this play by Lethal. Once you have the flag all the way back at your base, slays are most important. Your team is going to have reinforcements faster. So right now, Lethal wants to prioritize kills rather than just desperating the flag. And so he does a little both. He gets the flag a little bit closer. Gets that kill on Legend. And Sika, the only one left that has a chance of stopping it. And I feel like this is going to be a flag number two going in here for the Sentinels. And not every kill shows up the way that's value on the kill feed. The fact that Lethal was able to drop that flag, get that pivotal kill, he ends up going down. But if he doesn't get that one, Spy doesn't cap that flag, so a big 2-0 so far for Sentinels trying to send us to a game five. Yeah, all of a sudden you have Legend just sitting in the back of the flag, blocking spawns, in position to talk that, toss that flag out into the bottom center. It makes that whole flag scenario completely different if Lethal does not pick up and clutch up that kill. SLG wants to get his hands on those Dynamo Grenades, long range shots and information now being fed to the rest of his team as Quadrant looked to push up into Sentinel's utility side. Peace side being controlled by Sentinel, so Sentinel's giving up the side of the map. They're already overextending. And Quadrant, SLG pushing in the back of the Sentinel's base. Of course, he meets him 1v1 against Nick, and now it's a tough position. Realizing, does he decide to go for a fight one-on-one -on -one and jumps on out? I would say that's just not having enough trust in knowing when teammates were going to come on over or just hearing that there was so much pressure over on the Quadrant flag that he felt that there was going to be no pressure in the center of the map. Okay, Nick losing the fight over the Dynamos, but ends up winning that battle. Now trying to stay alive. Nades are coming in left and right, and somehow King Nick Dipsy Doodle in here dancing over on the car side, stays alive, and now the rest of Sentinels have the opportunity to push up right as active camouflage is coming up soon. King Nick, knowing that there's some weak players and bombers on the map, does not spot them out right away and wisely decides to get some high ground. Sika, what a nice shot to take advantage of that thruster. Dodging also the melee, not trading a kill there with Lethal, realizing that he was confident in his shots, that he was gonna thrust away and send in the trades. Look at the damage and Deuce is still creating. There is nobody in position here from Sentinels. They might be able to get damage on the flag around, but they are not going to get the kill to stop. That's going to be a flag answered here by Quadrant. Some Sika plays coming out of Sika to make sure that flag gets across that, but now you're within striking distance, SLG. Putting the heat wave to work, bringing the heat down to one shot, forced to back down, but still has that camouflage, still has that heat wave. And Sentinels have to fight them and deal with them, and that's easier said than done. And look at that. All the resources they had to spend just to take out SLG. That's Collect going down. That's Lethal going down. Two Foxy and Quadrant still have the utility under control, and they're putting the squeeze on all these members of Sentinels in the back of their base fight for their lives. King Nick getting the answering kill on SLG. Sika going down, so Sentinels get the kills that they need, but that is such a difficult spot to be in. When you're fighting out of your base, your reward is you may be able to move to the center of the map. However, if you're fighting your base and you lose, your, uh, your loss is a flag. They end up bringing that flag all the way out, and you're not gonna be a factor in that entire run. Sentinel successfully able to clear Quadrant out of their base, and now they turn that defense into offense as Quadrant go three down. Why the Sentinels approach the 50% portion of the map? Lethal now coming in with thrust, BR, a couple of dynamo grenades. Quadrant better be careful. If they go down one more time, this will be a flag pull. And Camo coming up here in 24 seconds, Tony. I want to see if these members of Sentinels decide to go for a flag pull during this, or if they're gonna opt just to stay alive. Two Foxy's been spending too long over on the fridge. In fact, SLG's getting a flag pull during this. This is gonna be bad for Quadrant here in just a moment. They revealed their hands, they overextended, and now Sentinels are gonna be able to get a flag pull and likely in a stronger position for Camo, as Lethal is blocking those spawns over at Util and the flag, forcing all those members of Quadrant to be over in the fridge. These next couple of lives are gonna be so important and Sika taking the pivotal battle against Lethal, but a distraction. Sparty's able to get away with that camouflage. One more kill, Nita as two Foxy goes down. This flag is gonna be relayed forward. What a play by Sense. Flag still alive, just as I suspected. This one's not gonna go in easy though. There's gonna need to be more slay. Sparty kind of not sure where to go just yet. Decides to get a touch and runs it all the way back. He runs it so fast, but his base is under attack. Legend all the way in the back. 
getting a kill on Sparty. Collect the only one alive back here, and you know the pressure is coming in. And Collect decides, does he just desperate this flag in, or does he go for a fight? And he's too exposed there. You cannot take that route when you're one shot. Quadrant able to overwhelm the base. Collect goes for a high risk, high reward play, and it looks like it might just pay off because Lethal is able to get the touch in that B turn. Already being started here by Sentinels. Sentinels still in the okay position here. I still think Sentinels have the advantage, right? As I said before, when the flag's on your half the map, if you can trade kill for kill, your reinforcements are gonna spawn close, and that's all four down to Quadrant. That's the third flag going in for Sentinels. Three one lead coming out of Sentinels. Two caps away, or four minutes and 38 seconds away from going to a game number five. Sentinels will not go down easily, Sparty. Making the sidekick the main character in this story as he deals with one, make that three. Goes for the curb slide into the pole, but the final player live SLG makes a play. Great touch though. Just getting that flag out of the base now doesn't require Lethal to go all the way on the flag. But unfortunately, too much presence across the map here for Quadrant and Collect's just gonna be a nuisance in their back, a thorn in their sides. Just continually rotating back and forth from the flag to the util. Just realizing that if he just gets kills, he stays alive. Quadrant are gonna be in inferior positions. So a player sitting in the back of their opponent's spawn and putting down damage, staying alive, being <laughs> you know, being that ratty type of player. Who does that remind me? I, 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 I can't put my finger on I mean, on it it. Just, it's just music to my ears. It just sounds like the perfect play style in Halo here. But look at these continual fights there. When we're looking at Sentinels, when they are around the sides of the map when they're over in the back of quadrant space. They're just in these upper strong positions and continually shooting down on these players over a quadrant, forcing them to do something impressive. I always felt quadrant at the beginning of this game, they were doing everything right. They had control of the util side. They got the first pull, that first cap. They were doing everything great, but ever since then, it's been tough. That must be so frustrating for Two Fox. You know, Sparty's able to spot you out, almost able to take you down from the pit. You try to get away, and you're just being called out, eventually taken down with that camouflage. Quadrant wanted to use it to get that pull, but once again, Sentinels clear out their base, and once again, Sentinels have an opportunity to charge forward. Despite oh, Sentinels having a comfortable lead, it has not been a comfortable game. Look at how many times they've just had to fight out of the util. How many times have we seen this battle play over and over again? We see Quadrant with Heat Wave and Dynamo Grenades over in the Sentinels util. Sentinel members just run into one after the other, just having to give up their lives just to get the side of their base under control. Quadrant so good at continuously applying pressure here, and Sentinels are feeling it. They've been able to answer it so uh, so far, but how much can you take before you bend? How much can you take before you break? Look at the same battle once again, and Ooh. SLG clutching it up, getting the reversal on Lethal, getting the last shot on King Nick, and I feel like we're just having deja vu over and over again. Quadrant members over the Sentinels util, and battle after battle deciding who's gonna get control. Sparty somehow get a double kill on two Foxy and Sika. So just as we see a clutch double kill from SLG, we see a clutch double kill from Sparty, equalizing out those numbers. Luckily for Quadrant, they were able to burn that camouflage before going three down. So not quite a win, but a good job. Great awareness coming out of them. But Quadrant still now have to show what they can do on their defensive side. Sentinel yeah. show they can continuously clear out their base. Quadrant going to have to do the same thing. And mind you, there's only a minute 30 for Quadrant to put two on the board. Minute 30, Sentinels know that Quadrant are going more on the offensive. And they now have to decide, do they want to put this into a flag stalemate and push a flag out? Or do they just want to go back and go for the slaying game? Looks like Lethal decides to toss this one out, and in the event that they get more slaves, they're gonna run across. That's three down. SLG the last one down. This is going to be the dagger. Sentinels going for their fourth cap, and interestingly enough, Sparty even just blocking Fridge, because guess what? If there's one all the way back in their base, they're not gonna be able to easily get it over towards the Sentinels base, and they somehow need to acquire three captures in 60 seconds. Yeah, I don't want to say it's over, but Sentinels. Definitely look like the favorites, and I've been telling y'all, us from New Jersey, we just different. King Nick with the 20 <laughs> kills, 9 assists. Sparty with the 23 kills and 14 assists, and Collect ready to put the final nail in the coffin. I thought they were just gonna play this one slow and safe, but they decide to go for all five caps. Sparty gets taken down. Collect gonna try to slowly ease this flag in. Sprints down over, and that is going to be stopped once again, so. 
Unless somehow Quadrant get a uh, unblocked flag line running it all the way across, I still think this one is still going to be a 4-1 victory. Yeah, I love that by Quadrant though. You know, they're not quitting. They they obviously know they're gonna lose this uh, this game right here. We're going to a game number five, but they're not just gonna roll over. They are going to fight every last second, and every last second has been accumulated here. Sentinels are gonna win that four-one, and we are going to a game number five. Those are my two favorite words. In also, game also with the stat lines being highlighted more these days, I think people are realizing, saying, "Well, guess what? Nowhere in the stats is there an asterisk that says." Five of these deaths were in the last 20 seconds of a game that didn't matter. It's like, no, stats still just show the same across the board. So maybe these players playing it all the way out till the very end. That's how I go. I don't care if I win or lose. I just want to say it wasn't my fault. I, I'm <laughs> stat padded all day. I don't care. Because at the end of the day, as long as I go positive, I that was on you guys. That's probably why I'm a terrible white teammate. <laughs> well, what a huge comeback there and statement from Sentinels to win that 1-4-1. Series now tied 2-2. Two to two. Game number five is going to be Imperial Slayer. That one can be a swing. If you get the opposing team's turret, you get control of those snipes, it can take a big snowball lead for the other squads. But before we talk about Varian, let's take a quick look at the stats once again. Sparty McFly, 25, 17, and 15. Biggest numbers on the board there for Sentinels and the entire game. What stands out to me for Sentinels is the assist. Everybody, double digits across the board here for Sentinels. So every time Quadra continued to pressure that base, it took a full team effort to get them out. Those 1v1 fights don't work when that pressure is coming in. And that's why you see all of those assists across the board for Sentinels. That defensive strategy worked out. They cleared out their base and it continued to push forward right off of it. Well played by them. Yeah, 17 assists there from Two Foxy. Taking a quick look over at the rest of the stats, though. Obviously, Lethal put in two of the flags. Collective Sparty putting in one apiece. Legend getting the one sole flag for his roster. It was a good flag cap. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a good flag Great flag cap. Just need to see a couple more of them. Empyrean Slayer going to be our game number five. And you, t and you talked about it, it's, it's, it's going to be tough for either one of them, man. It's, it's Quadrant's offense versus Sentinel's defense. Uh, but before that, uh, there was plenty of re there was plenty of highlights throughout this entire series. Why don't we take a look at some of them? Yeah, look at SLG holding on to that stalk rifle. Also, one thing I noticed, it had 7% left in that stalk rifle. He grabbed that from the weapon rack and used it until nearly the very last bullet. So just making perfect effective use of that Bulldog and that Stalker Rifle. Every time he had that bull that Stalker Rifle, it was dangerous. But I also love King Nick really showing us what that sandbox is truly made of with that Disruptor. There's so, there's so much damage you can do, that residual damage, bouncing it off of those weird nade pads and weapons on the ground. I love the fact that King Nick is really able to open up the, the playbook a little bit, but there is no Disruptor on the period. Absolutely, yeah. One thing that's also interesting, we haven't really seen uh, used as much uh, with something like the Disruptor, is just how that delayed damage can come into play if you trade damage with the player. Someone pokes out, you fight VR versus Disruptor. You trade out, let's say, half your shields each. King Nick can roll out as soon as the shields come back, and the other person's shields are still going to be starting to regenerate with that delayed damage coming out of the Disruptor. So we're going into a game number five, and this has been a hard-fought battle. You know, let's say your team captain or your, your coach Chig or, or whoever it is, you're coming in. What are you telling your team to make sure that you can win this game number five? How are you motivating your crew? Well, Lethal might be calling people idiots on Twitter right now, so that might be what he's doing before the match goes on. <laughs> but what you're doing before this one is saying, hey, we took it game by game. You were down 2-1. This is what you were hoping for. As you were down in the series, you wanted this game five. Quadrant were not looking forward to this. They wanted to close this one out on Aquarius. So you want to continue that momentum. Keep a positive vibe on your team. Say, we were looking for this game five. Now let's close out the series. Now what's that going to look like on a game like Empyrean? Is your team more of a sit back, protect your sniper, wait for them to make a mistake, and then charge across? Or are you the aggressive team? Do you want to try to find a push across the map, pushing through sword side, try to make something happen versus waiting for a mistake. And that all comes down to your, to your team's gameplay. Just sometimes remind your team what you're 
win conditions are and how you play can reinforce a habit because that's the worst thing that can happen sometimes in a game five is if somebody plays completely unorthodox. They don't play the way they normally do. If you have someone that's normally aggressive and making a play that happens so your team can charge across the map and they have one or two deaths and they say, oh, well, I'm gonna step back. I don't wanna be the reason my team loses game five. I don't wanna have too many deaths. That can be a detriment. Even though it might look better on their individual stat score, you need that player to play consistently because those are the openings your team needs to win the game, to get that full setup, to get over to the opposing tower. It's all about being that unselfish player. Why don't we take a look at some of the stats and and what, what what's jumping out on the screen that you I know I see Collect with the highest KD on one side, I see Sika with the highest KD, but what what's what else is jumping out to the screen for you? Um, I would say the amount of damage. One thing that's surprising is uh, Spartan with the lowest damage by a margin on here on Sentinels. Yeah. And then one thing, like I said, I couldn't tell if this was just a one off as we saw on Live Fire Slayer for two Foxy, but two Foxy also off by a margin there on total damage output. I think damage dealt is one of those great indicators. You know, I've, I've talked about stats before with like Lucid and he's like, yes, it's a piece of the story. It's not the full story, but damage dealt for the most part to me says, you are doing work across the map, whether that's getting an engagement and finish off your kill, whether that's getting a melee off before you die so that your teammates can pick off that uh, finish. It's just such a strong indicator of how involved in the game you are. Now, you've obviously had plenty of battles on Pit, which appearing is the remake. Now, with that damage, does that directly correlate into, like, if, if, if a team's doing more damage, does that come out of the wins on Empyrean, or is that going to play a little bit different? Is it more of a shifty map? How does that translate into Empyrean? That's a good question, because I would say on Empyrean, it's a good stat if you're the one that's racking up kills, because that means you're finishing off some kills, you're getting some of your sniper, your rockets. But if you are getting too much damage dealt that's not being finished, some points you're probably taking too many wrong engagements. You're exposing yourself to too many times you can get picked off. If you're trying to just peek out through Green Hall or through the bridge just to lay down a couple shots, like that's not the damage you're looking for, Empyrean. You're seeing a lot more damage on Empyrean result in a kill. You want to see that damage turn into a flanker, turn into somebody getting over towards top turret, towards getting towards a spawn kill. You want that to really translate to something else. So. Compared to other maps, uh, I would say Empyrean, you want to, it's not as much of get as much damage dealt as possible and yeah. be as active across the map. Instead, it's gonna be very concentrated efforts across the map. Get some damage towards sword side, get someone flanking through runway, and get towards the opposing turret. Ultimately, these teams are just vying for those power weapons, those snipers, the rockets, and that overshield, or they're vying again the opposing top turret because it's such a difficult spot to clear an opponent out of. I'm not glad we have Quadrant on screen right here, but back of the heads a little bit, but we saw them on screen because to me, they're the biggest question marks going into the Superior Slayer. Like, I love that ultra-aggressive play style. I love that the fact that they're not afraid to pressure Sentinels to get into their face. And on a map like, uh, excuse me, Empyrean, which doesn't have dynamic spawns, you can punish a team for going two, three, four down, but... We've also seen like the optic way of playing it where it's like the bend but don't break strategy where they kind of yeah. control their side. It, there's so many ways you can play you, Empyrean Slayer. You can play it and I, I do predict that Empyrean will have more slower periods as the map evolves as we get later in the season. But with it still being so fresh and I think that these teams can still take such a strong advantage like you said of pushing over and getting, being aggressive and taking that top turret. Halo and like all these other top games is about risk versus reward. And right now, the risk versus reward factor is heavily in your favor if you mess up, let's say three pushes towards, towards the opposing turret, but you get the fourth one to work. At that point, you can rack up 10, 15 kills just because of how the spawns can be so focused and concentrated on that half of the map with the way it's currently designed. So, you're, so it's almost it almost makes sense to maybe make the unorthodox play, and maybe try to get yourself through runway, try to get yourself, and maybe if you're pushing even by yourself, but, but try to get to your opponent's tower, because like once you get there, it's a power position. It it is. It, it also also relies on the backup from your team. So I also don't view it as just like a a singular play. I don't think anyone at this high level play is just gonna single handedly flank the runway on their own. But no what's camera. gonna likely happen is. If a sniper gets a pick over towards the opposing sword or opposing top turret, pushing through sword, pushing someone through runway, immediately trying to fill in that gap where the opposing team can't punish it right away. I think that's where we're gonna see some successes here that are gonna come out in Charlotte on Empyrean. Things will eventually get locked out a bit more later in the year, but we are gonna see some big old swings here on Empyrean here in Charlotte.
All my oldies are gonna be happy about this, like my man sitting right next to me, won't she? <laughs> it's Pit, the remake, Empyrean, game number five, Slayer, winner takes all. Not only is it winner takes all in the series, this is likely gonna be for the second upper bracket slot here in Pool B. So this, this series cannot be understated. This can determine if you're going to upper bracket or lower bracket in the double limb. Zika has the overshield, trying to put some pressure. Collect going down with a heat wave, doing so much damage to that overshield has got to be gone and negated at this point. And Sentinels hold on to a one kill lead. Now, do they want to get aggressive and push this? Looks like Sparty's going to take an unorthodox angle like we talked about and bring the sniper all the way towards long haul. Sparty, one of the most dangerous sniper rifles players in the game here. As Quadrant go forward down, and look now at that. an opportunity to punish them. Yeah, look at that understanding the spawn system. Three went down, then getting that fourth down, and Sparty says, all right, I'm going to back up. I'm going to leave the baller spawns open, and Spartan's over towards top turret. Or sorry, King Nick's towards top turret, and look at this. Look at this damage like we call, called out before. King Nick <laughs> towards top turret. Nobody can push out easily through the Needler side or from Mauler all the way out towards the opponents on the base. It's still a 10-0 shutout. If I was out of the game, this would be a mercy rule. You'd say, all right, game over, mercy rule, 10-0. Restart the next one. <laughs> Let me tell you, man, Quadra must be getting coached by my cousin Owen. My cousin Owen 12 right now. <laughs> my God, somebody tell him the game started. Sparty and Sentinels are running house here and punishing them. Every single spawn has reticle trains on them. But this is the danger of a map like Empyrean, the way it's designed. They were able to get that first sniper down. They had control of the entire map. So Sentinels finding that one win of opportunity, getting the slays, and turning that three or four kills into 14 kills. So masterfully played by them. They're also not fully over committed right here. Look at this play. They realize they still have bridge. They can just rotate back and forth. They know weapons and power-ups are going to come up shortly. And they still, even though they gave up one kill and some members of Quadrant got uh, out of the base, they, anytime they get a Quadrant member dead, they're going for those spawn kills rather than trying to get full map control because they're not going to successfully be able to just charge all the way back towards the Sentinel's base with ease and get those clears. King Nick hasn't had the most consistent series so far here, but when he pops off, he pops off 7 and 0 oh before finally getting his first death, even having an assist to go along with it, a large reason why Sentinels have a dominant double-digit wow. lead as Sparty strips the overshield off of the dead bodies of Quadrant, uses it immediately to get the double kill. Now gonna look for the triple. He refused to be repulsed off the map. He's gonna play this side and eventually should find that kill. Right? Not only just repulsed, but I think he was also just trying to avoid the melee. Eventually got a little fed up and said he's gonna charge on over. But what a great play there from Sparty to wait for the last moment to drop on that OS, get the kill, also snatch that OS so it doesn't fall off the map and just patiently get kill after kill. He was in no rush. Decides to reposition the sniper over towards sword side. King Nick, where is his throne? I guess it's over towards top turret still, as this has been his home for this entire game. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you that at one point, this was a two to one series lead in favor of Quadrant, and this has been neck and neck and absolute fight. But here in game number five, it has been all Sentinel. Sparty is nine and one. K Nick is 11 and two. This is bad. This is bad for Quadrant. And that was actually interesting. Oh, yeah. King Nick eventually got picked off there. I was going to say, why would King Nick leave tower? But looks like as soon as they lost that top tower, that is Sentinel's note to say, all right, we no longer have the position at the opposing base that we want. Everyone can back up. Don't overforce, give up any free kills. And look at this, going for a montage clip. <laughs> Sparty eventually taken down, but the damage has been done. 20 kill lead for Sentinels. Right now, they're just worried about getting any sort of slays and not getting spawn trapped themselves because it's totally an option right now. If Quadrant continue this pressure on and get the Sentinels top turret. Sparty must have forgot that he ain't on phase anymore going for those trick shots. Hey, <laughs> you want Sentinels down, man. They, they know for something different. They known for dominating teams the same way that you see right here with 32 to 14 lead for Sentinels and uh, Quadrant are struggling right now. Something has to change. Also interesting from King Nick, just barely missing that, uh, that grenade through the green slot. A lot of times you get someone weak over at green, you can bank that grenade through that small little opening, that small mm -hmm. horizontal opening, and get it deep inside green to pick off someone who's run away where they expect to not be grenaded. 
At this point, Sensos are nading each other, <laughs> trying to give Quadrant <laughs> some kind of hope here. Rocket launcher coming up. It looks like Quadrant gonna dive right in. Legend gets no scope right to the wow. body here. It looks like King Nick able to pick it up, but two Foxy will remain with the rocket. Sentinels end up getting wiped here. So now you have rockets and overshield in the hands of Quadrant. If a comeback is possible, it's gonna be on the backs of both of these power runs. It is, but I would expect them to take over towards top turret. In fact, looks like Sentinels trying to go a step ahead. They run into the trap of two Foxy. They just assumed that top turret was gonna be taken, and the pressure is mashed all the way through long haul. That's four down for Sentinels. But still, we have yet to see top turret taken. Sika, I love that play. That's so sick. Repulse, overshield top turret. They thought it was a safe spot, and then they tried to get over more positioning on their base. In fact, it was not safe, though, because Sika just took a sneaky, sneaky route to get that power position. It isn't over till it's over, and although it looks bleak, Quadrant still have an opportunity to come back here. The 40 kill mark has not been reached yet. Absolutely not over yet, because right now, Quadrant have control of the Sentinel's base. Sniper come up in 20 seconds, as say. This is a strong position here for Quadrant if they can hold on to their lives, but they are in some trouble. Actually, Sniper already popped. I don't know who has it. Did they run it out towards Sword? SLG maybe had it? But right now, that spawn trap has been broken, so what was looking like a glimmer of hope here for Quadrant is gone. Collect now has a full Sniper back at his base. Quadrant don't have the extra lives to toss to try to get a top turret control. And this is going to be a slow bleed, I feel, and fear for Quadrant. Just six kills needed for Sentinels. Meanwhile, holding on to a double digit lead. Collect with the sniper rifle in hands right now. And Quadrant forced to slow the game down entirely. Like you said, there's no lives they can waste at the moment here. And Sentinels have no problem doing the same thing, staying on their side. And Five minutes on the clock, I'm, I'm assuming we're not going to see this for five minutes. I don't think we'll see it for five minutes, but right now, Quadrant, you know, they're they're seeing the writing on the wall. It's a difficult spot to be in when you're down by so much, and you're just kind of saying, well, what do we even do here? They have Sniper, they have positioning. But the one thing you can do and hope for is you have to play around the power weapons. And secondly, if that opening presents itself, they need to all charge across the map. It feels like it could be a desperate play and potentially give up kills, but ultimately you're just gonna wait and die and lose this game anyway. So your only shot of winning is gaining control of the opposing base. Here comes the push here from Quadrant. Two members get taken down by Spartan though. That is now only four kills away for King Nick and King Nick wants to go to King Nick's throne where he's been this entire game over on the Quadrant turret. Sentinel's waiting for the right opportunity to get into the offensive set. And that's exactly the overshoot is coming up. And now on his team, they have a little bit of that overshoot to work with. He even has the heat wave as well. Back to back kills for Sentinels. Quadrant, go down. 50 31 victory. Strong statement for Sentinels. But Quadrant should still hang their heads high because that was an impressive matchup from both these sides, especially given all the circumstances and issues that their squad was facing coming into this event. If there's one thing I learned from that series is don't count Quadrant out. Not Team at Foxy's all. Team Foxy's a real deal. Even in, even in that, like, I think maybe ended like 10 and 8, so he still ended a positive with a low amount of deaths. Like, some way, somehow, two Foxy just shows shows his real skill set. It shows that that the way Quadrant play is the way that he wanted to play when he was on Na'Vi. He wants to play fast. He wants to play pressure Halo. And honestly, two Foxy really impressed me despite the fact that Sentinels ended up with the win on that it's one. It's just a heartbreaker of a, a game five as well. Like we talked about, you know, as we were breaking down Perian slash Pit, it's a snowball -y map. If the opposing team gets that full set up like that, it can snowball. We saw it with a 14-0 or 15-0 start there. And that's essentially the lead that they carried on to the end of the game. 16 kills, six assists to go along with it with King Nick and also 4,500 damage. Even when King Nick wasn't putting up all of the stats in the world, he still had high damage in the games that he pops off really shows up in the stat sheet. My X factor for that game was King Nick all day. King Nick was crushing just over on that top turret. It's just a strong position. And he knows probably those small nuanced differences, knowing how to dodge grenades coming from the back ramp, anyone lobbing grenades towards top turret, just doing a really, really good job. 3-2 win for Sentinels. Quadrant 
They're still alive. They're still in pool play. They're still going to do their thing, but Sentinels really showing us how strong they are. Yeah, Sentinels just came out to play. Uh, they are a team still to be absolutely feared. Same time, Quadrant, uh, a squad that some teams and players might have counted out, some of the Spectators might have counted out based on their last minute swap. Absolutely not. Two Foxy came here to play. Two Foxy's looking good. And we expect them to, to close out pool play the best they can. I expect them to likely be third in pool play and have to make a lower bracket run. Well, that's your match. You know how we feel about it, but I want to know how Lottie and the Deaths feel about it. Why don't we send it over to Lottie and the gang? Thank you so much, Tony and Walshy. Great cast, guys, as per usual. And Desk, I mean, it's our turn to react. And my reaction is, wow, what a close series that really was. Going all the way to game five there. I was actually really impressed with Quadrant. I know we had a bit of a back and forth between you two on the Desk, right. but how this Quadrant roster was going to perform. And before we get to Sentinels, Gaskin, I've got to turn to you and ask you about Two Foxy. For me, he was performing so well considering the circumstances. And you did say that he's been waiting for his chance to prove himself in Halo Infinite. Is he doing that for you here today? I think so. I mean, he wouldn't have been as well practiced as maybe some other European players that could have filled those boots, but they trusted his experience. They trusted what he was capable of, and he showed that in games one to five. Like, I think every game he stood up to the rest of the roster. He made sure he was going up against every, every opposition. He was winning engagements. He looked incredible when he was winning them as well. And I do think that even though it was a loss, there was a lot to take away there for Quadrant as they look to progress in the rest of this tournament. Remember, there was a Quadrant at Worlds that won this kind of game against the second seed, but then lost to Team War. They lost to a team, and then that was a team that came from open bracket, right? So Quadrant, they need to just make sure that they get that job done at this tournament. Yeah, and obviously it's going to be a difficult bumpy road for them. They do have that brand new addition last minute, you know, things out of their control. So, you know, hats off to them for, for that incredible, uh, incredible series. And unfortunately, couldn't get the win, but Sentinels looking pretty damn strong on the other side, going from strength to strength here. And Wes, you know, we have to talk about Spartan again. He's making plays for this roster. Talk to me about Recharge Our Ball. What did you notice? Yeah, a lot of individual plays to get over the hump here. Maybe not the most dominant win that I kind of expected on the side of Sentinels on Oddball and throughout the series, honestly. This series went a little bit too long for my liking for Sentinels is really opportunity, but this is an incredible play using the repulse to get the stick onto the second player. Another one, it's a fast ball. When you're able to process like that and make plays like that, you just create so much opportunity. But this is the thing, without those plays, what's the score to the game, right? And, and unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to continuously make plays like this, especially as you climb the bracket. So for Sentinels, they've still got to figure out a way to have a little bit more cohesive teamwork, a little bit better efficient strategy, and we'll see how long they fare against some of the best teams in the world. Because I mean, obviously Quadrant, a very solid team, a lot of talent, but a sub on their roster coming into today. This is going to be one of the easier matches I think Sentinels play throughout this tournament. Indeed, and as we look at the stats coming in from that series here, Gaskin, I think some of the big development questions for Sentinels is have they developed just a little bit since their series versus Optic coming into this one against Quadra? I know the score's a lot better, but in terms of the play style, you know, the team, you know, what, what kind of things can come across the board here? Yeah, I think I mean, a series against Optic is going to be a very different one. I don't think that Sentinels would expect to necessarily be matching Optic at this stage. It's a new team, it's a new roster that has to learn, that has to grow. I think they would have been a little bit worried about some of these results against Quadrant, especially considering how favorable the series was for them, how good they've been throughout qualifiers on a lot of these game types. And I do think that if that was a different game five on a different Slayer, it could have been a different result. Imperium Slayer was the best way Sentinels could have finished that series. The way they push their advantages is unreal. They're a pleasure to watch when it comes to that map and mode but then it's everything else. What happens now when they go up against a bigger and better team like Wes is talking about, and maybe there's some different series layouts there that they have to work with. That would be where my concern is. How are they learning? How are they developing? But certainly some good signs. 100% certainly are some good signs. I love how you always have the stats, Dan. You always make sense of things for me up right. here and for the viewers, so we love having you up on the desk. Wes, you're great too. Right, You're pretty good. You're pretty good as well. Somebody who always makes sense of things and is always checking around the arena for any little things that he can give us in terms of intel is Blaze. And he did actually manage to catch up with our A and Z keyboard and mouse player, Scoobmeister, to find out how that open bracket run is going to go. Blaze, it's over to you. 
What's up, everybody? Blaze here, and I'm in an open bracket with a very special player. It's Scoob from Team Vertex, and what makes Scoob so special, he qualified to come to this tournament, travel and everything paid for, but not by a controller, by the mouse and keyboard. So, Scoob, tell me about how has your squad's open bracket run been so far, and what has your tournament been like? Uh, so, so far, our team run has been very good, considering that we've come a very long way, coming from Australia, which is a relatively smaller and, you know, lesser unknown region. Working our way up into the open bracket has been, has, has been a good time. We, the first two teams initially were relatively easy, but uh, our last matchup was against Native White, losing to a fellow Australian barcode. And now we're in the lower bracket waiting for, you know, our, our next matchup, see how far we can push it. Uh, and so, as you said, a fellow Australian in Barco, you're coming all the way from Australia to get here. What was it like playing up against him? And when it comes down to you playing on mouse and keyboard versus controller, what type of other advantages that you can get from that um, versus being on the sticks? Uh, so playing against Barco, it's, a, you know, a bit of fresh air, seeing a fellow, you know, a familiar face. Because if we want to lose to anybody over here, we'd rather lose to one of our own, so we didn't really take the loss too hard. But um, the advantages of mouse and keyboard, as of recent, they've really closed, the gaps have been closed, considering the, the recent uh, competitive update, giving mouse and keyboard aim assist. So yeah, it's, it's closer than ever, and it's a real good fighting chance for mouse and keyboard players. Yeah, it really is as close as ever, okay? And if you guys want, you know, playing on mouse and keyboard and you want to be an ACS pro, hey, now is the better time than ever to get up into the game and lock it in. Now, any shout outs you want to give to the people that's been supporting you all the way from Australia, you know, what you got to say to them? Uh, I want to give a shout out to my family and my girlfriend. They've been extremely supportive of my, um, of my journey in competing, you know. Now that they see that I'm competing overseas, they're more supportive than ever and they'll help me give it my all. So I'm really appreciative to them and everyone back home. Mm -hmm. Well, give me some dap. Shout out to Vertex, okay? And we got Scoob here. Well, I'll keep bringing you the updates from them in the open bracket. I know he got to go play right now. They just called his name on the intercom, okay? So I'm going to let you get locked and loaded and uh, don't go anywhere, okay? Keep watching everything, you guys. I got you with those updates. Yeah, Blaze, you can't be holding up all of the competition in the open bracket. They've got one hell of a ride this weekend to get into the pool play, but really, really cool to catch up with Scoob Meister. What a nice guy as well. Very and cool. Clutch, I know that you're a stan of mouse and keyboard. Absolutely. I support the kid, and I'm <laughs> happy that he's here. I wanted to see how many mouse and keyboard players we had. Obviously, not many, but if I was competing, I'd be playing mouse and key. I, I knew you would. Yeah, yeah, is it because of the arthritis? Get a bit old now. Have <laughs> no, to change because it up opens a bit. up every opportunity of the world, Dan. I can kill you and then 180 kill Shurs at the same time. <laughs> I can 1v2. Uh, we'll Absolutely see. love it. Well, gents, <laughs> we have some more series coming our way today, of course, for day number one. And we just saw a huge battle on that main stage between Sentinels and, of course, Quadrant, one of Europe's most promising teams. But only one victor will take that dub, and it's going to be Sentinels getting that much-needed score in their pool as well. But next up, we have FaZe versus Rebellion. It's sure to be a bloodbath coming your way right after the break. Stop that! You filthy animal! Takes down one, he takes down 
two, and they know where the last two players are as well. Snake by oh, your dead as well, oh, making an over jam! Overkill for Jimbo! Talk about Cloud9, talk about the splice roster has had so much success. It's found the missing piece they need as he's making play after play, play after play. You got the heat, you've got the snipe. Oh, it's all headshots for Snake Point! Oh, big time snipe out of Stellar, and that's gonna close the door in game number one as Cloud9. This is a great, great position for G1 right now. They just have to pick off these players, they have the angles, they just need the damage. I liked everything that Boo Boo Doo Boo did there. Give him the overkill! And Boo Boo take my Doo Boo once again, baby! Orlando with the seconds, and now the journey is complete! Optic Gaming! The green wall stands tallest! As we're just a few moments left. Wait! Wait a second, you're Wait one a second! Hey, BG! That was off. The game isn't over yet. There's no way. Somehow, Cloud9. Now we can say it. Oh my God! It's a premature celebration, even on the stage for Optic Gaming. They thought it was over. C9 was in the hill the whole time. APG was shaking. He couldn't believe it. They forced a reset there in overtime for just a few extra seconds. Optic had no idea. We had no idea. And in the end, now we can say that Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions. I mean, we said, right, this has been the craziest week. The craziest tournament of all time. What other way would you have it end? But now that we are finally at its conclusion, Optic Gaming are your Halo World Champions! This is the world's most advanced processor. In entertainment, its rendering speeds render other processors obsolete. It drives the future of autonomous driving, powers cloud services for billions, helps change the course of climate change, connects communities of gamers anytime, anywhere and uses AI to accelerate disease detection and cures. We make the world's most advanced processors, but only with your vision can we advance the world. AMD, together we advance. <laughs> oh, he is awake. Richie, Scherzi, Sheridan clocking eight hours of sleep there. And you gotta wonder if the jet lag is gonna be a factor coming across the Atlantic. And here he is getting ready to face the day. And take a look at the Shamrock Jam. He's bringing in a little bit of taste to home here in Charlotte. You can tell that maybe he's gonna have a slow start. Let's take a look and oh, I think that's gonna be the first yawn of the day. That is a big one. That's a wide mouth bass. And oh, a shake of the head and a fierce look in his eyes. And I think this man is ready to go. And here comes the moment we've been waiting for. Full extension and this is incredible. Bro, get the out of my room. All right, folks, stay tuned for more coverage of Richie Shirsey Sheridan's first morning here in Charlotte. Welcome back, Halo fans. I'm going to have to do this intro mid-giggle because that was just too good. <laughs> One exceptional way to come back to the show. Uh, absolutely love all of these. Make sure you are staying tuned, of course, throughout the major for incredible skits like that. That will be coming your way. We're going to be, you know, secretly popping them in here and there. So make sure you are tuning in. Get those tabs open as Twitch drops. But more importantly, there's incredible action going on behind us as well. Welcome back, folks. I enjoy my clutch and Tony on the desk. And lads, you know, Paul's 
They've been getting a bit carnage It's been getting a bit wild out there. You know, we just had our first game five of the day. It's been absolutely incredible. Tony, how do you feel like full play is going? I think Google has been incredible. I got the chance to cast that game number five, and it was crazy. It went down to the wire, and I thought Quadrant were almost able to do it, but Sentinels come out on top, and uh, whoever comes in the open bracket in Pool B, they're going to have a tough time on their hands. They certainly are indeed in clutch. Looking at some of the results that are coming across here, but not just the results, the fashion that they have formed in. What are your overall thoughts? Yeah, so far, no upsets, right? And that means the one, the two seeds, they're pretty comfortable sitting in these pool plays. But these three seeds that are 0-2, well, they got one series against an open bracket team to determine if they're going to be even having an opportunity to move on to an elimination bracket or if their tournament's over here and now. So that's a lot of pressure to put on these three seeds. We'll see if any of them can falter or if they're going to start to get that ball going in the right direction. We've seen a lot of talented teams here that are still 0-2. And I worry that we might not see a lot of these teams later on. Indeed, and looking at Pool A as well, we're going to see a team potentially cement themselves as the top seed in just a moment. we got FaZe versus Rebellion on the main stage. And both of these teams are pretty ready to take that top position in their pool. I just got to find out who it's going to be. I think in terms of Rebellion, you know, it's about whether or not they change the meta enough to catch FaZe off guard. Things haven't been going their way in terms of scrims and the qualifiers against this team. But Lan is a different beast and Ryan Oob always has something up his sleeve. It really is a baptism of fire here, Clutch. But what do you make of Rebellion and what they're going to bring to the table? They're going to have to bring a lot of individual skill to the table. They're going to have to figure out a way to win gunfights against a very strong FaZe team. I expect Rebellion to make a couple plays here, a couple plays there. But, I mean, FaZe are not going to give you a lot of openings. And you better take advantage of the ones they do. Yeah, indeed you will. Tony, I mean, looking at what Ryan Oob said on the desk, he has every faith in Karl Mayer and Mental. And how they performed earlier on, they were lights out. Are you confident in this team going up against FaZe? I'm confident in this team and not going up against FaZe. As many times as Ryan Oob says that that trio don't play Halo the right way, let me tell you, they play one way. That's win their gunfights, play fast, play coordinated, and FaZe are the number one team going into this tournament for a reason. I love Rebellion, but... I'm sorry, I think FaZe come out on top. Yeah, it's going to definitely be a bit of a shaky one here, but from what Rebellion has showed so far, I think you do have to put a little bit of faith into this roster. They are definitely performing lights out right now, so we'll see exactly what happens. On the other side of things, though, the stage is set red. It is demon mode time for FaZe. They have something to prove here. Yes, qualifiers have been great. Online tournaments have been great, but that is online. We're here at LAN. This is where you have to prove your point. And Clutch, how good is this team? All right, boys. They made the change for the reason seven years of teaming with Lethal. It's out the window right now. You picked up Renegade. Why'd you do it to win championships? We'll see our first glimpse of this FaZe roster here against a very strong Rebellion team. And I expect to see FaZe coming out swinging. And we're going to see exactly the ceiling that this team is capable of. I'm very excited to get this series underway and one, watch this team comp compete at its first time on main stage because if this team's half as good as I think they're going to be, they're going to be on main stage a lot throughout their career. Now, Tony, you did get to cast a lot. And looking at the qualifiers, the results, and what happened in those, how are you feeling about Renegade and what he does for this roster? I think it just adds a level of firepower that just opens up the entire map for his team. Watching him and Frosty navigate the map together and just put down so much damage. Royal 2 sitting behind them and just kind of covering their backs. And then, you know, you have Snakebite, who obviously went through a, a, a big role change in what he's going to bring to the table for this team. But he's just out here like, oh, right, you guys, you guys, I'll hold the ball. I'll chill out over here. I'll make my IGL play cost over here. You guys go slay and do your thing. <laughs> Indeed. I think, you know, this, this change has changed the entire dynamic of this roster. I think in particular, Royal 2, I think it's giving him a lot more comfortability and confidence. He can actually be a lot more aggressive right now with Renegade coming in. Now, how does it change for him as a player? We're seeing a very main slaying role coming out for Royal 2. I mean, that's the big thing is Royal 2 gets to sit back, kind of like Tony prefaced a little bit. I would say that like Renegade's creating so much space, snake bites up in people's faces all the time, getting entry damage. Royal 2 now has more information, more space to play around, has more angles covered, and he He's just got to hit his shots. And if there's anything Royal 2 does, it's hit shots. So I think <laughs> he needed something to help him figure out, to feel more comfortable in these games, to have space in front of him in order to play around. Because once you give Royal 2 that opportunity, he takes over games. He's been doing it for 15 years. So I'm excited to watch how Renegade compliments specifically Royal 2. I think he's going to be in store for his best infinite tournament yet.
Well, we will see how close it's going to get on that main stage in just a moment. We have our casters at the ready, so please make some noise for Onset and your colour caster of the year. That's him. That's Ooh. him right there. That's him right there. That's Still, a shared award. They can't take the award away from you shared either. That's award. the great thing about it. Uh, welcome, everybody, though. What a game we have in front of us. And just like waiting for a brand new order of a shiny new car, we finally get that delivery, Andy. Yeah. We get our first look on the main stage at this brand new phase roster. What, what a time to be alive. It is exciting. As we said, and you heard them talking about on the desk, the threat to the throne here, a team that was built to take down Optic Gaming. The question is, are they the Optic Killer? We have three days of gameplay to find out, but let's take a look at the series layout here for their match against Shopify Rebellion. It's going to be the same series layout that we saw a little bit earlier on when we uh, started things off today. Argyle capture the flag, game number one. Imperian Slayer, game two. Strongholds live fire, Opal Streets, and if we need it, of course, at the end there, you have Slayer Recharge hanging on for dear life if we do need to see that game five. But I think it's only right that we focus on phase to start off with, right? The team change that's come in was one that shook everyone. It was one that was rumored for quite some time. Yeah. And if you look at the history of team changes that involve Snakebite and Royal 2. There's something very, very interesting. Yes. In they haven't got it wrong very often. They have not. Let's not forget the last time that Snakebite and Royal 2 dropped a teammate, it was Ogre 2. Now they've dropped Lethal, and now you can easily say that they've dropped what have been named the number one and number two Halo players of all time. And so far, it has worked out for them. The question is, will it work out this event? Will it work out this season? Their first test on the main stage will be Argyle CTF against Shopify Rebellion, currently 1-0 in pools as well. And Shopify Rebellion looked pretty darn good yeah. earlier on as well. A very, very convincing series victory for them. The question is, is this the step up in level for them? And will they be able to match it? It's only right that we start off with a new addition to this phase roster. It's going to be Renegade. That's right, Renegade unleashed on this roster. That's at least what he's hoping to be. So far on the qualifiers, he's done just that, and he gets a free ticket. Bottom middle, he's already on the flank here, sees the opponents through glass. Yeah, what an opening strategy this is from Renegade as well. And it looks like he's not gonna be sniffed out for now. He's Ooh. trying to find the sniper rifle player in Mental. Gets the repulse, gets the pancake, pancake. and takes him down. The flag is away though, and Renegade is last alive here for phase. Yeah, this is interesting here. As you said, Renegade left on his own. The flank worked but all the rest of his teammates do go down. He steals the sniper, and he stays alive back base. Ryan Noob knows he's there, though. Ryan Noob knows he's a problem. Snakebite picks up one on the flag carrier. Now Ryan Noob's got a player behind him, has no idea that Frosty is there. And Renegade taking that attention away was the difference. And now look at this aggression coming in from Frosty. He's got a sniper rifle, couldn't care less. Flies in with the grapple. Frosty steals that last grapple. Fight. Oh boy, he's gonna do it to as well. Oh, Answers back, raid resilience from Carmea from the bottom base. He will stay alive and get the snipe ammo as well. This man was absolutely ridiculous in the first series that we saw him today. And I tell you what, this man alongside Collect certainly a name to watch as this season rolls on. But Renegade opens the map up here for FaZe Clan. Double kill for him. You saw in the match earlier just how much back and forth there is, how much jousting there is between the teams at the opening and even the mid-game of an Argyle CTF. A lot of control necessary before you go in for those flag pulls. For now, it's going to be a bit of a mid-map battle, like you mentioned, as we are going to see many, many times. Carmea is trying to make a little bit of a flank here, should be dealt with, and now Royal 2 gets more information, and Royal 2 doing good damage, but again, a good push from Shopify Rebellion, making sure they're playing in those twos, and even though two of their teammates did fall, they pick up a little bit of an equalizer in the kill feed. Absolutely, now Rain here, just staying alive at screens. One thing you and I talked about a lot, Mark, as we watched the qualifiers, and really all the matches we've seen on Argyle so far, this map really is a movement master's paradise. So many Ooh. drop slides, curb. Ooh, one! Almost gets two. Those kills will be traded out eventually in the vent, but really, you can master the movement tech on this map in an area like screens, an area like E1, E2. You can really catch opponents off guard. And speaking of, here's Ryan Noob with his second camo of the game. Second camo in a row for Shopify Rebellion, and an opportunity now for them to put some pressure onto the base of FaZe Clan. Frosty will fall, Kamea, again, with that sniper rifle. Royal 2, no idea that Ryan Noob is behind him. That's going to be three dead here for FaZe Clan, and almost more importantly, two sniper rifles now in their hands. Absolutely. It looks like Frosty was last player alive back elbow. Spawn should be coming in. Yes, they will join him on elbow as well. Ryan Noob is going to be aware because Mental's already back base. Had the camo for just a second. It dissipated just the wrong time for him. If he could have held down that angle, then all of FaZe would have been in trouble. Ryan Noob just needs to hit a body shot here, and this might be an opportunity for a flag run, but FaZe keep that pressure on. But Mental is doing a great job in the back of the base here. Car is on the push from screens as well. If they can trade out these kills on the back of the base, it might be a Oh, Snake by with good shots in the back of the base. He will force Ryan Noob down. So right now, Shopify, even though they had three players spawning elbow, not able to capitalize just yet. Look at that angle from Frosty as well. Shooting from the elbow through that window. 
Mental gets one. Frosty finally finishes off the kill on Ryanu, but more importantly, that means a power weapon down in the bottom of the base. Rain's gonna try and pick it up, but Frosty, making sure to prioritize these kills in his base, has to clear outside. Now we can think about moving forward. That's right, Frosty probably knew if he gave Rain another second, he might have gotten turned on as well. So Frosty does very well to prioritize that kill as quick as he can. Three and a half minutes in, no flags on the board just yet. A lot of back and forth, as we said, it attempts to control, attempts to pull those flags have not come across just yet. These teams are going to need to look for even more convincing control before a flag goes home. Once again, Frosty prioritizing the right kill. Knew he had a teammate behind him, didn't have to worry about that player behind him because his teammate made sure that that damage was done to keep him alive. And now Shopify Rebellion starting to fall one by one, two by two, and momentarily three dead. It should be four dead in a few moments' time if Frosty can take down Carmea in the back of the base, which is aggressively. Should be able to get the kill, somehow stays alive for the killing spree as well. And now he's got his eyes trained on the Shopify Rebellion sniper rifle. That was either a Carmea nade or a teammate nade that gave Frosty that kill after the repulsor. In the end, it doesn't matter. He doesn't care how it works. It just works out for him. And he stays alive bottom base. But once again, you cannot waste any time. However, all of that control does lead to a camo grab for Snakebite in face. Here he is on the elbow. Snakebite doesn't really have much support, though. You can see he's just trying to get behind enemy lines here. Listen to the information that's being given to him by his teammates to make the play off the back of it. Now, he knows that Kamei has got a sniper rifle. If he can take him down quickly, then maybe there might be an opportunity for them to push. At the moment, he's still making defensive plays, trying to drag all of Rebellion back into their base. And now he looks for that flagpole, looks for the little G-slide off the ramp, and that's the tech we're talking about. That's exactly it. Nice little slide there. Needs to win this against Kamei and knows that he can't leave him there. Gonna decide to run this and try to get to the E1 angle before the sniper comes back. And he's able to just break the line. And now gonna continue flag on over halfway home. Look at this run from Snakebite. It's Beautiful. brilliant. He is weaving through the kills that are being picked up by his teammates. Snakebite, the objective mastermind of this team, puts FaZe up by one. A beautiful run showing he had the perfect picture painted of exactly what was going on on the map. Absolutely beautiful run. And I gotta give you credit, Mark. You were saying that the flag runs, something that's gonna be so key is hitting those slides off of each to just speed the run up even faster. Snakebite hits those perfectly. You heard them talking on the desk about what Snakebite's role is on this squad. In the qualifiers, it was very heavily objective focused. However, a lot of that came down to his ping online as well. I got to talk to Snakebite yesterday as a killing spree on your screen, by the way, for Frosty. Talking to Snakebite about his role, and he said, it's really going to come down to the first day. I'm going to feel it out with this team, and I'm going to understand exactly how much objective play I need to play. I think that was a pretty great example that he knows exactly what he needs to do in those situations. Renegade also heating up with a snipe. Renegade's gonna have so much fun with this weapon on this map. Some of the stat lines he's gonna put up are gonna be certainly ones to talk about in the future. For now, he's at eight and six, so a positive two. Frosty leading the way, though, for the squad. 15 and eight as he picks up another kill with a sniper rifle, but he just had that camo being popped, and his snake bite has got it in his hands. Great control here. At this moment, from the side of phase, two dead for Shopify Rebellion. Mental, by the way, was 11 and four earlier. He was leading the whole game. However, now Frosty just off that killing spree is 16 and 8, double positive after that move and just absolutely popping off here. 5.30 left on the clock. Faze still leading 1 to 0. Snake Bite using that camo again just to be annoying, just to be a nuisance. Dragging so much attention away from Rebellion. Allowing his teammates to get into power positions on the map, hold down some of these angles. And at the moment, it's working for FaZe, but still just a one-flag game. Plenty of time left for Shopify Rebellion in this game to turn things around. Now you're seeing the push start to come in. Power weapons taken out of the hands of FaZe, and Rebellion pushing past that 50-yard line, starting to put some pressure on the FaZe base. FaZe with two dead here on the POV or Royal 2, probably heading vent. It's a perfect time with 4.59 left in the game to get into a listen-in with FaZe Clan. I'm going this map, I'm going to Three here on me, three. There, there, there. I got one hit sidekick. Nice. Another one shot, another one shot he's sniped. I'm pushing shot, let's push shot, let's push shot. Are you He's a uh, weak low. I, sh I should have him, I should have him. Right, so he went low, he went low. He went low. He's right, he's right. Walking the fly, bro. Snow's coming, Billy. He's one shot behind you, behind you, behind you, behind you, I'll come, Brad, I'll come. Yeah, what's going there, Rain? Nice, nice, good kill, good kill. Huge, huge, huge. Uh, rain, rain one hit there, bro. One mid, one mid, one mid. Rain one hit there, bros. Rain one hit. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking. I'm dead from our shotty, I killed Rain. He's our shotty going up, he's our shotty ramp. Our shotty ramp going to street. I'm gonna find him. You two work together on that. Yeah, let's get these snipes to 20. Our back flag as well, bro. Yeah, our back flag, our back flag. Our back flag, our back flag. Our I'm 
They're sniping. They're sniping right now. They're sniping. You ran their flag. Ran their flag. One shot. Sniping. Are you done? Yeah, PJ has I can't. I can't push this guy. He has repulsor our flag. Yeah, that's fine. PJ, just keep him. Keep him. They're shotting. They're shotting. They're shotting. I'm gonna play for him. One shotty. One shotty. One shotty. One shotty. We have everything here. I'm, yeah, I'm just playing for him. Yo, yo, man, 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 man. Start walking right. This guy. Yeah. I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm chasing. Yeah, he's going to you, he's going to you. Sniper on one here, sniper on one here, sniper on one here. You can rush him. Yeah, there's three, no, there's three here. I'm playing. Sniping their back flag, sniping their back flag. There's two, there's two, there's two about to be on back. Our flag, our flag. They're playing a shotty side. Alright, alright, alright. Once there's two, there's two. They're shotty sniping, they're shotty sniping. I need to have shots. Another flag right front base. Nice, nice. You're sniping our fucking, our man, our man. On the ramp, on the ramp, on the ramp. As we jump back into the game, the score stays the same. Rebellion getting that flag moving, but something you wanted to comment on for that listening is the comms of Renegade. Yeah, comms of Renegade sound great. I think a lot of people might have wondered exactly how is Renegade going to fit in in terms of communication, right? Sometimes it's a little bit of a quieter player that just lets the numbers do the talking. However, I loved what I heard during that listing. You could kind of hear there's a real energy and an urgency to the comms. However, still really calm and overall organized communication coming out of phase. Also, we got to say, great camo play from Frosty. Uh, there was a lot to play for there. He had a lot of incoming information during that listening and players that were weak around him. He slow plays it, gets the back back on the flag carrier, and as a result of all that, they will still in the lead. 1-0 with 2.30 left on the clock. 1-0, one, one bullet left here for Renegade and his sniper rifle as well. And I've got to give a lot of credit, actually, to how FaZe Clan have approached the game since they got that first flag on the board. They have the lead. They also have Renegade just doing what Renegade does, which is no-scoping unaware players. Almost picks up the double on terrain as well. But they haven't taken any risks. They haven't needed to. They've demanded the respect of their opponents that, and that 50-yard line by having the lead. Getting the power weapons, holding the snipes, clearing their base out has been number one priority. Absolutely. Uh, three dead again. Back to back. Snake bites your last player alive uh, twice in a row now. And we'll see if this flag will continue. It should for Shopify if they play this correctly. Snake by still alive in the vent, just tanking damage. Oh, almost does a terrain. However, he stays alive long enough to buy the team time. Camo's up as well. He's still Renegade's just got away with the camo. Frosty gets bodied as well, but after doing a good amount of damage himself, Renegade gets away with that camo. And you have to say, with Shopify having the kills that they had in that position, Surprising to see Renegade allowed to live with that power up. They had three dead back to back and Snakebite trapped in the vent. Somehow Snakebite buys enough time for the team to keep that flag at home. However, the pull happens again. Flag is moving. Rain's got that flag in there his hands is. and phase. They find themselves too dead at the moment, Kamea. He's got a sniper rifle, then no one really looks oh! like they're gonna be able to get across the map, especially with Kamea just destroying skulls. What an angle, take a look at this by way. Shout out to the observers catching this flag run at the same time in parallel, no pull cap goes in. Shopify Rebellion, they pick quite a time to strike. They will tie the game at one to one with one minute left on the clock. And again, it's Kamea. Kamea making plays. If he doesn't hit those couple of shots, yeah. the flag goes home. Frosty was there inside of the base, causing a ruckus. But he manages to body him as well as ripping the face off a snake by bottom middle. Insane reaction times from him. And now FaZe, who have done so well defensively, this is the problem with playing defensively. If you let one flag go, when you've only got a one flag advantage, all of a sudden the momentum is back on the side of Shopify Rebellion, but it's raw face to life. They have three dead, they're getting that flag moving once more. Beautiful late game composure really from both sides here. A tug of war back and forth, three dead for Shopify. Carmeo was the only player with an angle. Snakebite will let the shields recharge and continue the run. We talked about him being the objective master. He's doing it yet again. Just weaving this flag back in the same way we saw him a few moments ago. Here it is. Whoop. 10 seconds till the sniper's coming up. With 10 seconds left on the clock, it's all about this flag cap here. Shopify Rebellion trying to make a last second stand, but they can't do it. And Snakebite puts in his second flag of the game. A little bit of pull there. Frosty gets a stop on the stand. That will be it. FaZe will take game number one. And they said, you think you might have picked the right time to strike? We will one-up you with our flag cap that comes in with four seconds left to steal the game away from Shopify Rebellion. Quite a late game effort from FaZe. They strike when it counts, and they will now have a 1-0 to zero lead in the series. Not for the first time we've seen FaZe leave it late yeah. on an Argyle capture the flag, but they leave it late for a reason, because they're waiting for that perfect opportunity, waiting for that perfect moment to get that flag running. You have to say, they soaked up a lot of pressure from yep. Shopify Rebellion in that game once they got that first flag cap. The one time it did break, it was a great conversion coming in from the blue squad, but that last moment run, the flood coming in on the base, they caught those players on the elbow of the respawn, just completely flooded it. Snakebite had a clear run home. He really did. I think one thing worth noting as well, when they had their backs against the wall in terms of the game clock, 
phase worked much faster with that flag run. And I think if you're able to time your kills perfectly, you don't have to slay twice. You can get that flag running immediately, and that's what FaZe did. If they had to slay a whole nother round, you can bet that game would have gone to overtime. Instead, FaZe taking advantage of the gap and the opening, identifying the angles they needed to cover, as you said. Stank by timing his shield recharge perfectly for the rest of the run to make sure he doesn't die to Carmeo, watching the engine angle. In the end, the flag goes home. It's well timed for FaZe, and they will win the game 2-1. to one. It's interesting you talk about. You, you don't have to get two sets of slays here. It's If you get a quick four dead, I think we were, we were timing it. We were running a custom game. We were saying it's about 13 seconds until we get that flag right. past the halfway mark on Argyle if you hit a couple of slides and do what you've got to do. If you can do that, think about the respawn time in the back of your head, right? There's no opportunity to get into a position to even right. shoot that flag carrier, and that flag is pretty much gone. All you've got to do then, you don't have to pick up the kills, you just have to back those players down to get that cap on board. That was what FaZe did so well. Yeah, exactly. Also, just love to see the discipline from Snakebite. Every time he's in screens, he drops the flag to hit the drop slide with the flag just to save the extra one to two seconds across the run whenever you can. And as these players have learned potentially the hard way in the qualifiers, saving those one to two seconds can truly be the difference on our and maybe even more so than other CTF maps we've seen, because you're going to have spawners that are flying at you from your side vent, from your side shotgun, and you want to get that flag in as fast as you can. FaZe does it twice. Shopify Rebellion only able to do it once, and they will close it out. Yeah, the tough thing on Argo is getting that flag over the 50-yard line, getting it halfway across. If you can do that, you can pretty much just deny all lines of sight from the respawners on getting shots on the flag till they have to, of course, go actually into that flag itself. So. That's the difference that you've just seen between the two squads, that quick, almost instantaneous four dead that was picked up by FaZe for that final flag cap was absolutely perfectly timed, like you say. But now we have to change the pace a little bit more. We have to think about our next game here. Yep. We're going back to Imperium. We're going back to Slayer. And I have to say, FaZe have looked terrifying on this map. They really have. And you have to think, even in that game, outslaying their opponents by 67, 61 as well, and running a lot of the slaying department throughout that game. And they're going to be ready for this. And I think a lot of teams are watching the main stage matches and realizing, OK, we cannot afford to go down in a big way in this game type, because you will get steamrolled, you will get snowballed, you will get blown out. The two players on your screen here, let's take a look at the matchup between Frosty and Ryan. Newman. Both in double positive in Slayers is not too bad. Certainly Ooh. the players to watch as we go into this game number two. And I just wonder what tricks this squad that is led, of course, by Ryan Uber's got up their sleeves for a team like FaZe who yep. want to play this game as aggressively as possible. If they get power weapons, they're going to use them. They're going to put you on a spawn trap, much like we saw a little bit earlier on. You know, how devastating this game can be. Quadrant really felt it for quite some time. Now, I'm interested to see if Ryan Uber's got some way to stop that, some way to slow the game down if they don't have the weapons to play with or if it's just a case of kind of looking to the heavens, praying yep. that you can get a couple of picks and get out of that spawn trap. Yeah, we'll have to see. If there's one thing we know, it's certainly that with Ryan Noob on your screen, also in the back, Coach B-Man. And we know best man plus Ryan Noob equals big, big brain Halo, especially on a classic map like Empyrean. They might have a few tricks up their sleeve in terms of opening strategies, maybe some nades and some angles that we might see them bust out here on the main stage against an opponent like FaZe. One thing I also want to highlight through that game, though, we had really dominating control from FaZe. They were actually out slaying by 10. And Shopify during their flag run and that great quick scope from Carmea, they were actually able to bring the game back pretty even in terms of slays. That's not easy to do. However, that resilience might indicate that even if they're down by a few here on Empyrean Slayer, they might be able to dig deep and get back in the slaying department. Only game two will hold the answers to that question. A little bit of an update from uh, one of our other games going on at the moment between the World Champions and Quadrant. Optic versus the French squad. It's tied up at one to one. Okay. So Quadrant certainly showing that they're not here to just participate in this tournament. They really want to make a deep run, but wow. they've got to close the series out today. They've, Optic, I mean, probably one of the biggest challenges to do yeah. so, but we've seen good signs, but good signs don't win your tournaments. They don't put you in the la last stages of the tournaments. They have to take down one of the big dogs if they want to solidify their position in this pool, and yeah. Optic's certainly a tough ask. Two, uh, two very different uh, teams. However, pretty similar shades of green, and only one of them is going to be able to win that series to be the ultimate green wall there. Optic going to want to make sure that they close out Quadrant quick, purely because if Quadrant gets an inch, they might take a mile, and Optic knows exactly what they need to do in that series. But back to our main stage match. FaZe versus Rebellion, it's 1-0 to zero in favor of FaZe after a pretty tight 2-1 to one win on Argyle CTF. Just in case you're just joining us, welcome to the very first HCS Major of the season live from Charlotte, North Carolina. It's great to be back with you here. I gotta say, I'm having a lot of fun in the booth. I'm, having the, I'm having the best time, dude. I'm having it, the best time. It, as I say, the off season was too long. Too like, long. Honestly, I was I was losing my mind. Yeah, I was in the off season. Yeah. So it's good to be back. At least it gives us something to do. To be honest with you, <laughs> I want to kind of just 
highlight a couple of things here as we wait for this game number two to get underway. The amount of trophies that have been lifted by these players on this stage at the moment. To put it in perspective, right, on the side of FaZe, Snakebite has 18 tournament wins. 18! On the other side of the stage, we kind of highlighted it, Mental has 22. Crazy. 22! That's how successful these players have been in their respective, you know, careers. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. And that is the amount of talent we're seeing on the screen. But I also want to highlight, if you were to make a, a top five list of snipers in Halo Infinite, three of the players would probably be on phase. Yeah. And I mean that with all due respect to everyone else, but Renegade, Frosty, Royal 2, it's tough to pick many players that's going to beat them if you pick up a snipe. Also tough the fact that we have back-to-back uh, -back dual sniper maps exactly. to start things off. And then, of course, your third map also includes a sniper. So as we mentioned earlier, this is the most sniper-heavy opening day of a tournament you will see in Halo Infinite yet due to the new maps and game types that are brought into the mix. But this gives us, it gives us a chance while we're, it sounds like some uh, audio getting sorted out on the stage. This gives us a chance to talk a little bit about the fact that we have a pretty interesting mix of teammates on the stage here. The one thing I have to say is Mental at one point in that game was 11 and 6 and leading the lobby in kill death with a lobby like this. It's yeah. pretty amazing. In the end, of course, FaZe gets the best of them. However, we'll have to see what they have up their sleeves, as you mentioned, in game number two. It also gives us a little bit more time. We kind of jumped into game one as we were discussing it, but the team change. Uh, Royal 2 and Snakebite's history of team changes, like the, the nerve that it takes to drop a player like Lethal and believe that it's the right thing to do is pretty crazy. The fact they did the same thing with Ogre 2 as well. Hey, do you know what? We'll come back to the story. I will try it third time around because we've got more, op more gameplay to bring you. And that's what we really care about is putting some Halo on your screen. So Optic versus Quadrant is where we're going to go. One to one. Like I mentioned, Lucid starting this on with a sniper rifle. Four dead here for Quadrant. Oh boy, a nice little 360 repulse to cut the distance down even faster. Lucid wasting no time. Here comes the needles run right away. Sniper set on top turret, but that flag should continue. Trippy already tossing through long haul. He does go down, though. They fall two of them. Two Foxy gets a nice little dub off the respawn, so this run will be slowed down just a bit. Two Foxy going to be challenging. Ah, it's just so tough to challenge this. <laughs> it really is. In that situation, got no rights to hit that no-scope, that body. Seeking so going to be trying to do what he can to clean him up, and even though Quadrant did a great job clearing their side and stopping that flag run, I mean, they didn't account for Lucid again, and he is just running amok in the base. Oh boy, and two Foxy spawning here means he's going to force all the courtyard spawns, and they will be staggered. Only two players alive. This flag will go far. It will at least go to their side long haul and likely even further. They're now getting ready to challenge the angle. It looks like off screen, nobody there to challenge. Yeah, this is a cap. This one's done. This is going to be one to zero by the looks of things and will be put home here by APG. So Quadrant kind of just gave up on that one, I think. And yeah. to be fair, it was almost like deja vu. It was like Lucid the first time around, stays alive after the exact same setup. Two Foxy got a double kill and they were like, okay. Let's try this again, but let's, let's not let that happen. And Lucid says, I'll get a quick killing spray on the plat and the first BR, then we'll run the flag. And 2Foxy, once again, last <laughs> player alive here, and that one's going to go as well. And you have to wonder if they're giving up even earlier there on that situation, as Lucid's going to stay alive here on Banana and just circle back to the base. Yeah, not sure if this is a case of Quadrant having a few issues or not. We'll have to get that confirmed. It looks like at the Feels moment like they're yes. playing, but I mean, Lucid once again looking for insta explode. Seeky going to be flanking. That gives us the answer. It is going to be Quadrant just solidifying their position on the map as 2Foxy flies through green, and that'll be for the first time us seeing Quadrant with numbers on the map. Three dead. Now all players on Quadrant on the board as well as SLG will pick up his kill. That looks like maybe a little bit of weirdness. Yeah, I think everyone watching... I can smell it. Yeah, you know, kind of smell it weirdness. in the air. A little bit of weirdness there. You could tell with Lucid nading his own green in a peculiar way that the way that the nade came out, it doesn't look like there was everything going right on the stage there. So if I had to guess, that first optic flight probably will count in the restart. They might go into that next restart of that match, leading 1-0. to zero. However, it's a, as expected, great start in that game for optic game. Yeah, very, very solid start for them. We'll, have to, uh, we'll keep you updated, of course. We'll let you know what's going on there and... Uh, all the technical stuff, numbers, yep. stuff that I'm not allowed to be involved with this season, officially. Yep, uh, we made that decision, and it's a good one. It's for the benefit of you. Yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, we'll, 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 of course, update you and let you know exactly what is going to go be going on and how that game will progress. But we do have some stats to, uh, to bring you from that map and uh, to keep you up to date of what exactly is happening in that series. And we're going to look at Lucid and Seeker here as the series you can see on your screen there. Still tied up at one to one. One to one, by the way, we also got an update here from our fantastic production team. That was a 50-48 streets win in game number two, the Quadrant one. 
So while it is this tied one-to-one -one series, not a blowout slayer, and Optic only losing that one by two. However, we should spend some time here to take a look at all the information while we wait for that game to get restarted as well. Lucid already at a 1.42 KD. Can you uh, imagine uh, being a barrister, by the way, and Seeker ordering a coffee, looking at you like that? He's like, I want that one. Just point like, at yeah, the picture. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yes. Uh, looking at the other side there, Quadrant. Legend, bit of a surprise to see his KD where it is at the moment. Yeah. You know, a lot of hype around Legend, understandably so in season one. Pretty much won everything in Europe, was one of the standout players on the international stage from Europe as well, but 0.67 KD, a little bit uncharacteristic from him. He's usually leading the line. It is, and to be honest, if we talk about uncharacteristic stat lines, it's also formal that are just below a one. However, not too worried, of course, we saw him go 16 and two on a pit slayer earlier and a pretty convincing one at that. However, expect to see bigger numbers from him as the tournament goes on. Don't you dare say a word about Imperium. how I said the pit. It's Imperium. You're with us, everyone at home, trust me. It's tough. There's 15 years of Halo got in these brains, and unfortunately, we're still gonna, we're still gonna get everyone and call it the pit. It's just what it it's, is. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll fight this we, battle all we, season. I'll we, win it by, we, I'll win we, it by we the end. No Don't worry about What's, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look at the pools uh, to take away from that conversation before we get fired. This is how things are looking at the moment. Phase one to zero is Shopify Rebellion. That's the series we're watching at the moment. Both flawless at the moment. Navi is zero and two, even though there were some good signs in the series. Yeah. Not so much against Shopify Rebellion. Looks fall apart a little bit, unfortunately, in that one. But Paul B, Sentinels at one and one. Quadrant at zero and one, but again, pushing Optic all the way. But it's the pools that we haven't seen so far I want to kind of look at here. G1, Believe the Hype. Both won those series, but that Believe the Hype Luminosity series went all the way down to a game five, and it was extremely tight. Right, that's not where BTH expected to be. Uh, don't get me wrong, Luminosity, a very very talented roster. They have been dominating in Latin America for quite some time, the better part of a decade. However, like you said, pushing Believe the Hype all the way, and they will need to make sure that they clutch up for the rest of the pools. Looking at Pool D then, you see Space Station. We'll touch on those in a few moments because we haven't even spoken about them this event. Surprise, surprise, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Divine Mind, unfortunately, struggling a little bit, zero and two. TSS, also a team to watch. Very, very dangerous team. Right. With that win on the board as well, but it does give us a second to talk about Space Station. How often does it happen that we get to a tournament, yep. we're looking at the new shiny thing, phase, exciting, new roster, great, fantastic, world champions, Optic. Yep. The team who was in the grand finals won as many tournaments as anyone last year, not even mentioned. It's Andy, true. that's just how they like it. It's just like Raleigh. If you remember back to the Raleigh Major, this is exactly how Space Station, formerly known as Cloud9, of course, this is how they like it. They want to be the sleeper pick. They want to go slightly under the community radar and know that if they're not talked about, they don't worry about it. They go about their business, they rip apart the bracket, and guess what? By Championship Sunday, who's in the Grand Finals? It's those four boys. We're expecting them to do that again, and they will quietly make their way through the bracket until they're on the main stage. Yeah, it's crazy to think about it. All the talk in the build-up to this event is who's going to win this event? Optical phase, optical phase. We saw you, everybody at home. We saw you all yep. online. Don't lie. Don't forget about Space Station. As I say, the Guardians of a Grand Final for a reason. Yep. We said last year, we joked about it, in the Grand Finals of the Halo World Championships, any Halo tournament that happens in the world, SSG will be there they will in be that there. Grand Final yep. at some point. Doesn't matter where you You could have a Halo tournament in Antarctica. Guess what? Somehow, by Sunday, Space Station Gaming is there on the other <laughs> side of the main stage, and they are in the Grand Finals. I just got an image of Penguin riding a polar bear to the main stage. Actually, imagine Penguin surrounded by penguins there. The oh man, my uh, wow, in his natural habitat. Speaking of the devil, there he is on your screen. This entire SSG roster, of course, coming from the Cloud9 banner, now at home with SSG, and they are looking to once again not just put their name on the map this season, however, remind everyone why they are household names and will always be a tournament favorite for every single tournament that they attend. 100%, and uh, SSG, a great pickup. What a move that was. Elamite obviously leading the way for SSG to make sure that he was in a position, and SSG were in a position to acquire that roster. An amazing, amazing pickup for them, and I'm sure they're looking to pay them back in trophies this year. SSG, probably one of the most storied orgs that we had in the, uh, the HCS for you know, team changes left, right, left, right, left, right. But this one is solid, this one is together, and this one is certainly going to produce results. I also think it's worth highlighting here, Shopify Rebellion, the role that they've had in the Halo Championship Series, of course, investing last season in a player like Mental, right? Building a team around FPS legends, and now to be able to pick up Ryan, to be able to pick up Rain, to bring them under the banner here. Best men now building quite a roster on the Shopify side, and now giving a pretty good test to face in game number one. We'll see what they can do in game number two, maybe tie up the series in the Slayer. Looks like game number two is ready to go. Thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Empyrean Slayer, not the pit, is where we head 
for game number two. Game number one went to FaZe Clan right at the last second in that capture the flag game. Now we have to see if FaZe are going to keep that ruthless aggression that we've seen them put together every time they play this map in the qualifiers. Will this be FaZe romping to a 2-0 to zero series lead, or will we see Ryan who come up with something a little bit spicy. If there's one team that can romp its face, they're gonna be romping through this one. And as we talked about, this team is so quick to identify the gaps, capitalize on opportunities. Let's see if they can do it in game number two, kicking things off with Frosty. Ooh, Frosty gets blamed to the start of things. Carmea again reads that one like a book. We saw that flank from Frosty a couple of times in the qualifiers, and it worked. This time, he gets read like a book, and that's preparation, right? That's just preparation. Frosty with a sniper! Oh! Ryan Oob drops the rockets. Look at the ball. Oh! Triple kill! For Frosty off the opening, he's got the combo. Sniper and rockets in hand. This is absolutely wild. One thing we got to highlight as well on set. Phase with a delayed sniper grab. They don't go for it off the rip. They get it late, and it becomes a triple kill for Frosty. Seven to two off the open. <sighs> Shop fire rebellion. They get about to be turned into juice because you found yourself inside of a phase blender right now. Rockets, repulsa, sniper rifle in the hands of Frosty here. He rearranges. Repositions Ooh. and mental explodes. Look at that. You thought for a second mental was maybe gonna play the drop shield angle there and maybe could have gotten away with it. However, he walks right into the rock. Oh, Frosty going for some style points as well. Repulsing off the training for a cheeky angle that you never would have seen in Halo 3, but Frosty's already bringing out some of the tricks in his first match on the main stage. Picks up hey. one. Kamea picks up two, though. Not oh. only picking up the kill on Frosty, also sniped Renegade. And I have to give a huge amount of credit to the team in blue right now. All the weapons, every single one, was in the hands of FaZe. And now you're seeing that score just a one kill difference. FaZe up by one, and Carmea with a chance to hit some shots. Carmea trying to say anything you can do, I can do better. Also, the same repulsor angle off the training. It doesn't pay off for him. However, they bring the game a lot closer. Now only down by three. Oh, man, oh, gets taken down by Renegade as well. Renegade somehow oh, comes out of that situation with a double, but that all came from an aggressive push down long haul from FaZe. They sent it down long haul. They did not allow Shopify Rebellion to feel comfortable for even a moment. And that's what you have to do on this map, of course. It has a lot of classic map tendencies from Halo 3's The Pit. However, let's not forget, this is still Halo Infinite. You need to play this game as fast as you can in those scenarios, and it pays off. This game was just 10 to 9, and off of that push, it's now 17-11 in favor of FaZe. As we said, they're wasting no time. They will identify gaps and pick your team apart immediately. Flank coming in here from Renegade again. Trying to position himself for those rockets and overshield, which are going to come up simultaneously in one second's time. Looks like they'll be able to secure those. Snake Bite has them. Come here, trying to make a play up. Won't be able to do so, though. Mental has the overshield, but Snake Bite has the rockets. That will be the overshield. Oh. Out of commission and yep. sent where the air is thin. Wow, chunky, chunky damage there, and then he just repulses them off to finish the one as well. 21 to 14 now. It's a great lead for FaZe Clan yet again. Seven and four for Frosty off of the opening. Renegade. Might be wearing the colors of FaZe, but in a few seconds' time, you might see him in a black and white shirt with a swag bag on his back as he's looking to steal that sniper away from Shopify Rebellion. At the moment, he's taking the top of the tower. Just has to pin these players back. Has the heat wave as well. Two players are flanked through, though, from Shopify. You can see that called out immediately by Royal 2. Now he has to think about how to position himself. Oh. Rotation comes back. That's going to help Frosty <laughs> removing one of them. You are playing against two of the best snipers to ever play Halo professionally. World 2 sets his crosshairs, but Frosty takes them. Oh my <laughs> god. This is some form of cruel, cruel punishment to have to go up against Frosty and Royal 2 while you're spawning in the back corner of Empyrean. Oh my goodness. I mean, they can't move at the moment. They're just being pinned in. Almost surprising to see a shot like that not being hit by Frosty, such as the immeasurable talent of this man. We're now going to rotate. Shopify Rebellion once again playing it slow, though, making them work for these kills. And maybe looking to play for that drop pool, which can be a way of getting out of this. 26 to 15 now, and feels like as things slowed down the tiniest bit, and a few kills being exchanged on both sides. Feels like a good time here at the mid game to get into a listen in here with Face Clan. Oh! oh! Oh, Matt, uh, Matt, where? Where? Cuts, cuts, cuts. 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 C
Where's the train pit? Where's the train pit? Where's the train pit? Hold on. We need to go train pit. They're rolling. They're rolling. They're rolling. He's on the bridge. On the bridge. Ryan, you're heading our side. I got him. I got him. Nice. Two, two, two. They're cuts. They're cuts. Yeah, I'm on there. They're cuts. 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 Yeah, yeah, they're quarter, they're quarter, they're quarter. Right 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 Matt, Matt, you and I go Ovi, bro. I got yeah, rocket. There's one going court. They're probably going to get this Ovi. They're probably going to get this Ovi. No, no, no. Fight the ship. Fight the ship. Fight the ship. Yeah, they have Ovi now. I'm RS2. Yeah, I'm RS2. Yeah, they're RS2. They're RS2. They're RS2. I rocketed to us already. He's in runway. He's in runway. Our training. Our training. Yeah, you guys hear me. They're RS2. They're RS2. They're RS2. They're RS2. They're RS2. They're RS2. Carmeo one hit our runway. Carmeo one hit going our court. Rockets are out. Custom is out as well. They don't have our court. Our court should be up now. You're pushing our tower, Matt. Care tower. You want to just flip or no? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it. Let's go long haul. Let's go long haul, bro. Yo, I hit him once already. If you did. Matt heard. He's gonna be in green. He wave is up. Our tower. Our tower is really. Oh, you're the one to get there. Should we want our green? Our green. Our green or our two. Brad, I can help you. You're literally good. He's going back to five. Play for once here. Okay, snipes at 20. Snipes yeah, I'm leaving there, sir. Tier for the first. I'm dead. You're a good man. I have you. Uh, so yeah, 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 Tier more. Tier more. Double hitting. Fight yeah, this shit, man. Matt, Matt, fight this. Fight this. Fight this. He's weak. 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 Really weak. Really weak. Really weak. Nice! Good shit, good shit. Oh, I'm one, man, I'm one. Yeah, yeah, he's hitting Muller, hitting Muller, watch out, watch out Muller, watch out Muller. Nice, nice, nice. good up. Yeah. Come to the long, right, last car tower, last car tower. Leave the guy tower, leave the guy tower. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 as the sniper is coming up on the face side, this game is done and dusted. We got to talk about Renegade. Yeah. <laughs> that reminded me of like, you seen the videos where people turn up in fancy dress and like no one else has? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, is anyone else wearing fancy dress? And everyone's like, yeah, 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 hundred percent. Oh my, in case you miss, oh, oh my, my we're not even gonna goodness. have any time to talk about it. We'll talk about it in the post game because there's not even any time left on the scoreboard. It's 48 to 23, two kills left for FaZe. These drop slides coming in from Ryan Oob, trying to do what he can. Does manage to pick up the bank shot. But it's only two kills to go here. The only question, as always in these positions, is Andy Dudinsky, how do you like your steak? Uh, I, to be honest, I like a nice chef's choice. Medium rare, and that's what you have served up. 49 to 26, one kill to go for FaZe. As they will look for that last final kill on the board. Five minutes left, but they certainly won't need it. Searching for that final one to end game number two. Please don't curse the steak dinner. Nah, no chance. It's all that's going through my head right now. No Renegade's trying to hunt down Kamea here. Should have the flank. Kamea knows he's there, though. The beat down, the repulse. Wait a minute. One kill to go for me to ruin the game. Surely they still get the steak dinner. It's, it's They've fun. got one more kill to go. Keep in mind, it's, it's 20 or more, so they can afford one more kill. And I think it's a testament to the scoreline, the fact that we're worried about the steak dinner more than we are the result of the game. Still searching for the final kill. There it is. OK, we get the steak dinner and phase more importantly. Close things out here on Imperium, and it was an imperious performance from them. Dominating so many big plays, so many flashy plays, especially from the sniper rifle of Frosty. And as I said, when you're on Royal 2's POV and he looks at someone on training and that player gets blamed by Royal 2 before, excuse me, by Frosty before Royal 2 can even hit the shot, as you see Royal 2 right now, that's how I feel he's playing right now. He's silencing the critics and they are hitting shots. You do not want to go up against two of the best snipers in the game simultaneously. Renegade also, by the way, going 12 and four, triple positive for him. Yeah, not bad, not bad from Renegade. One thing I want to just point out as well, Rain, four and 12. I get a feeling it was one of those games for Rain where every time he spawned, he got sniped. Yeah. And it's like, to come out of those situations sometimes with four kills, it's like, I'll take it. You know what I mean? I, I, this is what else you want me to do. Exactly. I think on Imperium Slayer, you don't even worry about the stat lines in a game like that just because you know players were getting absolutely picked and ripped off of their spawns. Great numbers from the side of FaZe. They will just narrowly, with no room to spare, still secure the steak dinner, a 20-kill victory at 50 to 30 and a pretty convincing one that's so hard to bounce back from. But just to get back to what you and I were laughing about, you might have heard during the FaZe Clan, listen in, there was an uh, opportunity where they said, should we flip the map? Should we trade bases? And Renegade is the only player alive on phase on the other side at Snipe 1 goes, yeah, 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 yes, 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 definitely get you over definitely here. Do that. Definitely trade bases. In the end, he was forced to come back, but he was uh, a hard yes on the vote for flipping the map. But a lot of great stuff during the listening, and you could tell a lot of practice of, for example, how many people are going OP, how do they hold green, when do they flip the map, what do they challenge, also repulsing the overshield off, just really great game management from FaZe all around. Another thing that jumps out to me from the listening as well as we bring the series score up, just to remind you if you're joining us where we find ourselves, is the prominence of the voice of Snakebite, again in the comms, right? Yep. 
clear communication coming in from him. You, saw, you heard Brad come back. Usually it was Frosty making some calls. Frosty seems to have just sat back a little bit. And this IGL role has gone back into the hands of Snakebite in a more authoritative way. He's going, okay, you come with me. We're now playing for this Obi. Frosty going, let's fight for this. Backing up what Snakebite was saying. And I kind of like that, but what an opening it was, by the way, for Frosty. Yeah. Starting off by flanking training. Didn't work, so he goes, okay, I'm coming back for revenge. I'm going to snipe three of you and uh, make parity once again. And what's so interesting is to take a look at Frosty there, uh, 1.46 KD on your screen. Just the way that he played that, it really is a free push. You have a free push to see if you can win a battle at training. And if you lose that, you lose one kill, then you reset, you grab your sniper, and maybe you get a triple. And that's exactly what he did. So it's a great delayed sniper grab from FaZe. That opening strategy really paying off for them and also paving the way for a steamroll of a victory in game number two. Yeah, it's always one of those things on Imperium or Pip, whatever you want to name it, whatever you know era you come from. Is I, I was always funny when people immediately picked up the snipe because I feel like the game has kind of moved to a place now where you can send more bodies for the power-ups further up the map because right. inevitably, you're going to lose one player, right? And they can rotate back and can play for that sniper off, off the pickup. Right. But, you know, if you pick up the snipe off the, off the rip, I always feel like you're kind of restricting your movement a little bit as a team. You can hold some angles, you but are. you're always worried about keeping the sniper instead of fighting forward right. for the rockets, for the overshield, and other things that come up on the map. So it was interesting to see FaZe take that same approach. Definitely, and we'll have to see if that continues to be a thread in the Empyrean matches for the rest of the weekend. We'll keep an eye on if teams are going for that immediate grab, maybe a delayed grab. Of course, the risk in delaying the grab is you could see if the other team is able to win the training and overshield battle, they could fly right into your S1. That's a little bit of the trade-off and the risk, but that's something we will certainly keep an eye on as the new map is played. But now that we've seen everything so far, we go back to the classics. It's live fire strongholds for game number three. Phase one away from closing it out. Phase two up, as you say. Just an update from our other game that we kind of quickly jumped into, Optic versus Quadrant. Optic now in the lead in that series, two to one. So that's going to a game four. The question is, will Shopify Rebellion be able to send us to a game four in this series, or will this be FaZe Clan closing things out? We called FaZe Clan the threat to the throne for Optic Gaming. So far, they have been quite a threat in this series and look like they are absolutely firing on all cylinders. And let's not forget, Snake Bite, Royal 2, and Frosty. Only one event for them last, excuse me, one event win for them last season. They are back for revenge. They have often been the title holders in professional Halo. They're looking to do that again this year. Here they are in game number three, leading two to zero, and we're underway on Live Fire Strongholds. If you trust anything I say this weekend, it's that they want that title back more than anything. Off the rip here, Renegade's gonna get that sniper rifle, so that's gonna be a little bit of power for them to play with, and now they're gonna make the push on towards C. Shopify Rebellion made an early push onto B. And it looks like they're going to be able to defend pretty strongly here. Taking the sniper rifle out of the hands of Renegade is going to slow the push down for a second, but now you're going to have to deal with Frosty. The second wave now coming in from FaZe. More pushes coming in towards C. FaZe really just playing for control here. And they grab the sniper off the opening. They also grab the overshield. They're going to pick up all these kills. That's two dead as well. And it took a little bit of a time, but they now will have AB under control. And now Frosty's still got so much overshield that they can continue to pressurize. They can continue to push. He can bait and shoulder this corner to make sure that Ryan doesn't get to use that green gun. And now they can think about the triple cap. Rain's just respawned over a B here. There's oh. one more play to deal with, and that's Kamea. And Kamea gets two, stays alive long enough to delay that push onto C. And that one play from Kamea maybe has given Shopify Rebellion the opportunity now to move on to A. Yeah, great solo effort there from Kamea. And to be honest, we're going to need to see big efforts like that from every player on Shopify Rebellion if they want to keep this series close. However, they will lead for what feels like the first time really in the series in a significant way, 35 to 13 off of the opening here. They just playing for information, playing for a pick here. Right, he's gonna get the first one though, but damage is being done over here at B. The attention certainly moving towards B as FaZe pick up two kills. Same by trying to pick up the kill on this flank of Carmea again. Royal 2 is gonna be wow. there with a beat down and doesn't get traded himself. So Shopify Rebellion, three dead now. B back into the control of FaZe Clan, and now that's a triple cap, and this is where things can get extremely worrying for the team in blue. Love this play from Snakebite here. He's being such a threat. Even though he's low on pillar, Shopify knows they can't afford to peek and get caught out here. Still a trip cap. Snakebite trying to defend this overshield. Mental trying to do what he can just to de-scope him as well, allow the rest of his teammates to move up. Snakebite just under too much pressure 
to hit the shot on the overshield. Player narrowly kind of threads the needle between the two, but it looks like Shopify Rebellion will get that overshield. But while this fight's going down on this side of the map, all of the points are just being collected here by FaZe Clan. They are doubling up on Shopify Rebellion. Look how much time the Snake Bite bought for FaZe Clan there. Even though he was sniping and the overshield gets lost, he buys him a lot of time. However, the trip cap is now being flipped. As you see, B will go, A will go, and even underway on C. So eventually the overshield paid off until then Carmea will fall. Face turn their attention towards A, trying to use this mid lane just to control the two strongholds they have in their hands at the moment. Frosty's job right now, get information, protect C. And then look to collapse maybe onto B or where they find the kills coming in. Snake gets one and now you immediately see FaZe flying to support that teammate who's just got the kill. Frosty, nice little no scope. Onto Rain, bottom middle, that'll take him out of the game, and they continue scoring here. They've gone past the three figures, 109 to 51 now, as Frosty looks to find some bodies. Looks for some bodies there, hit the remote detonate instead of hitting that shot. Be one dead for each side. Frosty gonna take his time and rotate here to Pillars. We talked about how important this area is, and it had only become more and more important as the meta shifts on live fire. Shopify Rebellion, stop the triple cap, and manage to stop the momentum of phase, which is such an important thing to do. There's a trade coming in from Frosty. Both weapons down back tower. Everyone's going to have to be aware of that. Everyone on the map is going to be trying to scramble to pick those up. But Royal 2 doesn't need weapons sometimes. Give him the old trusty battle rifle. He gets the job done. But Shopify Rebellion have completely flipped this game right now. For the first time, they have a triple cap and they have all of phase spawning over at B. What a comeback. They were just down here, 100 to 50. Now it's a, only a 20 point game, 109 to 90. Great control. However, B and C also being flipped at the same time. BNC being flipped, but with the control that they had, they now managed to get that next overshield as well. So this score is going to be flipped as well, and the pressure is being put back onto phase now. Shopify Rebellion have upped the pace here. They have upped the ante, and they have recognized they can't just sit back against this phase lineup. This they have to take the fight to them. That's right. This is exactly what they were looking to do. They know the pressure is going to be coming out of Sandbags and out of Big Door as well. They will continue to hold at BC, now applying pressure to A as well. Score flipped. Shopify Rebellion back into the lead now, and what a comeback this has been. As Rhynoob now makes a flank behind the back tower, waiting for information from teammates. As Frosty tries to make a play top middle. Numbers here over the tower for Shopify Rebellion. I mean, they'll be able to do good damage here and surely keep hold of C. Great shots coming in from Rhynoob as well. He has the advantage with the height on the tower, but out shooting Royal 2 from any angle, extremely difficult to do. Wow, what a set of plays here from Rhynoob. Just perfectly timing the peaks there to do so much damage. Also pick up a few kills as well. However, Rain's gonna have to clean up a little bit of the garbage and he can't just yet. Snake by turns on him there and maintains control over at C for face. Just wondered there if, if he doesn't have the Repulsor, the backsmack was the better option. Just kind of drew attention towards himself there. Unfortunately, which allow FaZe to pick up the kill. FaZe now flipped the scoring. AC once again in their control. C though being flipped as well, and now with Shopify, as we said, with their first significant lead in this series, it's a great opportunity to hear the comms and get into a listen in with the side of Shopify Rebellion. One nest. Nest, 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 nest. Nest, what do you mean? Nest, nest, nest. Nest, nest. Nest, one. Nest, nest, nest. Nest, bridge. Nest, bridge. Hey, Platter, something? Watch out, nest, and dice. Dice. Could be mid uh, I'm going. I'm, I think I'm going for it. 10 seconds or less. 10 seconds or less. I'm spawning available still. Spawning available still. I'm spawning. Push up right. Push up right. Come in. Come in. Come in. Five seconds or less. Two guys mid. Two guys mid. Could be playing. Be pushing it. One guy tower. Could be dropping. I'm in there. Everybody. Be playing. OS now. OS now. Screen's weak. Roll two. End a plat to make. Billy has a OS. Billy has a OS. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Watch out, Marvin. Watch out, Watch out, watch out. Watch out, right tunnel. Watch out, right tunnel. Key door. Two guys, key door. Two guys, key door. Alright, I'll throw this one, right? Cuts, cuts, cuts on screens. Cuts on screens. Cuts right now. Come in. What's up, Don't we're up weak with you, Ed. Yeah, we're, we're playing green. We're playing yeah, I'm back green. I'm back green. I'm back green. Yeah, I'm back green. I'm back back green. I'm back green. I'm back I'm back I'm back green. I'm back green. I'm back green. I'm back green. I'm back I'm back green. 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 I'm back Another tower, two, another tower, two weak. Two shot, two shot. Spawning green, spawning green, spawning green. 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 Spawning green, spawning we we'll jump back in the game and Shopify Rebellion have completely put the pressure onto FaZe now. Something to point out though, the overshield. We didn't catch it on camera, but I think it was Renegade ninjaring 
Mental, he just picked up that OS. A big play from Renegade. You expect a big player like that to be making those plays, and it, it has paid off and kept them close in this game. They'll now hold BC for the first time in a while. However, still trailing by 50 points. Shopify still with the lead. Weapons in the hands of FaZe, though. You saw, I think it was Frosty got away with the sniper rifle top middle. Renegade has the heat wave, and that'll be an easy pick for him, you would imagine. But that commando is so strong, and Mental just shreds him. And has only gotten stronger in the offseason, as we all know. We're expecting to that be an even bigger force here. Three dead, though, for FaZe. This should be an opportunity for B hold for Shopify. And we'll see exactly where the spawns come in. We should assume that they will be around back C. We're already seeing dummy spawns presence on Overshield and scoreboard as well. Overshield coming up in 10 seconds or so. Both teams going to be fighting for it as well. Rain trying to create some space. Renegade's on a flank. And Renegade on that flank, usually the team who flanks first is going to have the advantage with that overshield. But look at this play, Royal Toot trying to make a solo play on A. They wow. change their attention towards it to keep scoring, give up the overshield. And now you can see Snakebite kind of stuck. How do I want to play this? He knows there's multiple players around him. He can't find someone to focus on. Finally, the help arrives. And this should be an opportunity to recap A. Let's see, he doesn't no, finish. He does not he finish. Doesn't get it. In the end, BC will stay. A will get reset, but in the end, it's still going to be Shopify controlling the scoreboard. A will finally flip over here for FaZe. And my goodness, what a back and forth between the two teams there. As you said, pushing past the overshield. Eventually, they get it. Snakebite has to go heroic for a second. And it will be more points on the board for Shopify. 222 to 150 now. We should see FaZe flip this and begin scoring it again if they can finish B. Pressure already on though. Kamei up making a play bottom middle. The question is, where does he prioritize? Do they try and move towards C here? Do they try and flank bottom middle on the pillars? It looks like the trade has come in, so he won't be too important on the map right now. FaZe will be able to hold. They will be able to score, but they don't have many mistakes left in the tank. They don't. Here's Ryan Noob trying to get, as we said, the ever important pillars area stays alive. Bottom middle, which is going to be big as well. They'll start B, Royal 2, with a lot of pressure here. A lot of pressure, and needs to make a big play. He manages to contribute towards two kills. That's going to be three dead now for Shopify wow. Rebellion. Sniper Rifle and Heat Wave in the hands of Frosty, and most importantly for FaZe fans, scoring back in their hands. This could be the beginning of the end for Shopify. Yes, they were up about 220 to 150. However, FaZe has all the ingredients for a big comeback. Boom! Frosty takes down one. Ryanoob with... No real chance in that situation, just lined up by Frosty, and that headshot completely slows things oh! down. Frosty sniffs out another one, bomb middle as well, and with the OV coming up, two in the death screen for Shopify Rebellion means that FaZe are very much back in this game. Down by less than 20 now, Frosty just picking them apart quite literally, one by one, 223 to 211. All the hopes on the overshield now for Shopify Rebellion, and Frosty knows it. Frosty's moved towards that OS. He's got that sniper rifle traced on it as well. Anyone who jumps up will be body, but a three-man push is going to be good enough. Wow. The heatwave gets absolutely melted. It's a risky play here from Shopify Rebellion. They get the OS, though, and now they can make the play. What a timing push there. Two dead for FaZe. Shopify with a beautiful, perfectly timed three-man push on the overshield. Now FaZe stopped at 236. Can Shopify bring this back and get back in the lead here on the home stretch? But he's going to be contested. Frosty tries to do it. Does he get the stink? No, he doesn't, but gets the shields ripped off. Off. A's going to be flipped. B will be turned back over to Shopify Rebellion as well. And this game could not be closer. What a set of plays here in the home stretch now. Essentially tied at the 230 mark. They will continue scoring. This next round of slays could decide the game. Will decide the game. It's as simple as that. Whoever picks up the first kill could be in a great position to win it. It's Rain who gets it onto Frosty. Ryan who with a second as well. The score just keeps ticking up, up, up for Shopify Rebellion. And with someone contesting B, if Mental wins this pivotal battle. This will be the game. Go to Shopify Rebellion. Look at this. Just needs to stay alive. The pressure comes in B, though. They stop at 248. Can Frosty. they get the kill? He should be able to. Yes. Finishes it. That will be it. And Shopify Rebellion is back in the series. They will take game number three on the board here. Two to one in favor of FaZe, but that's sending us into some additional games in the series. They had one win condition in that end game. One. That overshield had to be won. That fight had to be won. Three players push the cards. If Frosty hits one no scope there, probably three players yep. fall to no shields. He doesn't hit that shot. Shopify get the OS and are able to make plays off the back of it. It's a great call from whoever made it. Did FaZe let it slip a little bit by not contesting a bit harder? 
looking on the result of it, you have to say yes, but what a back and forth game, and we got a series on our hand. Absolutely back and forth there at the end. You saw at least three or four lead changes between the 200 and 250 mark. Could not have been closer, and the final slays in the kills category between these two teams tied at 55 apiece. As we said, it could not have been a closer game number three, and it's an excellent response from Shopify Rebellion. And what did we say? When you get Ryan Noob and Best Man on the same team, it's Big Brain Halo on that last push. We were so lucky to see it from Frosty's POV because it was perfectly timed. We'll see if we can get a highlight later on in the show, maybe later on in the weekend. The fact that all three players exposed and showed at the exact frame. Frosty could not choose a target, unable to execute there. And that is the winning play for Shopify Rebellion. They will take the overshield and they will take the game. 250 to 236, and they are on the board, just one game away from potentially sending us to a game number five. And now we go to where all disagreements are usually sorted out. That's on the streets. We head there. For game number four of the series, Oddball is going to be the game type, a very, very interesting one for me as well. Historically, objective time-based game types. You love a Ryanu team, but faced with his slaying power, usually you don't get the opportunity to get near the Oddball. So it's a real interesting clash of styles here on the streets. And I'm very curious, as we said, uh, we've been looking at Snakebite's role on this team, and not just us here in the casting booth, but also Snakebite himself. If you didn't catch it earlier, Snakebite mentioning that he's still finding exactly what he needs to do for this team. In the qualifier, he played a ton of objective work. You could say it, it was actually the most objective points on the board in any actual physical HCS tournament there. Once again, part of that was due to his ping, and he decided to play the objective role. And he was telling me, he's wondering, in a situation where we're on firing on all cylinders, should I be dropping the ball for Renegade? Should I keep it? It's really going to be situation dependent, and this will be the first time we see them play oddball on the main stage. I'm curious just how much objective work we'll see from Snakebite as they continue to work out and kind of fine tune their team. Yeah, that's the thing, a really good thing you raised there as well. Kind of like what we were talking about with Sentinels a bit earlier. Yes, three of this core team have been together for so many years now, but this is still a new lineup. There's still a meshing period. Yeah. There's still time to sort out little parts of game types that just naturally are gonna take reps. FaZe don't have those reps right now. They've got a couple of online tournaments under their belts, a couple of scrims, but in the grand scheme of things, there are still gonna be little things that they have to adjust and they have to work out. The more games they get under their belt, of course, the tighter those moments are gonna become. The question is, are they gonna be able to tie it up here? In this tournament, at the first major of the year, in a way which pushes them towards that championship. Both Ryan Noob and Best Man on your screen, two of the best Halo brains to ever compete in professional Halo, now on the same side of the stage, it's different, especially with the talent that surrounds them. You see every player on your screen. Got a feeling, excuse me, got to be feeling good after that game number three. It's a big bounce back. It's a big late game composure as they now make the series two to one. But just to dive a little bit deeper into just how much objective play we saw from Snakebite, to paint that picture in oddball in the second qualifier, he had nearly triple the ball time of any teammate. We are so talking, long. we are talking significant objective play there. And so far, we've also seen him doing the same thing as well on Argyle CTF, for example. But hold the phone. Hold the darn phone. Wait. Nearly swore for the first time on broadcast. We got a game five. Optic Gaming versus Quadrant. Game five and only three kills between them here on Aquarius Slayer. What happens here? Sika falls. Make that now a five kill, six kill game. Very, very quickly changing hands as two will fall on Quadrant. But just the fact that Quadrant has sent Optic Gaming to a game number five, let's not forget with a last minute substitute on the side of Quadrant as well. Quite a series that we're seeing on the Bravo stream. If you don't have this open, make sure you open a tab as well. But for now, we'll stick with this to see exactly how this plays just out. Just an update for you. Game four was Recharge Strongholds I was hearing and Quadrant running 250 to 60. 250 to 60. That's not a close game, however, Optic starting to extend the lead just when they need to, and it's formal again. The man who is the iciest player in a game five you could ask for, he's 15 and six. Man, formal with a commando. You don't want it in your gen. He's going to be ripping apart, doing some damage immediately. And we joined this game when it was quite close within four or five. Now it's 46 37. Home stretch here for Optic Gaming. Home stretch. Two kills to go as well. This is looking like the series will be done and dusted. Two Foxy picks up one, but he falls as well. Seeker left on his own, a man on an island. As Optic Gaming will close out game number five, you would imagine here. One kill to be picked up. APG on the flank, Trippy gets it, but what a series that would have been. And if you caught that one on the other stream, you're gonna have to update me. I'm gonna go watch that one back because I look like a hell of a series. But I mean, the biggest story is here. Quadrant again, looking good. 
but not good enough. And you gotta think, on the Quadrant side of the stage, hard not to imagine what would have been if their entire roster could have been here. However, lots of Halo yet to play. They cannot dwell on that. I think there's a lot for them to be proud of on their side of the stage. The fact that they took the current title holders to a game number five is quite a big deal for Quadrant, and we will be keeping a very close eye on them for the rest of the weekend. Back to the main stage then. It's always good to keep you wonderful people at home updated with what's going on in and around the stations on the open bracket, and of course with the pools as well. A little update for you. If you're just joining us, standing in the same kind of position that we were earlier, Quadrant unfortunately fall to zero and two, Optic two and zero now, so they will secure that first seed moving into bracket play, but they still got some work to do here. They do. I think a lot of questions are going to be asked. I think a lot of other top teams are going to be looking at Optic going to game five with Quadrant with a sub and thinking, hmm, maybe there's a chance here. Maybe there's a chance to be in the discussion for the top three and maybe even a new title holder after this tournament. And you look at uh, some of the international flavor that's in these pools as well. Worrying times. Even though yeah, we've been saying Quadrant been doing really well. Still lost both series. Right. Zero and two. And with the open bracket being as fierce as it is, and by God, oh, a, yes. Yeah, if you pick, if you decided to play in this tournament, you are going to have a, a hell of a fight to get into that championship bracket. The teams coming through that open bracket, you've got the likes of Native Red. Yes, oh, with a sub. Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine. You've got the likes of Native White. I mean, it's it's going to be a bloodbath, an absolute bloodbath. Yeah. And getting out of those pools and keeping your tournament going. It's going to be tough for them now. And the international squads know that those teams are going to be coming up and ready to go after very, very long open bracket runs. They're going to be hot, they're going to be warm, and they're going to be ready to mess up those pools. But we're back into our main stage match. It will be game number four, Streets Ball, between FaZe Clan and Shopify Rebellion. FaZe Clan one away from closing it out. Shopify looking to send us to a game number five Slayer. Well, who's going to end up left on the streets here, and who's going to be moving into a much, much better position potentially in the pools or potentially in the series towards a game five. If you just joined us for the first time, welcome. Of course, the series is two to one in the favor of FaZe. Little break between the last game may have just allowed FaZe to reset, but Shopify Rebellion with all sorts of momentum. And talk about the opening strats here. Shopify flying way up into the Bulldog Street to get that damage there to take out the drop shield. It's good pressure from them, however. They're traded out two to two here off the open. Two to two, couple of kills starting to fall into the hands of FaZe. Rockets, where are you? There they are. Oh. One gets fired, so anyone to play with, but it's enough to take down Carmea. A nice little double kill and a Stalker now to play with for FaZe Clan. Royal 2's got all of the goodies. Look at both teams just really making sure they get the slaying control before they go for any ball time. It will now finally be some ball time here. However, four spawners all ready for Shopify, and here comes the push. Push is coming in. The only problem is Stalker Rifle's here as well. Carmea's gonna oh. challenge. Challenge accepted by Royal 2. He's always going to back himself in that position. Three dead here. And at the moment, Snake Bite's got the ball in hand. And you can understand why he had so much objective time. Because everybody is dying before they even get close to him. It's a perfect rotate there from FaZe. They immediately get the ball out of Bulldog, straight back to Tram before we can even mention it. And then they immediately pick apart the spawners. They split them there to Neon Street as well as B side. And the ball stays in Tram the whole time. It is 35 to 0 in favor of FaZe. Really important life here for Royal 2 as well. Not only has he got to stay alive long enough to keep his ball carrier safe, but he's also got both weapons. Come here with a flank here. Oh, he almost got the job done. But that's an important kill, a killing spree as well for Royal 2. Keeps all of the power in the map, all of the weapons in the hands of FaZe. Three dead again, and if this continues, this could be a very, very dangerous result for the side of FaZe in this first round. Already about 50 to zero off of dominant slaying control from the side of FaZe. They'll probably rotate this ball out as well. Here comes the Bulldog. Royal 2's barking on the stage a lot of the time, but He's barking in game now, does the damage, but you have to say a really strong push as well. Coming in from Shopify Rebellion, they pick up three members of FaZe Clan and most importantly, stop the scoring, stop the bleeding, and give them a way back into the game. Does Snakebite get these rockets? How do you let Snakebite get the rockets there as the last player alive? He'll trade off the rack as well, but Snakebite was the solo there on Neons, and if you're on the side of Shopify, you can't allow him to get that rocket launcher. Four dead, Renegade the only player alive on the map for a moment, and he's perfectly fine with that. Renegade's going to pick up that spare rocket as well. He's saying if nobody else wants to use it, I'm happy to. Brian Oof doesn't feel the same. As he gets destroyed by that rocket, and now the ball back into their hands. Another kill going to be picked up. Look at the teamwork there, by the way. Renegade's up in the face of Rain there. By the time he even presses the beatdown button, Frosty's taking his head off. Two deads here for both sides now, and 
Renegade gonna stay alive, a Commando does very well, maybe he thinks about playing this ball, however, if you look at the teammates, he has a lot of pressure along B stairs, so he's okay to continue holding here. Three players pushing in from PD and B side, he will just nade and continue to hold back on Commando. I wonder how Renegade's gonna play this. 4v4 situation, so the smart thing to do is try and help out with these slays and then reprioritize for that Oddboy. He's got the thrust as well, that'll be two dead. Good decision making here from Renegade, now they can turn their attention back to that objective. It's exactly what he does, it's perfect play, he brings the objective back, he's got the commando to play with, and the thrust. Therefore, the power's in his hands, therefore the oddball cannot be. Anybody watching this is probably thinking, how on earth are you playing as Renegade? With perfect timing there on the objective dropping, the slaying hits the pizza jump to go back to commando. Now once again, he's got stalker rifle holding C stairs. This is perfect gameplay from Renegade! Oh! And he picks up the kill on Carmea as well! Four dead for Shopify Rebellion and a harsh lesson in do not throw a nade if you're in that position, because Renegade will charge out and while your arm is in the air, He'll fire a couple of shots to take you to the death screen. 88 points on the board. They crossed the 90 point mark already. Top of my rebellion oh. are getting picked apart in round one. Renegade with his best Gandalf impression. You shall not pass. Picks up the melee as well. That will be the round. And what a round from FaZe as they'll take that first one in a convincing fashion off the back of amazing play coming in there from Renegade, the entire squad. Frosty also 12 and seven. We're already in round two, by the way. Whoa. <laughs> that was one of the fastest rounds of Opal. We've seen in quite some time. Looking at the other side and seeing what the stats are saying, there's not too much to smile about. Rain did what he could. This time, a much better opening strategy, though, for Shopify Rebellion. They get the rockets, they get the odd ball, and they've got a chance to pick up some slays. I think Shopify needs to realize that they're able to bounce back in this. I think that was such a deflating result that they maybe lost the momentum off of that game number three as we're here in map number four. They need to dig deep. They need to find a way to get back in this series and see if they can get another round on the board. Mental with that commando is doing enough, though. For the time being, just slow down this push. Now, my question is, do FaZe, after that incredible round one, get a little bit overconfident at the start here? Do they start pushing one by one? Is that teamwork going to be there in the way that it was previously? And at the moment, it's looking like they need to take a few seconds just to reset. But the pushes are coming in one by one, and they're being picked apart. By the way, that was probably the most Ryan new ball hold I've seen. Four players on Bulldog, and they are able to get 13 seconds. In the end, you got to ask if it was worth it because we're going to see FaZe get several players dead and immediately hold back A, probably taking the lead off of this hold alone. All four players spawning driveway and red room, but Ryan Oob with a remote detonation to kick off the spawn push. Rotation now coming in. Renegade lead the way. This is a really smart play, by the way. Oh my goodness, cuts absolutely cut in half. Sounds like a scene from Saw rather than Halo. If Renegade makes, excuse me, if Snakebite makes it across that window, though, it doesn't get cut down. Renegade cleared all the space in Tramp Room to make that rotation, but great prioritization, great call out from Shopify Rebellion to cut him down, but FaZe have bounced back off the back of that. 20 seconds till Rockets come up as well. More importantly, ball back in their hand and lead in their hands as well here in round two. Yeah, in terms of strategy, Shopify really looking for some scrappy rotate Halo there. As you see, they tried twice now to hold the ball without a clear man advantage, and it's, it's worked out. It's put points on the board. However, FaZe has, in the end, won both of those battles, and now that gives them a 28 to 17 lead. Rockets in the hands of Renegade. There's one, he's gonna double back. He wants two, he fights two. Ryan Oob now last alive. Snake bite with the ball in his hands once more, just watching his teammates go to work. I think Shopify probably gets away with this style, right? This scrappy, really aggressive oddball play against most teams. However, you could tell against FaZe, it's not gonna work. They will identify the gaps, they will have perfect timing pushes, and they will continue to lead in the game, just like they do now. Elusive Renegade is, by the way. His roots are just so, so unpredictable. He just slides between the defenses of the team that he's playing against. Rain in a 1v1 will manage to get the better of him. A little bit of damage being done to Renegade on the push there. Frosty with the Bulldog gets taken down by Carmea as well. So big transfer of power, not only the Bulldog, but also the thrust now in the hands of Shopify Rebellion. That was too dead for FaZe. As you say, an opportunity for them to continue holding maybe a little bit more of a convincing hold off the back of the mental double. They will continue holding here around Neons and they need to apply the pressure right away. Phase is too dead, so expect them to slow this down, go for a timing push on their side as well. Yeah, really good angle there from Carmea as well, just pinning two players back. Frosty trying to bait out, however, the Bulldog is gonna be enough, but the bait might just be good enough as well. Carmea's played that so, so well, by the way. Damages multiple players, almost gets baited in, but manages to stay alive long enough for his teammates to come in and most importantly stay alive. Should be a rotate here if anyone's in position at A, but no, because Carmea's the last player alive. The ball does not rotate it out of A, and instead, it's gonna stay here. Snakebite gets the PD spawns, and Faceplant gonna have a little bit of an advantage here off the spawns. Royal 2 gets caught off guard here, but he's got a commando. There's a little bit of help coming in from Rain. 
This is a great run from Carmilla. Look how tight this round number two is, though. Only one point separating the two teams. Very interesting there, but it's really unorthodox style of play coming in from both sides as that ball stays in back A, and Carmea is able to trade and tires three dead for phase. And in the end, off of a very back and forth battle, Shopify will have the advantage here. Three dead again for phase, and it will be points on the board. It will be a lead change. Shopify will now lead 38-34. Rocket's coming up as well, and that's why you're going to see Rain drop that ball immediately. Not only because of it, the power weapon being on the map, but because he's got that Stalker Rifle, so he can lane all these players that are trapped inside a tram at the moment. Snake by with a good prediction nade. Snake by with an even better challenge as well. And Shopify Rebellion find themselves three dead. Ball back in the hands of FaZe. What can Mental do? Gets taken down right away. Ryan Noob is a spawner, but it's PD spawns. As you Ooh. see, Royal 2 doesn't know about him, and he gets one. There should still be one player back A, and yes, indeed, that was Ryan Noob. He will get the kill. And now three alive as peace. Ryan Noob gets two somehow in this situation. Gets three? Oh god. Renegade, he's playing with him. He's playing with his ah! two and he picks up one. The don't Bulldog should no, and no, he no. gets two. What, don't There's no to... way the Renegade turns three here. He stays alive and this is why Renegade is special. What on earth? The coolest man in the room. He watches Ryan Noob gets a triple and then pulls a play out of his hat to maintain control for FaZe in the back of A. That was absolutely wild and undoubtedly a highlight from the day, maybe the tournament. Face Clan going to a lead though. Snake Bites rotated that ball away. Three dead, however, as I say, that means that Shopify Rebellion once again have a chance to fight for that oddball. Rain picks up the last kill, so important to do. Now they have the information on spawns. Now they know where Face Clan are gonna be located. The PD spawner is dealt with. Red Room spawns now located. They have the ball in the hands and the lead changes once again. Great job from Carmeo to make sure he takes down the player in the back of PD immediately. You cannot let them stay alive, especially when the B spawns are coming in. Rain gets a double yet again, and it will be more time on the board for Shopify. However, for a moment, it was only one alive. That was Carmea, the spawner. Two dead here for Shopify. FaZe getting the best of this push by the looks of things. Frosty gets taken down as well. So FaZe, who initially had the advantage, cannot deal with the final players from Shopify here. They clean up the damage that was done. Mental gets picked apart, though, by Snakebite. With that double kill, now allows the rest of FaZe to push up. They should have access to not only the oddball, but the Rockets again in the hands of Renegade. Carmea the solo, though, picks up one kill. Eventually, he'll be taken down. Ryan Noob picks off a kill off the damage. Carmea staying alive on caution as the only player and challenging the Rockets. That's huge. That's going to keep Shopify in this game. FaZe going to a lead, though, but it's a slender one. It's a tiny one. Stay by force to play ball bottom middle as well as two of his teammates fall. Rain picks that ball back up and he wants to go back into Tram and this is where the power is on this map. If you can get that ball back into Tram, that is your best bet for a long chunk of time. Rain thought about it. Now they need to find out where the spawners are. Frosty's in Courtyard. He should be dealt with. Snake fight on Heaven. That's trouble. They need to play this ball. You can tell Rain maybe stutter step. He needs to get this ball out because the pressure's coming. I wonder if this is a misplay here from Shopify. There was an option to get this ball back to Tram. They decided to try and fight the spawners. And the more time that they're delayed in this yeah. fight, the more FaZe have pressure on the map. Especially with 30 seconds left. The, the next few holds are going to determine the winner of this game. Rain makes the play, though. They've cleared this side out, and all of a sudden, it's time to work here for Shopify. They clear the back of the A tower, and now they go into a, one of the most commanding leads we've seen in the game with just 27 seconds left. Absolutely. Leave it to the Shopify squad. Not a misplay. They've played it perfectly. It takes them an extra second, but they get the kills they need. They get the space they need. Now they're up by 10 here. 20 seconds left. Too full, though. Faze making Good. a play, 3-4, ball not played, and all of a sudden, Snakebite gets in his hands, Shopify all hit the death screen, and Faze with 15 seconds left, now just have to hold off the push from Shopify. Oh my god, this is down to the wire here, ball's gonna be rotated here into PD, Shopify needs to make this push count, they get players weak in PD. Faze can't play the ball though, if a break comes in here, this could be the game. Completely switching, they want to bait this in. Mental flies in, they pick up one. The shotgun's here as well, the nades fly in as well. Oh my, oh my god, god. they combine! A Royal 2! They combine to win the round! They combine to win the game! I gotta say, that was, that was risky. That was risky. But it works at the end of the day, and FaZe will close out the series. Call them the policemen, because they held down the police department. Two men and a riot shield <laughs> holding down PD against three players of Shopify, and they somehow win a 3v2 to stay alive, hold the ball, and close out the series. And I got to say, that's quite a way to do it in convincing fashion. Yeah, I got really worried there for a second. I was like, wait, I don't think they've quite timed this right.
But the timing was perfect. perfect they managed nade. to throw that nade at just the right second, get the damage onto Mental. Snakebite gets a couple of beatdowns, just swinging for the fences. And manages to come out on top. We'll take a quick look at the uh, the end of that game as well. State Byro takes this ball in. and Look at the score, too. They need every second here before the drop. I, th I think Sego doesn't really have a choice, because if he tries to make the cross, he probably gets cut down by the push coming in from Rebellion. One second, the difference here. Oh, my. The look drop ball down. One picked up. Rhino has a nade, which I thought was going to be enough. But the slide out from Royal 2 actually takes the attention away from State Byro. And the wow. craziest thing about it, Andy, both survive. Both survive. They don't just win the 3v2. They win it and take down three and somehow survive the entire battle. And you got to wonder, where was the timing push? There was 11 seconds left for Shopify. They knew that there was only two players alive in PD. Take your time. Mental comes in the door first, dies. Then Carmea, then Ryan Noob. You have to think, if Shopify times that push just a bit differently, that might end up with a different result. But my god, did FaZe play that so, so well. Incredible, and shout out to production team, of course, for getting that replay to see that once again, because that was a special piece of play from FaZe Clan. I, I think it's the drop ball that actually yeah, saved him. The 100%. drop ball's the difference. If that's not there, that's Shopify Rebellion. For that's sure. them taking that game. But in the end, it's FaZe who take the game. And it's an opportunity for us now to go down to the main stage and have an interview with one of the, uh, the staples of this lineup. You can see down on the stage right now, it's FaZe Clan's Frosty. Thank you so much, On Set and Bravo. Charlotte, give it up for Frosty on the stage as FaZe Clan gets it done. Frosty, I always love uh, doing interviews yes, with sir, you, yes, but sir. talk to me about this day one to kick off the season. You guys are undefeated. How is this new roster? Well, you know, updated roster plan. You know, new squad, you got Renegade on the team. How y'all feeling? Uh, feeling great, obviously. Uh, played two matches so far. Um, we're just kind of getting comfortable, comfortable with each other on land. Uh, obviously, we've had a lot of scrims and online practice, but we're just kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, gelling, seeing how we're feeling. Uh, nice. But yeah, I mean, the team's feeling great. All right, now, when it comes down to Renegade, okay, what has it been like to have him on your squad? You know, what has felt differently playing with him on land? Uh, I mean, he's insane. Like, he brings a lot to the team. He's obviously, like, an insane slayer, but he brings much more than that, uh, just with his mentality and, and everything like that. But uh, he's a beast, so I'm glad to have him on my team. Yeah, we definitely saw it there on the stage, okay? Especially when you get about three snipers over there for the <laughs> squad. I can't nobody touch. Yeah y'all um, with this team but you know any last words you want to give out here to the fans that's been supporting you and the rest of the squad up yeah i mean shout out charlotte obviously phase up uh, thank you guys for all the new supporters and all the supporters we've had from previous teams so i appreciate y'all all right that's gonna do it for me and my man frosty here on the stage lottie take it away Thank you so much, Blaze, and a massive GG's to FaZe. I mean, incredible performance. Very dominant. Of course, dropping that one map, I do feel like that gameplay was still a very dominant performance from this FaZe roster. But that last 30 seconds <laughs> of that last map, I think everybody here was on the edge of their seats, and in particular, PD, that office, that play, with the 12-year trust coming from Royal 2 and Snakebite, with the drop shield, the grenades, perfect timing, perfect trust. Clutch, let's talk about that moment and the lead up to it, because it's always risky when you are playing for time with Ball, because, you know, anything could happen. You know, a massive, massive three-man push, like Ryan Noob is known for, yep. can happen, and it can get pulled off. But the fact that those two managed to stay alive and also get it done uh, speaks volumes with this team. Yeah, I wasn't sure how that situation was going to play out, but uh, it was basically a 2v3. You're trapped in a corner, and uh, you got to use your teamwork, and the one grenade you have between the two of you perfectly used to get that entry damage. And because Shopify came in one by one, it was an actual clutch opportunity for FaZe. I think Shopify is probably kicking themselves for letting something like this disrupt them. The drop wall, obviously perfect place. Uh, as they try to shoot a couple of the corners out, but you can see that they can't kick the stand out. And because of it, it makes their fortress just a little bit stronger, allows the teamwork to shine through. You get into melee range with the one player that's full shield there with snake bite, and that's a mistake you're gonna regret. Shopify was a live underdog in this series. Multiple different games they could have won. They actually took it to a game four. I'm looking at Shopify to continue to compete against some of the best teams in the world here and, and create an upset somewhere along the way. I think FaZe, obviously not that team. FaZe closed the door on that series, rightfully so, but well done Shopify to like represent themselves in a pretty solid fashion there because this FaZe team is going to give everyone a run for their money. Indeed, and FaZe obviously had many tricks up their sleeve, including Renegade, back tower here, fighting for his life, but just with such confidence. Tony, talk to me about this Renegade push and what he was doing with Stalker Rifle. 
What's crazy to me is that his team goes three down in that play. And, and, and any other player, you know, I'm talking to you guys in the chat, you know, your, your platinum lobbies and your bot lobbies, any one of them <laughs> go in early, put down the early damage, reveal their location, and end up dying immediately. Renegade just sits in a corner, uses that patience, waits just a little bit, and that little time is all he needs. Waits for the right moment, takes down Ryan Duke, throws a well-placed grenade on the one-shot player that's running away, and almost even gets the triple. It was it was masterfully done, and it just shows that patience it indeed is a weapon. I mean, the big thing about that is, look at how that game turned out, right? That was a one-second affair, and Renegade understands in that exact situation, like you're yeah. saying, like, hey, my teammates are already dead. Like, there's no getting out of this situation positively. What he does is he ruins any opportunity the Shopify Rebellion was going to have at a full setup, which they would have if Renegade just averagely dies, like you're saying. So Renegade himself with that one play, with just those two kills, takes probably about 20 seconds off the clock. That being said, they win by one. Without, without that play, they do not win that game. Indeed, I look, hold on. We got clips on clips on clips because FaZe, <laughs> they really were producing here. And Clutch, just to add to the point here of what this squad can really do, we got this camo play from Frosty with the patience, getting all that intel on all of the oppositions. But this backsmack coming through means a lot. And for a lot of fans who may be new to Halo, just taking this one man down with a backsmack so silently and getting all this info is huge for this map. It's just patience, right? These guys are such veterans. And I think like plays like this, plays like the ones we saw from Renegade just speaks volume to how controlled these guys are in that moment. How, in a moment where you feel pressure, you're probably more inclined to use your trigger, just deal as much damage as you possibly can. But these guys are so comfortable up on that main stage. That's why they're world champs. That's why they're professionals. And that's why FaZe Clan are the number one seed coming into this tournament. Now, Tony, we've got a load of stats on our screen here. But what really stood out to you in this FaZe roster in terms of the stats across the board? As far as the stats I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm instantly going towards Frosty's damage and Carbea's damage. I feel like not all damage is created equal, but the damage that I saw Frosty putting in was, was valuable. The damage that I saw Carmea putting in and his ability to stay alive and take as little back as well. It's about that damage differential. I thought it was good damage coming from both of the players, so that's what really stood out to me. And of course, the 1.25 KD out of World 2. I don't want to take anything <laughs> away from World 2, but when it came to that valuable damage, Damage, both Carmea and Frosty. Yeah, Shopify Rebellion have found themselves a superstar with this Carmea kid. His screen is fun to watch. He yeah. plays fast. It's almost Lucid-esque, right? And I, I know that that's a high praise and he hasn't accomplished much yet, but the skill is there and Shopify Rebellion maybe have found a diamond in the rough here. And if he can play like he's been playing throughout this Friday, consistently, he's going to give Shopify Rebellion some extra slaying power they're going to need when they're playing these top six North American teams. I can agree more with you. I think Kame have brought a lot of room to, to this squad, you know, getting some ridiculous shots off. And like you said, I don't think it is a bit weird to kind of compare him to, you know, Lucid or Frosty or any of the top players that we have because he had that same confidence. It was like watching the POV of one of these guys. And obviously you need to get the results under the belt to start producing the goods like uh, Lucid and Frosty, etc. But I think he's well on his way here. So absolutely amazing stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, we're going to head to a break right now. But when we come back, we do have the last match of the night for you guys. And it's going to be a big one. Do you guys believe the hype? We'll find out next with G1 versus BTH.
The HCS Charlotte Kickoff Major is presented by AMD and by Zowie. Welcome back, folks, to the HCS Kickoff Major, live from the beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, before the break, we saw a dominating performance from FaZe, despite Rebellion putting up a fight on map three. But ball play continues as we get into the last series of the day, and that main stage is getting set very, very shortly for a pretty epic battle. I do say so myself. I have been looking forward to this matchup for quite some time, especially through our qualifiers and all of the online action we have been seeing. But on my desk, I do have Clutch, and I have a new addition. Bravo, good to see you for the first time today. Always Little fist bump from afar. How are you doing? Good to be here. I'm great. Uh, amazing series on main stage. That last series was nuts. Quite a way for FaZe to end it too with that last clip. Uh, great day at Halo. I think we're seeing teams that people maybe didn't expect to be tested, tested right early on Optic and FaZe yeah. dropping games to pretty talented rosters. And I think a pretty great pool play Friday to start off the season. Certainly has been. Let's actually take a look at the updated pools as well that have been happening all throughout the day on different streams, not just only on the A stream, so make sure you do have those tabs open to catch all of the action as well. Because in all of the pools, obviously results have been coming in, but like you said, it has been a bit of a wilder ride than some of the scores kind of show here. Optic Gaming do get that 2-0 lead in their pool B, but Quadrant took them to a game five. Clutch, are you shocked about that? I am shocked about Quadrant. They've been playing very well. Unfortunately, none of it matters because you're 0-2. You got to win a series <laughs> against an open bracket team or your yeah. tournament's open. Yep. Yeah, uh, pretty absolutely. Difficult. Mark and I talked about it, but uh, all the international teams, I think they have a lot to worry about with those yeah. open bracket teams, to say the very least. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think open bracket, obviously, it's going to be a grueling ride for our open bracket teams here, but there is that open spot, and there's a lot of open bracket teams that I think have the capability to do and cause some upsets. There's a lot of talent in that open bracket, like you're saying, and the big thing for me is we haven't seen any upsets in pool play yet, which means our one, our two seeds, they're pretty comfortably going to probably move forward unless an open bracket team comes out on fire. It's that third seed team in every single pool that you got to play a best of five and your tournament life's on the line. Yeah. Now, for the last match of the day, we have two teams who have been making quite some noise online and who have a lot of pressure on their shoulders to perform here on LAN. I think there's a lot of question marks with both of them, but the one I want to highlight first is G1. They're going to be taking on BTH. And G1, I think, have so much potential. They have shown what they are capable of. The roster changes have come through, and I think for the better here. And I think Boo Boo and the squad are going to do some damage on LAN, and it starts here right now. Clutch Talk to me about this roster. What do you expect from them? What do you expect from Boo Boo to perform here? Yeah, I love what G1 did with their with their roster, right? I think that they built around Boo Boo Dooboo, the superstar that they found last year. And what a better way to build around him than to put absolute talent. I mean, Sab getting his best opportunity. Suspector getting his best opportunity. And Falcated, he's an absolute demon on the map. This team has so much individual skill that they can compete with the likes of Optic, of the likes of FaZe, and there's not a lot of teams or not a lot of composition of four different players that you can honestly say has the individual talent to be able to play with the world-class talent that's on those God squads. So well done, G1, but this weekend's going to be a proving point for these four players. And G1, obviously, to remind everyone in Bravo, they were the only team online to take down FaZe, uh, and it was pretty impressive the way that they did that. I feel like G1 now have a more consistent roster, yeah. and I feel like their teamwork is really starting to evolve and, and become very present. We'll obviously see that in a moment. But what is it about this team of four that really takes the kind of cake when it comes to, to defeating some of the best that we do have here? Yeah, I think they're a team with a lot, excuse me, a little to lose, right? They have pretty much nothing to lose. Uh, they're still pretty young in terms of overall age comparisons. And if you look at the rest of the bracket, yep. uh, I think they're young, they're hungry, we call them youngry. Yep. And they're ready oh, to go. God. I think they're, uh, they're a team that once again, backs against the walls. They know how to play this game really fast. I think last year was a building year for G1. We saw uh, a few notable results. I think Columbus Super is the one that stands out. Otherwise, it was a lot of online play. It was kind of a growth year for G1. And now I think this is the year where we really see them hit their stride. Yeah, indeed. Well, they have to prove that point here on the main stage. Now, moving on to our next team. You know, is history repeating itself? Can this team step up to the likes of that 2008 BTH roster? Ooh. Well, here's a little bit of HCS history to remind you guys. I don't know what's going on. I'm excited to see this Believe the Hype team. Who are they? Where did they come from? And how did they get so good? What happened? Were you looking ahead? Were you not prepared? Or were they just that much on fire? Uh, we just weren't ready for them. We were just kind of looking past this match, to be honest. And we got what we deserved, basically. Wow. 
Now that's a throwback. Uh, for any of you who don't actually recognize who that is, then that's <laughs> kind of crazy, but he does look a little different, is Walshy, and it's also a little bit different to see Walshy on a losing end of anything as well. So yep. uh, that was pretty crazy. Talk to me about the history behind that, brother. I'll start with you, uh, you know, and what was really going down there in that clip? There's a lot to talk about there. I, yeah. think, um, I think most importantly, right, you have a roster that came out of nowhere called Believe the Hype. Uh, with, a, once again, a team of young and hungry players with nothing to lose that made a huge statement and they upset Final Boss. You also wonder, at that stage in 08, right, was the fact that Final Boss had won Meadows 08, was that kind of a little bit of a leftovers from Halo 2 era, and, and how good was that FB roster? But that didn't really matter at the end. It was Believe the Hype putting up a performance, putting the Believe the Hype name on the map and teeing up Clutch for a national championship in the year that followed. Yeah. This is your time, Clutch. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is obviously, uh, it's going to hit me uh, very close to home, right? And I think what BTH did for me at a time like 2008 when I wasn't on the team and I wanted to be on the team, I was good friends with all those players, Bastola, Nexus, uh, Hines and Cloud, I believe was the roster. But I mean, I see those guys and those are guys I play with every day and those guys just be final boss, right? Yeah. And I think that that was like an underdog mentality that BTH embodies, like every single roster ever of BTH, it feels like. is. The underdog that can win every or any series, and if you get hot, you can go on a run. And I think that that's something that can be like, uh, like that can be resonated in like players that are representing the name here today. Yeah. Right. We've seen them have success and beat just about anybody online, especially in a best of five. The big question for me is, can this group of players do it on land? Will the BTH name like give them that false confidence, that like extra little bit of like motivation that hey. He, all giants can fall. There's David versus Goliath stories throughout the history of Halo. It's just a matter of when's my time. Yeah, indeed. And But this, this roster on your screen, this is the new BTH. They have borrowed this name, but have they borrowed what it takes to actually defeat giants the way that BTH did back in 20, uh, sorry, 2008. I'm still living in the 2020s right now. Uh, but Bravo, looking at how they have performed online in the qualifiers, making a lot of noise, a lot of questions on them. Do you see any type of comparison here? I think that once again, like we said, on, on this side of the stage, undoubtedly players that have become a household names amongst the core Halo community. I think they want to be even bigger than that, right? Everyone's seen these guys play for years now, and now they want to cement themselves as not just top players, but as a top squad in the league. Here's the challenging part for Neuronical Precision, Bowman Monster, is they're going up against players, if I'm honest, that are a pretty similar mentality, right? They're not going up against a Titan in this series. They're going up, they're going up against G1, who kind of has the same charter, the yeah. same mission. These, te these two teams are truly, they want to be top three conversation teams for the rest of the season, and that's the opportunity ahead of them. So I think for this BTH side, the challenge is, how do we take down a team that has the same exact goal as us? Yeah, good luck, right? I think yeah. that this is going to be a very difficult series for BTH. I could say I want them to win it, but in all honesty, those four players up there have got to decide who's going to take that series home. And I mean, they have their hands full, like you're saying, G1, very hungry to start making plays, very young in their careers, but they've experienced enough to a point where like, I'm expecting them to at least make a finals this year, let alone win a tournament. They're very capable of winning any of these tournaments throughout this uh, second series of HCS for Halo Infinite. So I'm excited to see what G1 has to bring. BTH, you got your hands full. You're an underdog. We've all lived the story. Is this going to be the one? Yeah, that is the big question right now as we take a peek at the series layout and see where we're going. Argyle CTF, we're seeing one of the new maps right up first, as well as Empyrean Slayer next, uh, which is going to be very difficult. Empyrean Slayer, known to be quite snowball-y. And if you're not on your P's and Q's here, you can really get it handed to on this map as well. So that's going to be a big swing moment, I think, for Believe the Hype here to see what they have under their belt and whether or not they can take that one to the test. But I think the big thing here right now is I want to know a little bit more about these players, you know, in terms of what are we looking for on this squad? Who's going to be the standouts? Who's going to be the slayers people have their eyes on? Who who can we get excited for? Yeah, I think you got a point at Monster right now. And the way he's been performing online, especially during the qualifiers, he turns it up a notch. His stats are unbelievable and he creates a pace. He's a very fast paced player. He creates a lot of space for his team. But it's really going to come down to all four of these players starting to click. They got a lot of individual skill, like I said, precision, a Gears of War player. But he's impressed me when I've matched up against him online. So I'm like, this guy has talent as well. I'm looking at Monster. I'm looking at Precision. They have to have a very 
good series to have a chance in this one. Well, I'll tell you what, BCH, big shoes to fill on that main stage. And for G1, a lot to prove here on LAN as well. Our casters are ready for you guys. We've got Shirzy and Gaskin on the mics, lads. It's over to you. Thanks so much, Lottie. And I have to say, Dan, one name I didn't think I'd ever speak in my casting career is Believe the Hype. We have them in front of us against G1. And what fit an opponent that's going to be for them? Yeah, I think that they have quite similar stories from last year's G1, who were incredible online. And then they were a little bit disappointing when it came to land. They were not able to replicate that. Can Believe the Hype live up to the expectations? They've been so good online. They've blown everyone. They've blown their minds. And I think that we've now got to look at what they can achieve when you're in a LAN environment, when the pressure is now on you, and they go up against a roster who's kind of been through those motions, made those changes, forced those changes around Boo Boo Doo Boo, and they're going to have similar desires, similar aims and ambitions. Let's talk about what they've achieved in this tournament so far. They, take, they took down Luminosity, but the issue was it wasn't too comfortable. It went to a game five. They had to go the distance with them. And when you, you speak about a top six seed coming into a tournament like that, you expect better from them. I would expect better from them. I think that Believe the Hype will look at that Luminosity series and they'll say, thank God that we were able to get over the finish line. Because if they had have taken a loss, that could have really changed their tournament. But at the end of the day, doesn't matter if it's a 3-2, doesn't matter if it's a 3-0, as long as you're getting that victory. And taking a look at the series layout, then game one, CTF Argyle. No doubt that is going to be so important to set the pace in this series. And G1 will not be looking to give Believe the Hype a sniff here, Dan. Talk to me about the stats. Yeah, and I think that we need to look at Neuronicle for this series, uh, for this first game of this series. We were hearing Clutch talk about certain players he thinks we could focus on, but Neuronicle's a guy in these capture the flag games that seems to avoid the flag runs. So I want to wonder, where is he? What is he doing? What is he going to do to make a difference when it comes to this map? Is he going to be in an area to be picking up the power up? Or is he going to be forcing some of those spawns, blocking anything that might help those flag runs? I think sometimes those players are very important when it comes to capture the flag. Something that G1 had last year was problems inside the camp. This team seemed to have changed that, changed the complexion. They seem to be all friends outside and inside of the game. Is that important to make you go that extra yard for your teammates? It is so important as we go into the first map of this series, then it means we get to have another look at the brand new map for this season. It's going to be Argyle, it's going to be CTF. Who's more practiced? Who's been putting in more time here? Both squads will want this. They put in so much preparation. This is the perfect way we could have started this best of five. This one's a big one and could dictate who tops the group. G1 up against Believe the Hype. Something we never thought we would say again and see on that main stage. Throwbacks to Wes Clutch and indeed the Maniac. But it all comes down to this. Shields up, weapons hot, we're underway. And instantly you're going to be seeing people go for the sniper and maybe it's going to be a reset on this one. But it is going to be one of those games where early on sniper rifle is going to make a big, big difference between these two teams. Who's going to be picking it up? What angles are you going to take? Can you out snipe your opponent's sniper and maybe force their hand a little bit to change who's going to be holding it. Dan, there's a problem here. I did a whole build up and then I said, I said the thing that I say and I feel like I've done that for the day. I can't say shields up weapons hard no, again. You can't do it again and, now. And, and it's gone. You I, kind I, of spoiled it a little I bit. I did, I should have held on to that you one. Committed too early. Well, it gives us a chance, an opportunity to talk a little bit more about what way we see this series going, series layouts and all that sort of good stuff. But talking about CTF Argyle and G1 have been good in this map. G1 have been good in it. It reminds me actually of when we had Catalyst capture the flag and the G1 of last year was very good at that one as well. It does seem like the new ones people are good at, people who want to put some practice in and those who do prepare for it seem to actually find success. Well, if you want to see some more gameplay, we'll tip over here to TSS up against Space Station Gaming while we get that tech issue sorted out. And as you can see, we're all tied up in the Slayer. And of course, TSS getting that invitation into pools after what happened to Native Red, but Space Station Gaming, a, a roster that's had a lot of talk around it coming into this event. Very similar talk to what we've heard time after time, event after event of, oh, well, you know, they're not performing so well online. Can they do it on land? Yes, of course they can. They were in every finals, right? This is a roster that is full of some of the most incredible players that we have seen grace Halo Infinite and, of course, previously Halo 5. And right now they are 40 to 39 up. This one is very close. And maybe Swish and the rest of the squad might be able to cause a little bit of an upset here. Bit of a nail biter. Swish, formerly of G1. Septify indeed on that Fnatic roster. Along with Super CC once upon a time, can they Cause the upset here. Find themselves now down by three. Septify getting tagged up and Penguin pick up the pieces onto Super CC. Kills going favor. And as we join here, it was all tied up. 35 35, but now all of a sudden, with the help of the Rockets, SSG just putting a little bit of distance between them. 
Lead now at two. Sometimes one of the biggest problems with underdogs and in Slayer games is they can get really close, right? They can be within a few, you get to 48, 46, and then you just seem to crumble. And that's why you, where teams like Space Station, like Optic, like FaZe, where the experience really shines through. They've been here, they're not phased by it, no pun intended, and they're able to battle through. Whereas some of the newer teams that are coming through the ranks that maybe haven't got as much experience, they can struggle in these really close and tight games. But as I say that, a couple of kills go in favor of TSS. It's 45-45. Five, and if they can get weapons on their side, which they have, they've managed to take the lead. One kill lead here as Penguin and Super CC trade elsewhere and off the map. Eco gets tied up, but he gets a trade before being able to back away. And just like that, SSG have a one kill advantage, but now have the numbers on the map. A Super CC backs up, puts it in reverse, and now the tram spawns. They're trapped. Space Station had no right to get those two kills off spawn. TSS may be caught a little bit unawares by the spawners, but now all four members of TSS stuck in station. Stella just wanting to wait for this Bulldog to spawn. And for SSG, they have a kill lead. They can wait, make it a two kill lead. Only one kill required. And TSS stuck back tram. No sign of the train. No tickets to be punched here. As we slow down. And this is good. Space Station giving them the respect, backing away, recognizing that this one kill could blow this whole map wide open. You can see that Space Station are trying to make the play. Bound was looking to try and make a flank. Eco's also looking to try and make a, a positional change here to try and get an angle. But TSS, they're just retreating. They are playing as a four. They're rotating around. Rockets are up in three seconds. Who's going to be brave enough? Is anyone brave enough to go for these? They've almost completely flipped the map. With all members of TSS now. Positioned over towards PD. Oh Morley steps out. Can he get the cleanup? No, he can't. Penguin secures the kill. And it's 2 0 SSG in the series. I did see a plasma grenade land right next to the rockets there as well. Someone trying to combat evolve those rockets in those final moments. But Space Station will take a 2 0 lead. Very close, though, from TSS. We have to give them credit where credit is due. Another roster that has impressed online and certainly could make a big difference throughout this tournament. Maybe Space Station might be too tall of an order, but. We'll have to see what happens elsewhere. Now, take two, action. We're going straight back now. The G1 up against Believe the Hype. This time I can't do shields up weapons out. I'll have to do it again tomorrow. Can I, I do move it? on? Well, maybe I can do it. You, yeah, you try it this time. You did the build up and you, you, you take it away. Well, game one, capture the flag here on Argyle, the newest edition of maps. Now do it now, Dan. In the HGS season. You're going to miss your time, Dan. It's G1 versus Believe the Hype. Can we see maybe some of that history of this incredible organization replicated. Shields up, weapons hot, we're underway. Yeah, How did I do? It felt forced. Did it? Yeah. Okay. On the way, we're on the way, and Booba Doo Boo picks up the sniper rifle and heads down towards coils or needles, as it's being called. Monster bottom middle, trying to get his hands on that repulsor if he can. Who has managed to sneak away with the camouflage in the meantime? And it's going to be Suspector on your screens now. Invisible to the naked eye, and to the fully dressed eye, you would have to say. But gets the trade. Precision goes down, but Bo MX elsewhere has picked up a kill. Monster and Neuronical in the basement. Snipeshot will crack the shields of one. And they're reeling and immediately on the back foot. Yeah, a really good angle that Suspect is taking in the moment as well. You can see just Believe the Hype turtling a little bit. They want to avoid the sight lines so they don't just get their heads ripped off because there's two snipers, Falcated and Suspector, both have eyes. Two have gone down, now they're getting aggressive and they won't pull this flag yet. They want to make sure they can at least find some of these wandering members who are a little bit unknown to them as it's three dead once again. But because Suspector's down to no shields, this flag still won't move. Two members, Believe the Hype. Over towards elbow, and indeed, that's where the spawns are coming. Three members up now, all four apiece. Trying to clear out their back base. Inspector recognizes he's in trouble. Tries to fire a couple of shots over towards Bomex. Doesn't connect. And all that early pressure they had will not amount to much in the start. Three dead for G1, and believe the hype now can finally push out of their base. This is sometimes one of the most difficult things on Argyle is how do you escape when people have two snipers to watch you? But Precision has the grapple. He has the ability to make a real difference as he pushes forward now. It means you can take angles, it means you can get aggressive in certain areas, and even though he's been shut down a little bit there, he can reroute, he can check that GPS, and he can go a different way. Tried to grapple up to the vent initially, but missed it just a touch. Looking a little bit sus now as he vents once more. Gets pushed back though, but he has a snipe rifle. Good, like that one. Two dead, and it does mean that I believe the hype can. Try and do exactly what G1 were doing a little bit earlier. Press them back into their base now. You just need to time your kills right. Camo is going to be up. Precision does still have the ability to 
Repulse up there if you wanted to go for a really aggressive style of picking it up, but I imagine because of the sniper rifle here, his job is merely about taking angles, trying to hit shots to support the rest of the team so someone else can get the power up. Precision. And his eye is trained across top middle, fires a shot towards Sab. Won't find a home this time. Drops down towards screens to help his teammate. Will get the cleanup onto Falcated. Now they can start to move up through the gears. Two dead apiece. Sniper shot. Rang out once more. And that was enough for Precision to put it in reverse. You see, Sabinator's gonna try and get his hands in the camouflage. Precision shields popped once more, runs into trouble, and gets taken down. Two dead for Believe the Hype. Camo still not being picked up as well. And you can see how difficult it is to push over the halfway line at times because there's so many angles you can be watched from, so many angles people can escape on this map as finally now Sab can try and do something with it. Three are dead for Believe the Hype as well, so this is going to be G1's best opportunity to get in that base, get a flag pull, but you've got to be aware of where these spawners are going. I like this from Sab as well, a little bit of trigger discipline. Ensure you get that first kill, but you still need support. G1 needs to be pushing with Sab here. Monster, the beautiful prediction aid. Front base, just into that little R1 space to ensure Sabinair couldn't push as quickly as he would have liked. 1v1, but boom! Comes out on top. You need to win fights just like that. And for all the talk about Monster, for various different reasons, he has been incredible in the online performances we've seen. But particularly in Capital Flag Argyle, he's actually been the flag guy. He's been the one who's been getting in the face of his opponent, pulling those flags. He has about quadrupled the amount of flag pulls as Neuronical. That just shows how often he's going to be in that base, but we haven't seen it yet in this game, and I just want someone to take this game by the scruff of the neck and just try and get some flags moving here. boo 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 on your screens here. An absolute superstar that G1 managed to secure last year and have now built and forged the team around him. So much talent here. And the height of their expectations this year. They spoke about it. Top 12 was their goal last year. They surpassed that, and now they have to be looking beyond that once again. And I imagine that Boo Boo ever since his success in Halo 5, has always wanted to replicate that, always wanted to find that young, hungry squad that can do what Splice once did. And maybe this Believe the Hype roster could be that squad. Maybe it won't be this event, but if you can build from this, if you can learn from this event, there's certainly a, an incredible platform that you may have Ooh. installed below you as Monster now has his chance to shine on the main stage. Has the sniper rifle, does tag three enemies, uh, but unfortunately will go down. So far, neither oh. team able to break the deadlock here. As Neuronical sends one straight through the visor of Boo Boo Doo Boo. Taste of your own medicine, looking for more. Has he bit off more than he can chew here though? As he's down to just one shot, help of a teammate, though, and he backs away. Yeah, and Neuronico, I really think he's the guy on this map for Believe the Hype in terms of making those plays, getting those headshots, doing something with a sniper rifle so he can initiate a push. But it just needs to be someone to be there to make the push after he hits those shots. You've got to think so quickly. You've got to react as fast as possible. Otherwise, suddenly the other team spawned all over again, and those sniper shots, they do nothing for you. The, the slays, they don't matter if you're not doing them at the right time. I've got to capitalize on the damage you're putting down on the oh. map, and Neuronical hits four fresh shots. And that's exactly what he needs. He got loud as well. That's what you want to see from anyone on that main stage. Let your opponents know. Get a little bit of trash talk on the go. Believe in yourself. And maybe then you can believe the hype as we look six minutes left. G1 have been on the back foot a little bit in the last couple of minutes or so. Believe the hype have done very well to push Ooh. their advantages, but Sab could change things. Game's been very cagey. Not really been able to get into the base, secure a flag, bring it back. Every time we see a team get in and around the base, they've been shut down pretty quickly. Boobo Doobo now, over towards basement. As he clambers up with that camouflage. Can this finally be the moment, the opportunity, as the flag's on the move? Well, so that's the first time we've seen a flag being touched this game, as Sab gets a headshot as well. So now Boo Boo's not only got camouflage and flag here, he's got support from the rest of the team. Sab gets another one onto Monster, three are dead, and this should be a cap for G1. They shouldn't throw this one away. Well, we might be able to put this in the stats column as a 100% completion rate on flags pulled. Boo Boo Doo Boo walking this one home, strolling, absolutely no pressure put on him. The rest of the team putting in work. And it's G1 who take the lead. And it took maybe longer than G1 would have wanted. There was a lot of fight back from Believe the Hype. They were defending well. But G1 were able to eventually just break through and do enough. And it was the sniping and the positioning from Sab that perhaps allowed it in combination of that camouflage. And I think that's what 
this map is all about. It's about timing it right with the camo plus the power weapons that you have in the snipers and then put them into effect so you can just get that flawless flag run so you don't have to get scrappy, so you don't offer any counter caps either. Boo boo doo then. As he pushes up, the enemy elbow. Thinks twice about it though, backs away. Has information that perhaps we don't. Chooses instead to hold the angle with the sniper rifle. As he moves now, up at the screens. Will Mon oh, step out, well that's a grenade that's hit his own teammate on the backside. And that one's not practiced that. That's always a frustrating one. And those can be sometimes the opportunities, the mistakes that can allow the other team to break through. But believe the hype, they're still in a three versus four disadvantage. Do tie it up a little bit. Managed to get a couple of kills. But again, Boo Boo's in the right position at the right time. Gets the camouflage. Even if he just Ooh. burns it here, that's job done. Boom. Picked them out of the air with a Shroyuken. But sure, Boo Boo gets nowhere close to his flag. Sends a snipe shot across the base. Won't connect though. Falcade's in big trouble. Fades to black. Suspector tries to scramble and scarper away. Bottom cuts. And a successful this time in keeping alive. That repulsor play though. Get one. Can he connect with the second one? Grenade's gonna spin up and hit him in the gob. But Sab somehow turns that one around. And with the addition of Argyle, I think having someone on your team that you can trust with the sniper rifle has been, become even more important. Like, if he had hit that sniper shot, suddenly it's a completely different push altogether. And you need to have someone who is well practiced, well versed in the sniper. Maybe Neuronical can be the one to make the big difference here. Does push in, does get the kill, but as he gets stuck in the wall and dies, it's a great hold from G1. G1 are now playing in a way where they know they have the lead here, Shurs. They don't really have to push up and try and push their advantages. Instead, it's just stopping Believe the Hype getting a cap. They seem to be happy with what they have, and. With that 1-0 lead, time will now start to be a factor with just under three minutes left on the clock. They can just play Slayer, keep their base nice and secure. With Sab, keeping them on the other side of the map. Neuronical's got a challenge, just about wins that engagement. 17 kills for Neuronical, by the way. Really has been the standout here for Believe the Hype, but if he can time these kills, if he can give that opening there is still going to be a chance they can get back into this game. And at times, Believe the Hype have looked the better squad, but G1 have just been a little bit more strict, a little bit more structured. Believe the Hype maybe a little bit scattered all over the place. It's still Neurological is connecting with shots. Finally, the BR does connect as well. Two minutes left. What do Believe the Hype do here? Do they start to get a little bit more aggressive? Do they start to get a bit more risky with their pushes? They've got a camo to work with now. Surely this is going to be the best chance. This might be their only chance. Two kills in their favor, it's time to go. Sab somehow gets a kill and escapes his life for now. That sticky grenade is so big. Camouflage a non-factor. And we saw a similar thing from Sentinels earlier today where Spartan got two big sticks and really did change the swing of the game. And sometimes that can be the difference maker. Those clutch moments that if one player had been able to get away, the whole game could have been affected by it. 1 minute 20 left on the clock there. G1 very much turtling back, defending, holding. And that can invite unnecessary pressure at times, but believe the hype will try and push through. Here comes the push then. Neuronical gets one. Precision, the top middle, with a couple of shots down on the Sab. And just a sliver of health left. Sab's decided to get himself out of dodge with the help of a grapple. Opens up that lane, boom. Didn't realize that Sab had it in his back pocket, ready to go. It was his ticket out of danger. Just patrolling back base. But as you talk about inviting that pressure on, all of a sudden, believe the hyper on their front door, and they're looking to kick it in. Trying to kick it in, but at G1 at the moment, they're barreling it up with whatever is possible. A bookcase, a chair, it doesn't matter at this point. Throw the desk at it as well. Because believe the hype just can't seem to get through. His monster will pop up. He pops back down, and Suspector says, I'll wait for round number two. Where is he? He hears some noises. The monster Ew. from the depths. Lost him in the clouds, it would seem. He heard the grapple, but just had no idea where to look. Went a little bit cross-eyed trying to find them as three go down for G1 now. Hold on a second. Believe the hype have a chance. How many times do we see this when you hold for so long when you want to just win 1-0, but then there is going to be a last-ditch attempt as Boo Boo, though, comes flying in, gets the kill, but the flag's still moving. Still on the move. What have G1 got then? Boom, desperately trying to provide some sort of cover fire. What have G1 oh. got in the tank? A trade comes through. Three dead for Believe the Hype. Precision last man standing. 
What can he do here? Can he keep this flag alive? Neuronical throws a grenade, but unfortunately runs out of time. And it's gonna be G1 who strike first. Uh, it wasn't pretty, it wasn't easy, it was not comfortable, but it was a game plan from G1. They just needed to get that break. They just needed to get that first flag on the board. And then they said, okay, well, we've had enough control in this game. We believe we can win it by one. And even though there was a dicey ending, I believe the hype gave it their best. It just wasn't quite enough. A good attempt, an incredible amount of kills from Neuronical of 21. But unfortunately, it never really opened up for that just strict flag run. It was a flawless flag run, by the way, from G1. It took six minutes before we saw a flag pulled, but it was a, a very impressive one, eventually. Looking at the stats then, Saab 21, 12, and 7. Falcade with 23, 18, and 4. They are not short of a few slayers in this team. And they were the two players who had the sniper rifles throughout the game as well. They were making them work. They were finding those angles, and they were punishing Believe the Hype off spawn. They made it very difficult for the BTH side to escape when they were trapped in their base. And that made it even more frustrating when they were flagged down, because they could never really get past that halfway point. Now, how important is it for Booba Dooba? We talked about him being the superstar, but now he has teammates around him that he can trust. Yeah, I think that Boo Boo maybe had a little bit too much responsibility on his shoulders throughout previous teams, and now he's got players who can step up to the plate in all kinds of ways, not just slaying ability, but shot calling abilities as well, objective play. You've got everyone on this G1 roster who can just do something. They can step up on that day and become a superstar, and I think that's what excites me about G1 this year. Next up, though, we've got Slayer Imperium, so it is going to be an incredibly different game going into match number two. Well, speaking of Boo Boo and indeed, Neuronical, 1.34 KD to a 1.27. Both had a very successful tournament so far in the positive, and if believe the hype are going to continue on in this tournament, they need Neuronical to stay hot. I think that Neuronical maybe has answered any questions there may have been. Can you keep doing it on LAN? He has certainly lived up to the hype. He has been a player who has impressed me with how well he has been able to find slays. It doesn't matter if he seems to be a shot or two down. He's confident enough to get involved in those fights and he trusts his ability. And it's naturally transitioning to LAN in a very impressive way that I think that, you know, the more that happens, the more they get comfortable on that main stage, he's going to have an opportunity to shine. I mean, spoke about Booba Dooba and maybe the responsibility that was on his shoulders and the trust that he can have in his teammates. Now, they, G1 put out a documentary piece just yesterday. If you're interested in that, go check it out. But it must be said, this G1 roster have so much faith in them and they gave him the keys to the castle and said, go out there and get the players you want. And it happens quite often in esports where a squad will be built around one player. And that must feel amazing, by the way, to know that the organization trusts you. And it can add extra pressure again, but I think that Boo Boo now has built this roster. He trusts the players that are around him, and there is a far better feeling in the camp with these four players. And I will say it once, and I'll say it again, that if you get along with your teammates, it is going to help in-game. Sure, it's not going to give you an extra 50%, but even 2 3% extra can help in some of these incredibly tight series when you're going up against some of the best teams and best players in the world. Up next, then. Slayer on Empyrean, Dan. We've already seen in this tournament players play extremely well, teams get blown out of the water, but state dinners and almost not able to get out of their own side of the map. What can we expect here from these two teams? Well, I think just judging off game one, the sniping ability from G1 seems to be a little bit better than that of Believe the Hype, and it's another map that has two sniper rifles, so you'd lean towards G1. Statistically, they were 4-2 and two in qualifiers coming into this tournament, so it is a good map for them, and I think they will be confident going up against BTH mainly because there's a lot of discipline on this G1 roster, and sometimes you need that on pit, but in multiple ways, right? When you're on this map, you need to know when to push your advantages. You can't afford to just sit sometimes at halfway and let your enemies come to you, because then you allow flanks to happen. Then you allow someone to get behind you, to get on your tower, and then suddenly they will make your life so difficult, and then suddenly they might have the power weapons, and suddenly they're pushing the advantages. So you always need to be on top of your opposition at all times. Now, something we can talk about for G1, and Wes touched upon it on the desk. This G1 roster have ambitions of winning championships, getting the grand finals. It's not just about competing and taking part anymore. They want to take over, and you have to be beating teams like Believe the Hype. Not just beating them in a game five, but showing them who's boss right from the get-go. And in game one, it was a little bit slower. A 3-0 would do wonders here for G1, especially when you look at results that have happened elsewhere. I mean, a game five between Optic and Quadrant are suddenly the unbeatable team 
showing a little bit of a kink in the armor. Is there going to be a chance for teams to take them down? FaZe dropping games as well. If G1 can start to demonstrate that actually they're not going to drop games against some of these teams that are lower seeds, then they start to become added to that discussion of teams that can start to break into that top three. RG1 going to be the pace setters then in pool play. Showing no faults. Results might show two zeros in the pools, but there's been some of the top teams have been dropping maps here and there. But G1 so far looking good. And they're in the driving seat to top this pool. And a very different starting strategy off the bat as well. Believe the hype prioritizing rockets, G1 prioritizing overshield. It's something, it's a tale as old as time. Because if you try and split the difference, sometimes you can end up with nothing. But if you can guarantee one, it gives you a chance to take out the other. But it looks like on this occasion, it is going to be overshield beats rockets. Or is it? That snipe shot seemed to connect and hit hard. Boobadoobo will scramble away, though. Overshield has dissipated, but they have now got precision right where they want them. He tries to get away on the outskirts of the map, and it looks as though he was successful for a moment as Bomex challenging the world from his platform. Boobadoobo gives him the respect, backs away. Snipe rifle then in his hands. Can he find? the shots that he needs, and all four members of Believe the Hype over towards Sword and Runway here. All eight players in this game are over towards Sword, and it's kind of crazy. You want someone to maybe get an angle here for G1, because Boo Boo has the sniper rifle here in Sword. He can definitely hit some body shots. If you've got someone over towards Green, or even on Bridge training, they can finish this. If there was someone on Green or training, maybe you finish that shot as well. So I think that G1 need to spread themselves out a little bit, but because Believe the Hype are forcing themselves into Sword, Maybe G1 are just responding in that way, saying, we'll take you four on four. Boobie doo Confidence flowing through the veins. Stands rock solid still. Waiting for Bohm to challenge. Happy with the damage he's done. And we'll back away, put the trust in his teammates to apply the finishing touches to that kill. Neuronical. And now we've got Precision Top Tower. Putting the shots down, it's Bomex who picks up two massive kills. And it makes sense now, you can see what G1 were trying to do. They were just trying to force one of their players on top of the tower so that they could take advantage of it, get those angles, and control it for the rest of the game. But because the sniper shots didn't then hit, Believe the Hype very aggressively pushed that player off of tower, and that's what you need to do. Get him off as soon as possible. Neuronicals in the world of hurt tries to scramble. Fortunately, he got one, but that was all it was good for. G1. Starting to claim territory and believe the hype side of the map. And that's going to spell misery. That they have got to be cleared out here. Or at least flip the map. Rockets are about to pop up here and you can see Monster's right where he needs to be. As they pop out of the oven. Is he going to fall for it? There's going to be a trade there. Rocket still ripe for the picking. Incredible play from Boobie Doobie as well. Expecting a player just to be waiting and hovering on those rockets. It's something we've seen for the last X amount of years. It's not something that's new and going to surprise your opponent, really. Still no kill for Suspector just yet, but we will keep an eye on it. It's Sab who's been picking up the Slays, 13 and 12, so still a very close one, but it's Overshield that goes in favor of Believe the Hype here, as Precision can't quite connect with the further shots. But it does seem a scrappy one, Shirts. At the moment, though, it's G1 getting the better of it. Three kill, make it a four kill advantage now. And they seem to be living rent free. And believe the hype side of the map. Precision will slide out, but a back whack comes through, and you can see Boo Boo Dooba's face. He had no idea that player was positioned there. I well, believe the hype, they're down by three, but they are doing incredibly well to push out of their spawns. I think this would be the perfect time to jump into a listening. I don't know why. Yo, the on S1, there's one. There's a quick, there's a quick, there's a quick. Push me green, guys. There's a second, there's a second, there's a second. I got one. Second. Our second, our second. Yeah, yeah, he went the cuts, he's going S2, he's in the, he's in the go. Get ready to and there's on green. You guys are green, you guys are green. I'm one shot, I'm one shot. I can't really go. One shot their back room. One shot their back room. Oh, no, sure. Guys, push me maybe? I need help. Uh, oh, you're by yourself. You're uh, yourself. I can help you. One shot their sword ramp. Yeah. Another one S2, S2 after. Watch out. On me, guys, on me, guys. I hear one. He's still on the box. The box. There's still, he saw me. Push me. I think he's their training. He could be wrong way. I don't like you. Training, one shot they're training. They're training one shot, they're training shot one shot. They're corner one shot. I'm one shot. Same thing, one. Got me. Fuck, dude, there's two. There's two? They're training, guys. I think I'm under sword. Yeah, I think you're gonna flank, bro. Two beverage, two beverage. Yo. The sword are really weak, guys. Our sword, our sword, our sword, our sword. Jump down, then. Nice, nice, nice. Yo, he went down, he went down under bridge. He moved down under bridge. He's in sword, I think. Nice, nice, nice. I can root pulse on this. Ovi, guys. Ovi rockets, Ovi rockets. Chance, I'm here, chance. 
They're short, they're short sniping! Uh, dude. One shot! Absolute. Absolute. Dead, there's three, there's two. There's two, there's two. There's two, there's two, there's two. Short rap, two, there's short rap! Three, 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 three! I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. They might push you, they might push you. Careful. And a vast difference in callouts. It was quite calm for a short while. They were reluctant to peek, but then suddenly the energy picks up as soon as slays go the other way. I think the one big thing we learned from that listen is believe the hype just being a little too cautious here, not pushing their advantages when they have the sniper rifle, and G1 then instead flipping it by hitting snipers' shots of their own. It was a very key, key play in that whole listening as well, where Monster gets a player weak on the train and calling him out, realizes no one's coming to get, clean up that kill, and steps out himself and gets his face cleaned right off his shoulders, I and mean, things like that, frustration starts to set in, and you can hear it in the comps. Yeah, and it's the same as game one. You know, it's the snipers that are making the difference. Hitting those headshots could do your team wonders, not just for confidence, but allowing players to push into angles like this. They're behind enemy lines. Now Falcated, being a nuisance, has the drop ball to work with as well. And just look at how G1 are working in tandem. They are always in at least a two, but for the most part, they were in a four at the start of the game. They are always aping the other team and really trying to press their advantages. Sab, situated over towards the sword. Trying to help his teammate Booba Dooba out here. Backs away though, perhaps will sacrifice Booba Dooba to the slaughter. The sniper rifle has just popped up and Booba Dooba somehow, some way, picks up two kills. He can't be doing things like that. And he's done damage and he's got info and that means the rest of the squad can push in to take advantage of it. It's Falcate who cleans up the rest. And now suddenly there is a nine kill difference between these teams and Falcate has sniper on tower. This is bad news for BTH. Can Falcade find a couple of faces then? Bodies might do. One on the bone. Position straight back to top tower. Demon D would be proud. Neuronical tucks tail, hides, waits for his teammates to spawn back up. Recognizing Falcade has the ultimate power position on their side of the map. And just look how reluctant BTH are to move because they know Falcate is there. They need to move as a unit. Someone needs to put suppressing fire. They've done just that. You force Falcate it off, but is there anyone to challenge it? Someone now has to press tower, but unfortunately, because of the angles of Suspector, G1 are just pinning Believe the Hype in. They've got two snipers. This game should be over. Only cleared Falcate out for a moment. He goes right back, top tower. Raining down death and destruction once more. A 13 kill lead here. As he fires those what? two remaining sniper shots. Locks in a killing spree. Falke is taking over. I love everything about this G1 roster and that is one of the reasons why they just... Every player has the ability to pull something out of their sleeve when you least expect it. Overshield's about to pop. Monster is going to be on it. So this is going to be Believe the Hype's last chance to try and get back into this game. Utilize the overshield to get your advantage and then do exactly what G1 have just done to you. It's the old cliche though, it has to be perfect. Plasma pistol's already in the hands of G1. They're looking to counter oh. it. It doesn't connect this time. Monster fires a shot, but that overshield's almost completely gone. So you're down by 11. You do have rockets, but one rocket goes wayward. You still clean up the kill, so that's at least the first piece of the puzzle. Now this is still doable from Believe the Hype, but you've got to watch your angles and you need support from the rest of your team. You can't afford to allow trades to happen here. Bone needs help. Here comes the cavalry, but is it going to be enough? Next few kills are going to be so important here. They can ill afford to lose numbers. 40 to 47 the score. Suspect they manages to find one, but all of a sudden Believe the Hype have control of G1's base. Down by seven. And Believe the Hype know they just need to go for those trades. Sometimes that could be down to just forcing a few players onto one. If you notice there's a straggling player somewhere, then you for sure are getting involved in that gunfight. You need to be aware of your opponent's position. What angles are they holding? What are they trying to press? The map's been completely flipped now at this point. They go all the way around and they find one more. One more kill, then the double the series lead. Is Boehm going to be the latest victim? Full They're setting two, yes, the years. And it's 2 0 in the series. Believe the hype showed signs of life, but not enough. G1 in cruise control now. Believe the hype just getting those power weapons and power ups a little bit too late. They weren't able to find the advantages that G1 had earlier in the game, and it was really that control of the sniper tower. Falcated just going off, and even though he didn't get incredible amount of kills, he wasn't like getting an amount of kills in the slaying department that anyone would really talk about. It was the importance of the kills he was able to pick up around the rest of the squad. Not only the importance of the kills he was getting, but the damage, coupled with the fact that he had a power position. He locked in a killing spree when really he should have been cleared out long and long ago. You call for it, they, they backed them down, but
didn't capitalize on the damage then and believe the hype, just let him stay there. Yeah, you have to have someone who is prepared to take that risk and put their life on the line to push up on tower. It's never a fun fight to take, but if you recognize the damage has been done, if a grenade has connected, you for sure need to get someone there. And the fight that did happen to S1, Falcade still was some able to win. Right, as we look at damage, I mean, it was Sab with 4.7K. Again, he was doing crazy things with a sniper rifle, but the entire G1 roster stepped up and showed us great teamwork on Imperium TS. Confirmation of what we've seen then. CTF Argyle 1 to 0 on Slayer, Imperium 50 to 42. But I've seen enough from Believe the Hype, particularly in the latter stages of that Slayer, Dan, to let me know that this team's not done. And after this series, they've got a lot more tournament to play. Yeah, I think that Believe the Hype are certainly showing exciting moments. They are showing glimpses of what they're capable of. And maybe it's not quite the dominance that we saw online in certain games. You have to remember that this is a G1 roster who also have been incredibly impressive, not just online, but now it seems to have been converted to LAN very comfortably indeed. But if Believe the Hype can maybe get a little bit of momentum from Game 3, even just find a map in this series, in this tournament they can still make waves, we could still have that historic moment published again here in front of our very eyes. But for now, it seems to be the G1 story. And it was just the dominance, really, of sniper rifles in maps number one and number two. I think the issue that BTH had, they allowed G1 to dictate the pace of the game and control their side of the map more often than not. Well, we heard it in the listenings, right? They, they had the sniper shots, they were doing the damage, and then I heard, don't poke, don't face, don't peek out. And it's like, you've got to be able to take those risks and peek out and face to be able to convert some of those sniper shots to be hit. As soon as you're saying to your teammates, don't peek out or don't face, then there's going to be that element of fear. You can't show any fear against G1 because then G1 will push their advantages. And also, G1 then will dominate the game, right? They will sense you're scared and they will be pushing onto you. That's it, isn't it? It's, it's a mentality the way you're playing Halo. You spoke about them turtling up on Argyle. G1 almost did it. the same thing on Argyle. Let, open up the door and let Bleed the Hype walk in for that almost that final flag cap to tie up the game. And if you hand the initiative over to G1, they'll punish you for it. But live fire loading up here, Dan. Talk to me about it. What can we expect to see? Well, I think that, again, we've got a sniper rifle on our hands. It's not going to be two this time. But I think one of the things Believe the Hype have to recognize from maps number one and two is how influential that sniper has been. Take it out of the hands of G1. Don't even allow them to be able to start popping off with it. But I will say, G1, when it comes to strongholds, their rotations are excellent. They know exactly when to be pushing their advantages, when to be pushing onto spawns, and when to not push on spawns. This is going to be a difficult game for Believe the Hive, but if we can see some of those glimpses, some of those moments where they did show promise, maybe they can get themselves back into this series. Is this the perfect opportunity then for Believe the Hive to catch G1 slow, catch them cold? Perhaps if G1 already think the job is done, a little bit of complacency might set, out, set in here. But two go down for BTH. That's a Spectre indeed for G1. Early engagements traded out. 2-2 two, two split for a moment it was. Overshield just popped up and you can see all eyes on it. And you can see why Precision secures it for his team. But can they capitalize on this now? And that was thanks to the support from Monster as well. When it does come to Strongholds, oh, it's unfortunately Plasma Pistol rips that Overshield right away from him. Monster's going to be that guy to defend these Strongholds when they are in control. And it's going to be Neuronical who we've got to look out for for Believe the Hype to make that difference of pushing the Strongholds, of taking them away from their opponents. It's not going to be easy, though, because G1 are so good with their structure here on Strongholds Live Fire. You spoke about the Sniper Rifle and it's already doing the damage. Neuronical will be spawning back up in a moment, but you can see Monster desperately trying to stay alive as Falcade finally puts him to bed. Suspector. With the Sniper Rifle now, back green, A and B in control of G1. And PTH have just got control of C. And our G1 now happy to hold what they have and keep scoring points for now. They will be until slays happen and then they'll make an assessment of where they need to go. They saw that C was going to be where the spawners were, so they immediately got the cap onto A and B. And now they wait. Now you have a little battle in middle. If we see the rotation towards A, you take the fight A. If you see the rotation towards B, you take the fight B. It's about when you prioritize overshield. When do you move away from one of these strongholds? Do you give it up just temporarily? And it looks like that might be a decision here from G1. They've given up A and B. The trade-off will be overshield. And just like that, Neuronical gets oh, the kill. It? It's a Spectre. Desperate tries to pop it into his chest and just secures it for his team. 2v2 on the map now. 
Making a 2v1. And is that trade-off gonna be successful? All four dead for BTH and G1 take control again. So frustrating when you're on the opposition side, when you see that overshield just get punched into the chest when they're on those shields. Could have been so different for BTH had they got that kill with a grenade, but now Suspector still alive on the killing spree. Still has the sniper rifle in his back pocket, but he is gonna be out of ammo, so he switches it out now. 86 to seven, believe the hype struggling to even get out of spawn sometimes. Trades come through. Believe the hype have man advantage for a moment, but just like that, it's equalized. Suspector will capture B. Two captures in their favor now. C is going to be the point of contention. If G1 want to connect and make this a triple cap, they have the slaves in their favor if they choose to do it. Suspector tries to use the repulsor, and just like that, numbers advantage flipped on its head. So this could be the first time we see Believe the Hype with a chance at holding some control on this map, especially now they've got that sniper rifle. That could be huge. Monster, a lot of responsibility, but unfortunately he will go down as well. As we take a look across to Neuronicle. He'll just be quiet in the moment, wants to stay as quiet as possible to maybe hold B, but this is good. You need to react as quick as possible to help the rest of your team if it's going to be a full set towards C. Ironical, the jig is up. They know exactly where he is. Booba Dubu takes care of business. The heat wave in the hands of Poem. Can he connect? Didn't need to this time. The damage is already done by Monster. As he descends on one, Suspector goes down. And BTH now starting to roar to life. B and C in their control, and now a triple cap. You can really see the difference now. They've got weapons Ooh. to work with as well. The first attempt just hits the body, but the second one will do the job. Overshield's coming up. Monster's in the right position at the right time. Very similar to Imperial, actually. He was always there, willing to be putting his life on the line for the Overshield, knowing how important it is. But now you've got to put it to work. Suspector made that a very difficult kill. Overshield almost completely gone, but they maintain this triple cap, and that early progress that G1 had in this game. It's almost completely gone. It was such a huge lead, but this can be the difference sometimes between getting that total control or just holding those twos. And if you are a team who likes to pressure advantages, likes to go for the full three, you can suddenly get an incredible amount of points. And now, Believe the Hype have the lead, and G1 are very much on the back foot here. It's high risk, high reward going for the triple cap. But when it works, you can see the results on your screens here. Claude completely back into this game. And it's exactly what the doctor ordered here. Maintaining this AB hold. Slay is going to be so important. Precision gets the first one. Ultimately, it gets traded out. You can see Suspector immediately turns his attention towards B now. Heat wave face to face, but he gets the melee. A punch to the gob. And that'll be enough to send him away. But G1 perhaps caught a little bit by surprise here that they were in a triple cap for so long. Well, I think G1 were doing well objectively, but believe the hype were winning the slaying game, and now it's finally actually resulting in some points here. G1 haven't really been able to stabilize ever since believe the hype got so aggressive. Now they'll be scoring. They can't afford to allow believe the hype to have such easy slays as a big double from Boo Boo will now get G1 back into the equation and give them the opportunity to go for this trip cap. And I think that's good. Sometimes you have to react to a team who pushes aggressively for trip cap by going for them yourselves. What have BTH got then? The break open this setup. Sab got the first kill and looks like Booba Dooba got tagged up by a friendly grenade. Overshield up very, very soon. Which team will secure it? And will it be the difference maker? A and C remain in control of G1 right now. Overshield has been scooped up by Boo Boo. He's moving down bottom middle, cleans up one, turns his tenses now over towards C, knows the player back tower. He gets cleared out. The eviction notice comes. It's 150 to 139, and just all of a sudden G1 have flipped it back again. Yeah, just like that, suddenly G1 have more slays than believe the hype now, and it was a killing spree from Boo Boo. The leader of this squad, the captain of this squad, who's been entrusted with building a new roster. Just being able to push his advantages and shut Believe the Hype down when it looked like they had gained enough momentum to perhaps take this game. Sniper Rifle now in the hands of G1 as well, and the grenades are good too. Believe the Hype, will this just crush them now? Is this the last straw? What do they have left in their tank would be my biggest question. I'm trying to get A. That'll only stop the bleeding. And G1 will continue the score. Two go down though. They have managed to capture it. Monster will scamper away bottom middle. He's hoping to maybe bait G1 in. And spawn his teammates elsewhere. Falcade happy to hold B. The call has come. 
wait for the next round of slays. But who will they favor? And they're on back tower. He's managed to just escape. Grenade comes through, will, will not tag up Valkyrie this time. Fight will be traded out. Leave the hype down too. Trying to capture B. But both members positioned over towards green. This spells danger. But just like map number two, I fear that maybe Believe the Hype got back into this game a little bit too late. They allowed far too early a lead for G1. And even though they took the advantage and they took the lead, as soon as they lost that control, G1 were able to wrestle this game back. And now they're 10 points away from taking the series. They haven't looked back. That early bit of pressure that BTH had, it hasn't amounted to much more. As G1 remain in the driver's seat, cutting BTH apart. And that's going to be it. G1 with the clean sweep. So maybe it's not quite going to be the story of 2008 just yet, but there were moments of promise from Believe the Hype. But it's maybe not the same roster that G1 would have faced in online competition. It does seem like G1 have converted better to the LAN environment. But that comes down to experience. That comes down to the players that are on this roster. That's why this G1 roster exists. They've looked for those players that have that experience. They've looked for those players who are ready to take that next step. This G1 roster has their eyes, not just on top three, they have their eyes on finals. They have their eyes on championships. This is what the building has been around. This is what the target has been. G1 unfazed by the big stage, when the lights shine brightest, when there's a little wobble, they're always there to pick up the pieces. And on the other side of the stage, PTH. This is valuable reps for them. They've only come together in this last short while. They've seen early success online. And they're hoping to build upon it now. It's sometimes the experience you need on main stage to take a loss, to know that feeling, to then propel you into more practice, into more determination, so that the next time you face this team online, you want to make sure you take them down. What could you do? Are you going to study more? What, what didn't you do enough coming to this event? Did you get a little bit more nervous than you would expect? Are you going to be more comfortable next time? As we can take a look at the stats, you can see Suspector, 18 kills. Uh, he was the standout player. Again, the sniper rifle did make a difference with some of the shots I was able to see as well. But I think G1 will be delighted with that game in particular when they went down, right? When we saw that total control from Believe the Hype, they were able to wrestle that game back thanks to several different factors, but it was a boo boo doo boo killing spree that really did it for me. Looking at the damage then. 4,500 for Suspector. Boehm, a little bit shy of that with 4,100, so he was putting down damage, as was Sab. But what I was most impressed by G1 in that game was prioritizing Overshield, happy to give up caps to do it, but then being able to turn the screw. Confirmation then, G1 with the clean sweep. 1-0 on Argyle, 50-42 Slayer Empyrean, and 2-50 to 139 Strongholds Live Fire. It wasn't perfect, but they got the job done. But it was a 3-0. I mean, it looks perfect, and you compare that to some of the bigger teams in this tournament who have been dropping games to lower seeds than Believe the Hype. Maybe this is suggesting that G1 are a real threat, and those teams who are at the top right now need to be looking and saying, hey, you know, G1, they've caused waves, they've caused upsets in these online tournaments, and even in previous years with a different roster. We need to keep an eye on them again, because we can't afford to underestimate them. Otherwise, suddenly, G1 could be taking down some of our big giants in this tournament. Yep, G1 make an absolute statement here against BTH, but it's over to Lottie and the boys to break this one down. Thank you so much, Shirzy. Dan, you boys are done and dusted for day number one, but we have yet to talk about what just happened on the main stage behind us. And first and foremost, there's a couple of questions coming out of this series, right? Was you know, BTH, were they the real deal? Were they going to be up to the task here the first time we're seeing them on LAN? What is the answer to that question, Clutch? That was tough. That was tough to watch, yeah. right? I think that they are going to want that series back. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. And uh, <laughs> losses, they happen. Uh, it's how quickly can you rebound. I believe they're still second in their pool at this time, having beaten Luminosity Gaming earlier today. So they're going to have an open bracket team to play against uh, early tomorrow. And ball goes well there, then you advance second in your pool, no harm, no foul, you start in winner's bracket, you get another chance at one of the, the top four seeds at this tournament. Yeah, I've got to say, G1 looking fantastic on the other side of things there. Obviously, a very, very clean result for them. But more questions, I think, need to be answered about this roster is, you know, from what you've seen, are they capable of taking down some of the titans that are here to play at LAN? I think they've given us no indications that they can't, right? Yes. I think, we, as you said, we need a little bit more information about them. But in watching those games, 
There isn't anything I saw in those games where I was like, big gap, worrying play, or solos that should have gotten kills that didn't, things like that. Uh, so I think uh, pretty convincing. However, as you say, we need to learn more about them at the start of the day tomorrow. We do indeed. Let's take a look at the match stats coming forward from that series as well and see how G1 ended up with that 3-0 and what the stats have to say. You can see they're a little bit strange for Falcator to be under on that KD, to be uh, negative, but really, really great stuff coming through from the rest of the team there, but getting the job done. And I think there's something to be said about not everyone going positive on a roster here. Sometimes you don't need to. If you're getting the, the task done, if you're getting the job done, I time and time again see in Twitch chat or see on social media people, you know, flaming others for, for not being up there in the sleighs. If you're getting the objective work done, if you're doing what needs to be done for your teammates in terms of comms, in terms of opening things up, that's all that can be asked for. Yeah, if I'm a G1 fan, the last person I'm worried about it's as foul. far as their KD ratio yeah. is Falcated. Yeah. yeah. When they play against FaZe, when they play against Optic, Falcated is going to be popping off. He's by far, in my opinion, their best slayer. So I'm looking at Falcated like, hey, but you can take this series off. We got you here. It's a 3-0 anyway, so no games were really relatively close for them to even sweat and even begin to talk about statistics. Yeah, let's not also forget, if you look at those statistics as well, Foul was second on the team of damage, right? Yeah. So I don't care what his numbers Absolutely. are, right? Second, okay. like, oh, just under 13K damage there in the end. So I think he's playing pretty well, as Clutch says. We'll take a look at the pools as well. Yeah, we will indeed and see how that one does affect all of our pools here. Just remember that our open bracket teams will be added tomorrow, so they can always stir the pot here. But looking pretty good for Phase, Optic, G1, and Space Station. You know, Pool D, we haven't spoke a lot about Pool D. We haven't really seen anything thing at all coming across from Pool D yet. Space Station Gaming, though, there were a lot of questions about this roster and how they were going to perform at LAN, and so far they're doing their part clutch. Yeah, I got no questions for Space Station, right? Nope. That team's always in the finals. I expect them to at least be in the elimination bracket finals come the end of this tournament on Sunday. Space Station can win this entire thing going through the winner's bracket for all I'm concerned about. How well is Bound playing? I, I think he was a player that progressively started to perform at a higher level every single tournament. World's being his best tournament. If he continues that streak and yeah. elevates his game even further, Space Station are taking home this trophy. Well, we may not have seen SSG yet on our screens, but we're certainly seeing them on our KD leaderboard, as well as Boo Boo being that number one spot ooh, ooh. from G1. Huge, huge stats coming across the board there from all of our main slayers so far. And look, it's pretty even across the board. It's SSG and G1 going toe-to-toe -to -toe on that KD ratio. Huge stuff here, bro. But what is that telling you about these two crazy powerhouse teams? Yeah, I think once again, on a pool play Friday like this, I think it's a real opportunity to, to get some serious numbers on the board. And unsurprisingly, SSG and G1 are taking advantage of that. You might also look at their pools and think that that might have also assisted the fact that their KDs are kind of off the charts and compared to other other teams, but pretty good numbers for both of the squads. I just want to point out there as well, Ika. Yeah. 1.43. That's where I was going. Yeah. I mean, looking at the qualifiers and how he performed, uh, you know, he, he actually wasn't very happy with his performance there. And I think Space Station, you know, they have notoriously been kind of poor online compared to their LAN accomplishments. But Ika being up there with one of the main slayers, that's pretty scary for a lot of teams looking at this SSG roster. Yeah, when Eco's playing at his best, he's probably the best player in the world, in my opinion. So, love seeing that out of him. Obviously, he's had a very successful Friday. Stellar is a guy that's usually on the top five KD ratios for every tournament for the past 10 years. So, it's nice to see someone match that level of power from him. And for it to be Eco, that's surprising. But at the same time, not really. He's just probably doing eco things and having a very successful time doing so in this pool. Yep. Well, gents, our shift has come to an end on the desk. We're going to be back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, with plenty more action. And I'll tell you what, we've had the most incredible start to the kickoff major. Pool play has been a grueling ride for a lot of our teams. The open bracket has been battling their way all day to make it into pools. And tomorrow, we will see the teams who will have their chance to cause some serious upsets and get their chance at being in the championship bracket where it's all to play for. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys tomorrow for day two of the kickoff major.